The story begins with some man's hand slowly and warily reaching for a sword as if hesitant with every movement. That person turns out to be Hunter E. Rang, sitting all bloody and pointing his sword at someone or rather something. It turns out that he is pointing his sword at the stone statues, which are slowly but surely approaching him like undead guards awakened from an age-old slumber. In his eyes, distorted by painful fear, you can see the despair, the sense of helplessness before the inevitable. And on his face, distorted by agony, you can see the inner conflict, the inordinate suicidal striving for perfection, mixed with the fire of anger and suicidal despair towards himself for his weakness, for his shortcomings. And just when he thought it couldn't get any worse, one of the statues swung its weapon at him, as if following the orders of an invisible lord. The city of Seoul is located in South Korea, and here we see our main character Hunter Sung Jin Woo again. Even among those who are also E-rank Hunter Sung Jin Woo is the weakest among them. Now it's headed for the gateway at a construction site in Seoul. Here is one of the gates connecting the other dimension to our world. We can see Kim's Hunters, who is also a member of this dungeon clearing squad. Before he goes to the dungeon, he decides to get himself a cup of coffee. And at that moment, a man called out to him. That man turned out to be a retired hunter like Mr. Kim Hunter Buck. The reason why Hunter Buck decided to return to the way of the hunter was that his wife is pregnant and money has to be taken somewhere. And Hunter Kim confirms that in his situation, the best thing to do is to get back on the hunter's path. But Hunter Buck does not hide the truth from Hunter Kim, indicating that he is very worried, because for a long time of absence, he may have lost his shape. While Hunter Back is telling his worries to Hunter Kim, Hunter Kim, in turn, ignores Hunter Back's words and turns his attention to Hunter Song Jin Woo. As soon as Hunter Song Jin Woo appeared, he was immediately told something by a similar hunter who had come to clear the dungeon. Hunter Kim keeps up too and asks Jin Woo about his condition. After all that Hunter Buck has seen, he has the impression that Sung Jin Woo is a very strong hunter, because everyone is very happy to see him. Hunter Kim grinned after hearing the assumption from Hunter Buck. After which he clarified the situation and told him that Hunter Song Jin Woo was the weakest hunter. After which he continued to mock Jin Woo. From the expression on Song Jin Woo's face, it was clear that Hunter Kim's words had hurt him. As a result, in order to at least cheer himself up a little, Hunter Sung Jin Woo decides to get himself a coffee. But even here, he was out of luck and the coffee had just run out. The employee apologizes to him, but it doesn't change the situation in any way. Just then, from behind, Jin Woo hears a scream. As he turns around, he sees his old acquaintance, B-ranked Childer Ju Hee, who immediately shows her surprise that Hunter Song Jin Woo is all wounded again. And then Jin Woo says that in the last trip to the E-rang dungeon, the group that Jin Woo went to the dungeon with didn't take a single healer hunter with them. And Ju Hee still shows him sympathy and worries about him as well. After all, it was only E-Rang's dungeon, and as usual, he was the only one affected. He goes on to give more details about his dungeon trek. And Ju Hee resents the actions of the team members of that raid. To which Jin Woo grinningly says that it's okay and he's used to this kind of thing. And now they're finally going to go to the dungeon. With a shout, one of the hunters gathers everyone in a pile. They are interrupted by an experienced hunter, Song who summons all the hunters. He says that even if he's not suited for the role, he'd like to be the leader of this raid. And in the end, everyone agrees to give the role of hunter leader to Song, because he is the strongest hunter among all the gathered. And of course, Hunter Sung Jin Woo agrees with this as well. After the leader is unanimously chosen, everyone enters the dungeon. But Hunter Sung Jin Woo is not ignored. He is again told not to hurt himself while raiding this dungeon. And so they enter a dungeon connecting another space to their world. Looking at the expression on Hunter Sung Jin Woo's face, it's safe to say that he's ready to give his best. And so they finally enter the dungeon. And the workers of this construction site, having made sure that all members of the squad successfully entered the dungeon, put up fences. As the hunters were being escorted out, the cafeteria worker wished he had been able to give Hunter Sung Jin Woo coffee. Even the simple cafeteria workers know about Sung Jin Woo, and they also can't stop marveling at the fact that Hunter Sung Jin Woo always comes out of the dungeon wounded. We can see that one of the squad members is using healing magic. It turns out that Hunter sleep almost immediately after entering the dungeon gets wounded, and healer Juhi has to treat him. Hunter Song destroys monsters with his fire spell that burns monsters to the ground. Hunter Kim also keeps up with him, chopping up monsters that get in his way. As for the rest of the hunters, they do quite well and calmly destroy the monsters they encounter in front of them. The raid is nearing its conclusion, but Hunter Sung Jin Woo notices that something is bothering healer Ju Hee. After dealing with all the monsters, everyone came together. Ju Hee is still showing his curiosity. However, Ju Hee doesn't understand why, after being injured so much, Jin Woo still continues to walk in the dungeon. To which our protagonist doesn't tell her about his sick mother unless you want to be pitied. Instead, he says it's just fun to go to the dungeons. He makes Juhi very angry because every time he gets hurt, she has to treat him. 
In turn, Ju He points out to make sure this fun doesn't become his undoing. Since everyone had dealt with the monsters, they gathered together in a circle. A crystal falls from each mob upon death. These crystals they can sell, then buy the equipment they need to help them further clean up the dungeons. But because Jin Wu is very weak, he can only get one Erang crystal. Unlike the Erang crystals that cost pennies, the Rang crystals are worth thousands. It would seem that the raid is already over as suddenly one of the raid participants finds another passage in the dungeon. And so they stood before a dark and deep cavern leading into the void. Group leader Mr. Song realizes that this is most likely a double lair and the dungeon boss is still alive. With his unique fire magic, Mr. Song creates a fireball, after which he launches it into the depths of the cave. Flying into the depths of the cave, the fireball illuminates a small part of that cave. And so Mr. Song's attack radius reached its limit and flames erupted in the depths of the cave. There's a theory that pops into Mr. Song's head. He reminds everyone that if you don't kill the boss, the dungeon won't close. So if the gate is still open, the boss must still be alive. Mr. Song says that the rules say that they must inform the Hunters Association and wait for further instructions. Everyone's confused. No one understands what Mr. Song is trying to say. But if other hunters get to the boss faster, the reward for the whole raid will be reduced. So the squad leader suggests that we all go together and kill the boss. But among the men of the squad, there are those who are wary. And they decide whether they go there or not by voting because there are only 17 people participating in this raid. Somebody wants to continue raiding and make more money, so they vote in favor. And some feel threatened by the continuation of this raid and fear for their lives, so they vote against it. Some people vote for some people against. In the end, the vote for and against turns out to be equally divided. The final vote goes to Sung Jin Wu. He only earned one E-rank crystal in this raid, and he needs money to keep his mother healthy. So to protect and keep his family safe, he votes to go after the boss. The decision has been made and all 17 are going to the bosses. They've been going for a long time and it's been 40 minutes. To defuse the situation, Hunter Sun decides to talk to Ju He. From Hunter Song Jin Wu's face, it could be seen that he was uncomfortable with what he had answered for. Everyone else also had to continue the raid. Ju He tried her best not to show her emotions. And Hunter Song Jin Wu didn't believe her words and decided to ask her if she was sure she wasn't mad at him. In the end, even the quietest and calmest Ju He couldn't take it. It turned out that Ju He was mad at Sung Jin Wu. And Jin Wu is showing that he's really sorry. After which Ju He gets even angrier at him. But afterwards, there is a spark between them. And Ju He demands from Hunter Sun Jin Wu to give her something to eat after today's raid. To which Song Jin Wu was unable to utter a single word. In turn, Ju He took it as a rejection. But eventually Jin Wu agreed to her terms. And now their conversation is interrupted by the raid leader who has finally found the door to the boss cave of this dungeon. None of them had ever seen a door like this before. After everyone has seen the doors to the boss's chambers, the raid members begin to have doubts about whether or not it's worth going after this boss. To which raid leader Song replies that he's not going to back down after the journey he's made. And even if he's alone, he won't back down and still go after the boss. It's encouraging to other hunters. They remember how strong Hunter Song is, so their anxiety gradually fades away. These huge doors open with difficulty and continue to instill terror in the raid participants. Just like that, the group opened the doors to the boss's chambers. As soon as they crossed the threshold of the boss's chambers, torches were lit that illuminated this dark hall. They were able to see the full scale of the room. On the walls of this building were many torches that illuminated the boss's chambers and made it even more terrifying. There were many statues in this place. Some of them were holding guns. Some of them were holding musical instruments. Hunter Song Jin Wu was also amazed at the scale of this room and the amount. But the statue in the center of the room stood out the most because it was the largest. The hunter Song Jin Wu had some suspicions about this statue, as it was the only one of such size. All the members of the group split up started looking for any clues in the room. The only clue Mr. Song came across was the magic seal. But suddenly another hunter called out to Mr. Song. We can see that in front of them was a statue different from other statues. She had wings, and in her hands she held a plate with runic symbols. And so they decided to read what was written on this slab. While Mr. Song translated what was written on the slab, everyone listened to him intently. While he was translating this text, Hunter Song Jin Wu was pulled towards him by healer Juhi. She pointed to the statue in the center of this hall, and she claimed that while Mr. Song's rune text, this statue was looking at them. And then we can see the dumbfounded face of Hunter Song Jin Wu. He stands puzzled and senses that something is not right in this room. While Mr. Song is still trying to translate the runic text, and then there was a rumbling noise that caused everyone to look back. 
turns out those big doors the group came in through had closed. And then one of the hunters steps forward. Turns out he wants to try to get through those doors. He shows that he doesn't want to stay here and doesn't care about the boss and the treasure. Here at last, he approached the door of the boss's chambers. And then Mr. Song yells at him not to touch the doors. Someone or something makes a move so fast that no one was able to even catch a glimpse of what happened. It turned out that the stone statue standing near the door in the blink of an eye cut off the head of the hunter who touched the door. After he killed that hunter, the stone statue stood in its original pose. On the hunter's faces, we can see the fear and surprise that these statues can move. Our cowardly healer b Rang gets really scared and clings to Hunter Sung Jin Woo. And at that moment, Hunter Song Jin Woo recalls Ju He's words that she saw the statue standing in the center of the room looking at them. And at the same instant, Hunter Song Jin Woo turns back around and catches the eye of that huge statue in the center of this room. He feels unimaginable fear from this statue. But also a big problem are the smaller statues, one of which just killed one of the hunters in a flashback of eyes. And here we can see a large number of the same stone statues are in this room. Hunter Song Jin Woo starts to analyze what's going on. And it turns out that that hunter was D-Rang. Hunter Sung Jin Woo was shocked that a hunter stronger than him was able to kill the statue with a single blow. This was just a rank dungeon in which there shouldn't have been any problems. After what had happened, they had forgotten all about the runic text. Even the strongest hunter among them, squad leader Mr. Song, is shocked by everything that's going on. And all the hunters here stand aghast as the statue in the center can probably move too. After Mr. Song's assumption, Hunter Song Jin Woo immediately looked at this statue. And then something happened that he never expected. That statue looked back at him. And then we are shown Hunter Sung Jin Woo in his first raid. The way he was wounded by a goblin-like monster. How he almost died from exhaustion, lack of food and starvation. One of the main reasons why Hunter Sung Jin Woo was getting injured even in low-ranked dungeons was because he didn't have good enough weapons to fight monsters. He constantly thought of his mother for keeping alive who needed a large amount of money. He was constantly putting his life in danger. And all the other hunters were constantly surprised that he was getting injured even in the E-Rang dungeons. He constantly came out of them exhausted and in a serious condition. In addition to having to pay for his mother's treatment, he also had to buy new clothes after a few trips to the dungeon, because the past ones were already worn out. There were all sorts of monsters that Hunter Sung Jin Woo had encountered, one of which was a Cyclops-like monster. But this statue was different from the other monsters Hunter Song Jin Woo had encountered. Because Hunter Song Jin Woo was constantly on the brink of death, he sensed something. He grabbed a standing beside him and a very frightened Ju He, and he told everyone to get down on the floor. Everyone was surprised that the weakest hunter could say anything in such a situation. And then that statue's eyes flashed like lightning in a thunderstorm. And so, this statue strikes Hunter Sung Jin Woo along with the healing B-Rang Ju He, but they manage to lie on the floor and dodge. The statue is trying to kill the hunters with this beam and shooting at them destroys the floor beneath them. The power of this beam was so strong that smoke was seeping out from the eyes of this statue. The place where that statue's ray hit became so liquid that it was tangible. After realizing what had happened, the hunters came to their senses and began to help each other. But we can see the hunters horrified by the charred hand they saw. This huge statue had killed many people in a single strike, and many survivors had only managed to dodge the beam because Hunter Song Jin Woo had told them to keep their heads down. After this attack, Hunter Song Jin Woo can barely stand up, but Ju Hitak is lying on the floor and won't get up, while Mr. Song tells them to stay where they are and not to rise, claiming that he will attack again if they rise. Everyone else, though not initially believing him, follows his orders. Mr. Song tells the worried Hunter Song Jin Woo that Miss Ju doesn't really deal with her fear and so only goes to low-ranked dungeons. But looking at those terrifying statues, you can't say that this is a low-ranked dungeon. Mr. Song shows his attentiveness and tells Hunter Sung Jin Woo that only those who listened to him survived, to which Hunter Sung Jin Woo is surprised. In turn, Mr. Song is surprised by Hunter Sung Jin Woo's reactions because he thought he screamed because he knew what was going to happen, to which Hunter Sung Jin Woo replied that he just sensed danger. It turned out that Mr. Song had lost his left arm in the attack of this huge statue. After Song Jin Woo saw that Mr. Song's left arm was missing, he hurriedly stopped the blood. So Hunter Song Jin Woo was able to stop the blood. While the rest of the hunters sat and watched this huge statue, we can see by the look on Mr. Song's face that he is dumbfounded by the difficulty level of this dungeon. He ponders what rank this dungeon might be. Eventually looking at this huge statue, he comes to the conclusion that this could be an S-rank dungeon. And then he remembers the rules of this temple called Kartanon. The first two rules of this temple were to worship and praise the Lord. The third rule was to prove their faith, 
and the note was that those who would not follow these rules would die. Since Mr. Song and Hunter Song Jin Wu are the only ones who can think soberly in this situation, the two of them think about what they can do. And then Hunter Song Jin Wu gets some idea in his head. For his part, Mr. Song suggests that destroying these statues would take too long. And then we're shown a gate identical to the one these hunters entered. This gate is the reason they are in such a dire situation. The first gates appeared about 10 years ago, and as we can see, they can appear both at ground level and above ground. The advent of the gate has brought many changes to this world. Take hunters, for example. Like in the situation of Hunter Sung Jin Wu, anyone can become a hunter. Except that once awakened, the power they had gained could not increase. Hunters are those who have been given special powers to fight monsters in the gate. Various monsters may be encountered in the gate. As we can see, our protagonist has encountered truly terrifying monsters in the D-Rang gate. He's still sitting there wondering what he can do against monsters like that. This monster is a huge statue with glowing eyes. Hunter Sung Jin Wu is worried about Mr. Song whose arm is bleeding. Mr. Song says he took three healers on this raid, but there's nothing they can do in this situation. One of them was killed by a beam from the eyes of the huge statue. The other cannot even think straight because of the fear that has consumed him. And now even a B-Rang healer is lying on the floor because of the same fear that consumed the second healer. They sit down and don't get up from their seats so the huge statue doesn't attack them. And Mr. Song and Hunter Song Jin Wu keep thinking about what they can do. After all, most of the hunters are scared and can't think straight because of everything that has happened. And from the expression on Hunter Song Jin Wu's face, you can see how desperate he is to save his life and find a way to avoid fighting these statues. We see one of the raid hunters standing off the ground. He just joined a major guild, doesn't want to part with his life so early. The squad leader Song was angry at his actions and ordered him to stay where he was. But he ignored the squad leader's words and still decided to resist the power of those statues. Emphasize his unusually strong legs. And so he decided to fight back after all. And in a moment he was tearing toward the doors at full speed. You can see in his eyes that he is confident in his speed and the strength of his legs. As he tore toward the doors, the eyes of the huge statue in the center of the room glittered. And at the same time, we were shown to us by the surprised and fear-filled Hunter Song Jin Wu and Mr. Song. As it turned out, the statue in the center of the room with its beam from the eyes left only his feet from the hunter who rushed to the door. The incredibly terrifying power of the statue once again shocked all the hunters. Some of the hunters were screaming for all they were worth because of what they saw. And others could not even utter a word for fear that the same fate might befall them. Except that Hunter Sung Jin Wu was not only filled with fear but also anger. He's angry that these statues could kill them at any time, but they don't. The head of the squad, Mr. Song, is equally perplexed, and so they begin to reason why these statues are not attacking them, because at the moment there is nothing holding them back. And yet these monsters are different from the other monsters that attack anything that moves. The guard statue at the door only attacks those who approach the door. The statue in the center attacks those who begin to move. Hunter Song Jin Wu still continues to think about what they can do in this situation. And so, after a long time of deliberation, something does occur to him. And so, having come to some assumptions, he turns back. His gaze went to a statue that was different from the others and held a slab with runic text. And he recalls that Mr. Song, when he translated this runic text, spoke of the rules of this temple of Karanon. And now, from the expression on Hunter Sung Jin Wu's face, you could tell that he had finally realized what the pattern of this temple was. And so, realizing what it is, he asks Mr. Sleepyhead what the first rule of this temple was. For his part, Mr. Song doesn't understand what he needs it for with difficulty remembers the first rule, to worship the Lord. And by Lord, you probably mean the statue in the center. After that, the hunter Song Jin Wu, having received more information, begins to rise, to which Mr. Song does not understand the reason for his actions begins to dissuade him. Hunter Sung Jin Wu is almost fully back on his feet, and Mr. Song is still puzzled as to why Hunter Sung Jin Wu is doing this. Well, after looking him in the face, his hysterical screaming suddenly subsided. He realizes these are not the eyes of a man about to die. Almost fully on his feet, he begins to explain to the others what the pattern of this huge statue is. And so practically when he got to his feet, the eyes of this stage began to sparkle. Hunter Sung Jin Wu immediately lowered himself to the ground. You could tell from his eyes that he had just experienced an indescribable fear of death. Well, after the hunter song. Jin Wu lowered himself to the ground. The huge statue seemed to have changed its mind about attacking him. And hunter Sung Jin Wu finally got to understand the meaning of the first rule. And he immediately hastened to tell the rest of the hunters about this rule. To which the other hunters that hunter Sung Jin Wu went crazy. It wasn't until Mr. Song Jin Wu realized that Hunter Sung Jin Wu had finally figured something out. And from the expression on Hunter Sung Jin Wu's face, 
we can clearly see that he is completely confident in his actions. While the statue stares intently at the hunters, Hunter Song Jin Wu tries his best to explain the first rule of this temple to the others. Even though he bowed his head to the statue, you could tell by the look on his face that he was not going to obey it. Sitting covered in sweat because of the loss of his arm and Hunter Song Jin Wu's risky actions, Mr. Song hopes that Hunter Song Jin Wu knows what he's doing. To which Hunter Song Jin Wu replies with the same confident face that he is. And so Mr. Song grinned, realizing they had no more options. Finally, all the remaining hunters listened to the Hunter Song Jin Wu and bowed their heads before the huge statue. Bowing before her, they hoped to be able to get out of here afterwards. In turn, the statue still sits motionless on its throne. Huntress healer Bi Rang Juhi finally came to her senses. What hunters? What big statue no one has even moved so far? The expression on that statue's face changed. Obviously, the hunters noticed it. This roused them, either sense of dread only intensified. Only his facial expression has changed, but if you are, my fear has increased so much it's hard to even describe. After changing his face, no one dares to even move. Remembering how he had killed other hunters before, the fear of the remaining hunters only increases. And now even Hunter Sung Jin Wu, who could understand the meaning of the first rule, doesn't know what to do next. And now the previously mentioned and just returned Hunter Buck notices that the statue is no longer attacking. Even after he stopped attacking them, their anxiety only increased. Still, at his own risk, Hunter Buck decided to stand on both feet. Then everyone started cheering thinking that it was over. Because even after they were all on their feet, he didn't attack any of the hunters. But still, something was wrong and Hunter Song Jin Wu realized it. There was a rumbling noise that startled all the hunters. It turned out to be a huge statue in the center of the room standing up on its feet. With a regular step, he turned the floor beneath his feet into splinters. It gave the hunters that this wasn't the end of all this craziness. It's a statue hundreds of times bigger than humans. It strikes terror into the hearts of anyone who looks at it. And then hoping that he has some kind of backup plan, Mr. Song turns to Hunter Sung Jin Wu. But as it turns out, Hunter Sung Jin Wu has no plan. And with a terrified expression, she looked at the hunters trembling in fear before her. This statue starts attacking them by stepping on them like they're bugs. When it hits the ground, it causes a shock wave comparable to an earthquake. After that, the hunters struggle to keep their balance. And now, Hunter Sung Jin Wu is finally what you're thinking of. He recalls the second rule of this temple to worship the Lord and shares it with the others. They are in this turmoil trying to figure out how the rule can be enforced. And then out comes one of the hunters who was a member of the church choir saying he can praise him. Gathering his thoughts and taking the cross hanging around his neck in his hand, he begins to praise God. While the huge statue continues to approach him, we can see how small humans are against this huge monster. But the excitement in Hunter Song Jin Wu's face didn't go anywhere. Watching the faces of the hunters felt like it was starting to work somehow after all. But here's the face of Hunter Sung Jin Wu saying otherwise. And the face of the statue itself became even more horrifying. As we can see the foot of this huge statue is right above the head of the man who began to praise God. At this moment this man is in so much fear that his face has turned pale. And then Hunter Sung Jin Wu realizes he's been praising the wrong God. But before he could say that the huge statue had already crushed that hunter. This plunged the rest of the hunters into even more fear. Because of their desperation and lack of ability to resist him in any way, they began to mindlessly run away from him. From his face, it looks like ants are running away from him trying to escape. Some of the hunters were so desperate they couldn't even move. And the statue itself, in turn, trampled everyone in front of it. Hunter Juhi could only move thanks to Hunter Sung Jin Wu. If it wasn't for Hunter Sung Jin Wu, she would have died just like the last two. And now Hunter Bug is on the brink of death and remembers his wife is pregnant. He reaches the very edge of the room and thinks he is safe. But Hunter Kim yells for him to turn around. So he ran right up to one of the statues. And just as Hunter Kim warns Hunter Buck, the statue behind Hunter Buck chops him in two. We can see how deadly and ruthless this statue is in killing Buck the Hunter. Then it returns to its original position, just like the statue by the door. While on the other side, a huge statue tramples everyone in its path. Hunter Sung Jin Wu is trying to find a way to escape them. There are guards behind them and a huge statue in front. The statue behind them will attack anyone who comes near them. Each statue has a different weapon they use to kill the hunters. And Hunter Sung Jin Wu keeps thinking about how to deal with these statues. And then he notices that some of the statues don't have weapons, but musical instruments. He recalls and analyzes that those statues that killed the hunters were weapons. But if they don't have guns, but musical instruments, they can't attack hunters. Hunter Sung Jin Wu reports this to the remaining hunters. The first to reach the statue with the musical instrument was the squad leader, Mr. Song. After he approached her, she began to play an instrument, and he, as well as Hunter Sung Jin Wu, told the others to go to the statues with the musical instruments. Just like Mr. Song, Hunter Kim reached the statue with a musical instrument. 
He too has been consumed by fear and loathing, and now he sits in tears. Observing the huge statue and the corpses of his comrades lying before him, Hunter Song Jin Wu, along with the hunter with all his legs, is trying to get to the statue with the musical instrument. But after we got to the statue with the musical instrument, it didn't start playing. She still stood motionless in one place. The two of them stared at the statue in horror. Hunter Bi Juhi's wound was so scary that she was already drenching herself in tears. The hunter Sung Jin Wu leaves her in front of the statue with the drum in his hands, and he rushes to the other statue. Well, here's when he starts running towards another statue. A huge statue is looking at him. Without a backward glance, he runs with all his legs and tries to find another statue with a musical instrument. You can tell by the look on his face how tired he is. And then the foot of the huge statue that had just stood very far away turned out to be right above the head of Hunter Song Jin Wu. He was barely able to dodge this attack, but then Mr. Song yells something to him. It turns out that Hunter Song Jin Wu ran to the wrong statue. This statue holding a shield in his hands attacks the Hunter Song Jin Wu who is right in front of him. Hunter Juhi, who was left in the statue with the drum by Hunter Song Jin Wu, shouted with all her might. Bloodied and all wounded, Hunter Song Jin Wu tries to get away from the huge statue. Because of his injuries, he can't go no offense. He literally crawls away from this huge, terrifying statue. And in response, it's a statue as if mocking him, smiling at him. Hunter Sung Jin Wu is once again on the brink of death. Being on the edge of life and death, he is held on the thin, almost severed thread of his life. His face is almost completely bloody. And then one of the statues that looked like a girl started petting. It turned out that the Hunter Song Jin Wu had gotten to the statue that looked like an angel and was not holding any weapons. And now on the brink of death, Hunter Sung Jin Wu manages to survive once again. And about the huge statue that just trampled all the hunters in front of her, she stopped. Just after the huge statue stopped, Hunter Juhi rushed towards Hunter Song Jin Wu. Getting close enough to him to see his body fully, she was horrified. The Sunshine Hunter himself apparently didn't understand why Yuhi was so surprised. On his own, Hunter Sung Jin Wu realized what was wrong. It turned out that he had lost his right leg, but because he was already emotionally exhausted, he didn't react in any way. He huddled against the statue behind him and healer B Rang Juhi began to treat his leg. But suddenly blood started pouring out of her nose and mouth. Apparently trying to heal his leg, she used up all her strength. The remaining members of the squad were watching. And Hunter Kim points out that when they went into the dungeon, there were 17 of them, but only six survived. And Mr. Song, being left without his left arm, indicates that two of the remaining six hunters are in very serious condition. And obviously one of those two is Hunter Sung Jin Wu. And Hunter Kim says it's all the fault of the squad leader, Mr. Song, who made a hasty decision and decided to come in here. And then, during their conversation, the huge statue moved. This did not faintly frighten the remaining hunters. They all stared in horror at this huge, motionless statue. And then there's a sound that makes everyone nervous. A pillar comes out of the ground right in front of the throne of this huge statue. Didn't stand still and watch then as something that looked like an altar came out from under the earth. Watching this, they hoped they weren't in for the same thing that had happened before. And so a circle and a stone slab in the center of that circle came out from under the earth. The hunters don't even have a clue what it could be. But Hunter Sung Jin Wu, even in his exhausted state, realized that it was an altar. And the other hunters marveled at what was said. After that, we are shown an example of an altar where a certain group of people sacrifice something from living beings. And so the Hunter Song Jin Wu was also able to understand the third and last commandment of this temple of Karanon. After Hunter Sung Jin Wu's words, we can see that Mr. Song's facial expression has changed. Even Oleg's face became much simpler and calmer. And then one of the remaining six hunters starts pulling something out. It was Hunter Kim who drew his sword from his air vault. After he fully drew his sword, he pointed it at the head of Mr. Song's squad. Pointing his sword at him, he claimed that he was the reason they were in this situation. He spoke about it to Mr. Song, recalling the deaths of the other 11 members of this unit. Hunter Kim tells him that he must sacrifice himself as he is the culprit behind everything that is happening. Hunter Sung Jin Woo says it's not his fault and gets nothing but hysterical screaming in response. And Mr. Song himself agrees with Hunter Kim and admits his mistake. But Hunter Song Jin Wu disagrees with their opinion. Mr. Song himself voluntarily decides to walk up to the altar and sacrifice himself. There he went and walked up to the altar that had symbols on it that Mr. Song had never seen before. A couple of seconds after Mr. Song walked up to the altar, a flame lit up behind him. Hunter Kim, who insisted Mr. Song sacrifice himself, didn't realize what had happened. So Mr. Song decided to find out what Hunter Sung Jin Woo thought about it. But you can tell from the Hunter Sung Jin Woo's face that he didn't expect such an outcome. He looked at the exhausted and still healing Juhi's Huntress. After he saw that nothing had happened to Mr. Sleepyhead, he decided to walk down the aisle. In this, he was helped by the rest of the hunters. 
and so he gradually approaches the altar. After the three of them had entered the circle around the altar, three more flames were burned, just like in Mr. Song's situation. Hunter Sung Jin Wu asked Mr. Sung if someone would come to rescue them, to which Mr. Song replies to him that it's likely these statues will start moving before that happens. They continue to ponder their next course of action as well. Hunter Sleep, though badly wounded and very much exhausted, continues to think about their next moves. The goal of these raids is to kill the boss and close the gate before the seven-day limit expires. And there's something bothering Hunter Sung Jin Wu. If this limit is exceeded while they are in this dungeon, these monsters will escape. Turning around, Hunter Song Jin Wu calls Hunter Juhi and Hunter Kim into the circle. After all, the trials will likely begin when all the hunters are in the circle. Hunter Juhi and Hunter Kim look at each other hesitantly. Finally, all the survivors of the squad are in a circle and the remaining lights have come on as well. Suddenly, more lights appeared around the other circle but blue in color. Everyone is standing around in bewilderment trying to figure out what's going on. Suddenly, there is a rumbling noise coming from the doorway. Everyone turns their attention to the doors and sees them swing open. Not believing their eyes, they are very surprised at what is happening before their eyes. Even though the doors swung open, the guard standing beside them didn't go anywhere. But at the moment, the hunters don't care because now their thoughts are only on the possibility that they can get out of here. Those doors became their only escape route, just as suddenly the hunters started getting nervous and yelling something to each other. As it turned out, all the statues around the perimeter of the room began to move to the side. Being practically in the center of the room, they didn't know how they were going to get to the door before these statues got to them. They were fussing and trying to find some loophole through which they could come. As suddenly after Hunter Song Jin Woo looked towards some of the statues, they stopped. That's when Hunter Song Jin Woo came to mind. The Hunter Ju He closed her eyes because she was too afraid, but the Hunter Song Jin Woo told her not to close her eyes. Just like Hunter Ju He, Hunter Song Jin Woo told the others to keep their eyes on the statues. As time passed, the blue lights around the outer circle faded. Hunter Song, Jin Wu tried not to take his gaze away from the statues so they couldn't get too close to them. Just as suddenly, one of the surviving hunters behind him shouted, and like she was off the chain, she ran toward the exit. After she left the inner circle, one of the red lights that indicated the number of people in the circle went out. She ran with all her might to the door leading to the exit, and so ran near a statue of knights, one of whom had earlier killed a man approaching the door. The other hunters were surprised that she was able to run past them. And the first hunter to emerge from this room was one we know nothing about, but did not notice that after she left this room, the gate was slightly covered. The strange pattern of the altar that Hunter Sung Jin Wu is trying to unravel, he begins to remember everything that happened in this dungeon. About the first rule where they were to honor the Lord, where they were to worship a huge statue that was in the center of the room. The second rule where they had to praise the Lord was to run up to the statues with musical instruments. And then finally the third test when the exit doors opened. Hunter's wife, analyzing everything that is happening, begins to approach the solution to this ordeal. According to his suggestion, the third test is that you must remain steadfast even in the sight of mortal danger, and must also keep his faith. But while Hunter Sung Jin Wu was thinking about what this ordeal was all about, one of the hunters apologizes to him and says he can't stay here anymore. This hunter pushes away Hunter Sung Jin Wu who then hits the altar pretty hard starts yelling for this hunter to come back. In Hunter Song Jin Woo's eyes, one can see the shock and contempt at the betrayal and heinous act from a comrade. And just like the last girl, he was able to run past the statue of knights near the gate. And just like last time, Hunter Ju He and Hunter Kim were able to run past those knights. In turn, the Hunter Sung Jin Woo's facial expression makes it clear to the others that no one else can leave this room. After all, in order to contain these statues, they have to look at them. And if one more person were to leave now, six eyes wouldn't be enough to look after all these statues. After everything Hunter Sung Jin Woo said, Mr. Song asks him to explain everything that's going on right now. The Hunter Song Jin Woo tells him that the main goal now is to watch the statues approaching them, and the lights around the outer circle are a timer, and they will be able to get out of here after the lights disappear. Hunter Kim believes Hunter Sung Jin Woo, but still asks him if the gate can close if those blue lights go out. Listening to what Hunter Kim says, Hunter Sung Jin Woo realizes that he wants to do something he doesn't need to do. Hunter Kim can't believe that a weak hunter like Hunter Sung Jin Woo could be so useful. He tells him about how he's always looked down on him, and notes that all the survivors are alive only because of Hunter Sung Jin Woo. He says that he is truly grateful to Hunter Sung Jin Woo. The bad thoughts in Hunter Sung Jin Woo's mind about Hunter Kim's possible actions are not getting out of his head. Hunter Kim is completely in tears and snot talking about how he doesn't want to die. He apologizes to them and slowly begins to move towards the door. Hunter Sung Jin Woo tries to change his mind about leaving this room, trying to change his mind and not wanting to experience the bitterness of betrayal again. 
Hunter Song Jin Woo also sheds tears. But Hunter Kim is almost out. And Hunter Sung Jin Woo experienced that feeling of betrayal again. Mr. Kim's escape will cost them their lives. Being in such a dire situation, even Hunter Sung Jin Woo doesn't know what to do. After Hunter Kim left, the doors to the exit closed even tighter. It wasn't until Hunter Kim left that Mr. Song was able to understand the meaning behind the ordeal. So Mr. Sleep says they have no choice but to get out of here. He says that as long as there is at least one person at the altar, the city will close. But even after hearing this, Hunter Sung Jin Woo is not willing to give up on Mr. Song. Because Hunter Song Jin Woo is missing his right leg, Mr. Song turns to Hunter Juhi to help him get out of here. But before she could answer, Juhi collapsed to the ground as if her legs could no longer hold her. Not expecting anything like this, she didn't realize what had happened. On trying to stand up, her legs give a shake and seem to refuse to get up. She looks at Hunter Sung Jin Woo in horror and tries to figure out what happened to her legs. To which Mr. Song says his assumption is that she has used up all her mana, so her body is now in a state of weakness. After that, Hunter Song Jin Woo tells Mr. Song to get out of here with Juhi. After which, they start arguing over who will stay in the room and who will get out. But in the end, Hunter Song Jin Woo and Huntress Juhi can't get out of here on their own, and Mr. Posture realizes that he will have to get out of here with Huntress Juhi after all. To which the Huntress Yuhi offers them her idea for her to stay here. And then Hunter Song Jin Woo remembers his promise to go out to dinner with her. Because he can't take her out to dinner after all, he gives her his only crystal he's earned today. She's not taking that crystal after all. And then she jumped up and said that she should stay here after all. Suddenly, she received a rather strong and scathing blow to the neck. So, realizing that she's going to insist and Mr. Song decides to knock her out and carry her himself. Hunter Sung Jin Woo asks Mr. Sung for a sequel so that he can take care of her, to which he does not want to leave him, and replies that he will do his best. As Mr. Sleep and the Huntress Juhi leave here, Hunter Oleg has no strength left to at least raise his head. Here they are finally coming out of that gate. In the eyes of the hunter, dream can be seen despair, exhaustion, and not wanting to die. But then comes the relief that Mr. Song and the Huntress Juhi got out of here. And so the stone stats approach the only remaining hunter in the room. And Hunter Sung Jin Woo is the ticket to hold the sword left behind by traitorous Hunter Kim. Our all-bloodied and scarred protagonist is desperately trying to at least somehow resist the power of the dungeon. To me, this stone statue of the Hunter of the Living is a minor biped. His eyes show an emptiness akin to the emptiness in the hearts of those who betrayed him. But after a moment, his gaze is filled with courage and daring, can meet his death with dignity. And then one of the stone statues swings at him. She pierces the chest of Hunter Song Jin Woo through and through with her huge spear. After which, she almost chops the Hunter Song Jin Woo into two pieces with a single and swift upward movement. Losing a large amount of blood and being hit so hard, the eyes of the Hunter Song Jin Woo's eyes were showing how sore he was at that moment. After being hit by the attestation, Hunter Song Jin Woo landed directly on the altar, pouring his blood on it. Hunter Song Jin Woo is showing that he doesn't want to die. He recalls Hunter Kim's words before he betrayed Hunter Song Jin Woo, how he thanked him and afterwards apologized for giving it to him. Like he said about how he was the only one who would die when he didn't want to die at all. And now, as if following someone's orders, the statue swung at Hunter Sung Jin Woo again. Hunter Oleg can no longer save anything, but all his wife, losing hope, asks for another chance. Well, this is the statue delivering its final blow. But suddenly that statue stops and some kind of window pops up in front of Hunter Song Jin Woo. Not for the first time, Hunter Sung Jin Woo, who was on the brink of death, doesn't understand what it is. This window tells him that he has met all the requirements for the hidden quest, Courage of the Weak. But even after reading what was written in this window, Hunter Song Jin Woo didn't understand what it was. And then another window pops up in front of him that asks him if he accepts the assignment. If he refuses it, his heart will be severed in 0.2 seconds. Well, since this is his second chance at life, he's taking this assignment. And the face of that great statue that killed so many hunters has returned to its original form. Immediately after accepting this task, light consumed everything around Hunter Song Jin Woo. Hunter Man Jin Woo cold then opens his eyes. As it turned out, he woke up in a hospital tent. From his heavy breathing and the way he clutched his chest, you could tell that the moment that statue pierced his chest, he felt again. But he doesn't understand how he survived and thinks it was just a dream. Looking around, he realizes he is in a hospital. So he's just woken up and he's being distributed by two men in suits. Hunter Song Jin Woo seeing them for the first time is a bit agitated. It turned out to be the inspector of the Korean Hunters Guild. Turns out Hunter Sung Jin Woo had been unconscious for three days. And then Hunter Sung Jin Woo asks the Korean Guild inspector how Mr. Song and Hunter Juhi are doing. But the inspector notes that because of the loss of his left arm, it is likely that Mr. Song will not be able to continue his hunting career. 
And speaking of Juhi Hunter, she's now in traumatic shock after everything she's seen. The second inspector starts talking about the other hunters. The hunter Sung Jin Woo tells him that's enough. The inspector informs the hunter Sung Jin Woo that only six people have escaped from the dungeon. But the work of hunters is dangerous. But such a massacre is very rare. After those five hunters got out, the high-ranked hunters entered the double dungeon. When they entered this dungeon, they found only an Olek hunter lying on the altar without any injuries. Hunter Song Jin Woo did not believe what the inspector said, but it was the truth that the inspector had seen with his own eyes. But still, the reason they believed it was that the testimonies of the survivors completely matched, and also the remains of the dead hunters were found in this dungeon. The inspector says that they assume that Hunter Sung Jin Wu has gone through a reawakening. Still not fully digesting the information, Hunter Sung Jin Wu was shocked by what the inspector said. Reawakening is a reawakening when an already awakened person awakens a second time. And to test it, the inspector brought along a magic power meter. Inspector think there, according to witnesses, the power of these stone statues was so great that only A rank or S rank hunters could handle them. And the only survivor in that room was the Hunter Sung Jin Wu. So it's no wonder the suspicion of a reawakening fell on him. Here we can see the results of the measurement of Hunter Sung Jin Woo's magic power. The assistant inspector who measured the Hunter Sung Jin Woo's magic power thinks that even by ERAG standards, this is a very weak result. The Hunter Sung Jin Woo realizes that his strength has not changed and he is still a very weak hunter. But there was one thing that confused him. The fact that they didn't see the notification window that was in front of Hunter Sung Jin Woo. As it turns out, the leg of the Hunter Song Jin Woo that was torn off by the shield statue has recovered. And also, Hunter Sung Jin Woo's chest pierced through is also fine. The Dream Hunter now has no idea what is going on in his life at all. He's trying to figure out what that notification window is that only he can see. And so while he was examining this notification window, someone came into his room. Turns out it's his little sister, Gina. So he asks if she sees this notification window in front of him. Hunter Sung Jin Woo asks her how she usually opens an unread message in games. And so, with the help of his younger sister Jin, a hunter Sung Jin Woo, he does open this alert. And then, just like in the dungeon in front of him, pops up a window where it says that he received a daily task called Get Stronger. This asked the hunter Sung Jin Woo in even more bewilderment. And then, after his little sister visited him, she left with her friend. While hunter Sung Jin Woo was trying to figure out what those windows were. And then he remembers the same window that appeared when he was attacked by the statue. And so repeatedly in front of him appears a window on the alerts of the daily task of becoming stronger. And so after Hunter Sung Jin Woo says, open this alert opens, a window appears that is much larger than the previous ones. And in this assignment, it says about today's goals for the fulfillment of which it is necessary to do 100 push-ups, abs, squats, running. But for failure to fulfill these tasks, he will receive a penalty. But the Corvid Hunter takes it as a simple joke. To accomplish this daily task, he decides to go to bed and he thinks he'll figure it out after he gets some sleep. Well, this one thing doesn't go away, and we are separately shown a warning that if he does not complete these tasks in the prescribed time, he will receive a fine. And suddenly, after a while, Hunter Ordenko wakes up because of the earthquakes. The earthquake was so strong that he fell out of bed. As it turned out, it was not just an earthquake. He moved to another place altogether, and that place turned out to be the desert. Sung Jin Woo, a hunter sitting in shock, doesn't notice that there is some kind of evil behind him. The object behind Hunter Sung Jin Woo was getting bigger and bigger. And so Hunter Sung Jin Woo finally turned his attention to this object. It turned out to be a giant sand centipede that came out from under the earth. A window reappeared in front of him that alerted him that he now needed to survive for four hours. Hunter Sung Jin Woo, who just returned from a double to the dungeons, is in some kind of trouble again. We can see him trying his best to survive again. He's running from that giant sand centipede. And now we are shown the hospital tent where the hunter Sung Jin Woo has just been and that the time is already 5 o'clock in the morning. And then we are shown the mouth of a huge sand centipede with fangs as sharp as a sharpened sword. Hunter Song. Jin Woo's face was distorted with fear. But it could be said that the fear he was feeling now was nothing compared to what he had experienced in the double dungeon. Finally, Hunter Sung Jin Woo returns to his room. With the hunter Song Jin Woo. His chamber moved not only himself, but also a small amount of sand, and also a window appeared in front of him saying that he had completed the penalty task. It is clear from the face of Hunter Song Jin Woo that he is very tired, because he has been running away from the huge sand centipedes for four hours. Another notification appears in front of him that he has received a reward for completing a penalty mission. But because he is too tired, he cannot accept it. After a while, a nurse enters his room, and Hunter Song Jin Woo lies unconscious on the floor. And it turns out that Hunter Sung Jin Woo is being discussed by the nurses. 
They talk about how almost immediately after he woke up, he started running. Though he is a hunter, the nurse's concern for his health does not subside. Just so he's awake, he winds laps around the hospital building every day. And so that the situation that happened on the first day related to the penalty task will not happen again, he tries to fulfill the daily task on time. In those four days, he realized that this instruction before evolutionary is not a hallucination. As it turns out, he's accomplished all four goals already, and no one but him sees this pop up. As it turns out, he gets three rewards for completing the daily task. The first reward is recovery. This reward restores his spent strength and relieves the fatigue of his body. Also, the next rewards are characterization points, or a box of unknowns. Characterization points allow him to increase his base parameters. In addition, he can monitor his parameters, skills, items, and inventory. In general, it's becoming more and more like a game. So after he accomplished his last goal and ran 10 kilometers, he decided to sit down to rest. And now watching his status, he can't help but be happy that he can increase and improve his skills. And so, towards evening, he goes to the administrative desk where he wants to ask for permission to leave. Well, that the girl sitting behind the administrative counter tell him that of course he can leave, but not for long. And here our hunter Oleg is in front of the subway. Turns out that when he completed the day quest for the reward box with John Doe, he got some kind of key. In reality, this key is the key to the E-Rang dungeon. On the face of Hunter Sung Jin Woo, we can see the anxiety and impatience of what might be waiting for him in this dungeon. He thinks all these quests, status windows, rewards might be because of the double awakening. And here he thought for a while as he shook the key in his hand, still decided to go down to the subway and open the dungeon and rank. At the very least, he thinks that if anything, he can escape from this dungeon. And as you hold the key forward, it begins to sparkle as if it really does open the doors to the dungeon. At the end of the descent into the dungeon appears some kind of light that so exudes magical power from itself. On the other side of this, we can see the shadow of Hunter Song Jin Wu. And so he finally enters this dungeon. But suddenly entering this dungeon, the entrance to it closes. Hunter Sung Jin Wu tries to walk back through it, but it's blocked. But the average girl who walks up the stairs to get out of this subway goes through this barrier. As it turns out, none of the people except Hunter Sung Jin Wu can see this dungeon. Hunter Sung Jin Wu is trying his best to find any gap in this barrier to get out. But he can't find any loophole. He gets a notification that he can't leave this dungeon until he kills the boss or uses the Crystal of Return. You can see by the look on his face that he's at a loss to sing he's going to have to mop up an entire dungeon by himself. Looking into the deep darkness of this dungeon, he can feel it exuding an ominous magical power. Hunter Sung Jin Woo gets scared and realizes the mistake of coming here alone. Walking a little further, we can see that everything around looks like a regular abandoned market. You can tell by the look in his eyes how he's losing his confidence with each step. And here he feels a stench and some tension. Turns out there was some kind of red beast nearby. And here we see the huge and ferocious mouth of this beast. It was a wolf-like beast with a metal jaw and fangs as sharp as a perfectly sharpened sword. He tried to attack our protagonist, but Hunter Song Jin Wu was able to dodge his attack with one sharp and swift movement. And here we can see this beast in full glory, and also the Hunter Song Jin Wu who had just dodged his ferocious attack. This is exactly the kind of monster that doesn't care who's in front of him, he'll attack anyone he sees. And Hunter Song Jin Wu in turn catches maximum concentration and thinks how he can overpower him. But Hunter Song Jin Wu can't budge. He doesn't understand why his body won't obey him. It's unlikely he has any trauma left from the double dungeon. So while he was thinking, this wolf-like beast began to take action. With his sharp fangs, he tries to bite Hunter Sung Jin Woo in half. Except that Hunter Sung Jin Woo somehow manages to dodge his attacks. And one of his attacks, he was almost able to get the Hunter Sung Jin Woo, who barely dodged him. Ducking, he takes a one-handed leap and hits the Iron Gate. He marvels that he can do such acrobatic stunts. He moves so lightly and quickly as if his body seems to weigh nothing at all. And just dodging another punch, he lands on his feet. But then that wolf manages to attack him again. So Hunter Sung Jin Woo can barely react. And so he gathers all his strength into a fist. And with one mighty blow, pushes this wolf away. He hit it with such force that the wolf flew several meters away and destroyed the iron beams with its body. Hunter Sung Jin Woo himself didn't know he had such power. But still he only managed to flip it away to defeat this red wolf called Raken Steel Fang. This strike was not enough. Raken Steel Fang continues to attack our Hunter Sung Jin Woo. But Hunter Sung Jin Woo manages to fend off his attacks. There is no doubt in the wolf's face as he sees that Hunter Sung Jin Woo is weaker than him. Hunter Sung Jin Woo once again manages to dodge the attack of the Steel Fang Raycan. Its fangs are so strong and durable that it can chew metal like ordinary rubber. Looking at him, Hunter Sung Jin Woo doesn't know what to do. And so he decides he has no choice but to run away from him. But the Steel Fang Raycan proves to be faster than him and blocks his path. 
And so after so many attacks, the Steel Fang Raiken manages to wound the Hunter Song Jin Wu. Hunter Song Jin Wu keeps thinking about how he can overpower him, and he's thinking that he'd really need a weapon with magical powers. And that's when Hunter Song Jin Wu comes to mind. He opens the inventory where we see something lying around. So he puts his hand in the inventory and starts pulling something out. In an instant, the Steel Fang Raiken's face split in two, and Hunter Song Jin Wu chops the Steel Fang Raiken into two with one sharp and precise swing. It turned out that the sword that Hunter Kim left in the lair was somehow preserved in Hunter Sung Jin Wu's inventory. And then we see the bloody body of the remaining Wolf Ray Can and a new alert that Hunter Song Jin Wu's level has been raised. He remembers that Hunter Kim said that the sword was worth 3 million won, but before that Hunter Sung Jin Wu couldn't even touch it, and now he's using it. And he replies that the inventory is also a very useful item. He was visibly calmer after the weapon appeared. And then two more steel fang rakens appeared in front of her. But suddenly he can't pull out the sword that's been digging into the ground. Because of this, his anxiety began to increase. After all, the two Raiken didn't wait for him to draw his sword. Hunter Song Jin Wu tries with all his might to pull out his sword. And so pulling it out, he chops up one of the Raikens. But the second Raiken manages to stop his sword with his steel fangs. Hunter Song Jin Wu in turn is not going to give him his sword so easily. And with a mighty swing, he chops off Raiken's head. And then another Raiken standing behind him shuddered as he saw the bodies of his kin. After slaying three Raikens, Hunter Song Jin Wu's confidence increases. After all, compared to the monsters from the dual dungeon, they are quite weak. And so he looked at the last fourth Raiken. After which, this Raiken begins to retreat and pull back. But his eyes glow in the darkness as if to say he'll be back. Now he stands and analyzes his status. When he performs a daily task, he gets three characteristic points which he can spend on any characteristic. And when he raises his level, each characteristic increases by one point. And now we can see that the Hunter Song Jin Wu is now at the second level, but how strong he becomes as his stats increase. Apparently, he decided to pour all his characterization points into the Force. With the improvement in his abilities, even his face began to exude more confidence than before. He believes that the most effective will be this concept of levels, because after each new level, he gets plus one point to each of the characteristics. Now he's taking a breath and trying to make sense of it all, and so he finally gets up and decides to move on. Looking at the corpses of the monsters they killed, he doesn't understand why they don't have a magical core. But instead of magical nuclei, various items from these monsters fall to him. Hunter Sung Jin Woo discovered that he even has a store among his features. But it turns out he can't buy anything there because his level is too low. So he decides to sell the steel fang that fell out of the Raken steel fang. As it turns out, this fang of Raken is worth 20 gold coins, Except that he doesn't know if it's a lot or not because he can't even use the store yet. Here's Hunter Sung Jin Wu sitting and picking up the dropped loot from Raiken. After he's picked up all the loot and he's sitting there wondering what to do next. Here's the stained sword of Hunter Sung Jin Wu, which is still different from regular swords that break after practically the first park of blows. In order to exit this dungeon, Hunter Sung Jin Wu needs to kill the dungeon boss or find the return stone. But to kill the boss, he still lacks the strength, so he needs to level up first. And just in time, a whole pack of Raikens manifests in front of him. It feels like the Raiken that got away called their kin to kill our protagonist. And so, Hunter Sung Jin Wu gathers his thoughts and prepares to bat with the Raiken pack. His look has truly changed and become more confident than in the past. And before he gets to him, he's the first to attack him. Once close enough, he attacks them. And so with his punches, he begins to chop up the Raikens. But while he was distracted by one Raiken, the other waiting for the moment grabs Hunter Sung Jin Wu by the scruff of the neck. With his sharp and sprawling punch, he shoves Raiken away from him. And so we are shown that Hunter Sung Jin Wu still has many enemies. We are shown his confident look, the look of a predator. He swings his sword with incredible speed and attacks the Raikens. He swiftly strikes them with incredible quick strikes. By killing these Raikens, he gradually increases his level. But if he hesitates even for a moment, his doom awaits him. That's why he continues to exterminate Raikens without hesitation and so -oh alienation. He exterminates them in various ways, chopping them in half, cutting off their heads and piercing their heads with his sword. While fighting them, he thinks of the people dear to him, who will be in trouble if he dies. Keeping these thoughts in his head and his sword in his hands, he continues forward. He no longer wants to put his rukins down as a coward or weakling. Now he holds his sword firmly in his hands, attacks monsters without hesitation or hindsight, gradually increasing his level. And so there are many corpses and pools of Riken's blood all around him. You can tell by his heavy breathing how long he's been fighting them. But it's not time to relax because there are many more monsters ahead of him, and his gaze grows more and more confident with each battle. However, there was one thing his sword had already worn out. Despite being a high-end weapon, after so many battles in a row, its durability has decreased. 
And so a dream hunter tells that there was an occasion when he bought a dagger that cost a little over 50,000 won. Hunting with it became much easier, but as we can see in the battle method, it broke down very quickly. Even that day with the 50,000 won dagger, he had only gotten three E-rank crystals. And here we can see how happy hunter Sung Jin Woo is because he has this sword. As we can see, he succeeded in killing all the Rikens. While killing these Rikens, he got quite a bit of dropship. And in the midst of this drop was the thing he needed most, and that was the Stone of Return. And then Hunter Sung Jin Woo thought about coming back. Well, from the way he grabbed the Stone of Return, you can tell he doesn't want to go back yet. Still, he ponders what will happen to the dungeon if he uses the Stone of Return. Since this is a dungeon created by the system, he assumes that this dungeon is likely to disappear. But he doesn't want to stop there and eventually decides to continue mopping up this dungeon. He walks deeper into the dungeon into the darkness, and here he is fighting the Rikens again, and we can see him trying to get everything out of this dungeon. We can see other monsters appear in front of him, such as Briga, who looks like a panther, and Razan, who looks like a monkey. Hunter Sun Jin Wu has definitely gotten stronger, and the magical power around him feels clearer than before. But we can see that Hunter Sung Jin Wu's sword has more scratches on it. He had already defeated many monsters, and it's like... You know what they're going to do, he's anticipating the movements of these monsters. Realizing that there is a pattern to the movements of these monsters makes it easier for him to deal with them. Change to the hand position and pick up the sword. Hunter Song Jin Wu stabs Razan's chest in one sharp movement, and then without stopping his attack he chops the head off one of the brigs, after which he continued his attack chopping the head of the second bridgie. Suddenly a Riken appears from the other side, but his appearance did not embarrass the Hunter Song Jin Wu in any way and it easily slices the lath in two. And so after numerous battles against monsters, he notices one thing. Depending on their strength, the color of the lettering above their heads changes to show what their name is. But when Hunter Song Jin Woo first came to this dungeon, the color of the Raycan's name was red, but now it was white, which means that Hunter Song Jin Woo has become much stronger. But he does have one problem. He senses an eerie aura from the basement below. Even though Hunter Song Jin Woo had encountered monsters much stronger than this one, she feels that there might be trouble from this monster below. An ominous aura never fails to seep from the basement and give Hunter Sung Jin Woo a thrill. Since ordinary monsters are no longer a problem for Hunter Sung Jin Woo, there is no point in him fighting those monsters anymore. Also, if his arrival in this dungeon is delayed, his sword will break sooner or later. And so Hunter Sung Jin Woo decides to go down. Descending lower and lower, Hunter Sung Jin Woo feels the ominous aura more and more strongly. This descent was much longer than he expected and knew. Finally, Hunter Song Jin Woo reaches the very end of this path. Immediately after going down, he is attacked with a very fast and scathing blow. He still manages to block it, though. However, the Oler proved too strong, and he fails to block it completely and casts it into the wall. The blow was so hard that his organs were hurt, and he even started coughing up blood. To continue fighting after such a blow, he has to take a little breather. But as it turned out after that blow, his sword broke. Turns out he was wrong when he thought he'd raised the level enough. And now we can finally see the boss of this dungeon lord of the swamp blue Rasaka that was like a huge snake. His eyes were so fierce that they were filled with terror, and his front two Ks were incredibly sharp. And in turn, the Dream Hunter realizes it's a dungeon boss. Against the background of this boss, Hunter Dream seems small, but not all that simple, because the color of the name of this boss is orange, which indicates that this boss is not so strong. But its scales are so strong that the sword of Hunter Sung Jin Woo can't penetrate it. The already wounded Hunter Song Jin Woo is holding a broken sword, while the dungeon boss looks at him. Finally, the Rosaka makes his move and attacks the Hunter Song Jin Woo. But Hunter Song Jin Woo manages to parry his attack, but he fails to penetrate his scales. And so, Hunter Song Jin Woo encounters a more troublesome monster than before in this dungeon and tries to find a gap in its defense. His different side's Hunter Sung Jin Woo still doesn't understand how to pierce his scales, while Rosaka attacks him without any hesitation or fear. Rosaki once again manages to catch Hunter Sung Jin Woo and attack him, but Hunter Sung Jin Woo once again manages to parry her attack. Well, as it turns out, this attack was very dangerous. Hunter Sung Jin Woo barely manages to dodge that punch. But since Rosaka is like a snake, she can move very unpredictably and still manages to get the Hunter Sung Jin Woo. After which Hunter Sung Jin Woo falls to the ground. Even after pumping up his skills and becoming a stronger hunter, Sung Jin Woo realizes that it's still not enough. But he doesn't give up hope. He gets up and continues to attack the Rasaka in hopes that he can find her weak spot. And then he remembers his past self, specifically his conversation with Mr. Song, where Mr. Song talks about Hunter Sung Jin Woo being called the weakest hunter. And he urges Hunter Sung Jin Woo to try harder to get rid of this nickname. And then we see Sung Jin Woo fending off Rasaki's attack. 
But suddenly, she manages to attack Hunter Sung Jin Woo once more, and he barely manages to parry his attack. But he still can't stay on his feet after that punch. And so to get rid of that annoying nickname, Hunter Sun Jin Woo goes on the offensive. He is desperately trying to defeat this boss. But with a broken sword with a hilt and a bit of sword left, it would be hard to defeat him. After all, this Rasaka's strength was nothing compared to the strength of the monsters in the double dungeon. In that double dungeon, they had to surrender and duck their heads in the face of danger. And the Dream Hunter continues to recall his moments from his life. Among other things, he recalls the huge statue in the double dungeon. One that was powerful and could wipe them out at any moment. In front of such a force, they had no choice but to surrender and bow their heads. Hunter Sung Jin Woo is once again reminded of Hunter Kim's betrayal, as he talked about how he always looked up to Hunter Sung Jin Woo. Like he said about how he didn't expect a hunter like Sung Jin Woo to do anything. And the fact that right before the betrayal, Hunter Kim thanks Sung Jin Woo. But it didn't matter at that moment. After all, after seeing such terrifying power, anyone can betray you. And so, Hunter Song Jin Woo flipped the sword to change its position in his hand, after which he attacks Rasaka. But no such luck, Rasaka strikes him on the back with his tail. After which, Hunter Sung Jin Woo is cast into the wall. And so, as if to show his strength, Rasaka doesn't attack him. But Hunter Sion Jin Woo doesn't give up and gets back on his feet. You can tell by the look in his eyes that he's hungry for more power. And then Rasaka attacks him again. But after dodging his attacks, Hunter Song Jin Woo strikes her with a counter strike. However, he never succeeds in piercing its scales. But still, Compared to the huge statue in the double dungeon, this monster is nothing. I mean, he doesn't inspire as much terror as that boss. Gathering his thoughts, he attacks Rasaka again. He tries desperately to pierce his scales again. But Rasaka reacts with a sharp and quick counterattack of his own. However, even after losing his sword, he didn't hesitate and grabbed Rasaka with his hands. He didn't grab her like he was choking her. And he didn't grab her with such force that she hit the ceiling of this room in her efforts to free herself. She tried every way she could to ask Hunter Sung Jin Woo off herself. And from the expression on the face of Hunter Min Jin Woo, one can see that Rasaki's attempts to ask him are not futile. But Hunter Sung Jin Woo is not going to give up so easily. He squeezes Rasaka even harder after that Rasaka takes quite a bit of damage and is already starting to spit blood. And after that, Hunter Sung Jin Woo starts squeezing what he can. Without letting us see the end of their battle, we are moved to the hospital. As it turns out, the doctor and the girl sitting at the administrative table are discussing Hunter Sung Jin Woo. They say he's almost recovered and will be discharged soon. In turn, the doctor replies that the top-ranked hunters are quite rich, while the weak can barely earn anything. And he does not understand why the weak hunters continue to risk their lives. The doctor replies that the injuries the hunters get after raids are terrible. In particular, they come in a state that any normal person would have died in by now. To which the girl shows her interest and asks how they still stay alive. And the doctor emphasizes the strength they have upon awakening. And so we are shown the place where Hunter Sung Jin Woo and Dungeon Boss Rasaka just fought. The fog makes it hard to see what became of Hunter Sung Jin Woo. And now we are shown Hunter Sung Jin Woo sitting near Rasaki's tour. His clothes are completely torn. Hunter Kim's sword that he threw in that dungeon and it ended up in Hunter Sung Jin Woo's inviter broke. And he's sitting there all wounded and exhausted. But here he is holding some new weapon. It turned out to be a C-ranked dagger called Rasaki's Fang and it has two effects, paralysis and bleed. He also received an itemy, Aranga Rasaki poison. Since Hunter Song Jin Woo killed the dungeon boss, the dungeon began to disappear. Dungeon began to return to her true form. Just like in the video game, the dungeon and Rasaki's corpse disappeared as if they never existed. And so after clearing this dungeon, Hunter Song Jin Woo goes upstairs. When the Hunter Song Jin Woo comes upstairs, he sees that it's already dark. And then some silhouette appears. It turned out to be the soldier who escorted all the regular people to safety. Since Hunter Sung Jin Woo just came out of the dungeon, he asks the soldier what happened here. The soldier saw the Hunter Sung Jin Woo holding a sword. He also sees that all his clothes are tattered. Then the soldier realizes that Sung Jin Woo is the hunter. So after that, the soldier tells the Hunter Sung Jin Woo to follow him. While Hunter Sung Jin Woo was following the soldier, he noticed that there were monster corpses lying around. And he realizes that a portal has opened nearby where the monsters got out. After the soldier confirmed Hunter Song Jin Woo's words, his expression changed. And we can see how our protagonist has changed. Just as suddenly he felt a surge of magical power, and so we are shown this monster. He's attacked in various ways, but it has no effect. We can see the hunters trying hard to take down this monster, while the soldiers make sure none of the regulars get too close. And then people start to resent the hunters for taking too long to deal with this monster. But they don't realize just how difficult a hunter's job is and how hard it is to deal with monsters. And so we're shown this battlefield. The healers are trying to heal the tank who takes all the hits. As it turned out, this monster's armor was stronger than they thought. Finally, Hunter Sung Jin Woo arrives on the scene. 
We can see that they're having a hard time containing this monster. And it's the tank that takes all the hits. Hello as hunters desperately try to do at least some damage to this monster and healers who try to heal all the injured. The hunter Sung Jin Woo was thinking about something. One of the mages asks a second healer to heal him. As it turned out, this healer turned out to be B-ranked healer Hunter Ju He. But the hunter doesn't understand why Huntress Ju He doesn't treat them. She's starting to think there's something wrong with Huntress Juji. And so we can see her start to use her powers. But suddenly she remembers the face of that huge statue from the double dungeon. And her face shows that she still hasn't gotten over her trauma from that dungeon hike. She realizes that if she backs out now, she can't go back to her old life. And Hunter Song Jin Woo notes that even after a week, she still hasn't been able to overcome her fear. It also suggests that he hasn't fully dealt with his fear himself. And he also realizes that if he backs off now, he'll go back to his old life as the weakest hunter. He determines that this stone boss is about a D rank. Having calculated everything, Hunter Sung Jin Woo takes a wide step back for the Taki and swings his now practically broken sword. For this attack, he tenses all his arm muscles. We can see his confident and determined face that says he's about to smash this monster to smithereens. With a combination of footwork and a sharp sword thrust, he sends his sword straight at the boss. At this time, the hillers with all their might were treating the tank that had been taking the boss's blows for a long time. You can see by the look on his face how tired he is of holding back the stone monster. And the healers wouldn't stop treating him and saying they needed a high-ranked hunter. But then Tank notices something strange. And in an instant, something flies into the boss's face. And just like that, this Atauga worked. After Hunter's son Jin Wu's attack, the boss was shattered into splinters. The hunters who fought him cheered as they thought they were the ones who slew him. But Tank thinks about the fact that up until that moment, either attacks were of no avail and suddenly, he collapsed. And eventually he realizes they had help from someone outside. He starts looking for what flew at him. He looks at the boss's corpse and doesn't understand how or what could have blown his head off. He finally finds the weapon that killed the boss and can't check that ten men couldn't even wound him. But he was killed with a sword. Tank turns to one of the soldiers. He asks if he saw who threw that sword. The soldier wanted to say on Hunter Song Jin Woo, but he was already gone. And the soldier tells him that he was just here but vaporized. Here's the mangled and battered Hunter Song Jin Woo. He's thinking about how that stone boss died too easily. And in the moment, we are shown Hunter Ju He, who sensed the presence of Hunter Song Jin Wu. Finally, we are shown that Hunter Song Jin Wu has returned to the hospital and is back on his daily mission. At the moment, he is doing abs. How great his body has become after all. Afterward, he starts doing push-ups, sweat pouring off him. And then one of the nurses comes in. She apologizes to him for dropping by unannounced. She marvels at his badass physique. She can't take her eyes off his body. She wonders if he had a body like this when he first got here. She finds out that today is his last day here, and he's getting out of the hospital today. And so she just took a moment to get his phone number. At first, Hunter Song Jin Woo doesn't understand why she needs his phone number, but then comes to the conclusion that she's probably sending him the results of his tests. So he gives his phone number to this nurse. Afterward, we are shown Hunter's sister Sung Jin Woo Jin Ah. Only awake, Hunter Sung Jin Woo asks if she's going to school. She notices something about her brother's body and asks him if he started swinging. She also notices that he's gotten a little taller than before. He lets no words pass her lips and tells her to bring an umbrella. She tells him she doesn't need the umbrella, but Hunter Sung Jin Woo pulls her back and puts the umbrella in her backpack. And then, after Jin Ah leaves, a window appears on his side. This window notifies him that he has completed today's daily quest, and notices that after these daily exercises and improving his performance, his body has actually gotten better. In the main, these measurements appeared after his strength increased. You can tell by his status that strength is obviously dominant among his abilities. And he's worried about getting overpumped and becoming like the overpumped bodybuilders. Not counting his strength, all his characteristics are on the same level. He thinks about what characteristics are related and which ones he is best at pumping. And this time, he didn't put everything into strength, and also invested a few points into perception and strength, and left eight points into dexterity, as strength and dexterity are quite darkly related. While he was distributing his characterization points, someone called him. And he, of course, picked up the phone. It turned out to be his tenant. I ask him why he hasn't answered their calls lately, to which he replies that he was hospitalized because of some accident, which the tenant is not surprised about. Turns out he's calling him to let him know the rent's due. Apparently knowing about Hunter Sung Jin Woo's provisions, the tenant immediately says that he can postpone his payment to the next month. Hunter Sung Jin Woo has gone through some kind of reawakening and become stronger, so now money is not an issue for him. And he thinks he can become a top-ranked hunter soon. But for that, he needs more dungeon hikes to gain more experience and more magic crystals. 
but now he has a problem with the fact that expensive and really valuable crystals fall from high-ranking monsters that are in high-ranking dungeons that will not let Hunter E rank into. Hunter Song Jinwoo himself had never been to a dungeon above the D rank before. And so watching TV, he thinks about approaching a TV studio and offering to do a report on Hunter, who has suddenly risen in rank. But still, he thinks about the bad consequences if he does report the Salem reawakening. There will be questions to what he can build and increase his power. So he's coming to the point where he's not going to reveal his cards just yet. But first he decides to make some money. And then we're shown some kind of building. And of course, Hunter Sung Jin Woo came to make money. And so he is met by a crowd of hunters like him who are probably about to go on a raid. The hunter who approached him apparently at the head of the group asks him if he is an E rank. Hunter Sung Jin Woo replies that yes, and at that moment, one of the other hunters says that he knows him. After which he reminds Hunter Sung Jin Woo of his nickname Weakest Hunter. Then the squad leader calms him down and says that they are all about quantity. It takes a certain number of people to enter a dungeon of C rank and above, so Hunter Sun Jin Woo is called as just a pot staff without the need to fight. And for that, this squad with five C rank hunters and four D rank hunters are willing to pay Hunter Sung Jin Woo to simply join their ranks. And here we are shown the rule when entering a C rank gate, the number of people entering must be at least ten hunters, and at least half of them must be C rank. While Hunter Song Jinwoo was familiarizing himself with the contract, someone approached him. It was D-rank Hunter Yu Jin Ho, who was called for a stakeout, just like Hunter Sung Jinwoo. Hunter Sung Jinwoo's face said that he was very surprised by something. It turned out that Jin Hobol was equipped with gleaming and seemingly very expensive armor. As we can see, the only thing Sung Jinwoo will have to do is just carry their bag of supplies. This muika contains everything you need, including food, change, equipment, and first aid kit. But Hunter Sung Jin Woo notices that there is not a single healer on the team. The head of the squad says that none of the Seditors want to go with them to the e rang dungeon. And yet their team is made up purely of tanks and boyzolves. But still he doubts whether he should accept under such conditions. Seeing that Song Jin Woo is still thinking about whether he should go on this raid, the other hunters tell him not to worry about anything, and that they will handle everything themselves. And so the squad leader finally announces the start of the raid. Yi Jin Ho pats Hunter Song Jin Woo on the back telling him not to worry. Because Hunter Song Jin Woo is an E rang Jin Ho says that in a pinch he can protect him. But you can see from Hunter Song Jin Woo's face that he doesn't trust Hunter Jin Ho very much. Finally Hunter Song Jin Woo agrees to go on this raid and put a backpack on his back. And so they finally do go to the dungeon. Before entering the dungeon, the head of the squad notes that recently in this area is somehow turbulent. Even construction has been suspended. Yi Jin Ho says that the reason for this was that their director fled overseas with billions of one Hunter Song Jin Woo doesn't understand why he's telling him this. Jin Hao tries to be friendly, asks the Eagle Hunter if the bag is heavy. Well, Hunter Song Jin Woo replies that it's fine. Hunter Song Jin Woo emphasizes that because he has invested characteristic points in strength, this bag is as light as a feather for him. Even if they just met, it's like there's something between them after all. Jin Woo's hunter Sung Jin Woo emphasizes that he usually doesn't pay attention to him. Then the hunter Sung Jin Woo gets furious at his phrase that hunting is just a hobby for him. And now the chapter announces that they're finally there. Compared to the gates we've seen before, this gate seems to be several times larger. The size of this gate surprised even C rank hunters who had been in such dungeons many times before. Hunter Jin Ho was also shocked by the size of the gate. But hunter Sung Jin Woo, who had seen the S rank gate for the first time, was not surprised by it. They also emphasize that the size of the gate is not so important, because the most important thing is the amount of energy that comes from the gate. But still, the look on Hunter Sung Jin Woo's face shows that he's still a little nervous because it's his first raid in the s rang dungeon. And so they finally do begin to enter the gate. Jin Ho firmly grasps his sword and shows it off. From the outside, it looks like his rank is higher than D. Still, it feels like Hunter Sung Jin Woo is jealous of Jin Ho's outfit. He also notes that the rest of the squad has pretty good equipment too. Once inside this dungeon, the first thing hunters are surprised by is that it's very dark. And it was also strange that there were no glowing stones and not a single monster here. This made Jin Ho nervous who then asked the eagle man, Is it possible that there are no monsters in the dungeon? Whereupon Hunter Song Jin Woo shows him to be quieter. He tries to concentrate fully and hear even the slightest movement of the monsters. This dungeon consists of many tunnels that are engulfed in darkness. So Hunter Song Jin Woo notes that most likely they prefer the darkness here and they just haven't shown up yet. He talks about how these monsters are most likely intelligent, since it is usually difficult for monsters to live and navigate in the dark. And now we can see that in one of the tunnels, rocks have begun to fall. Of course, Hunter Sung Jin Woo heard that. 
The hunter Sung Jin Wu, after thinking it over, comes to the conclusion that they are insect-like monsters. After that, all the hunters started fussing. They were also affected by the darkness and the sheer number of tunnels. Hunter Song Jin Wu realized that they would attack them from above. Everyone was very much surprised because the attack from above was most unexpected for them. We can see many monsters glowing red eyes in the dark. There were so many of them that they didn't completely cover this huge tunnel. They just kept crawling and crawling and crawling and crawling and crawling. So one of the hunters shoots a magic ball into the tunnel where these ants came out of. But it was obvious he couldn't kill all the ants with that blast. And then the squad leader uses one of his powers. After he used this ability, the insects started behaving strangely. As it turned out, it was the ability to lure all the monsters onto itself. And while they were distinguished by the head of the squad, the rest of the hunters quickly disposed of them. Hunter Sung Jin Wu swept them up with quite a bit of teamwork. And he understands why they don't take healers with them after all. They have clearly been fighting together for a very long time. And Hunter Huang as the leader of the squad is very good at his role. But still, Hunter Sung Jin Wu notices something amiss in this troop. She notes that their fighting style is a bit rough and brutal. So doesn't forget about Jin Ho, whose equipment is excellent to compensate for his lack of experience. While Hunter Song Jin Wu was observing the other members of the raid, one of the insects approached him. It's obvious that this monster is no match for Sung Jin Wu. Watching the face of Hunter Song Jin Wu, we can see that he is quite disappointed in the c rank dungeon level. Here they finally got all the insects sorted out. After that, everyone began to collect magic crystals from the corpses of the monsters. Ah Wan thanked Hunter Song Jin Wu for warning them about the monsters and asked him how he knew the monsters were above them. Thanks to his well-developed perception, and Hunter Huang emphasized that he has good instincts. Na Wan asked not to pay attention to such trivialities anymore. And then the hunters of the squad noticed something wrong. They found a bunch of ants that were killed not by magic but were simply torn apart. Vova Squad suggests that there was a territorial feud between the monsters in this dungeon. That means there are monsters that are stronger than them. Just then, the expression on squad leader Huang's face changed. Well, it's not just him, it's all the members of his squad. And so felt something wrong, Sung Jin Wu checks with Jin Ho to see if his weapons are expensive. After which she tells him to be on guard. It's obvious that Hunter Huang and his party are up to something. And here we see again, that in this dungeon there are many passages that are quite easy to get lost. Sometimes it happens that to study the entire dungeon can take weeks. It may be that you can find the boss in a couple of hours. Here they continue to look further and further for the rest and the boss. Oksana is also still not engaging in combat, just carrying everything she needs for this raid. At times they stop for a break, but Hunter Song Jin Wu's uneasiness did not go away by any means. There was something wrong with the facial expressions of the members of this squad after all, and it was obvious they were up to something. And so after the break, they continued on their way. But once again, they meet a pile of torn apart insects in front of them. Squad leader Huang notices that you are not right and asks his ally to initiate a little further. And now this hunter also notices that you're not the same. And you can see from Hunter Huang's expression that they found something truly terrifying. They found many insects that were wrapped in spider webs. Almost the entire passage beyond was blocked by a thick layer of cobwebs. And they came to the conclusion that this is the boss room they've been looking for a long time. The plan orders everyone to be on alert and prepare for a boss battle. Once again, one of his subordinates notices something amiss. Walking a little further and looking around, they found something. It turned out to be a huge amount of mana crystals. Yes, these crystals are not comparable in price to the crystals that fall from monsters. But there are so many of them that they can earn more from them than from the crystals that fall from monsters. And here's one of Huang's subordinates talking about his younger brother but it was as if the head didn't pay attention to his words, still continues to stare at this amount of crystals. You can tell by his greedy look just how much money these crystals will bring them. As he looks at these crystals, he thinks of his younger brother who, after gaining a high rank for the sake of more money, left his homeland. Indeed, such an amount of crystals cannot help but excite. While all the members of Huang's squad rejoice at the catch, Jin Ho asks Hunter Song Jin Wu for his contract. After reading his contract, he has a question for Huan. And so Jin Ho tells Huan that this contract only talks about sharing the magic crystals that you had with the monsters. It talks about the crystals found dungeons. But it was obvious from the faces of the hunter units that they didn't like this question. But Hunter Huang doesn't let him know that everything they find in the dungeon will be divided equally among each raid member. But they need to take care of something else first. And then we are shown the face of a huge spider. You that in the depths of this web was a giant spider that is the boss of the dungeon. But since the gate closes after killing the boss, they need to take out the mana crystals first. But it looks like he's pretty much asleep after a heavy lunch. And when they were about to dig up the mana crystals, it turned out that the hunter who was in charge of the equipment had left it outside. As he looks at them, 
Hunter Sung Jin Woo realizes that something is wrong here. And the head of the squad, Hunter Van, forgives his subordinate for this slip-up. And after that, they ask Hunter Song Jin Woo and Jin Ho to stay and wait for them here. Such a request, Jin Ho starts to get nervous, so Huang starts to calm him down. But Huang assures him that if they stay away from him, he won't lay a finger on them. And he doesn't even listen to what they have to say, so he decides they're gonna stay here alone. Smiling, he asks them not to worry, but we realize that behind that smile is a very devious man. Isn't it amazing that untold wealth and the risk that you might die are in the same room? Having changed Jin Ho's mind after all, Huang and his posse head for the exit. But then Hunter Oleg remembers that to enter the gate, C Rang needs at least 10 people. If Hunter's son Jin Wu and Jin Ho stay in the boss room, and Huang and his guys go out of the dungeon to bring the equipment they need, they will not be able to go back in. And then Hunter Sung Jin Wu realizes that they've always been calling left-handed people with them for quantity. And here we can see Huang addressing one of his subordinates. He orders him to block the entrance to the boss's room. Afterward, the orgy hunter and Jin Ho hear some rumbling. It was coming from that tunnel that Vom and his subordinates had gone into. So Huang and his boys end up blowing up the way they came in. Of course, this surprised Jin Ho very much. And so we can see the entrance has been chipped away with large rocks. Hunter Song Jin Wu had suspected all along that they were up to something, so this didn't surprise him that much. Suddenly, we are shown a drawing of what looks like a lizard. Hunter Song Jin Wao recalls a conversation in the past with one of the hunters. He speaks of lizard-like hunters in the dungeons. It means that their job is quite dangerous. So it's not surprising if something happens to a hunter during a raid, but there are those who do it and kill hunters like them for money. But since it's a dungeon, the authorities can't prove that they killed these people themselves. This hunter is trying his best to warn Sung Jin Wu. Such people are called lizards because the most dangerous moment they'll leave you like when a lizard sheds its tail. And here she shows the worried face of Zhang Ho doesn't know what they should do. He finally realizes that Huang and his team only wanted to lure them into this dungeon. Marlik watches the already desperate Jin Ho hunter. If they even decided to go with them, Huang and his men would kill them. Back then, when Song Jin Wu warned them about the insects, that's what Junk meant when he said, don't pay attention to such trivialities. He was just waiting for the right moment. And so our hunter Sung Jin Wu is finally ditching those backpacks of supplies. He realizes that the one who caused the collapse was a S-rang mage named Gyu Huan. Hunter Sleep begins to watch the cave-in to see if there are any loopholes through which they could come. He realizes that getting out of there won't be a problem, but there's one thing. And that's going to be a pretty big problem that's going to keep them from getting out of here. It turned out the dungeon boss, who was snoozing after a hearty lunch, had woken up. While Hunter Song, Jin Wu, and Jin Ho are stuck in the boss room, Huang and his team have already found a way out of the dungeon. One of them talks about how it wouldn't be easier to kill them themselves. You replied that then the spider would wake up and they would not be in a favorable position. Huang realizes that the weakest hunter in the world, E Rang and D Rang, who has no experience, will not be able to defeat the dungeon boss. And then one of them notices that they're taking Jin Ho's outfit, which looks like it's worth millions in. You get the phone to find out what kind of family Jin Ho is from, and we can see how happy Gyu Huan is with his work. And then Huang asks Gyu Huan if he could handle this monster alone. Gets a negative answer. And Huang himself is of the same opinion because he's the boss after all. Mr. Earth Time Spider already about to attack Hunter Sung Jin Wu and Jin Ho, telling Hunter Oleg to get behind him and that he'll figure something out. And so the Huntress begins to analyze who he will have to fight after all. It's an enemy with many long limbs. So I'm on my way to Sung Jin Wu and Jin Ho. This spider is sweeping away everything in its path. But Hunter Song Jin Wu remembers the double dungeon, about the unforgettable fear and wonder he experienced in that dungeon. And here we can see the smirk of Sung Jin Wu, who realizes that this boss is nothing compared to the monsters from the double dungeon. Hunter Song Jin Wu walks a bit forward and tells Jin Ho to stay behind. Suddenly something starts appearing in his hand, that it's his prey. Puzzled, he doesn't understand what he wants to do, to which Hunter Song Jin Wu tells him that he's going to kill the boss. But Jin Ho doesn't understand how the weakest hunter in the world can hope to kill the S-rank boss alone. He notices that only an elite B or C-ranked hunter can kill a C-ranked boss. While Jin wants to talk to Sung Jin Wu and offers to find a way to get out of here, Sung Jin Wu is almost ready to be infected. We are shown his new weapon. It's the blade he got by killing the dungeon boss, Rasaka. Finally ready to fight this boss, but this time he is not trembling in fear at the sight of the dungeon boss. And then he thinks of the boss Rasaka who was most likely above D rank and the boss Golem who was just below D rank. And those bosses don't even compare to this C rank spider boss. At the sight of such a dangerous and intimidating boss, Hunter Song Jin Woo didn't even flinch. And then finally this boss starts attacking Hunter Song Jin Woo and Jin Ho. 
But Hunter Song Jin Woo was not surprised by this and rushed towards him in response. Concerned Jin Ho stood in the garden and worried about Song Jin Woo. Hunter Olya strikes this C rank boss with a quick and accurate strike, and in an instant is behind him. Before attacking a monster, he doesn't realize if the attack worked on him. But we can see that Hunter Song was still able to wound this boss with Rasaki's fang. And so Hunter Sun Jin Woo lands behind the boss after his attack, relaxing after hitting a boss once. Because now the real hunt is about to begin. And so Hunter Sung Jin Woo and the dungeon boss are standing opposite each other. Meanwhile, Jin Ho stands in bewilderment. He sees Hunter Sun and doesn't understand how he was given an E rank with his strength. Jin Ho was surprised not by the strength of the dungeon boss, but by the strength of the Hunter Song Jin Woo. And he wonders if Hunter Sung Jin Woo is definitely an E rank hunter. Watching from the sidelines, he sees Hunter Song Jin Woo dealing the dungeon boss many quick blows. And here we can see the dungeon boss attack. But Hunter Sun easily dodges the boss's quick attacks. Hunter Song Jin Woo moves so fast that even the dungeon boss doesn't have time to strike him. In addition, Hunter Son parries attacks that he can't dodge in time. Gradually blocking the boss's attacks, he slowly probably chops off the boss's limbs. During the battle, Hunter Song Jin Woo notes that he has pretty thick skin, and to wound him, he has to put in quite a bit of effort. He has 12 eyes, so he has no blind spots in addition to having eight legs with which he can easily pierce the ground and rocks. And so gradually the Hunter Song Jin Woo begins to speed up. And all the while Jin moves to watch Hunter Song Jin Woo battle the boss. Still doesn't understand who he is. He can't believe that E-rank hunters can fight the C-rank dungeon boss on par. But the guild is clearly told that he is an Oranga. His swift movements can't match his rank. And then Jin Hop assumes that Hunter Song Jin Woo is a false ranker. Among hunters, there are those who can control their magical energy and thereby lower their rank. Hunters are called false rankers. And as it turns out, most of these hunters are psychopaths who kill purely for pleasure. And so Hunter Sun chops to pieces one of the boss's legs. His face does not match the hunter who is considered the weakest in the world. After his assumption, he was horrified. And I was beginning to regret my decision to go on this raid. After all, he was first betrayed after that. He came face to face with the boss and is now watching the false hunter. As Hunter Sun Jin Woo's battle with the dungeon boss, it's been five minutes, and the Hunter Song Jin Woo, who was already almost exhausted, had dealt too little damage to him. Responsibly, as his fatigue increases, his speed decreases, and then he decides to use the dagger's special ability against the boss. And Hunter Son remembers the cardinal rule of raiding, which says to exploit the enemy's weakness. Vulnerable place of any living creature is the head on which the most vulnerable point are the eyes. But suddenly the boss also decides to use his special ability. This ability is acid, but still Song Jin Woo was able to dodge his attack. With acid, he was even able to split the earth. It's me so and the boss could do irreparable damage to Hunter Sung Jin Woo. And then Hunter Sung Jin Woo realizes that he has to deal with this boss quickly. To do that, Hunter Sung Jin Woo will have to move even faster. Here we can see the ground crumbling from the force of Hunter Sung Jin Woo's feet. And he's next to the boss in no time. Jin Halpy was surprised that Hunter Sung Jin Woo was able to shorten the distance so quickly. Here we can see that Hunter Sun is using his blade's paralysis ability. With a large number of attacks, Hunter Sung Jin Woo realizes that he is missing one powerful strike. We can see that Hunter Sung is putting his best foot forward. The number of his attacks is increasing. He starts moving faster and faster. Once again, Jin Ho is amazed at Song Jin Woo's speed. But he realizes that if he continues at this pace, he'll run out of breath very soon. But Hunter Song realizes this too. However, even knowing this, he doesn't stop attacking him. Suddenly, he doesn't notice one of the spider's blows, but still manages to block it. The spider was so powerful that it was able to Sun's hunters to destroy the earth. After receiving a direct blow from the spider, Hunter Sung Jin Woo lies on the ground. Realizing that this is his best chance to kill Sung Jin Woo, the spider attacks him. Well, here we are shown one of the rewards that Hunter Son receives for completing his daily task. And in that moment, the only word that Hunter Sleep uttered was, accept. After that, Hunter Sung Jin Woo manages to dodge his blow. Even from the face of such a monster, one could tell that he was dumbfounded. And in the blink of an eye, Hunter Sun is on the boss's head and pierces his eyes with his dagger. Hunter Sung Jin Woo's gaze shows his determination. At this time, Hunter Song continues to attack the boss through his eyes. And he parallels his blade's skills of bleeding and paralysis. And we can see a lot of damage done to the boss. Having pulled off his final attack, Hunter Sun finds himself behind the boss. After finally killing the boss, Hunter Sung goes to the Jin Ho. At the moment, Hunter Song Jin Woo's condition leaves a lot to be desired. At this time, the Hunter Sung Jin Woo is shocked that he was able to defeat the dungeon boss by himself. You can tell by Jin Ho's eyes that he's realized something. And now he's certain that Hunter Sung is a false enemy. 
after which he approaches Sung Jin Woo. Putting on the bag that had previously been carried by the hunter's son, offers him to store his crystals with him. Afterward, he offers Song Jin Woo a drink of water. Next, he starts mining the crystals, showing that he wants to please Hunter Song. But Hunter Song gets the impression that Jin Ho is just grateful to him for saving him. And then we can see the explosion of the entrance that was blocked. You can already tell from the silhouettes who it is. The expression on Hunter Song's face shows echoes of contempt. The faces of these people are slowly starting to come into view. And as you may have realized by now, it was Hunter Huang Dong Suk and his subordinates. I'm not of course surprised that Hunter Sung and Jin Ho are still alive. And then they stand there puzzled and start exchanging guesses. And in the end, they come to the conclusion that the boss was most likely defeated by Jin Ho, thanks to his equipment. Squad leader Huang realizes that he underestimated Jin Ho. She notes that it is likely that his equipment hides some sort of special ability, as an orang hunter would be of no use in such a battle. As Huang ponders what to do next, he comes to the conclusion that he needs to lure Jin Ho to his side. And he tells Jin Ho that while they were out of the dungeon, he learned about his father being a rather wealthy individual. To be more specific, he was the son of the chairman of a construction company, Yu Jin. But Jin Hoi doesn't realize how much that matters in this situation. And then Huang talks about wanting to discuss something with his father and give him a chance to get out of here with them. But to do that, he'll have to kill Hunter Sung Jin Wu. Surprised at what Huang Dong Suk said. According to Huang, Jin Ho has no choice but to kill Hunter Sung Jin Wu. Otherwise, they're both going to die here. Initially, Huang thinks Jin Ho is afraid of being found out. But then he thinks he's afraid of Erang for some reason. After that, he turns to Sung Jin Wu, to which Hunter Sun tells him not to worry. Hunter Sona has been betrayed again. And the reason is that he is the weakest hunter. We can see that Hunter Huang is definitely not happy about something. He was surprised that Jin Ho had decided to fight on Hunter Sung's side. Natasha, after Jin Ho stayed on the side of Hunter Song, Huang realizes that killing the son of a wealthy family is very stupid. And so Huang and his subordinates bear their weapons. Huang then asks them, with the most serious expression on his face, if they've ever killed people. It was noticeable that these words and the expression on Huang's face affected Jin Ho's condition while Hunter Song didn't even move. But suddenly the Dream Hunters are given an emergency assignment. He doesn't understand why the system suddenly decided to give him an emergency assignment. The conditions of this emergency mission are to kill the enemies who intend to kill Hunter Song. And at the same instant, a fiery projectile flies into Hunter's sleep. Taking a direct hit from a fire projectile, he flies off into the wall. Afterward, Huang tells a surprised Jin Ho to forget about Hunter Song Jin Wu and suggests he join them again. Johanna grows tears, for he had never before seen the death of men. Meanwhile, Hunter Song is lying among a pile of rocks. And there was a look of contempt in Sona's hunter's eyes. And he realizes that in this cruel world, survival of the fittest, he realizes that it wasn't wrong until then. He's been on the verge of death so many times, he had gone to the dungeons an infinite number of times. Constantly crippled and maimed, but he didn't give up and kept going, entering the dungeon again, hoping that someday something would change. And now he realizes that to survive, he's gonna have to kill people now. It would indeed be foolish for him to die now, especially after all he'd been through. And it's not a coincidence or a goodwill gesture, it's what the system needs. So Hunter Song accepted that he would have to kill people after all. He realized that the system was trying to help Hunter's son become stronger and was pushing him to push past his limits. And you can tell by Hunter Sung Jin Woo's smile that he's ready to fight them. He gets to his feet and shows that he's ready to fight them right now. Because he couldn't kill Yi Rang with one hit. Gyu Huan's teammates think his skills have deteriorated. The hunter Gyu Huan realizes that something is wrong here. He put all his strength into this strike. And so Hunter Sung Jin Woo moves confidently toward Huan and his team. Jin Ho realizes that they've pissed off Hunter Sung. But they still don't take Hunter Sung Jin Woo seriously because he's an E-Rang. And in turn, the hunter sleep is as serious as possible. And then one of the hunters approaches Sung Jin Woo. He puts his hand on his shoulder while Hunter Sleep's hand begins to glow. And in an instant, a dagger appears in Hunter Song's hand, which he points at the throat of this hunter. With one upward swing, she chops off this hunter's head. Everyone here, you have the fact that E-Rang was able to kill S-Rang's hunter. The blood was flowing from this hunter. Hunter Sung Jin Woo with a bloody face ready to continue his hunt. And the other members of the Van Hunter group are perplexed and don't understand how the E-Rang hunter was able to kill their ally. While I'm not trying to figure out where did Jin Woo get her blade from, he is gradually approaching them. Even the head of the squad and the strongest hunter in the group, Huang, can't understand how he did it. While Hunter Sung Jin Woo is thinking about the fact that he killed a man. Now his hands are stained not only with monster blood but human blood as well. And the fact that he did it because of an emergency building can't be the reason. Because the fact remains that he killed a man just like himself. 
Natasha, after he stained his hands with the blood of a man, this will no longer break our protagonist. Now that he's realized that only the strongest survive, he'll never doubt again. And so Hunter Song Jin Wu exudes a very powerful magical energy along with a strong bloodlust. Even the Jin Hao who is at his side can't even move next to him. And now having recovered his magical energy, Huang is about to attack the Hunter Song Jin Wu with a fire charge again. Gathering the magical energy in his hand, he sends it to the Hunter Song Jin Wu. But not even a meter away, the Hunter Song Jin Wu was already gone. And now Hunter Song Jin Wu appears right in front of Ju Huan who just used a fireball and is currently unable to defend himself in any way. We can see Hunter Sung Jin Wu chopping Ju Huan into many small pieces. Squad leader Huang stands puzzled and doesn't understand how this E-Rang can resist hunters like them. At this time, two hunters from Huang, I'm such a hunter, Sung Jin Wu's squad jumped up. One of them attacks the Hunter Song Jin Wu with a broad sweep, but he doesn't hit Hunter Song from his extremely fast speed. In an instant of being behind this hunter, Song Jin Wu inflicts comparable wounds to life. And at the same instant, another hunter already attacked the Hunter Song Jin Wu but he easily deflects his punch, aimed right at his head. Hunter's son knocks the weapon out of his opponent's hands with one slight movement of his hand and stabs him directly in the stomach. Another hunter keeps trying to get a hold of Hunter Song, but he loses control of himself because he can't do it. And so saw the hunter son dodging all the blows thrown at him. And we can see in Hunter Song's eyes not an ounce of doubt or pity. Thanks to his dagger's paralysis ability, when he damages one of his enemies, he immobilizes it. And then the remaining hunters realize that Hunter Sun can use magic. Even Jin Ho, who had seen Hunter Song kill the dungeon boss himself, was surprised at how he was fighting now. He notices that he was even stronger now fighting the dungeon boss. His bleed and paralysis abilities are getting more and more hunters. No one, not even a mage of all ranks, can hurt him in any way or generally do anything against him. At this time, the Hunter Song is massacring all of Huang's subordinates with his dagger. And so virtually all of the hunters who fell victim to Hunter Dream are now lying on Earth. And now Hunter Huang felt an extraordinary fear from Hunter Sung Jin Wu, who had just slaughtered all of his team members. And now Hunter Sung Jin Wu receives a notification that he has killed seven enemies and only one is left. After seeing the sight, the junk hunter is also of the opinion that he is stronger than Song Jin Wu and is not going to just give up his life. Once he has collected enough mana, he uses one of his enhancement abilities on himself. After that, his physical abilities increase by two, three times. Also having filled his shield and sword with magical energy, and holding the opinion that after the battle with the boss and the seven hunters, he was exhausted, Hunter Huang attacks Song Jin Wu. After analyzing Hunter Sun's abilities, he notices that the hunter himself specializes in speed and agility, but he can't penetrate Huang's armor. But suddenly, Hunter Sung Jin Wu's hand is right in front of Huang's face. As soon as Hunter Sung grabbed his face with his hand the way Hunter Huang shed a tear, you could tell that it was definitely quite painful. Instantly, Oka Hunter Song seals Huang's head into the ground with incredible force, and so holding his head in his hands, he points out the difference in their powers. They are still in this c rank dungeon. Hunter Huang still does not understand what happened and how he ended up on Earth. Hunter Huang comes to the same conclusion as Jin Ho, thinking that Hunter Sung Jin Wu is a liar. But not understanding the whole situation, Huang asks him to emancipate him and says that he will give him everything he needs. In turn, the Hunter Sung Jin Wu shows him with his appearance that he has no intention of letting go of the one who tried to kill him three times already. And then Hunter Huang tells him that he can't handle the consequences that await him. But Hunter Song Jin Wu reminds him of his own words, that what was in the dungeon will remain in the dungeon. And then, seeing no more outlets, Huang begins to threaten the elephant hunter with his little brother. But Hunter Song doesn't even bother to listen to him to the end, and with one sharp and precise swing, chops off the head of today's raid Huang Dong Suk's head. It's only after he's finished his hunt that he notices he's covered in blood. At this time, Jin Ho, who was watching all of this, was feeling nauseous because of all the horror she had seen. After the death of the boss, it's been quite some time, so the dungeon has already started to close. So after that, Hunter Sung and Jin Ho decide to get out of this dungeon. And of course, the alerts come in that Hunter Son has met the conditions of the emergency assignment and he can receive his reward. And so after the Dream Hunter has sorted out his problems in the Saranac dungeon, we are shown a building from the city of Washington, USA. Here we see some man waking up in his room. The way he woke up in a sweat, you'd think he'd probably had a bad dream. Observing his physique, you can tell he's probably an unusual person. And so we are transferred back to our soul home. We can see the inspector who sulks came to the Dream Hunter after the incident in the double dungeon. As we can see, he was minding his own business. His assistant came to him with breaking news. He reports that during the C-rank dungeon sweep, eight people died and only two hunters who are D-rank and E-rank survived. 
The inspector is not confused and thinks that most likely after the eight hunters died, these two low-ranking escaped from the dungeon, but his assistant reports that they have cleared the dungeon. Tells him that the Jinha hunter had a high-ranking equipment thanks to which he most likely defeated the boss. But the strange thing is that from the usual boss, giant arachnid Buyura ate people at once. However, the inspector realizes that his assistant is hiding something else from him. The aide reports that one of the survivors was Erang Hunter Song Jin Wu, who survived the double dungeon incident. But the inspector says that I should suspect him too, to take the magic meter they're using at the time was high end. And it's more telling that there's another problem. He reports that among the dead hunters was Hunter Huang Dong Suk. And then the inspector realizes there's a reason for all this. And he can't just leave it at that. Here we can see someone enjoying drinks and chicken wings. As it turned out, it was Hunter's son who had returned after mopping up the c rank dungeon and decided to give his little sister a treat. And finally returning to the dungeon, Saranga Hunter Dream wants to enjoy a beer, but he cannot. The reason for this was the ability he gained after raiding your home dungeon. He didn't pay attention to it then. Its abilities are now safe from any poisons. And thanks to Hunter Song fulfilling the necessary requirements of the secret mission, Courage of the Weak, his leg was able to recover. And then after the Dream Hunter remembers about this ability, which does not let me affect the state of the Dream Hunter in any way, something comes to his mind. So leaving the rest of the food to his little sister, he goes to his room to test some theory. Sis realizes that after the Dream Hunter's training, he has somehow changed, and it's as if he's become much harder to communicate with. So after a snack and then his powers, he went to his room, and then he pulls out from his inventory the Rasaki poison bag that he knocked out of the Erang dungeon from a huge Rasaki snake. At his own risk, the hunter of the dream drinks Ikrasaki, which is a color similar to acid. And so, thanks to his ability, the negative effect of weak muscles is cancelled, and the positive effect that reduces his received physical damage by 20% is activated. So after his little sister ate, she comes to him and talks about someone calling him. And now we can see that the one who called the dream hunter and decided to meet him was Jin Ho. From the expression on the dream hunter's face, you can see that he is a little surprised that Jin Ho was able to find his number. We can see how grateful Jin is that Hunter's son saved him first from the dungeon boss and then from Huang and his men. As it turned out, Hunter Sleep had received 1,008,001 for the mana crystals they had obtained in the dungeon. What we can see is that Hunter Dream is happy with the deal with Jin Ho where he was able to make money yet silent about what happened in the dungeon. To which Jin Ho replies that it's Huang and his men's own fault for trying to kill yours. And he couldn't tell anyone that Hunter Sleep had killed eight people in the dungeon because he had saved his life after all. So the Dream Hunter finally asks, what did Jin Ho call him here for? We can see the satisfied, determined look in Jin Ho's eyes who says he has a serious conversation to have with the Dream Hunter. Without letting Hunter Jin Ho finish telling him that he was going to form his own group to mop up the dungeons. Hunter Song Jin Woo immediately rejects Hunter Jin Ho. He won't even let Jin Ho explain why he needs a dream hunter to clean up the dungeons and says he doesn't want to babysit a rich brat. And then Jin Ho shows with his whole body that he's serious. Jin Ho told him that a good reward would be waiting for him, after which the dream hunter still paid attention to his request. Reminding Hunter Jin Ho of what happened on their recent trip to the S-Rang dungeon, he asks Asen if he's sure he wants to continue his job as a hunter after what happened in that dungeon. And then one thought occurs to the hunter of the dream. As it turns out, Jin Ho asks Hunter Song Jin Wu to clean up the dungeon with him, which is going to become a guild master. After such a selfish request, Hunter Sleep is even more unwilling to help Jin Ho, but still convinces Hunter Sung Jin Wu to listen to him. Hunter Jin Ho tells him that in order to become the head of the guild, he needs to participate in at least 20 raids. He also has to pass an internal exam in addition to this standard but he won't have a problem with that. And now the hunter himself remembers that he is the son of the owner of Yujin Construction Company. The timing suggests that his desire to become a guild master is directly related to this company. As it turns out, Jin Ho's father wants to start his own guild. It's a very dangerous place, but they hold a lot of treasures, magical crystals, mana crystals, because even the corpses of monsters can be used as material. Here's a dream hunter realizing that this will be quite profitable for Yujin's company tells him that his father wants to hire S-Rank Hunter to make him the guild master and his brother the vice president who will run the guild in S-Rank Hunter's shadow. And then the hunter himself remembers that there is only one free S-Rank Hunter in their country right now. Right now, Hunter Jin Ho is not even being considered as a guild master, so he wants to convince his father to consider his decision. And so Hunter Jin Ho tells Hunter son Jin Wu that this deal will benefit him too because everything they get after clearing the dungeons they will share between them. At this time, Hunter Jin Ho assumes that Hunter Song Jin Wu's rank is B, or maybe even higher. 
So Jin Ho is finally interested in Hunter Sung Jin Woo, and he asks Jin Ho what he will get in return. And then he hands Hunter Sung Jin Woo some papers. Then we are shown that Sung Jin Woo's sister came out with him for his morning workout. And so, having put on their tracksuits and having warmed up enough, they are going for a little jog. While they were gaining momentum, Hunter Sung Jin Woo asked his sister what she would do if she had three billion won. And so she starts talking about what she would most likely spend the money on. But I don't understand why he's suddenly asking her about it. She's asking if it's too unrealistic. But the Hunter Song Jin Woo realizes that it is very possible and starts to speed up and runs away from his sister. And here's Jin Ah who couldn't catch up with him already just walking after him. Hunter Song recalls his conversation with Jin Ho yesterday. It turns out when Jin Ho handed the Dream Hunter some papers, it was the documents of their guild building with an estimated value of 3 billion won. Hunter Sleep realizes that this is a pretty lucrative deal where for 19 dungeon hikes with rank, he will get 3 billion won. Finally, the Dream Hunter began to think about whether he should accept the offer. But he realizes that it is quite risky, because he is a special case even among the Awakened, because he can raise his level. So Hunter Sung Jin Woo tells Hunter Jin Ho that he has one condition. I was told that only the two of them would have to go into the dungeon. This condition made Hunter Jin Ho very excited because it meant that they would have to clear the C-Rank dungeon alone. Jin Ho remembers that it takes at least 10 people to enter the C-Rank dungeon, to which the Hunter Song Jin Woo says they can use the same method that Huang Dong Suk used. Jin Ho replies that it will be very dangerous. The Eagle Hunter says that if they follow this plan, no one will get hurt. Jin Ho finally understands what Hunter Song Jin Woo is trying to tell him. While Hunter Song Jin Woo was thinking about his conversation with Jin Ho yesterday, he didn't realize that he was already finishing his daily quest. Just thinking about yesterday's conversation with Jin Ho that he even exceeded his daily assignment. I turned back and realized that his sister Jin Ah is behind him. And Hunter Song Jin Woo noticed something strange. As it turned out in the conditions of the quest, began to show that he ran 11 of the 10 kilometers he was supposed to. And because he still has to wait for his little sister, he decides to exceed his daily quest. And then a whole 20 minutes goes by. In those 20 minutes, the sleep hunter was able to once again fulfill all of the quest conditions except running. And now, panting and already tired of having to catch up with her brother, Jin Ah finally catches up with him. However, the hunter Sung Jin Woo runs away without paying attention to her to fulfill his quest once again. And so we're going to be stirred back to Washington, D.C., USA. As it turns out, the man we were shown earlier is now talking to someone on the phone. And then he has some question for his assistant. Well, she says he can ask her anything. The man's question was what would happen to him if he killed someone in Korea. After standing there for a moment in bewilderment, she realizes he's asking, it's completely serious. Then she tells him that since Korea has not yet finalized the Indian Treaty to punish hunters who have committed any crimes, he will be sent back to America and it won't be hard to quiet the case. And it turns out that person was Hunter Huang Dong-su, who is an S-rank hunter and the younger brother of Hunter Huang Dong-suk. He reflects on the fact that his brother wouldn't sacrifice himself for some weaklings, and most likely these low-ranking hunters set some traps and killed his brother. And now Hunter Huang Dong-su assistant to release his schedule so that he can fly to Korea, to which he receives in response that if he suddenly disappears, the guild in which he is a member will be paralyzed. And she tells him that he won't have time until two weeks from now. So he does agree to fly to Korea in two weeks when his schedule is free. She's worried about Hunter Huang dong Su, who might get into trouble in Korea after all. But he's showing he's not going to back down and kill the men who killed his brother. And here we are shown the data on Hunters Sung Jin Woo and Jin Ho. And so we move again to Korea where the hunter sleep holds a dagger in his hand. As it turned out, for exceeding the daily quest he got some kind of key. So it turns out this key is an S-rank key. He, after completing the daily quest a second time, got another fourth reward. And so we are shown that the Dream Hunter begins to activate this key and open the gate. In this place, a light appears that illuminates this dark night in Seoul. Hunter Sleep is finally starting to go to this dungeon after all. After he entered this dungeon, we can see that everything around him is on fire. Everything around the house, the building is ablaze with raging flames. Recalling that the past E-rank key respectively opened the E-rank dungeon. And since this key is S-rank, it's likely this dungeon too. And we can't forget that the Dream Hunter still has the return stone from the previous dungeon. Since he'll soon have to mop up the S-rank dungeons with Jin Ho, he needs to know his limit. And then the paw of some monster appears in front of the hunter, Sung Jin Woo. As it turned out, it was the guardian brother of hell, Cerberus, whose name was indicated in light red. But even such a monster didn't shock hunter Sung Jin Woo. He remembers again the key he used to open this S-ranked dungeon. If the dungeon's Verdrugrang corresponds to the key's rank, his chances of surviving here are zero. 
After B rank, complexity in the dungeon noticeably increases, but fortunately it does not happen so often, and the number of open S rank gates can be counted on your fingers. Like the S rank gate that opened on Jeju Island. After they opened the island turned into a wasteland, raiding this dungeon shows that even if S rank hunters form a team, it is not a fact that they will be able to clear the dungeon. Yes, and right now the number of S ranked hunters is too small. Therefore, sleep hunters would be better off refraining from going to the S rank dungeon. And here's thinking about S rank gate Song Jin Wu recalls a double dungeon in which he encountered terrifying monsters whose durability and strength was incredible. And just as Cerberus began to attack him, the hunter sleep outpaces him and attacks him near his ribs. And so after attacking Cerberus for the first time, he thinks, can his attacks have any effect on S rank gate monsters? And so having activated his title Wolf Killer, which increases his abilities by 40% against wolf monsters, she carries Cerberus with many more attacks. But realizing that he still lacks speed, he activates his sprint skill, which increases his movement speed by 30%. With this ability, he makes even more attacks at his maximum speed possible. She's so, so fast that Cerberus can't even keep up with his movements. And so to do even more damage to the Cerberus, he uses his bloodlust skill. We can see the aura that Hunter Sohn directed at Cerberus enveloping him. But as it turned out, the resistance of the church was too great, and because of this, the effect deviated. But Hunter Sleep, who seemed to know that this skill wouldn't work on a Cerberus, wasn't too surprised by what he saw. Hunter Sun realizes that even though his characteristics are enhanced by the title Wolf Killer, his attacks do not do any damage to Cerberus. After which, all his doubts go away, and he realizes that this is an s rank dungeon. Then all of the Dream Hunter's attacks pissed off Cerberus and he activated his Rage skill, which doubles Cerberus' stats. After he activated his skill and Cerberus goes to attack the Hunter Sun. On the Hunter Sleep does not hesitate faster than a Cerberus attacking him right in the eye. But as it turns out, unlike normal monsters, Cerberus doesn't feel any pain. The Dream Hunter, who at his own risk rushed first into battle with Cerberus, did not expect that Cerberus does not feel pain. And it cost him that Cerberus was able to attack the Hunter Sun and nicked him in the forearm. Hunter Sleep flies into the wall, thus destroying it. And so we can see that the Sleep Hunter's health is dropping very quickly. And even in this situation, the system helps our Hunter Sleep by activating his skill resilience, which is activated when the player's health is below 30%, and the damage received is reduced by half. Hunter Sleep realizes that the system is trying to help him in every way possible, and realizes that the only thing he can do is exceed its expectations. After which Cerberus attacks the Dream Hunter again. And so just before the Cerberus attacks him, the Hunter Sleep activate his first reward recovery condition, thereby restoring his strength, health, and mana. The Hunter then sleeps before the Cerberus attacks him and grabs him by the fangs, and turns his head 180 degrees. Then it's like the Hunter pulls out his second sword, which is stuck in the eye of the other Cerberus's head. Then cutting the eye of one of the Cerberus heads, he crushes the skull of the third head. And now we can see that everything around Hunter Dream and Cerberus has been destroyed. And of course, Hunter Sleep was finally able to kill the Guardian of the Gate of Hell Cerberus and raise four levels. Thanks to the battle with the Cerberus, the Hunter Sleeper realizes that he is not strong enough yet, and if he enters the castle gates, he will be killed. And he comes to the decision that he'll return to this castle after he's even stronger. And here we see a shabby man who appears to have had some kind of tragedy. Also an employee of the Hunter's Associations who asks the man what led him to him. Talks about hearing that everything that happens in the dungeon stays in the dungeon. But the Hunter Association member still doesn't understand what this man wants from him. The man then places a large bag on the table in front of the member of the Hunter's Association, which happens to have two billion one in it. He starts begging members of the Hunter's Association for him to kill whoever hurt his daughter. Thus he tries to avenge his daughter, who committed suicide after the incident. To which Hunter says he'll have to pay an extra one billion for the rest of the Hunters. He says he has no problem killing them, but there will still be other Hunters with them. As it turned out, he is a B-Rang hunter who is usually called into large guilds, but instead of joining a large guild, he endured the hunger and joined the Department of Tracking Hunter Guilds. The reason for this turned out to be that it was much more enjoyable for him to kill people than monsters. What are we shown as a man in a training uniform attacking someone? As it turned out, the two men were having a friendly sparring session. There were other people watching them shine with the guy. They finally completed their guy after all. Then we can see that one of the contestants was Mr. Song, whom his student praises saying that he is as skillful as ever. But he notices that his apprentice wasn't fighting at full strength. Well, his apprentice doesn't even hide the fact that he succumbed, tells him that he can't fight at full strength when he sees that he has no left arm. To which Mr. Song tells him to ignore it and fight him full force. 
and then he gets some kind of emergency call from the Hunters Association. Afterward, his student asks about whether he is serious about postponing his retirement. We can see from Hunter Song's gaze that he wasn't even planning to retire. Then he says he wants to spend the rest of his life being useful to the world. Doesn't answer. What's strange is that an S-ranked hunter is being trained by a low-ranked hunter like Mr. Song. And so the hunter Song goes to yet another dungeon, which is D-Rang. On his way to another raid, Hunter Song thinks about why he has awakened as a mage hunter instead of a sword hunter, having spent his last decades honing his swordsmanship. And he still continues to search for reasons why he became a mage hunter, but his musings on this are illuminated by the silhouette of one familiar hunter. Recognizing him as someone he knows, he turns to him. When he sees his face, he realizes that it was the Hunter Song Jin Wu whom he last saw in the double dungeon. And of course, Hunter Song Jin Wu will immediately recognize Mr. Song. Not surprisingly, Hunter Song couldn't recognize Hunter Song at first. He doesn't understand what made him change so much in a few months. And then he abruptly remembers that in that double dungeon hunter dream he lost his right leg. Well saw that his leg was intact, he marveled at this and asked how his leg had recovered. To which the dream hunter, without revealing the truth, says that when he woke up his leg was already in place. Mr. Song rejoices at this relief for it would have been bad if a young man of that age had become a kolek. But Hunter Sung Jin Woo is not satisfied with the absence of Mr. Song's hand, to which Mr. Song tells him not to worry about his hand because he is glad to be alive. That's when they both find out that they're following the guild's orders. And so, along the road chatting with each other, they reach their destination. After which they see three very familiar silhouettes. These people turned out to be those who also, what Hunter Song Jin Woo and Mr. Song, survived the double dungeon raid. Seeing the dream hunter safe and sound has Hunter Juhi in tears. And of course the hunter sleeper is surprised that Juhi was also called by order. Well also he doesn't see another person. He sees Mr. Kim who was also in the double dungeon that day. And he certainly hadn't forgotten that day Mr. Kim had run off leaving them for dead. But Mr. Dreamer realizes that it's not his place to judge Mr. Kim. Because in the end, he too left Hunter Sung Jin Woo to die. And of course they all have memories of the monsters they met there. Evat, we can see that just these five are the survivors of that raid. The Juhi hunter can't believe that the hunter Sung Jin Woo is standing in front of her and notices that he has changed a lot. To which the dream hunter, of course, with a smile, looks me over and replies that he's a little late. Juhi had been looking for him all this time, and suddenly she met him completely by chance before the raid in D-Rang's dungeon. And of course, she was surprised that the dream hunter had a leg. But before the dream hunter wanted to explain himself in front of her, their conversation is interrupted in a rather rude way. It was some three men in handcuffs, apparently criminals. Then one of them continued to incite Hunter Sung and Huntress Ju He, saying that he felt like they had come to star in a romance series. To which one of the hunters from the game warden department tells him to shut up and stand still. As it turned out, it was Hunter Kang Tasik, who as we already know is a B-Rang hunter. Then the same criminal when passing near Ju He told her to take care of them during the raid. But of course, such a picture did not please the members of the raid especially Hunter Song. And then there was another hunter from the surveillance department who came to inform the other hunters. Onus told them that they were prisoners who, along with the hunters, would be going into the dungeon today. Of course, Hunter Song shows his resentment and unwillingness to go on the raid with the criminals, to which the member of the surveillance department says that it is common for a criminal who used to be a hunter to shorten his sentence by going underground. The member of the supervision department apologizes and says that it is a forced measure because there are very few hunters here. And it also says that a B-Rang hunter will go with them to sit on the criminals. And after hearing all of this, Hunter Dream feels that something is wrong and tells Hunter Juhi not to go on this raid. Then she asks Hunter Sung Jin Woo if he will go on this raid. So what does Hunter Sung Jin Woo's response get about going on this raid? After which the Dream Hunter receives the same response from Juhi in return. And of course we're shown Mr. Song who has no choice but to go on. Also shows the remaining two squad members who also survived the double dungeon raid. While Mr. Song was thinking about something, and he couldn't believe that the Oversight Division actually wanted these criminals to go on the raid with them. And finally all those who are going to go on this raid have arrived. And now the perp we just saw is being uncuffed. Then they feel relieved that they've been in these handcuffs for a long time. But Hunter Kim Tasik continues to treat them like slaves. And so he finally introduces himself to Mr. Song's posse. He says that he'll keep an eye on the criminals so they don't have to worry. Then he asks who will be the leader of the squad to which Mr. Song says he will. He then asks Hunter Sung Jin Woo if it's okay with him, to which he receives an affirmative answer. So after expressing his gratitude to Hunter Sung Jin Woo for giving him a second chance, Mr. Song bows his head to him. And he notes that 11 people died in that raid because of him. But thanks to Hunter Sung Jin Woo, six people survived. And he's once again thanking Hunter Sung Jin Woo for giving him a second chance. 
feeling uncomfortable, the eagle hunter tells Mr. Song to raise his head. Afterwards, Mr. Song asks Hunter Kim if he would be okay with Hunter Song being the raid leader, to which the hunters tell him to do whatever he wants. Whereupon, Mr. Song, as if inciting Hunter Kim after his reply, sighs heavily. And so we can see that in the dungeon they are met by goblins. Then we can see that someone is smashing the face of one of the goblins as if with some kind of whip. It turned out to be one of the ones they let in here under the supervision of a hunter from the surveillance department. Then we're shown a second perp who wields a weapon that looks like a bat. And of course the previously shown third hunter carrying brass knuckles. Even as a criminal he had the strength to strike with such force that the goblin's body was blown to pieces. And so while Mr. Song was watching these criminals fight with monsters, and didn't understand which of them was the monster he was also attacked by one of the goblins. But of course he expected it. I killed him with one powerful blast of fire. After which he was attacked by two more goblins. But he with his powerful fiery attack incinerated them. Hunter Kim looked at him in amazement and couldn't believe that he wasn't an ordinary S-Rang hunter. And in turn, Mr. Song asks Hunter Kim if it's normal for a swordsman to have such a weak swing. And so we can see that they're doing a great job clearing the raid and continuing to kill goblins non-stop. Mr. Song emphasizes that Hunter Song Jin Wu has become more experienced and is surprised that Hunter Song, who has always fought unarmed, uses such a good dagger dagger. Hunter Juhi agrees and asks Hunter Song Jin Wu if he has been practicing martial arts while they were apart, to which Hunter Song Jin Wu replies that he was just warming up every day. Mr. Song, who said this in jest, emphasizes that he has changed a lot. Hunter Song Jin Wu realizes that not only his appearance has changed, but also his aura, and he always thought he was hopeless, but now he is very confident. But on the other hand, seeing as how Juhi's hunter is afraid of ordinary goblins, it seems that this injury has affected her quite a bit and she may have to leave her job as a hunter soon. And so while they fought goblins and pondered, they came to a fork in the road. Hunter Kim emphasizes that the difficulty of this dungeon is low, although it may be dangerous, but it will greatly reduce the time to clear this dungeon. After a bit of thinking, Mr. Song agrees to split up, while Hunter Kang says that he and the criminals will go to the third passageway, and if Mr. Song finds the boss's room, they will be able to find Kang quickly. Looking at these three passages, Hunter Song Jin Wu feels that a large amount of magical energy is being exuded from the first passage. And realizing that the boss is in this very first passage, he suggests that Mr. Song go into this passage. But immediately, a sliver of suspicion towards Hunter Kang can be seen in Hunter Song's gaze. But the Dream Hunter also notices that Hunter Khan suspects something. They finally split up and went their separate ways. And so walking down his tunnel hunter, Sung Jin Wu thinks that the boss is at the end of this passage. As it turned out from killing goblins, he almost does not fall experience. And to this dungeon brought him a little bit of use, he wants to kill the boss of the dungeon. But right now, he's more intimidated by Hunter Khan. And so we get to watch Hunter Khan watch the criminals deal with the monsters. As it turns out for these prisoners, these goblins are two weak monsters. Hunter Khan talks about how goblins are weaker than a grown man, but their size and intelligence is no different than children, and if children are given weapons, they are just as annoying as goblins. And actually, even a child holding a gun can kill a person. On the other side of the earth, many child soldiers are attacking people. And also emphasizes that there is no difference between humans and monsters, and that they are all insects. Hunter Kang then asks these criminals if they can kill children, but they say that it's a stupid question. After pondering the question again, Hunter Kang realizes that he really did ask a rather stupid question. He tells them that they will meet many children in this dungeon. This has the prisoners stunned. They wonder where the children in the dungeon come from. He tells them that these children are hungry children who are willing to eat all your flesh in order to survive, and again asks if they can kill these children, to which they reply without a fraction of a doubt that of course they can kill them. Hunter Khan's point was that to survive you have to kill everyone. That's what he would tell the Hunter's Guild. While Hunter Kang was telling them all this, they didn't understand what this hunter was talking about. And then Hunter Khan says he'll tell the Hunter's Guild that they met a hundred goblins here. In the meantime, Hunter Kim and another hunter were dealing with the goblins in the tunnel in the middle and hoped that this dungeon would be cleared without incident. After that, Hunter Kim remembers the past related to Hunter Sung Jin Wu. Hunter Kim finally decided to bow down to Hunter Sung Jin Wu after the raid and apologize for betraying him and leaving him to die in that double dungeon. Then he asks the other man if he wants to apologize too because they both ran away after leaving the hunter song Jin Wu. He says that since he's a hunter, he should get used to this kind of thing like bowing, and that he doesn't expect hunter Sung Jin Wu to forgive him. Even if he doesn't forgive him, he says he'll apologize to him anyway. Then he says that they should hurry up, because unlike the other groups, there are only two people in their group. And so they reach the end of their passage, and as it turned out, 
their passage and Hunter Khan's passage with the criminals were connected. And having found the passage, Hunter Kim looks into the passage connecting their tunnel and Hunter Kang's tunnel. And what he sees when he looks into that tunnel is shocking. We can see someone monologuing about how someone is on a mission where he has to kill someone as painfully as possible, and how that person likes to watch those people he kills beg for mercy. And next we can see Hunter Canuck holding one of the criminals by the neck. And the sight that Hunter Kim and another man saw was Hunter Kang holding one of the prisoners by the throat, and two prisoners lying on the ground in pools of blood. Hunter Kang turns around and sees Hunter Kim and another hunter and doesn't understand how they got there. He realizes what appears to be two passageways connected and pulls out his dagger. And then, with one sharp swing of his dagger, he cuts off the head of the prisoner he was just holding. At this time, Hunter Kim and another hunter were watching this spectacle in awe. Suddenly, Hunter Song, Jin Woo, Mr. Song, and Juhi in the distance hear a very loud and ear-slashing scream. And at the same time, Hunter Song feels a very strong thirst for blood and suggests that Mr. Song go back. And now, back at the fork, they enter the tunnel where the hunter Kim and another hunter had entered before. They don't realize the whole situation as quickly as possible trying to get to the source of the creek. But suddenly a hunter Kang appears out of nowhere and purposely tried to kill healer Ju He, but hunter Song Jin Woo falls down and blocks his blow. Kang is surprised that hunter Song Jin Woo was able to react to such a blow. At this time, hunter Song Jin Woo doesn't understand why he suddenly attacked huntress Ju He. While Hunter Kang doesn't understand how Hunter Song Jin Wu was able to block his ambush attack. After Hunter Sung Jin Wu blocked Hunter Kang's attack, Hunter Kang jumps back. Hunter Kang notices that he has very good instincts and doesn't understand how he was able to stop his sneak attack after all. He didn't want to get into a fight. He thought Hiller B. Ranga would be a liability, so he decided to get rid of her first. But as we can see, he had to change his plan. He's going to kill every hunter here just like those behind him. Watching everything happen, Mr. Song doesn't understand why a guild member would do such a thing. At this time, the hunter Song Jinwoo turned his attention to the person behind them. That man turned out to be Hunter Kim Sang-sik. As we can see, he sits all bloody and wounded in a pool of blood. And then Hunter Sun Jinwoo tells Hunter Juhi to cure Hunter Kim, but she didn't hear what Sun said. After that, Hunter Sung again tells her to heal Hunter Kim in a higher tone. And so the hunter Johi begins to treat the hunter Kim who sits all wounded. But realizing that he can no longer be saved, Hunter Kim tells Hunter Juhi to stop treating him. He's already all scarred up and even a B-rang hunter healer won't be able to heal him. He's already lost so much blood that he can't be cured. Hunter Dream tells him that he must live for his family. No matter what happened to him, he has to live. Hunter Sleep says he has to live to have someone to hate. To which Hunter Kim says he didn't mean to apologize like that. He meant to apologize with his head down. But if he puts his head down now he'll die. We can see what horrible wounds the hunter like us received when fighting the hunter Khan. Finally, Hunter Kim apologizes to Sung. We can see the pity on Hunter Sung Jin Woo's face. At this time, Hunter Kim had already lowered his head and went to heaven. The hunter himself asks Hunter Kana why he did this to Hunter Kim. And what he replies that he doesn't know and says it was probably monsters. He recalls that once the gate opened and monsters flooded the land, it was a real disaster. And here he is talking about how he was just thinking about a good story that involved carving with goblins. But he fleshes out the story by saying that the criminals broke out and tried to escape. Then they killed the hunters and tried to attack him who was fighting the boss. He concludes by saying that they were too weak to kill Hunter B-Rang Kang, so he was the only survivor of the raid, and asks the hunters if people would believe such a story. After hearing this story, the hunter's son got angry and was about to attack the hunter Kana but Mr. Sun stopped him and said he couldn't handle him. Instead, he said that he himself would defeat him, realizing that Hunter Kang B-Rang and S-Rang like him would not defeat him. That said, Hunter Kana has the assassin class, but even with that in mind, Mr. Song decides to fight him and takes Hunter Kim's sword. And so, taking his sword in his hands, he slowly makes his way towards the Hunter Khan, after which he asks to hunt Yuhi to increase his physical strength, to which Juhi's hunters increased his physical strength, surprised that Mr. Song picked up a sword. And here we can see the effect of Juhi's Huntress spell that increased Mr. Song's physical strength. And so, taking a deep breath, Mr. Sang focused completely on the enemy in front of him. But since Mr. Song is a hunter mage hunter, Kang doesn't take him seriously. Mr. Somk emphasizes that non-physical strength is pretty useless for a mage. But along with that, we can see that the effect of Juhi's hunter spell also affects Mr. Song's sword. Here's our squad leader, Mr. Song, finally ready for battle. He understands the difference between their powers and realizes that he should be careful given their differences in strength, stamina, and agility. But even though Juhi's hunters are helping Mr. Song, this situation looks like you're pedaling a bicycle with a car engine installed, and that doesn't guarantee their victory. 
If he doesn't control his power, he'll probably die. While he was thinking about how he could defeat such an opponent, Hunter Kang had already attacked him. But even such an unexpected attack, Mr. Song was able to block it with his sword. And Hunter Khan says the decision to pick up was likely his best decision. But he goes on to say that in the end, he's just a pathetic wizard whose power can't even compare to D-Rang, and there's no point in Mr. Song taking up arms. You're showing us a hunter named Sung Jin Wu who was surprised by something. As it turned out, Mr. Song was able to chop up Hunter Kana with one swift and precise swing. Then he replies that it makes sense that he picked up a gun. As it turned out, what Mr. Song chopped was only the silhouette of Hunter Kang, who is amazed that Mr. Song's moves are so good and sees that he has been practicing these moves diligently. And the Dream Hunter emphasizes that Mr. Song was able to catch up with him even if only for a moment. Right after Hunter Kang finished speaking, Mr. Song is already attacking him. And after seeing his quick and accurate hunter attack, Kang says it was a good idea to switch magic for weapons after all. But as we can see, even that's not enough, and Hunter Kang stabs Mr. Song. And Hunter Khan says that if he thinks about it a bit, he'll realize why there are so few mage knights among hunters. But no such luck, Huntress Yuhi immediately cured Mr. Song. After that, Hunter Kana's expression changes, and it becomes obvious that Juhi is becoming a problem for him. And if this battle becomes a battle of endurance, he might lose. And after this, Hunter Crane decides to get rid of the healer Yuhi first. Then Mr. Song appears behind him with his same quick and accurate punch as before. But Hunter Kang turns around sharply and fends off Mr. Song's punch. That's when he realizes he shouldn't underestimate Mr. Song. And Mr. Song emphasizes that there is an S-rank hunter among his students. And here he gives him another very quick slap. But thanks to his hunter's speed, Kang easily dodges his attack. But just like Hunter Kang, Hunter Song was able to repel his blow. Just as suddenly, Hunter Kang accelerated and attacked Mr. Song with multiple attacks. And Hunter Song missed almost all of his punches. And Hunter Kang emphasizes that if his opponent was someone else, he would be able to win in this situation. His rank is superior to Hunter Song's rank. His braid totally shows that he's confident. At this time, the Juhi Huntress runs up to Mr. Song. But just like her, Hunter Kang is also approaching Mr. Song. But in turn, Mr. Song doesn't even move. And here Khan swings in to kill him with one punch. But suddenly, Hunter Song raises his head and begins to use his magic. Use your magic, he raises the pillar of fire into the sky. And so used in such an attack, he hopes she was somehow able to hurt him after all. But as it turned out, Hunter Khan's speed was much faster. And Hunter Kang emphasizes that Mr. Song's plan where he hides his magical abilities by pretending to be a swordsman to unleash his magical power while a blade approaches his throat is a pretty good plan. But even though Hunter Kang praised him, of course Mr. Song is disappointed that his plan didn't work. And now Hunter Kang is on his second Wolverine to kill Mr. Song. That's where the Hunter Sleep fends off his blade with his own blade and throws Hunter Khan away from Mr. Song. Hunter Khan's hand shuddered at the force with which Hunter Sung wrestled his blade away. Once again, Hunter Sung gets in Hunter Kong's way. Afterward, Hunter Kang asks him who he is and what his rank is. So Hunter Sung Jin Wu answers him that his name is Sung Jin Wu, and he is E Rang. Then he steps back when he sees that this false hero is saying something not so related to his identity. Because then he realized that it couldn't be since that person couldn't be that strong at that rank. This in turn also surprises his allies, as they did not expect that this man could strengthen his skills so much in such a short time. Time is a man thought how can this opponent use such a skill if he is a rank. Only then he thinks that this man is hiding his power but he does not know the reason for this action. At this time his ally thought something like this could not be that his loyal friend could be among the fake rank people who usually engaged in bad deeds. At this time, the opponent says that this man cannot leave alive people who have seen his power, and most likely he also killed his opponents. And most likely this man is the awakened one who has once again received the power that embraces him. This surprises his close friends because these cases are very rare, and they are surprised that this friend got such power because it is very rare and one person out of hundreds of thousands gets such an opportunity. This pleased the inspector very much as he was right by the reaction of his allies. No one knows about this and if he now copes, it will be of great benefit to him. Having received such prudent information, he was in a euphoric effect, and though for the moment would decapitate his opponent, thus gaining even more pleasure. But in the meantime, our protagonist was asking why this man was doing this and what his motives were. In turn, he pretends that he doesn't understand this kid's words since he doesn't want to risk his cards. At this time, even the main character was already because he knew it was a man pretending to be something he didn't understand because you don't want to answer questions like that. At this time, his interlocutor says that from him emanates a very strong aura, and it frightens even the devil himself. But he answers that 
Even if it's his yet to answer him honestly, and he doesn't do it because it's all fun for him, there's a more objective reason for his actions that he's doing at the moment. He remembers that a few days ago some man came to him about eliminating some people. This man gave him the opportunity to make the world a kinder place, and he also gave him a lot of money. This person could see a look that he had lost everything, and even so he was saying that there was currently two billion one in that bag. When he asked that he killed the very criminals who were involved in this enterprise, and he brought very much. You could see that he was afraid to do it. But still his conscience and paternal love made it happen. Even so, this hunter asked for another billion to take care of the other hunters and asked, then is it possible to do it? But he also wondered why his father was doing this because it had been a long time, and he wanted to know the reason. He compares these people to garbage that presents discomfort to all the people who see it on the street. But what's also interesting is that why would this person give such a huge amount of money to just beg this garbage to another dumpster? Then the same man replies that one of these prisoners raped his daughter and there's no way he can ask that. Because of this, his daughter hanged herself and her mother is still in the hospital trying to come out of shock and think, in a few years, this animal will come out of the garbage. And this situation does not let him sleep at night as he worries about his child and his relatives that this case will never be repeated and this garbage will just rot in the dungeon. When he tells our protagonist that he could not refuse such a request because it proves that in this world there is still at least a fraction of kindness. And all he saw was his request, but it didn't turn out the way he expected. He didn't want to hurt the guys. But it was obvious from the look on this man's face that he was definitely lying because he couldn't even hold back his laughter. When our protagonist says what he has no desire to believe, and his words there is not a single reason to trust someone who just recently came up with fake death stories. Then he also immediately starts attacking and with all his might to make his opponent just fall to the ground. You even this man says something that doesn't matter if he is, he just feels sorry for them all being around these insects. All this was visible to all the people who were here, and they saw that his friend could not compare to this killer. But with this fact, our protagonist was fully agreed because he knew that this man would soon die by his hand. At this time, his death didn't scream something he doesn't know how many markets he's raised since waking up. But it won't be as easy as he thinks. But at this time, our protagonist was splitting his enemy like a leaf he saw his body split in half by his blow. But it turns out it was an illusion that was created by his opponent. This illusion was created with a speed that leaves behind a trail. Then the protagonist notices that this man is not simple and very fast, and it is necessary to follow him for the beginning of the fight. At this time, they fought with great speed, and it was not visible to ordinary people. It was like a bright flash of light. At this time, his elder and friend that, ah, how can they move like that because it was a superhuman whose speed is complicated time. Then he notices that this young man has changed a lot because of this time, and he is no longer the man he knew. A man with purple hair comes into view, saying that three billion wouldn't be enough for the job, meeting a hunter of that level. The man with purple hair collides his gaze with the stranger across the street that looks just as confident and cold-blooded, thinking they have the same speed. The man with purple hair doesn't seem to waste any time, immediately gaining the strength he needs and bouncing his feet off the ground, leaping high. The man's look changes to a frantic one, full of anticipation of something interesting, saying that since that guy can't keep up with him, it's useless. Nothing seemed to portend that this tension between the guys would break, but suddenly someone appears, calling off a man named Jin Wu. And that person seems to come just in time, supporting the man named Jin Wu, vocalizing for him to be strong, which only motivates him more. At such an occurrence in front of his eyes, the man with violet eyes grows gloomier, thinking that he needs to become more serious, intensifying his speed. Briefly pondering their future actions, the boys clash their swords with each other, beginning a serious battle that costs them their precious lives. It seems that to watch such a serious battle between two strong men with high levels, a crowd of enthusiastic people gather around them to watch the fight. The man with purple hair is rather annoyed and acts quickly, stating that this difference will lead to someone else's defeat since he's trying to protect his healer. Some strong magic is developing around, which can easily send any person to the other world. It is heading towards the girl with great speed. The girl seems to freeze in one place, unable to move in any way from the fear overwhelming her, as a hero appears from somewhere in the form of a man with a sword and a cold stare. The man is distracted by such a situation, seemingly worried about the girl who is still supporting him at the beginning, as a huge dark shadow develops behind Jin Wu. As soon as Jin Wu is only distracted for some couple of moments, many streaking cuts appear on his body in the same instant, adding to the horrible pain. The man with purple hair was only waiting for someone else's moment of weakness. A kind of club of smoke formed around them, 
for with what great speed he had accomplished this. The man with purple hair is watching someone else's reaction. Naturally, this guy should have collapsed to the ground a long time ago since there are so many deep wounds in his body. Much to Jin Wu's surprise, but he won't fall to his knees in front of someone so easily. He's holding a dagger, still standing still as well, and telling him to control himself because he's sensitive. The man raises his gaze, which glows with a blue light, states that the quest itself has activated and someone will be left alive. Just one person. Jin Wu seems to decide to just not waste precious time. With his serious look, looks, and says that he starts this game first. Speaking confidently, the purple-haired man doesn't seem to expect anything like this in any way, pondering the fact that he has the advantage in this battle after all. So, what is Jin Wu up to? Jin Wu crosses his arms and faces, looks on with a cold-blooded stare, and says that he's grateful to this system for giving him another reason to straighten him out. Apparently, the confident Jin Wu is going to not even give a chance for any words to this guy, so he uses his powerful force that glows with white light. The other guy apparently only gets turned on by something like this, stating that Jin Wu uses a dagger in his agility, and he's a melee fighter. Aren't they excellent opponents? Jin Wu only responds to such words with his usual coolness and confidence, saying that he's learned a lot from him, but isn't talkativeness useless in a fight. The following actions should not be expected from a concentrated Jin Wu, he uses his skill as a sprint and falls completely into his state. After the place passed by, this guy around there are clubs of smoke and the road just crumbles under other people's feet because the guy's speed is increased by 30%. The man with purple hair seems rather puzzled by such a picture in front of him. He tensely stands and barely has time to catch up with where Jin Wu is running with his gaze. The man stares shocked at what is happening, arms barely crossed in time for the daggers to cover his own face, scrolling in his thoughts that he has gotten speed. At some unexpected moment, a gust of wind just knocks the other's stance down, seeming to make a deep cut into his chest, knocking the air out of him and the thoughts that he was using the skills. The purple-haired man is extremely dumbfounded that he just realized this guy's true nature while Jin Wu stops behind him after executing a punch. The man, noticing the stranger's presence behind him, looks at Jin Wu with the corner of his eye, feeling his own blood on his cheek after receiving a hard blow. But does that stop it? The face of the man with purple hair instantly changes to a bloated vein, enraged by what's happening, instantly activating many alien skills. He reacts calmly to something like this happening to his own body, analyzing that it's all because of Jin Wu's dagger, which imposes many different effects. A multicolored circle formed around the man with purple hair, seemingly due to the multitude of effects overwhelming the other's body, but something was off. Jin Wu concentrates on watching the other's condition from the side, analyzing in his thoughts that these effects won't affect the guy for long because the opponent is strong enough. The man with purple hair pulls the boy out of his own musings his face going completely dark, and he states that he wants to demonstrate a few of his skills. Which is to be expected from a man with purple hair, he uses his skill by demonstrating complete invisibility that makes the man a little nervous. The man's voice rumbles around Jin Wu, saying that he was able to block his attack, even though he's hiding his presence. So the guy has good instincts. That voice still echoes around him as well, going on about him hiding his voice, his scent, his form, very few people get this skill, and no one would know he has it. And it's all because, just like the man with purple hair says, after activating this strong skill, simply no one is left alive, shocking Jin Wu more. The boy stands in one place, listening to the other man's voice and what he is saying, as he feels something very sharp cut across one of his legs, making him scream. The man who is hiding thanks to the activation of his own strong skill appears in the light a bit, stating the obvious that Jin Wu's tendons are torn. The boy settles back on his feet while the guy says his tendons would heal easily, but it's too far away from other people so it won't work. The man with purple hair still appears in scraps as well, pointing his sword directly at the boy, telling him to stand his ground and wait for his outcome. The girl watching everything happening from the side is very afraid for the fate of Jin Wu, who was badly injured in the form of torn tendons. She looks forward in fear. There's also a man watching beside her, tensely contemplating that if this continues like this, the Suna stamina will soon run out. He can't even call for help. Still, the same man holds the sword in his hand with slightly trembling fingers. Thinking that he has a duty to save Mr. Sun, he must buy at least a little time for him. The man with his frenzied eyes looks at the guy enduring this pain, saying that whether he can withstand his attacks in this condition, because he won't be able to reach the past speed. Jin Wu stands in the same spot, his leg completely bloody and barely moving. The man continues to talk about how long it will take for his leg to heal. 
No matter how much pain the boy is in right now, he's still just as cold-blooded and shows no sign of feeling bad, glaring that the man is too chatty even at this moment. Jin Wu seems to gain the strength he needs, sinking down into a semi-sitting position and golden threads appeared around him enveloping his body, restoring his status. It seems that even the people wanting to help Jin Wu at this moment are not expecting such a maneuver from someone else's side at all, that he suddenly starts to recover at a great speed. The man with purple hair widens his eyes, one of which is still dark, surprised to notice such a thing from Jin Wu, that he should have been exhausted and exhausted. The man starts running through his head questioning whether a hunter class with healer elements even exists, until Jin Wu says that it all has its drawbacks. The atmosphere around begins to heat up in every possible way, for the man's thoughts are muddled with speculation and conjecture that perhaps it is false self-confidence and deceit. How many times can this be repeated, concluding at the end that Jin Wu is dangerous enough for him, that he's not the easy man he seemed to be just a short time ago? Jin Wu is thinking about something of his own amidst other people's musings, feeling the atmosphere around him begin to heat up and the place gradually darken, completely hiding his face. Jin Wu's gaze gradually changes from full of emotions of hatred and irritation to a tired one, gradually fading away and losing some strength, saying that again. One of his emotions died again, gradually appearing somewhere in the sky as a blue light and falling somewhere down, beginning to go out, leaving nothing behind. The man doesn't seem to change in any way in his firm voice, even after losing another emotion, saying that it's silly for him to even be angry at people like the man. The man with purple hair begins to gradually appear in his appearance in front of the other person, some strong wind flow stressing him out more. The man, noticing some danger near him, though even though he uses his skills in the form of disguise, barely manages to dodge Jin Wu's swinging arm. The violet-haired man's gaze changes to one of dumbfounded disbelief at what is happening now for the boy can see through his disguise again. The guys recoil from each other, both holding their blades and daggers, intent on ending it all as quickly as possible, the man stating that the other is aiming for his neck. At one point, the man with the purple hair stops, seemingly realizing just now some important detail, saying he's finally realized the real difference. The man's gaze changes and a smile appears on his face, showing the complete insanity at the moment, thinking that Jin Wu already has experience in assassinations. The man watching the other man's fight from the sidelines starts to get a little nervous listening to this conversation while laughter is heard in the background and a comment that they are of the same sex. The purple-haired man reflects that Jin Wu is willing to change his own fate even at the cost of his life, that someone else's choice was forced. And it seems that Jin Wu's appearance is a very small part of what has changed in this guy, he exclaims awakening, for such an unexpected force has changed the order of society. He continues that new rules have been created for hunters and there is no point in sticking to laws or morals. The word of the strongest is law. The man with purple hair seems to be very serious, starting to gradually lose visibility, saying that he is therefore going to show his power. After those quickly spoken and confident words, the very spot where the purple-haired man had just stood instantly disappears, leaving a puff of smoke. Jin Wu, with his head down, as if trying to set himself up for some kind of attack, feels the instant danger approaching his body at high speed. The boy stands in the same spot, as at some point severe wounds and weapon cuts instantly began to be inflicted across his body, sweeping everything away in a matter of seconds. The man thinks as Jin Wu discovers him during his disguise, seemingly because of one moment and that's the bloodlust that shows his presence for a split second. Jin Wu doesn't react in any way after the cuts he's received also standing still while the man thinks that he can't figure out where his punches are going to be anyway. The boy doesn't seem to react in any way, but at some point he raises his head and his eyes turn bright, activating the bloodlust skill. The man clenches his jaw, completely dumbfounded by what's happening, in no way expecting this kind of reaction and steely state, completely baffled by it. A man with purple hair finds himself in the water somehow, his legs seemingly unable to move. He looks down, puzzled. The man lifts his head up, Wanting to look at Jin Wu, at his own fear, an unexpectedly dangerous man, unsure of what to do now. It's as if he's trying to gaze into something ahead of him, feeling his tension begin to grow stronger, and only incomprehensible exclamations of what's happening come off his lips. There seems to be complete darkness around the man. He can't see anything. He thinks of some darkness covering his eyes, but ahead are blue lights in the shape of eyes. The man stands puzzled in the same spot holding his weapon in his hands, not knowing where to go now in the complete darkness, realizing that it is Jin Wu's shadow. The man seemingly realizing his own sorrowful plight, 
begins to choke on the blood that flows from his mouth in thick streams, stating who he is. The boy towers over the man, stares with soul-chilling eyes that express no emotion, the stranger's body seeming to evaporate into thin air. The weapon embedded in the man's body causes him to freeze, and Jin Wu says that he doesn't put hunters and regular people in the same category, does he? The man with purple hair continues to stand, saying that if he leaves this world, it's because he lost and it's only natural for him to do so. Even though blood is flowing out of his mouth in a big stream, he wonders who Jin Wu is, if he's a killer with recovery magic, which he can't believe in any way. And the abilities imposing the negative effect, the man has never heard of such a thing, and Jin Wu looks on, saying he doesn't know anything about it himself. The man at the same moment starts to get angry, saying that the unclosed mouth and useless, but having a lot of secrets is not so good. At the same moment, the stranger's body twitches, adding several effects in the form of bleeding and paralysis, forcing him to endure horrible pain in his body, but not giving up so easily. The man's eye begins to visibly bleed, and he lifts his head up and says that Jin Wu will no longer be able to hide his skills after killing him. The boy only remains silent at such words, looking at the man with a somber gaze, seemingly pondering what to say to him. The boy states after a while that he is getting much stronger with each battle, and asks the man how strong he can become. The condition of the man with purple hair only gets worse. His pupils become larger and his head rises higher, with large amounts of blood coming out of his mouth. A man, leaning his exhausted body against the rock behind him, he slides down, completely surrounded by a pool of blood, saying that his shadow is connected to the darkness. The man gradually loses his strength, lowers his head, and whispers that Jin Wu will become as strong as his shadow goes far into the darkness. The boy's bangs cover one eye and he stares coldly at the dying man, realizing that the urgent quest is finally over. The boy puts the hood over his head, pondering and scrolling through the thoughts that he is certainly becoming much stronger than he was before. The boy stands by the man sitting in the pool of blood, seemingly unmoving, pondering that it's like he loses something each time he gets stronger. The boy continues to stand in the same spot as supportive people gradually appear behind him, the girl voicing her thanks to Jin Wu. A man also approaches, stopping behind Mr. Sun. He smiles and sincerely says that if it wasn't for Jin Wu, they would have just died. The two men who came in after thanking Mr. Moon decide to divert their attention to other concerns, for they should go outside and inform the guild. Jin Wu says to start by closing the gate, which the man wants to deny, but afterwards says he's seen Mr. Moon's skills and can't contradict him. The man is standing next to the girl, watching what is happening around them. Many corpses lying on the cold ground, and he would like to give them a funeral. While the two men who came in are discussing their future plans, Jin Wu walks up to the man at the same moment and pulls out his dagger with a distinctive sound. As soon as the dagger is left in the boy's hands, a rune with the power of cloaking appears in the same instant, blinding everything around it with a bluish light. The boy, holding this rune with magical powers in his hands, ponders and realizes that it seems he can gain the power of his enemy once he gets rid of him. Mr. Sun is distracted from his deep thoughts about what happened by two people who say that they are going to notify the guild and the guy needs to hurry up. The boy doesn't make them wait for his answer, yells for them not to worry, because it won't take as long as they might think. The boy, hiding his face behind a deep hood and keeping his hands in his pockets, approaches the man's body lying on the ground and covered in blood. If one looks deep into the hood of Jin Wu's hood, one can see his eyes sparkling with blue light he coldly vocalizes to get up, for the man is alive. The boy seems to know ahead of time someone else's actions and maneuvers, asking why he's trying to play dead, probably just to escape. He annoyingly realizes that the man can't speak, saying that Kang Tai Shik would have been much tougher and made to suffer in a horrible way. The black-haired man trembles, listening to what Jin Wu says, who gives some hope for life, saying that perhaps he can be saved from his fate. The boy drags him by the collar of his suit right along the ground while the man thinks it doesn't seem to be a passageway to the exit, starting to kick in every way possible. Just as the man sees the picture unfolding before him, it is a wooden gate inviting into the gloomy place, along with torches all around. The man looks in horror at what is happening in front of him. A large number of monsters with red eyes stare hungrily at him, clearly as food. The boy, closing the doors behind him, crosses his arms over his chest, and coldly states if he remembers all his victims, to which the man looks at him panic-stricken. The boy's one eye glows blue, and he says hatefully that he'll never take a man like him outside, because he's worse than Taesik. As expected, so behind the man appears a large number of hungry monsters that are eager only to take revenge on his opponent. Green monsters and goblins open their mouths in an attempt to devour another's body without remnants to avenge the past. 
Green hands mercilessly climb up the man's body and begin to torture him in every way possible and climb into his mouth, grabbing his jaw hard. The man has no time to do anything. He stretches his arm forward, which is very wasted because his fingers are immediately bitten off by one of the goblins. The whole horrific picture is revealed in all its glory to the boy as this man is devoured by his own once present victims. The boy, looking away from the scene in progress, reflects on the fact that he had no trouble overpowering the hobgoblin. As soon as he left the dungeon, the guild had already been alerted by what had happened. The staff member realizes the situation is large enough and started working. A black car pulls up to some building, stopping abruptly, and it turns out to be an elite employee that arrived some time later. The man asks how much time has passed since the dungeon sweep, realizes there isn't much time left, giving the decree that they should try to drag the bodies away in eight minutes. The man continues walking in his direction, keeps one hand in his pocket, and asks if the survivors have cleaned up the dungeon themselves, which is said correctly. He thinks Taishik tried to kill the rest of them during the contract, but it seems strange enough to him, as if he's hiding something. The man ponders Taishik's plans, what he could possibly be up to, as he notices the guy ahead of him walking along with someone else looking back at him. The man's gaze changes to one of surprise, for he seems to realize that the hooded man is Hunter Sung Jin Woo. He reflects on the fact that at first, he couldn't figure out who it was in front of him, saying hello to Jin Woo, who says that he seems to be from the surveillance department. The man introduces himself as Jin Chiel and apologizes for the inconvenience, saying that everything will be fine soon. The boy's gaze changes to a serious one, thinking it's too early for him to rejoice since he's defeated such a strong Tae Sheik. The boy senses that the guy in front of him is quite strong and on another level, and the guy keeps saying he wants to ask some questions. The boy realized that the one has A rank and he is not strong enough to defeat him. Jin offers him cooperation, to which he agrees. The man doesn't make his question wait long, directly asking the people around him who massacred W. Rang's Taishik. The boy thinks he needs to cancel his contract with Jin Ho, as the latter needs a strong but low-level hunter. The boy ponders his own thoughts while no one is answering the question yet, but suddenly someone nearby says that it was he who did such a thing. The man says that he straightened out Tai Sheik, saying that he's rank C, but Jin thinks that's weird, since the man has B rank. The man confidently says and asks if Jin can't see who he has behind his back, which is a girl surprised at such an action. Jin ponders what he's just learned, clearly not fully believing that this particular man could have handled him, but asks him to walk with him alone. As soon as Jin Chul moves away from them, the boy calls back the very man who just stood up for him, surprising him more. He asks him why the man lied, to which he says that Jin Wu clearly had a reason to hide his abilities. Was he standing up for nothing? The man smiles, saying the boy still won't escape investigation, but at least he's repaying something for what Jin Wu did. Jin Wu, reflecting on what he's heard from the man, hears Jin Chul's voice, which catches his attention, causing him to turn around. The man says that it's unlikely that Jin Wu could overpower Tae Shik, but advises him to be careful or his life could soon be over. He asks what the man means, to which Jin says that perhaps some people want revenge on him after destroying Huang Dong Seok's group. The boy interjects to ask if he's talking about S-rank Huan Dong Su, and Jin agrees, saying it doesn't matter what was in Raid. All that matters is that Jin Wu was the one who survived that moment, but since the other has S-rank, the law can't control him. The man goes on to say that they are a living miracle and a disaster at the same time, but it should be in Jin Wu's best interest to be wary of these people. After all, the boy can be hunted by someone that even monsters fear. He is quite large in build and has one red eye. Jin Chiel continues his speech and speculation that perhaps leaving the country with his family and love would be a good enough decision. Three hours later, during the investigation of Kang Tai Sik's murder, the CEO of the gold business turned himself in, justifying the action. The boy is minding some business of his own, engrossed in contemplation, raising his hands in the air as the girl appears, calling him off by name, seemingly for some reason. The girl holds a glowing petal in her hand. She scrutinizes it with fascination asking the boy if he remembers what it is in her hand. The girl falls into some sort of memory from the past, as the two of them stroll through some neighborhood, looking around at the area around them. The girl, continuing down the path, suddenly stops at the pillar, clutching her hands behind her and saying that Jin Wu has changed quite noticeably. She puts her head down, seemingly distressed by what she's about to say, for she remains as she was, unlike the boy she rises up. The boy on such words of the girl only says that she has overcome many trials and everyone changes quite differently. She turns to him, glaring that he's right, saying she's scared to be a hunter, trying to overcome all her fears that are choking her. 
She keeps talking admiringly about the boy's rank going up, and she still stayed with D-Rank, and then she met Jin Woo a lot. The girl scrolls through the moments as she then treats him for all the wounds that were frequent enough that it even became annoying. She thought the guy was naive. But as she continues to say, the boy always manages to save the girl and get out of a difficult situation. No matter how scary he is, he moves on. Those eyes that are filled with life, so full of life, they say they want to survive in this challenging world, to see the next day and the next challenge. The girl smiles, saying that she will apparently never get to look at the world with the same eyes that the boy has at the moment. The girl holds some sort of thing in her hand, saying that it is the thing that holds the boy's communication about dinner, when they will return alive, whether he remembers. The girl, briefly contemplating her future action, reveals the palm of her hand with the item, saying she's returning it to the boy slightly nervous. Jin Woo seems to guess what will happen next after the girl's words, but it's as if he's trying not to believe it, as if it's just his silly guesses and thoughts. The girl smiles, talking about how she's going to leave, which proves to other people's minds that the thing she gave back was given back for a reason. The girl says she's going back to her hometown of Busan, but continues that if he wants to see her, just let him give some sign. The boy seems to reflect on what he has heard, and afterward clutches the thing in his hands, saying that if he is near, he will certainly call for a walk like this. The girl does not hide her joyful smile from what she heard, because the time spent with the guy is valuable enough for her, so she just agrees. The girl holds her outer garment in one hand, waves to the boy with her free hand, and bids him a similar farewell to go home. The boy still remains standing in the same place, unmoving, staring in the direction of the girl retreating on her way, clutching the thing in his hand. He holds it tighter in his hand, squeezes it tighter, and afterward he reflects on the fact that there is yet another reason for him to become a stronger version of himself. The boy rolls the image of S-rank male hunter Huang Dong-su in his head, remembering that he needs to overcome him sometime in the future. The boy confidently sets himself the goal of definitely becoming stronger, because only so he can overcome the man, only so he can survive here. Jin Wu appears in a sporty look, wearing a red sweatshirt, and he appears to be dissatisfied with something from what he's seen, turning to Jin Ho and asking, The boy seems puzzled to see a large number of different people, ranging from the weakest to the strangest in appearance, but the other doesn't seem to see anything strange. Jin Ho himself comes into view, looking so energetic and charged with good cheer, he says that all these people are their team. Jin Ho begins to list those who are here, such as those who have a hunter's license but can't participate in the raids due to injuries. Also, here are those who are struggling to exist because of life's difficulties. It may be because of alcoholism, but they are also on their team. Even those who came because of a quick buck are present here, which refers to one girl who is distant from the others but looking all around. Jin Woo asks if children are even allowed to participate in raids, to which Jin Ho says if an adult is awakened, it'll be fine. The same girl, who is classified as a child, enters the conversation, saying that she is not a child, but a hunter who has completed all her training. The boy addresses that she seems to be in high school, does she have any experience in raids, but she says she doesn't. So Jin Woo determines her rank as E. The boy says that's enough. He needs that girl to just stand outside the dungeon while he along with Jin Ho are inside. Jin Ho enters the conversation, stating that they need 10 people who have C rank and low rank, drawing the attention of the other people here. People here are thinking about how strong these guys are since they can go there alone. But someone asks about the money, that they're not really going to pay them that much. Someone else's question is confirmed by an outstretched hand. The guy states that everyone will be paid 3 million even if they don't have to lift a finger. The guy lists on his fingers all the things these people will have to do, but if they slip up, they will be obliged to repay the given amount tenfold. Jin Wu enters the conversation and puts his head back down, looking up, and then says that he's still curious about something as he continues his speech. Jin Ho comes into view, dressed in a full set of hardened armor made by the Italian guild. Wouldn't they need to prepare well? The stranger's speech is interrupted by a nearby boy who touches the stranger's armor with his finger, scratching it lightly, still standing in the same spot. At some unexpected moment, he makes Jin Ho fall down in that hardened armor without any great effort leaving behind puffs of smoke and showing a funny situation. The boy isn't at all surprised by such a moment that happened. He only states for Jin Ho to take off his armor when he says so. The boy is confident in his movements and strength. He thinks it's just a funny thing that has no use. But then a guy's voice is heard. He calls out to Jin Wu, seemingly kicking around in the same spot, unable to climb up due to being so heavy on himself in the form of armor. So he asks the boy to help him. Jin Ho still managed to get up from the cold ground, already saying with a serious look that it's time for them to go on their way. Only he's a little worried. 
Standing next to him is Jin Wu, who seems uncomfortable with the guy's appearance, asking him what he's wearing on his head and if it's all serious. Jin Ho says why doesn't he take that helmet for safety, to which Jin Wu sighs and agrees with him while a heated conversation between the teens goes on behind their backs. One of the men sips his cigarette and wonders aloud what's the point of them going to such a low-ranking dungeon when they are so strong. What if they both die? One of the other teens says he knows about Sung Jin Wu, who has E-rank, and yes, he has an alias of Weakest Hunter, someone his name sounds familiar to. Another man smokes a cigarette and exclaims that it's as if these guys are just poncing around, thinking that such young men will only hurt others. While the gathered people are heatedly discussing someone else's departure, Jin Ho suddenly appears running on the other side, holding onto his backpack with all his might. The guy makes it to safety, bends in half as he's a bit exhausted, and the others exclaim that they've managed to escape and what happy news that is. Some people decide to take a look at where the two men ran from as one of the men loudly exclaims that they didn't run away, it's worth it just to look ahead. The man says in a disbelieving voice as the gate closes, a bluish light and gradual flashes of bright lightning appearing around it, announcing successful completion. The people around them disbelievingly exclaim that did they really straighten out the boss, while Jin Wu asks Jin Ho where their next target is. Jin Ho only seems to charge harder as the people around him open their mouths in surprise. He exclaims that they have about three dungeons to mop up. The guy goes on to say that he hopes everyone there will do their best for the three million, while the rest of us shockedly think about our own. Everyone is pondering over the fact that whether these two are on a raid right after this dungeon, yes, who are they, without expending their strength at all. The location changes to the White Tiger Guild, from where a voice comes from one building, recalling a sir that seems to be in a great hurry to go about his business. One of the guys exclaims that did someone really spend that much money to get the rights to sweep all the C-rank gates? Another man says that when he was trying to get up to a hundred million, someone so influential bought the whole thing for two hundred million. The man tries to find out more about this man, learning that he's Yu Jin Ho, who seems to be buying up gates thanks to the company's support. The man turns to Kichul, reflecting on the fact that there was a man named Jin Wu there, that he was the survivor of an incident about two months ago. The man picks his head up with the palm of his hand, gazing somewhere off to the side, pondering what it seems to smell like to him as a great opportunity. A loud commotion starts in the office. One of the people in charge reports for the workers to find more information about Jin Ho and Jin Wu as much as they can. The man stands at the working screen, scrolling through his head, wondering if Jin Wu has gotten away dry in the last three incidents. The first was a two-level dungeon, and the second was the death of Huang Dong Xiaok's group. The third is the murder of the surveillance department warden. He ponders that it was in the second incident that the two met each other. But the main thing is Jin Ho's connection to his company. He recalls that there's a rumor about recruiting experienced workers for Yu Meng Han in order to start a guild. But since it's true, all of Jin Ho's actions seem understandable to him. All of his thoughts slowly begin to form into a cohesive puzzle, putting together some sort of benefit and thoughts that all of these moments are connected. The man, after a few minutes of his musings, seems to draw the final conclusion that Jin Wu may be an awakened one. He doesn't seem to believe his own thoughts, trying to figure out if he's mistaken about anything, but all his guesses remain that Jin Wu is the awakened one. Another person confirms someone else's thoughts, because how else can one survive three incidents? And there simply can be no other options. The man is talking about one report with different ranks, which is not possible at all. He assumes someone else has dealt with the department hunter. The man lists all the people who survived the global incident, and he seems to suspect only one person. One of the listeners digests the information they've heard, but afterward calls off Chief An Sang Min asking about where they're going now. Chief An Sang Min, holding his bag with one hand that encircles his left shoulder, edges his eyes at the other and states that they are going on a reconnaissance mission. The man in the business suit stiffens with some shock, not believing that the chief himself is about to go on some kind of reconnaissance mission, which is very rare. Around the barely lit cave, three wolf-like monsters gathered in a somewhat circle, clanking their sharp teeth and opening their jaws. One of the huge werewolves seems to shake a bit at the atmosphere around them, sensing great danger and that they seem to be in some sort of trap. If you gaze into some distance through the dust that envelops someone's body near the monsters, you can spot Jin Wu, who appears suddenly. The three monsters don't seem to know where to go now. They are surrounded by something dangerous and very strong. Even some smoke is starting to gradually submerge this place. Some fraction of a second passes, and in between these monsters, Jin Wu appears in his greatest form. He instantly massacres the monsters. Jin Ho, who is watching from the side and holding a pickaxe in his hand, admiringly ponders that this is the skill that Jin Wu has been hiding all this time. 
Once the mission has finally ended successfully, Jin Wu exhales tiredly, able to relax a bit while Jin Ho thinks he's gotten noticeably stronger. The boy reflects on his own, that he's leveled up a few levels and even gotten some fun skills that he doesn't seem like he'll ever really need. The boy drinks a mana potion. He ponders a rune that is quite strong and has various significant effects, but needs to consume a lot of mana. The boy stands in the same spot as he notices an angry wolf running in his direction, and he thinks he didn't mean to invest in intelligence. The werewolf is approaching at great speed, already very close, clearly confident in his actions and in handling his target. In that same instant before the wolf can get to its target, three huge holes appear in its body, knocking the werewolf out of any strength. The boy watches his creation from the sidelines, clearly pleased with what he has just done, noticing the fact that his level has been raised. The boy stands in the middle of the dungeon, having dealt with all his opponents, as he receives an alert about the necessary level gained. At the same instant, another quest notification arrives with the availability of the job change quest. After a while, an alert comes in about whether this quest is an example of Jin Wu, without giving any details. The boy ponders the alerts he just received, wondering aloud what other job change was in store. After a while, closer to the dungeon itself, the two investigating people also approach, not realizing what's going on here. The place is filled with people minding their own business, and there is a portal behind them while the guys think it's a playground. The man speaks aloud, seemingly addressing the others as to what is going on here and why they are sitting near the gate. Suddenly, the very intrepid girl appears, stating that this is a forbidden area and who they are while the man wonders who the child is. He immediately responds to her, telling her not to disturb the adults at work, and the other picks up on someone else's words, saying it's dangerous here. The girl immediately replies that she's also a hunter, and could they take her for a child, and the guys don't quite believe it and ask again if she's a member of this team. The girl's gaze changes to a cold-blooded one, and she replies briefly that yes, while in her thoughts she ponders whether she has ruined anything with her words. The man at the same moment thinks that Jin Wu with Jin Ho has already entered the dungeon. He thinks that this hunter is special and a great recruit. One of the men talks about the leader returning, alerting everyone and getting everyone to gather as quickly as possible. The boy talks to Jin Ho, asking him about tomorrow's plans, saying he can't go to the dungeon because of important business. Jin Ho talks about how he's already had time to book some dungeons for tomorrow, but if it's so important, he can cancel them. Jin Ho goes on to say that if any gates are reserved but he doesn't enter them for two days, they are automatically rejected. To such information, Jin Wu says, then let them better keep them reserved. But someone catches the hunter's attention. The chief of the White Tiger Guild's second management department of the White Tiger Guild came into the stranger's field of vision, introducing himself to the hunter who stood in front of him. The boy looks at the stranger's hand which is holding out some kind of paper, while he interjects about the White Tiger Guild. The man lists the different guilds and says that Jin Wu obviously knows about this one, and the man agrees because this guild is one of the best in South Korea. The boy and the man move to the same building. The chief himself starts one topic, stating that he will explain some situation. A man in business form states that he wants to recruit him into this guild, offering an amount twice as much as Yu Jin's company. The man ponders in his thoughts that there is no point in wasting time says that if someone else's skills are good, the price might go up. The boy doesn't react to such an emotion in any way. The man ponders the fact that it's a great offer for a hunter who was with Erang. The boy doesn't languish for long, asking about how much the White Tiger Guild building is worth since they are offering him such an offer. The man seems taken aback by such a counter-question, asking for forgiveness and ostensibly interjecting if he understood it that way. He doesn't make him wait long to answer the question, stating that they don't use all the floors, but the value is about five billion, to which the hunter states whether they want to give this building to him. The man seems to be getting visibly nervous, glaring that he doesn't quite get the gist of what Jin Wu said just now. The man shrieks about three billion after a while, getting up from his seat and holding his hands on either side of the table. Because of such a loud shriek, even the people sitting near their table look around in surprise, not understanding why such a sound. The boy says that Yu Jin's offer was for a three billion building, so as he thinks that, then this guild is offering him a building twice as expensive. The man ponders how strong this boy is. Maybe he's just bluffing since no one can test him. The boy says that if they don't believe him, he can prove it. But in the meantime, he scrolls through his thoughts that maybe this chief knows about their relationship with Jin Ho, but was mistaken. The man is already mentally panicking that Jin Wu isn't bluffing, saying that such a large sum is beyond his capabilities, but he needs to discuss. The boy doesn't make you wait long for his reaction. He stands up pushing back his chair, and says that's when they're done. The man clenches his jaw, 
thinking about the fact that if he hadn't rushed in, learned the details of someone else's deal, none of this would have happened. But he is pulled out of other people's thoughts by the boy who has turned his back to the chief, drawing attention to himself with his, by the way. The boy turns his head toward the man, asking bluntly about where he was able to get information on him. There's no way the boy is shy about asking such questions right to this man's face, asking if he's looked into his past, making the chief wince. The man doesn't seem to know what to answer to such counter questions. He feels drops of cold sweat start to run down his face. At one point, the boy disappears, and the man fearfully thinks he is using a disguise, hearing words behind him about not turning around. The man now realizes why Yu Jin made such a suggestion. He begins to confess that he didn't do any investigation on purpose. The man continues to speak, giving an example about three global incidents confirming someone else's abilities as a highly ranked hunter. The man talks about maybe Jin Ho seeing Jin Wu's skills during the second raid, and the boy bluntly asks how many people know about him now. The man honestly says that only he and his subordinate know about him, who is now eating lunch and thinking about his boss and what he is doing right now. The boy thinks he revealed himself because of his high gate sweep rate, says he wouldn't want many people to know about him. The boy asks that if a rumor about him gets out, can he consider the chief himself and his subordinate? The chief is slightly nervous and covers his eyes, saying he's obligated to report this to the guildmaster, but he doesn't quite want to die so early. The man continues, saying he will correctly convey this to his subordinate, only to be heard thanking him in return. The boy continues that due to clearing a large number of dungeons, they have hindered the White Tiger Guild, but they won't stop. The man looks at him slightly nervously, continuing that dungeons are fewer and fewer, and newcomers need to be trained somehow. The boy looks at the chief confidently, and afterward offers some kind of deal that will apparently fix this whole situation. The man doesn't quite understand what the guy is getting at, what he exactly wants to hear from him, and he interrogates, wondering. The boy wants to sell them the three gates they have reserved, so this offer is for today only, and others will have a hard time finding such gates. The man ponders that the one is quite cunning, and it will be difficult to train newcomers, so he just agrees and asks the price. The boy, without ceremony, states that he wishes to receive 300 million won for each gate, causing the other to be shocked. The man is already starting to panic at this price. He says that it is beyond the capabilities of their guild and offers a maximum of 200 million. The kid doesn't seem like he's going to fight over the goal he's set and just settles for 200 million. The man extends his hand for a handshake, nervously asks if they have a deal, and Jin Wu says he's expecting 600 million won in his account. The boy seems to recall some sort of gift, forcing the man to open his mouth to pour the red liquid into it. The man watches in shock as the wounds on his own face instantly heal and leave nothing behind, surprised more. The man asks that if the man shows his aiming skills, can Jin Wu be considered to trust him? To which the man asks him to keep his secret. The boy leaves the building and the man still remains seated at the same desk until a stunned subordinate runs up to him. A subordinate nervously runs up to him and asks him what the glow was on the other man's face and if they got a deal. The man continues to come to his senses after talking to him, stating that they seem to have met an even more terrifying individual than they thought. The boy raises the phone receiver to his ear to notify the caller that 600 million won has successfully arrived in his account. The man on the other side of the phone asks who he managed to sell the cancelled gate to, to which the man replies that it's a trade secret. There is some shouting coming from the second manager's office. There is noise and commotion. Something seems to have gone wrong. The chief seems shocked to hear the news from a subordinate that the C-rank gate is still left in their territory. A subordinate holds out his phone to the chief saying the price at the gate is no more than 10 million, and the chief doesn't believe what he sees. The subordinate himself nervously reports that Yu Jinho's team has not booked any gates for today. The chief is shaking. He's in shock that they've been duped, made to pay for something that isn't there at all. And yes, he just failed the recon. The man reflects on the fact that he did it without even fearing that the chief might reveal someone else's identity, but then someone calls. An unknown number sends a new message. It's from Jin Wu, and it says it's compensation for them digging into his past. The man exhales, realizing that this is what Jin Wu had been counting on all along, realizing just how badass the hunter is at what he does. The man surprisingly calmed down, saying that even in this way, but was able to get Jin Wu's number, so one must be content with what one has. The man says that the money spent is not that much for the White Tiger Guild, but he might have problems with his superiors. A boy dressed in a sports uniform stands, kneading his hands, and afterwards says aloud that he is about to start something. After his words, a purple glow appeared in front of him, dazzling everything around him with brightness and adding a powerful atmosphere around him. 
The boy's hair is slightly tangled and up. He's vocalizing about changing jobs, which he thinks sounds pretty good. A large purple glow appears in front of his body, as if beckoning him to go inside while he wonders what kind of monsters are in there. The glow gradually changes in different colors, becoming brighter and darker, attracting one's attention while one thinks that finally this game, finally this game becomes real for the boy. He gets inside the gate and then those disappear from sight, leaving darkness. Some monster in large and heavy armor swings his sword, fighting the boy as best he can. Strangely enough, the boy is much stronger than this monster and tackles it with great speed, getting rid of his enemy. The boy uses his critical strike, which wastes his mana and is only used for his dagger, to slay his enemy as quickly as possible. The boy barely recoils from the strong glow that rolls over this monster in a large stream, causing him to be knocked off his feet. Much to the boy's surprise, he notices that his attacks do no damage, watching as the monster calmly endures the magic. The boy reflects on the fact that this monster isn't that strong. Only his armor is strong enough, so he's still alive. The boy analyzes the fact that there is no unpredictability in other people's movements, and there is no great force in their attacks that would knock Jin Wu down. The monster aims his sword somewhere but doesn't hit, and the boy's shadow moves behind quickly, scoping out different places for this monster to attack. The boy recalls his past battle, in which his blade could not defeat the sturdy armor of his opponent. The boy, thanks to his great speed, grabbed the stranger's head and ripped it to shreds, leaving no chance to move. The boy says it's a puppet-type monster, but it's no use in long battles, as if it doesn't even count as a monster. Due to the boy using a torch for lighting instead of a fluorescent rock, the place is quite dark. The boy realizes that he cannot spend a lot of mana here, because to get out of here you need to clean up the entire dungeon, leaving nothing. The boy realizes that if he had foreseen this whole situation, he would have put more points into intelligence so that he wouldn't have had such shortcomings with his powers. This career change quest is dangerous enough. He realizes that the boy has no way to heal, and it looks like he may be here to stay for a long time. The boy tries to remember if he has done his daily quest, which usually takes over 12 hours and is quite tedious. The boy realizes he needs to get everything over with quickly so he can start his daily quest, thinking centipedes will be next. But at first, looking ahead, where big bulky armor appears in someone else's path, there seems to be only one thing left for him to do. The boy says that he needs to take care of these monsters that take care of their strong defenses before going forward. The boy, trying not to waste much time thinking, leans in as if aiming for one of his targets ahead. His palm turns into a fist that gains some strength that even strong currents of air appear around his hand. The boy, aiming at his target, hits right on the armor of one of the monsters causing it to fly in the air for a moment. The stranger's speed is so great that he, unable to get his feet on the ground, drags another monster behind him. Out of the four monsters, two of them flew off a great distance, a certain strong stream of air surrounding them, thanks to the strength of the boy's fist. Without wasting a second of precious time, the boy transforms into a kind of shadow, pushing himself off the ground to fly high in the air. Just as he calculates on his big jump trajectory, the boy hits one knee right on one of the monster's heads, disposing of it. In the same instant, the boy moves on to the other monster that flew off, his strong grip holding the alien's head and pressing harder. All of the stranger's power accumulated in that grip to get rid of his opponent once and for all, squeezing the stranger's head with all of his strength. In the same instant, the stranger's head flies off, still between the shoulder and elbow of the boy, who puts all his effort into it. The boy realizes that if he can't deal with them with a dagger, he just has to hit where the monster's bones are. The boy examines the armor lying on the ground, realizing that some even had something fallen off of them, and things are decent enough. The boy is amused, saying that it's good that no one can see this thing because outwardly it's funny, but will it protect Jin Wu? The boy finds a bag of gold, roughly calculating that it contains about 30,000 gold coins. At some point, the boy realizes that someone is right next to him, so he reacts with instantaneous speed, seemingly barely making it. His dagger accurately hits the head of one of the monsters, asking in his thoughts that was this monster with a disguise. This does not encourage the boy. He is a little tense because the task is already not easy, and then there are monsters with disguises. The boy sees some sort of mage in front of him, realizing that this time it is this monster with a disguise that uses firepower. The boy has no way of knowing what is going on in this place. This magician is using disguise with his magic, just like Zhou Gyu Huan. The boy scrolls through his thoughts that everything looks as if this situation is like his past battle, as if it's happening again. The room is filled with a large number of monsters, with a wide variety of skills and abilities, many of them dangerous to the boy. Jin Wu realizes that this place is much more complicated than he ever imagined. 
given that there are many different types of monsters with their own characteristics. The boy realizes that if he takes points off his strength, he won't be able to break the armor of the knights, and if his instincts are low, he'll have trouble with assassins. The boy needs to save as much mana as possible, as much as he can, and he needs to stop taking opportunities, because fatigue is increasing. The boy turns away from the chaos going on behind his back. Everything is just going his way, preventing the boy from gaining any strength for energy. The boy is gradually sweating, his breathing even beginning to hitch, for the longer he is here the worse the situation becomes for him. The boy settles down on the cold floor, bending slightly in his body, realizing he needs to close his eyes briefly to reduce his fatigue. Just as the boy is about to relax, he grabs a sharpened arrow from somewhere, realizing that rest is off. In front of the boy stands a large number of archers, who are dressed in their strong armor, clearly intent on massacring the boy. The boy clutches the arrow in his hand with anger, bending it in half, and afterward is annoyed at not being given even a chance for some rest. The boy, wasting no time, opens the leather pouch to get a flask of fresh water and 20,000 gold coins, which might do something to help. The boy analyzes that he has gotten over his fatigue a bit, and has collected many different items that should help him in this battle. The boy stands in an empty room, saying that even after being so pumped, he still won't understand one thing. He can't understand the level of the thing behind that golden and high door that hides something interesting and powerful. The boy, wasting no time, presses his hand on the door, which gradually opens, and realizes it's the boss's room inside. Such a strong flow of wind makes someone else's hair develop and his clothes slightly pull back. This shivering makes even his spirit tremble. The boy looks around the room in front of him, analyzing the place, realizing that it seems to be a throne room, what with no one inside yet. The boy steps a little further into this room, realizes how strong and terrifying the aura around here is, which can't help but be bad. The boy is trying to understand his body and what he feels now. His ears, eyes, fingertips all react to this place. The boy stares intently somewhere ahead of himself, seeming to recall something, as if he had felt similar once before. These feelings seem to remind him of the very place in the two-level dungeon that he remembered for quite some time. The boy notices a strong opponent in front of him with a red uniform and a terrifying aura. He feels that same bone-chilling feeling. The boy stares intently and studiously, seeming to realize that this energy is coming from this particular guy. This guy is a bloody warlord of Igris, his eyes glowing with white light, his face can't be seen by ordinary eyes, everything is carefully hidden. The boy clenches his jaws, realizing that the dark red title is definitely, definitely, definitely different from all the others here. The boy realizes that in front of him stands exactly the knight who protects the empty throne, getting rid of ill-wishers with all his might. The boy can't help but notice that this knight is purposefully walking specifically towards him, making him tense up. The blood knight doesn't waste a moment of his time, swinging his huge weapon as if trying to get rid of it as quickly as possible. As soon as the knight swings, the boy reacts instantly, settling back down to the floor just to avoid ending up lying in pieces on the floor. This kind of impact was so strong that even rocks began to fly out from the dungeon itself, causing the ground to tremble violently. The boy compares the pillars to the tofu that the blood knight had cut so easily, realizing that the one was very even strong. The boy, not wasting a second of his time, tries to try and do some damage on the blood knight's armor. Surprisingly enough, the blade failed to inflict any kind of cut on this bloody knight, only leaving behind a gilded mark. The boy is slightly distracted by the fact that the knight is a pretty fast and cunning guy, so his weapon is already bent over the stranger's body. The boy barely has time to react to the stranger's attack, flying away with his strong jump far away, shaking the ground beneath his feet. In the darkness of this dungeon, some yellowish glow can be seen far ahead as if attracting attention. The boy realizes that this battle is going to be very long and hard for him. He clenches his jaws and tries to focus. The boy dodges other people's huge weapons using his skills, which he only has to get rid of the enemy. He takes advantage of the large wind flow settling to the ground for a while while the blood knight stands with his back turned away from the boy, as if to look for him. The boy clenches his jaws, trying to figure out what he should do, realizing that armor restrains movement if you have less than 80 strength. And this guy is clearly over 80. His strength far exceeds that of the boy, even his agility is better. The boy had no idea that the knight would turn out to be so strong. He thought he couldn't defeat him without a weapon. But the boy has another option. He begins to knead his hands, seemingly preparing himself for the intended version of his actions. The knight is watching the boy from the side, as if he finds the situation amusing, as some kid decides to straighten out the knight. The knight seems to treat him as a worthy opponent. He decides to place his weapon nearby for the time being. The blood knight, like the boy himself, begins to prepare for the upcoming battle, 
pulling off his red robe. Thanks to the sharp ends, he can anchor it directly into the rocky ground, deciding that this seems to ease his burden during the battle itself. The Blood Knight appears before the boy in his red armor, looking at him intently, as if to show that he is ready for battle. The boy only seems to get more annoyed at such gestures, taking it as the knight not taking him seriously. At the same time, the Blood Knight, without wasting a second of his time, accelerates at high speed towards the boy, heading towards him. It happens so quickly and unexpectedly for the boy that the knight, before he can react, pushes forward with force. The boy doesn't have time to move. He's like some kind of puppet watching the knight grab him by the collar of his jacket. The Blood Knight, grabbing his target, pushes the boy with great speed straight into the wall behind Jin Wu. The boy seems barely able to move his limbs. He's dazedly trying to realize what just happened. The boy barely reacts in time to cross his arms at his chest, getting hit hard by the bloody knight, which continues the attack. The blood knight doesn't seem to have time to react either, when at that moment the boy simply disappeared from sight, his fist hitting the wall directly. The alien blow is so strong that the stone wall has completely collapsed, and stones are flying in different directions of this throne room. The boy gritted his teeth, feeling unbearable pain, realizing that although he had endured the blow, he had lost about 500 XP, even with body armor. The boy realizes that he can easily lose if he keeps taking blows like this, because the knight is incredibly strong. The boy watches the bloody knight, not realizing how he even needs to fight this monster. But his eagerness in no way leaving his body, the boy breaks into a run, thinking his speed will have to help. The boy activates his sprint skill. His speed increases by 30%, Jin Wu moving very fast. The boy, trying to confuse the bloody knight with his movements, suddenly appears and slams his fist into the other man's armor. The blood knight reacts instantly, aiming his elbow right at the boy's head, about to hit it with force. The boy barely has time to react and covers his head with his free hand, clenching his jaw and trying to hold on. The boy, with all his effort, pushes the other man's hand away from his head, which he's pretty good at doing. At the same instant, there is a quick attack with his hands, the boy trying to hit the blood knight with great speed. The boy's blows follow other blows. He builds strength in them to make the bloody knight stagger. The boy, engrossed in his swift attack, isn't quite paying attention to what's going on around himself. At the same instant, the blood knight swings and hits with great force right on the boy's head, causing him to recoil. The boy's head turns the other way from the blow itself. His health is greatly reduced, so the resilience skill is activated. The boy cheerfully points out that if his defense is increased due to a passive skill, he still has a chance. The distraction is quite cunning. The blood knight deftly grabbing the boy's leg with his strong grip. The knight, not wasting a second of his time, swung with all his might towards the other man's leg, about to straighten the boy out. At the same instant, there is a big bang with a strong flow of wind at the guy's battleground, causing the ground beneath them to crumble. There even seems to be some kind of stream of smoke emanating from the boy's body, blood gradually flowing out from his mouth, knocking him out of his strength. The boy settles right on the throne of the bloody knight. He can barely move, for he has received a very strong blow. The boy bends down, unable to move in the other direction away from the bloody knight who has already approached him, which doesn't take long to see. The blood knight extends his arm to the other side, and at the same moment, his leftover sword flies to him in a golden stream. A huge weapon becomes near the bloody knight. He immediately grabs it with his hand to accomplish the intended deed. And now comes the long-awaited moment for the Bloody Knight. He swings in with great speed to kill the boy. The atmosphere is heated around this dungeon, and the air is mixed with some dirt and rocks. But the boy has no intention of leaving this world so soon. He grips the sword with his fingers, looking confident and hateful. The boy took such a strong blow from the Bloody Knight that the air and various puffs of smoke flew around. The boy starts his magic power with his free hand, gathering it as best he can, for his strength is gradually running out. The boy clenches his jaws and squeezes out one word at a time gradually, for it is very difficult to do everything at once. A stranger's dagger appears in the boy's hand, which he tried to draw to himself as it suddenly goes straight into one of the bloody knight's eyes. The blood knight reacts instantly, his head rising up, still holding that boy's dagger inside. But it's not over yet. The boy doesn't let the blood knight wake up, not giving the moment to attack, so he clutches at the other man's body with all his might. The boy presses the bloody knight into the opposite stone wall, begins to press into it with tremendous power. The boy stumbled back at the last moment to grab his dagger, lest he leave such a precious item for someone else. The boy's gaze is cold-blooded and confident, thinking about the fact that he won't give this object to anyone. The boy watches other people's attempts to summon their own weapons, but Jin Wu doesn't allow it. He extends his arm out to the side again, realizing he can summon his dagger back, trying to do so as quickly as possible. In the same instant, the boy swung with tremendous force, hitting right at the Blood Knight's throat, starting to use the power. 
The boy's gaze is confident and waiting for that long-awaited moment, trying to do everything clearly and quickly. The boy uses his critical strike, causing the Blood Knight to simply hang from such a relentless blow to his body. The boy doesn't hide his emotions, screaming from their overabundance, putting all his great effort into one result. The boy looks straight into the eyes of the Bloody Knight, from which some smoke is already emanating, his dagger helping to finish off the enemy. In the final result, the Bloody Knight settles to the floor, unable to counter such an attack in any way. The boy is breathing tiredly, he's pretty exhausted from all the intense fighting that's taking its toll. It seems that after a while, some white liquid starts flowing out of the Bloody Knight right down his chin. Some sort of white puddle gradually appears. Around the Blood Knight itself is a small stream of wind surrounding it. The boy can't recover his breath. He tries to catch his breath and asks disbelievingly that could he really win. The boy clutched his hands in his lap, realizing that he was close to his death, for he was no better at anything than the knight himself. The boy realizes that this victory is pure luck for himself. Had he made a mistake, he would be lying dead on this earth. After some time of contemplation, the boy exclaims in surprise that interesting objects have begun to emerge from the bloody night. The boy even begins to sing along while holding some four items in his hands, realizing that this is an incredible reward for him in this place. The boy uses the leather sack, receiving a million and five hundred thousand gold. Jin Wu's gold has doubled from what it was before. The boy is shocked to notice the S-rank item he received, which is a red knight helmet and a great item in battle. The characteristics of the red knight helmet are incredible. It gives so many useful skills that Jin Wu needs so badly. The boy holds an orange rune stone with a touch of ruler in his hand, and he also has something else interesting. And that interesting thing is a green rune stone that grants some sort of return that it's not quite clear what it's for yet Jin Wu. Boy, after analyzing all the bonuses he received for defeating the throne room boss, he realizes that there seems to be more to it. His attention is drawn to a magical portal that has appeared from somewhere, which seems to prove that things are not as simple as they should be here. The atmosphere instantly changes to a somber one. The boy tenses up, waiting to see what will happen next in this very portal. The boy's gaze changes to a strained one as he exclaims that he knew it was impossible that things could be so easy in this dungeon. The boy notices that something dangerous and scary will soon be fighting alongside him. It seems to be monsters too, but thankfully not like this powerful boss. The boy lifts his head up and realizes that there are some glasses above him that seem to indicate the longer he stays here. The boy, looking around him, notices that someone has come out of that portal after all, standing with his feet on the cold ground. Another huge monster appears in front of the boy, from which some moments with the current, only the monster is not one, but several. The boy is confidently backing himself that he can overcome these guys even in his current state, which is a very good thing. The boy ponders that if these monsters were of the same level as Igris, it would be impossible for him to defeat them at all. The boy ponders how long the timer above will go but it is an appropriate condition for this career change quest. The boy realizes that he doesn't have much mana left, but he stays on the plus side well enough even if he uses his disguise. The boy continues that for every second of cloaking, exactly one mana is spent. So he will only have three minutes to cloak. The boy happily realizes that he still has plenty of health and mana, so he will try to hang on as long as possible. A wizard appears from somewhere and uses his pretty good skill, thanks to which he can detect the boy's presence. The mage uses his strong skill, which helps him stay alert and not get killed by an enemy's strike, to figure out his location. There seems to be some sort of orb with an eye in the air that easily detects Jin Wu's presence, even if he uses his power in the form of a disguise. The boy is tense and angry at the same time that he's being noticed by the mage despite his disguise, which is unexpected enough for Jin Wu. At the same instant, the knights in the room turn their attention to the boy, spotting him in space. As soon as there is any chance for the knights to spot the boy amidst the emptiness in the room, they try to make their shot. At the same instant, the boy himself appears, that being even with his back to these monsters, massacres them with his great skills. The boy's strength is so strong and pumped up that Jin Wu, using his skills, causes the two monsters to fly off a great distance. The boy turns in the direction where those two monsters should have gone, and his gaze changes, activating the bloodlust skill. The boy using this powerful skill causes monsters to lose 50% of their characteristics, which already affects them instantly. The boy realizes that the bloodlust ability consumes 100 mana units, so he only has one chance for this instance. The boy loudly proclaims that he has to deal with the most number of opponents in one minute, starting to deal with them. A huge number of monsters surround the boy on all sides, but he does his best to make more than half of these foes disappear from here. Much to their surprise, but these monsters... Realizing that they couldn't cope with such a strong opponent, 
ran towards the open gate in a huge crowd. The boy's health is greatly reduced to a thousand, he growls, realizing that this case isn't that easy. A minute is too short for such a crowd. The boy realizes that these monsters are coming out of those gates much faster than he himself can deal with them. They are not as stupid as they seem. The boy gets an alert that his passive fortitude has been activated, which he must use on his opponents. The boy realizes that he has been irresponsible by spending too much mana on disguise. So because of this, he is unlikely to be able to use other skills. It's hard enough for the boy to cope against this crowd. He thinks about the return stone. But does he even need to use it now, although the difficulty is high? The boy remembers about the Stone of Return, realizes that if he uses it, it will mean that Jin Wu has failed this quest. The boy's gaze moves to the overhead clock that tells the time, but he is shocked by something, it seems, even very unpleasantly shocked. It turns out it's only been about five minutes, but there are so many attackers that it's just hard for the boy to cope alone against them. The boy pulls out the Green Stone of Return, realizing that he has no other choice if he wants to stay alive, so he'll have to use it. The boy seems oblivious to what's going on around him that a weapon from one of the monsters that picked up a good moment is already flying towards him. At the same instant, with great force, the boy flies this blow right into his forearm. Yes, with such force that streams of wind envelop the stranger's body around him. The boy, unable to find the strength to keep his feet on the ground after such a blow, falls on top of her, holding on to the sight of the hard blow. All the monsters surrounding the boy suddenly froze as if they were expecting to see the further body movements of Jin Wu, who was lying down for now. After a moment, a huge stream of air appears as if some titan has risen, and it's just Jin Wu gathering his strength. The boy bends slightly in his body, his clothes visibly frayed and tattered, but this in no way prevents him from continuing his plan, seemingly oblivious to the stone of return. The boy's gaze changes to an angry one, the kind that cannot tolerate defeat, so he proves to himself that he is obligated to finish this quest without defeat. The boy takes the opportune moment to fold his palm into a fist and gather his strength, saying what a great chance this is for one thing. The boy recalls that because he was at rock bottom, he always longed to be at the very top, jumping as high as he could. The boy knows the sadness of what it feels like to be the weakest. He remembers other people's words about his rank, what help he would even be able to give them. The boy remembers what was said about him, is he the one who hides behind a comrade's back? The one who can't kill a single monster only angers him more. A couple seconds after a high jump, the boy lands on the ground, hitting right into one of the monsters already on the ground. The boy hears words about his nickname of the weakest hunter. Everyone is talking about Jin Wu being the weakest S-ranked hunter. One of the men listens to the other and seriously can't believe that Sun is a naysayer. What is it about him that makes him so weak? Another man says that if Jin Wu comes, their dungeon instantly becomes light wary that someone might hear them. The boy does not hold back his tears. Hearing the words of supportive people that he should rest, he is asked to sit down for a while. The boy hears someone's voice saying that, isn't it his fault for trying to play with his death at every opportunity? The boy turns toward the booming voice, listening to see if it isn't a miracle that an E-ranked hunter rises to such a level. The boy gazes at whoever is standing in front of him, and it turns out to be a full copy of him, but at a young age, talking about his past. The boy is visibly shocked, He's sweating a little from overwhelming nerves, interjecting that he doesn't think he's himself. Little Jin Wu says he can't believe he is the boy he is now, that he has matured so much, looking like a muscular and strong guy. Little Jin Wu, though he lists the boy's good looks, continues that it's just a fake. He's just a wimp. Little Jin Wu asks what makes him different from the boy, is that he finds himself in the same situation where he is once again on the cusp of life and death. The boy listens to the voice of his child version as he suddenly pushes the monster swooping down on the relaxed boy causing him to recoil. Little Jin Wu says that eventually, if he doesn't control himself, his attitude will ruin himself. The boy, finding no words for the other's advice, only changes his gaze to an annoyed one, glaring that little Jin Wu shut up. In an unexpected moment, a huge hand in strong armor appears from somewhere behind him, causing the boy to stagger back. The boy's look changes to one of surprise. There was no way he expected that he could be caught in some weakness when he was distracted by the other Jin Wu. Before the boy appears a huge monster in armor that towers with its body, showing all its power in front of him. After a few couple seconds, the first attack from the monster occurs, which clearly hits right into the boy's body, forcing him to go the other way. The boy does not expect such a fast and strong attack. He tries to dodge, but the monster grabs him without giving him a chance to run away. After a moment, the monster's large fist flies straight into the boy's back, causing him to lose his balance and collide face first with the ground. The boy's gaze changes to shocked. There is no way he would expect such a thing from some knight, 
After all, there was no such aggressive person here. The knight in large armor continues to press the boy's body into the already shattered stone floor while the other monsters watch. Among this crowd of other knights, a small version of Jin Wu says that the boy has a lot to go through if he's not willing to give up. He continues that the one will have to straighten out even more people, leave them in trouble or sacrifice them. This even includes his family and friends. Little Jin Wu gets the kid with his words about driving himself into a grave alive by continuing to do everything. At the same instant, one of the huge knights swings his weapon to deal with this boy once and for all. The boy lifts his eyes upward, feeling the same sensation that he once did. He just can't remember it. What happened then after that? The smaller version of Jin Wu says that luck is also a skill. It seems that leaving him here to die is too great a loss for luck itself. Little Jin Wu seems to finish his speech, daring to leave the boy alone amidst this cluster of angry knights in armor. The boy can no longer move or somehow resist this fate. The huge monster is swinging his weapon, but there are zero seconds left. The huge knight stabs his weapon straight into the ground. Should have ended the boy once and for all, but the other is moved into the penalty area. The knight does not understand because just before he was a weakened and half-alive boy, something broke and went out of control. The huge knight watches as he hits the stone floor instead of the slain boy, shattering it slightly with his power. The boy opens his eyes in fear as if this was some kind of scary dream that would end with dire results. The boy lifts himself up in his body to look at what surrounds him around him, and it seems to be some kind of desert. The boy can afford to exhale and even take a breather for a while, questioning if this is really the penalty area. The boy's mind flashes back to the last fragments of his life spent in the very dungeon where he almost left this world. The boy analyzes that if you really think about it, he never did his daily quest, so time ran out on it, which saved him. The boy marvels at what a cool coincidence it is that he was able to survive in such a dangerous situation thanks to such a thing. The boy remembers that very nervous moment in the throne room where he had his own timer, where the more he stood in that spot, the more points he would get. The boy realizes that the quest was so difficult that he could only hope for some luck. Or maybe he was so encouraged that he got more points. The boy ponders in his head whether it's luck or maybe coincidence itself in all its glory. You can call it whatever you want so he keeps heading in the direction of the store. The boy recalls that his fatigue has risen above 90 for the first time, so he wishes to buy some cool earth for that. The boy uses the potion, realizing that it doesn't add to his health in any way, so he'll have to wait a while for it to regenerate. The boy is thinking about the profession change quest dungeon, but maybe by practicing in the penalty area he can raise the levels here. The boy gets to his feet, rubs his neck, and confidently states that he has never felt so good and better. The boy only wonders if the monsters here will help him raise any level for himself. The boy suddenly says he doesn't need to worry about that, seeming to notice a few monsters somewhere ahead of him, eager for battle. The boy instantly jumps up from his seat, settling right on the head of one of the huge monsters, with his dagger straightening it out. The boy keeps busy pumping himself up, agreeing that if he can survive in this interesting place, the boy receives some notification that he needs to survive in this place for four allotted hours in order to get back. The boy raises his gaze to the side, as if something would distract him from straightening out one of the monsters, thinking anything that doesn't kill them. The girl wakes up and gets out of her bed, saying what a strange dream she just had, trying to come to her senses. The girl decides to look at the wall clock, realizing that it's quite late and the boy still hasn't come yet. Is he really working late? The girl lies back on the bed, covers herself with a blanket and thinks that maybe he's got himself a girlfriend, though she's not sure he can have any. The girl says that she definitely definitely told him about the PTA meeting, so he should definitely come to it today. The girl looks at the ticking wall clock as if to reassure herself, reassessing whether he is definitely coming to this meeting. A notification comes in that the penalty quest is gradually coming to an end. There are only 15 minutes left to stay in this place. The boy tackles monsters in the area with great speed and ease, creating critical hits. A notification arrives that Jin Wu has upgraded his level, which can't help but please the guy standing in the middle of a lot of monsters. The boy realized that he could heal in the penalty area as soon as he increased his level, and thanks to the store he could regenerate other abilities as well. Once again, the quest notification comes back that there are some three minutes left to go back to doing this profession change quest. The boy says that he still has time to prepare. He'll have to do whatever he can do, because the dagger doesn't always help him. The boy thinks about the fact that he will need a stronger weapon than this one, so he decides to look in the pop-up store, searching for the right one. The boy sees some choice of weapons, finding a dagger that can even pierce armor, which is in no way a good thing. The boy realizes that the price of this weapon is quite high, costing about 2,800,000 gold coins, 
but why not? The boy realizes that things will be much different thanks to this weapon. It has a night killer effect that will make life easier. The boy bandages his arm along with the dagger in his hand, thinking that by doing so, he won't lose his weapon like he did with the return stone. The boy finally finishes bandaging his arm, his gaze confident. He is ready for any fight and outcome, for he must try. The boy in his other hand holds an orange rune stone of the ruler's touch, which might give another chance at a tough moment for the kid. The boy recalls that the rune stone he got from Kang Tai Shik helped him learn the skill of disguise, but this time, something will be different. The boy uses the orange rune stone of the ruler's touch. At the same instant, a stream of golden air and some kind of power appears around him. Now the boy can control objects without touching them, that ability that doesn't require mana, it's quite useful. The boy recalls a blood knight who seems to have used similar skills. Perhaps thanks to him, Jin Wu now has such a thing as well. The boy thinks he can't move objects that are too big. He tries it on a rock that doesn't move because the ability level is low. The boy realizes this is his last chance. He thinks it's the most he could have prepared for in those couple of minutes. The boy realizes that it seems he will have to rely on his own luck for the rest, realizing that the penalty quest has been successfully completed. The boy returns to the very place where he almost died because of the large number of knights who seem to have been waiting for his return all along. The boy is surprised to find himself in this place for some four hours of a punishing quest to get back to a place where there are many times more knights. A large number of monsters instantly swoop down on the boy, determined to massacre their target quickly, but who thought Jin Wu had grown up in the meantime? The boy, using his dagger, instantly cut all the knights attacking him like pieces of some kind of meat, his eyes flashing with blue light. The boy appears in his own amazing character. He confidently wields his new weapon, handling these knights with such ease as if he never dreamed such a thing. The boy realizes that the night killer effect is a very useful thing now. It's much better than fighting with bare hands as it was before this weapon. The boy has been massacring the countless knights attacking him for some time now, which doesn't seem to end here at all. The boy senses something amiss with the floor itself. He feels that after dealing with a large number of knights, his level never rose. The boy recalls the penalty area in which he was raising his level. Even Warlord Igris gave him experience, realizing that the healing effect limits experience. The boy realizes that there was no way the mages standing at the back of the battle were attacking him directly, when the knights, as if to distract the boy, were taking all the damage. The boy wonders what kind of magic these mages used, a debuff or another kind of curse, but he still feels nothing. The boy's gaze changes instantly as he begins to think that this might be summoning magic he didn't realize he had. The boy, it seems, begins to understand the whole essence of the gate, because from them after a certain time, knights appear thus increasing their number. The boy realizes that it doesn't matter how many knights he defeats, they still won't give him experience, they're just abnormal monsters since they were summoned. The boy gathers strength in his clenched fist from the anger that overwhelms him, for the summoners were the last to leave this gate. The boy gets to one of the mages, tormenting his body with his magical power and skills, realizing that they are the ones in charge in this battle. After receiving the blow, one of the mages instantly leaves this space, disappearing as dark air, leaving behind nothing useful. Exactly this second. As soon as the mage leaves this life, instantly all the conscripts also independently die one by one. The boy uses his blade throw ability, realizing that the knights have been summoned by wizards through this magical gate. The boy realizes that this isn't the end, and he needs to find the rest of the lurking wizards using disguises. Most mages instantly use the detection ability, trying to find a target of interest in the form of a boy. The boy thinks about the fact that maybe these wizards have found his location. He is already finding these mages who are his main target. But due to the fact that the mages use their abilities, he also found them themselves, their disguise that these wizards are in. The boy watches from the sidelines, realizing that there aren't many mages left, plopping down in the crowd amongst the large number of knights. The boy turns his attention to his newly purchased weapon, which was left embedded in the stone floor as soon as Jin Wu had massacred one mage. The boy uses the first level ruler's touch ability, which requires no mana usage but controls different objects. The boy, without wasting precious time, grabs his weapon with his hand and is about to finish off all the ill-wishers of this dungeon. The boy gets up to one of the mages rather quickly, his weapon very quickly messing up the other's body, disemboweling one of the mages. A notification comes that another mage has been successfully defeated by the hands of the boy. He gradually disappears, dissolving into dark smoke in the air. The boy is confident in his actions. He is serious about winning this dungeon, exclaiming joyfully that there are only four mages left. 
The boy realizes that getting to these wizards isn't easy, as they use their knights to take the blows of Jin Wu on themselves. The boy acts very fast thanks to his new weapon, with it really is much easier to deal with the opponents attacking him. The boy notices again that his weapon is slowly dissolving into thin air, but he uses the ruler's touch ability. The boy pulls his hand towards the disappearing object, as if trying to catch it so that it doesn't vaporize into thin air. Only the boy's outstretched hand ends up at the face of one of the knights, who doesn't even see the stranger's movements beside him. The boy instantly turns his palm into a fist to aim at the other's head to get rid of one opponent. The boy, just as he had intended his blow, performs it with tremendous force, causing the knight to simply break into different pieces. The boy seems energized by everything that is going on. He confidently states that he will chop everyone present into pieces. The boy, just as he had said earlier that he could handle these talentless knights, towers over a bunch of life-shattered monsters. The man stands at the very top of the folded dead knights of this dungeon, but the work is still going on, for there are many of them. Only the boy overlooks one point of his safety, completely oblivious to the fact that he could be attacked from behind, which is what happens when the sword is thrust into him. The boy twitches in such surprise, growling in pain that even the sword breaks apart, remaining chunks in Jin Wu's body. The boy's breathing is confused. He can feel the blood rushing from the wound that is bleeding. He endures the overwhelming pain, but he's not going to back down. The boy cries out furiously about how much longer these wizards will hide behind the backs of the knights, afraid to fight face to face. The man irritatedly finishes his speech, pulls his hand forward, instantly grabbing one of the mages right by the neck, taking out all his anger on him. The boy doesn't make him wait long for someone else's fate, instantly massacring him with his dagger, looking irritated at the sagging body in his grip. The boy happily realizes that there are about three mages left, which he must definitely deal with, and as quickly as possible, because enough time has already passed. At one point, the boy notices a purple glow from beneath the immobilized bodies he had just a couple minutes ago massacred. Standing on top of the monsters spread out by his hands, the boy finds himself on top of some monster that has risen from other people's dead bodies, even a sword in its back. The boy realizes that before him appears a huge monster golem that is far more powerful of the combined knights and mages here. The boy in no way expects such a monster in front of him, instantly jumping off the stranger's back, quickly leaping away from this monster to avoid being attacked. The boy settles to the ground holding the dagger with his bandaged hand and not knowing what he should do for now with such a stone monster here. This golem is quite strong. Its destructive power just easily destroys the stone floor, turning it into some impassable road. The boy instantly falls into his image, his eyes beginning to glow blue, and his speed increasing slightly to dodge. The boy notices the glow next to the mages, realizing that they have decided to replace the number of countless knights with a single destructive force. The boy doesn't seem like he's going to waste his energies on one huge monster, which is clearly going to take a lot of his time and nerves, and take his health as well. Gaining great speed and amazing strength, the boy pulverizes in one blow every standing mage in the distance from the battle site, leaving one enemy behind. The boy, gathering all his strength, finishes this battle with the last mage he disposes of, ending this beating beautifully, thanks to his speed. At the same instant, the huge stone golem begins to collapse right before the boy's eyes. It settles to the ground and crumbles into pieces, some stones. Following the main golem destroying the place fall the knights themselves. That had been such a great inconvenience to the boy all this time. The boy looks at what's going on, exhales relaxedly, and states that if the mages didn't get together in one bunch, it would be hard to deal with the golem. The boy looks at a timer that describes the amount of time spent in this place, and afterward comes a notification that all monsters have been killed. The boy thinks there won't be any more alerts, and afterward notices that he can choose a class based on the number of points he's scored here. The boy clutches his weapon in his hand, realizing that the quest is over and he will get a profession. He is sure he will be given assassin. The boy notices another notice stating that the profession will be issued at the end of the player's analysis, and apparently Jin Wu can't choose for himself. The boy starts to analyze that he has put all his points into strength and agility. He can get a warrior at the expense of strength or an assassin at the expense of agility. He also suggests he might get a tank because of his stamina. Something clearly has to be from the above fighters for Jin Wu. But the boy will be happy with any profession that this quest will give him because it is with a new power that he will be much stronger than he is now. Several notifications come in that wherever the player goes, the Reaper will follow them, and the player's path is full of various corpses and the smell of blood. He's not quite sure what the alerts are about, and the one continues that someone is leaving nothing for his allies to do, coping with their own forces. Perhaps it's a warrior. 
The next alert says that the boy will have an army of the dead that will follow his orders, forcing the whole world to obey his laws. The boy is extremely surprised by what he has just read. He can feel himself starting to gradually get nervous, because this mystery makes him feel shaky. The boy's eyes widen in horror as he notices something ahead of him, asking in disbelief that is this really his profession. The boy realizes the next notice stating that his profession is necromancer, causing him to freeze in a kind of horror at what he reads. The boy opens his mouth in a kind of horror, does not know how he should react to the profession he received, because he did not expect something like this at all. The boy panics in every possible way, seemingly not knowing where to put himself. He has never once delved into intelligence, so why did he fall into this particular profession? The boy's subclass, Necromancer, is a dark mage with an army of undead following his mage on his heels, following all his orders and laws. The boy doesn't know if there are necromancers among the hunters, but in various games, they are the ones who leave most battles to subordinates. The boy recalled that since he had registered in the guild, he was a fighting class, but Jin Wu used weapons all the time. So why this particular class? The boy decides to find some pros to necromancy after all. Perhaps it's good in that he'll be able to create his own army that will follow him. The boy realizes that such subordinates cannot become stronger. Perhaps because of this, his characteristics will simply become useless. At one point, the boy, contemplating what to do in this situation, sees a notice about whether he will accept his class, wondering if he has a choice. The boy mentally hopes he can get some more class if he refuses now, which he does, voicing his words out loud. The boy recalls that all hunters with unique abilities work for large guilds and have a lot of influence. The boy thinks about the fact that perhaps because of his hidden class, he will have a unique ability like other guild hunters. The boy holds his bandaged hand up to his face, realizing that he doesn't have to think too much. You can take a necromancer class at first to give it a try. The boy is still pondering what's going on, looking at the area around him seeming to notice something interesting among the knights and mages lying around. The boy gazes into one of the corpses and seems to realize that these wizards had a similar ability to necromancy. The boy hesitates, thinking about the fact that it's as if someone is trying to show him how to use this ability. Not a bad idea. The boy realizes that he also has combat abilities that mages don't have, but if a mage would be capable of melee combat, you get something interesting. It seems that the boy is beginning to realize that with such abilities, he will be able to mop up a B-rank dungeon, or even higher on his own. The boy realizes that in this game, his abilities depend on characteristics, levels, and abilities, and summoned creatures can become stronger. The boy realizes, and it seems, begins to finally understand that, thanks to such a profession, he will be able to raise the level no longer alone, but with someone. The boy makes a conscious choice, finally making his decision, choosing that he is going to continue to walk side by side with this class. This alert is followed by another, stating that due to the large amount of points, Jin Wu will be able to raise the class to the top level. The room slowly begins to fill with black smoke, alerts coming one after another describing that points have been added and the return stone is unused. The next alert says that Jin Wu's point count has exceeded the limit he's allowed, and black smoke is gradually approaching him. The boy tenses at such a thing before him, seeming to expect something bad and unpleasant, for black smoke does not attract any trust. This black smoke, much to Jin Wu's surprise but without any ill intent, envelops Jin Wu's body, elevating his level to Shadow Lord. The boy is slightly nervous about what is happening to him now, surprised that his level has risen to such a peak, improving it. The next alert says that the boy has learned an exclusive class ability, gets a boost to his characteristics, becoming stronger. The boy is surprised by the instant boost obviously due to having a lot of accumulated points, becoming a fairly strong warrior. Starting with the common warrior to the berserk, moving on to the common knight to the greatest swordmaster the boy had ever encountered. Next comes the class of ordinary mages, becoming a higher mage, a more powerful wizard. After that comes the necromancer, and then the Lord of Shadows himself. The boy begins to realize that it seems that if he hadn't accumulated such a large amount of points, he would be some necromancers. The boy realizes that he can hear some of the cries of pain and despair, such loud cries of warriors and knights who have left this world. Notices gradually rise above some of the immobilized bodies on the ground, stating that shadow summoning can be used on someone of. The boy finally realizes that the reason lies in the abilities of the necromancer himself, that he possesses many different ones. Jin Wu realizes that shadow extraction is needed to turn corpses into summoned creatures, and since necromancer is a commanding class, it. The next notification doesn't take long to arrive, asking him to set up a key phrase to summon the shadow, making him think twice. The boy's gaze changes to serious. 
He seems to take this key phrase responsibly, choosing the word rise up, short and clear. At the same moment, black smoke starts coming from the ruined armor and dead knights as soon as the keyword boy's voice was heard. A hand begins to emerge from some one knight that tries to get out of the heavy armor at the command of his mane. The boy watches as an all-black subordinate with a blue glow near his eyes rises, bending his body in a bowing form. Such an action is shocking enough to Jin Wu, who is in no way used to teamwork and that he will have to try something new, not alone. But such a picture is interesting enough to the boy, who seems a little more time, and will quietly get used to his subordinates. The boy begins to realize that he can turn all of his dead into summoned beings that are of normal rank for now. In addition to the regular knights in the boy's dark army, there are also present from the elite squad that are shadow mages standing up to Jin Wu. The boy calculated that he had about 27 knights and 3 mages on his team, his maximum number being 30 very different subordinates. The boy thinks about what happens when he gets someone with an A or S ranked hunter. Those are pretty strong subordinates. The boy watches the shadows appear before him, but his gaze falls on someone sitting against the wall away from the rest of the knights. The boy finds a glance at Igris, pondering the fact that his squad now has two A-ranked shadows with powerful abilities. The boy touches one of the shadows with his fist, saying he needs to let the eleven weakest ones go, apologizing for summoning them in a bit of a hurry. At the same moment, after cancelling the summoning of the eleven shadows, they disappear from that space, no longer able to return to the squad. The boy turns his head in some direction where there is a target of interest to him at the moment. The boy looks up to the blood-red warlord Igris, wishing for him to serve him. For what a strong unit after that. The boy, deciding to try his luck and not languish in a long wait, briefly states his rise, commanding the shadows to obey him. Literally a couple seconds after the man uttered the word, black smoke begins to flow from the blood-red body of the warlord, gradually appearing as a shadow. The boy already thinks he succeeded in accomplishing the desired thing. But only after that there was some resistance from the stranger's side. The boy has to cross his arms in front of his own face, trying to endure the torrent of wind with black smoke in front of him, something he's clearly failing at. After a couple seconds, a notification appears that the boy failed to summon this shadow, wondering to himself why it didn't work. The boy has two attempts left. He states that it's not that easy. It all depends on time. And it's been about four hours since the massacre of the boss. But the boy has two more attempts at summoning the shadow of the boss in question. He will try to do what he wants, voicing his command to rise. The boy's key expression was followed by the same reaction from the warlord, not allowing Jin Wu to take another shadow. The boy shifts his gaze towards the throne, which is empty, has no king or queen sitting on it. There is no in charge here in this place. The boy points his hand towards the empty throne, saying to stop defending this place whose owner has long since left this world. The boy is still gesturing with his bandaged hand as well, vocalizing that he'd better follow whoever is now standing in front of him. The man thrusts his bandaged hand toward the bloody warlord, tries one last time, ordering him to rise. The key expression was followed by some kind of reaction, already quite different, some kind of flash appears and black smoke envelops the space. The boy feels this is a different reaction and response to his order. He begins to smile, realizing that the knight has decided to follow him. The boy watches whoever it is in front of him begin to appear. He smiles, addressing the shadow quite formally. The boy looks down at his subordinate, changing his expression and realizing it's ridiculous and even kind of tedious, wanting to change his nickname. The boy watches as the stranger's shadowy hand with sharp claws appears before him in all its glory, trying to think of a way to address him. The boy briefly ponders and decides to name this subordinate simply Igris considering what he is like in his guise. In front of the boy appears quite strong subordinate of high rank. Now he can be called Igris, and the most important thing is that this shadow is in his command. The boy looks at his subordinate with eyes glowing blue light. He tells him to let this shadow take care of him. Transitioning into another reality, the boy is awakened by a sudden phone call that has no way of interrupting. The boy sleepily asks who is calling him, and in response he hears that he is still asleep, and a loud, look at the time. It seems that Jin Wu must be in a hurry somewhere. The boy still can't wake up, scratches his head and asks what time it is, and it turns out that it's two o'clock in the afternoon to which he is so surprised. He hears Jin Wu threateningly remember to go to school in response, asking what time he should be there, realizing he needs to make it by five. The boy instantly rises from bed, parallel to say that he won't be late, hearing in return satisfied that she didn't doubt him in any way. The boy is already slowly getting ready, thinking about whether he should dress better, realizing that as it is, but he is going to his sister's teacher. Being already in some room, the unknown girl calls out the number 280, 
drawing the boy's attention to what is here. The girl asks what the guy would like, to which the guy states that he would like a new debit card and to update his bank book, getting an agreement in return. The girl checks all the papers, looking at the boy's bank accounts, noticing that he has about one billion and four hundred million won, but the one is still so young. The girl decides to ask what kind of work this boy does, to which he honestly answers that he is an ordinary hunter. The girl sighs, seeming to understand what the guy is saying, pondering that hunters don't get paid that much, perhaps his rank is quite high. The girl says that their bank has an offer for VIPs who have sent good feedback, to which the boy only politely declines. Some girl looks at someone in front of her with an attentive and rather penetrating gaze, starting to address Sunu. It's as if this girl can't believe that Sung Jin Woo is standing in front of her right now, supposedly clarifying whether this person is definitely beside her right now. The boy, in response to such a question, only asks that he is so unlike Sung Jin Woon, keeping his hand in his pants pocket. The girl awkwardly says that people can change so much, and he replies that he's going to a meeting with her teacher, so should he really go in gym clothes? Many students and female students came out of their classrooms to look at Jin Woo who had come to this school, supposedly surprised to see the handsome boy. A lot of questions were sprinkled on the boy about who he was, thinking that Jin A was next to her brother, and that she said they liked him. The girl gives a sly look, asking if her brother is sure he doesn't have a girlfriend, what he did yesterday, offering to introduce him to the beautiful students here. The boy grabs the girl by the cheek and starts pulling her, telling her not to call her that nickname, and she starts apologizing. After a while, the boy opens the door of one office, peering inside, immediately hearing the question of whether he is Jinae's brother. The pretty woman is excited to meet her, introduces herself as her teacher, and yes, she didn't realize Jinae had such a wonderful brother. The boy thinks that although he has studied here, this is the first time he is seeing this teacher, hearing a polite, sit down in response, to which he agrees, thanking him. The woman says he doesn't need to worry about Jin A. She's a good girl, and is an example to the students, so things are going smoothly enough. The pretty woman asks if the boy knows that Jin A is going to medical school, to which Jin Woo replies affirmatively. The woman continues that Jin A has good grades, so she thinks she's capable of getting into that medical school, but she doesn't need to push her too hard. The cute teacher decides to change the subject, holding up a cup of coffee and ogling that she heard about Jin Woo working as a hunter. The boy opens his eyes in shock at such words, listening to the question that if Jin A had such abilities, would he have sent her as a hunter? The man instantly changes in his face after hearing the question. He gives the woman a serious look to let her know that no, he wouldn't let her do that. The pretty woman lowers her head, exhales, and vocalizes that this is what she thought as she continues to hold the cup in her hands. The woman continues that she started the topic because of one student who was going to drop out of school, as it was discovered that he was awakened, after which he stopped attending. The woman continues that if this continues, the school will start taking some action, even if you became a hunter, isn't it better to graduate? The woman says she doesn't know much about hunters, so she decided to ask him about it, asking what her rank is, and the woman says it seems to be the lowest. The boy realizes that this student has an E rank and will apparently be leaving this world soon, and the woman is talking about some kind of favor. She says that this student is a friend of Jin A's and can't Jin Woo talk to her so she can at least graduate from this school. The boy hears back that this student is a girl named Han Sung Ai, causing Jin Woo to be surprised and open his mouth. Some girl in a black hoodie and with a white cap on her head calmly walks out of the building alone while a boy asks her friend's name again. The boy is standing outside the building, seemingly waiting for just the right girl, leaning his back against the wall behind him and saying that Korea is small as it is. The boy seems to notice this girl coming out of the building, so he immediately appears in someone else's field of vision and says that just as he thought, it's her. The girl seems puzzled by the man's presence in this very place and in such a form as if he himself works here, asking what Jin Woo is here for. The girl instantly asks that maybe something happened since he's here and afterwards states that the hunter the teacher wanted him to meet is him. The boy pulls out his cell phone, which has a funny picture on it, and asks if the girl knows this person. The girl instantly guesses that it's Jin A, and he's probably her brother, saying that she went to the hospital with her recently, but hasn't seen him. The girl continues, realizing that the boy is Jin A's brother, which is why he knows her teacher, and Jin Wu states that he wouldn't say he knows her well enough. The girl crosses her arms over her chest and looks away, stating that she doesn't know what the teacher told him, but she's not going back to school and she wants to continue being a hunter. The boy says she's E-ranked, and her normal attacks don't work on monsters, and she needs a weapon to do the hunting. 
which still needs to be changed. The boy asks that maybe she plans to fight them with her bare hands, hoping that she's not going to become a professional hunter for money. The girl briefly cuts short the boy's long speech, saying that enough of these lectures, and afterwards states that Jin Wu also has an E rank. The boy mentally points out that the girl is stubborn, telling her not to worry as he's not going to talk her into giving up. The girl looks at the guy incomprehensibly, because wasn't he going to do the opposite, while he mentally remarks that until she faces the problems herself, she won't realize the seriousness of it. The boy doesn't make her wait for a long answer, only answering her briefly that he intends to make a great hunter out of her. Some respectable man with gold glasses on the bridge of his nose notes that the atmosphere here has definitely changed. The man stands with one hand shoved in his pocket and his other hand holding onto the handle of his suitcase, saying he's back here much sooner than he expected. The man's attention shifts to the other person that appears in his field of vision, saying what a kind encounter who is standing in front of him now. The man wonders what Hunter Wu Chul is doing here, to which the other replies that he would naturally come to see an S-ranked hunter. The man smirks, realizing that the hunter is still working in the surveillance department as he continues to talk about how goofy this co-gun he is. The hunter asks how long the man will stay here, to which he replies that he is not going to stay long, only to finish one job. The hunter is a fairly savvy kid, realizes that the man has come for a reason, maybe to get the hunters Jin Wu and Jin Ho. The man blurts out irritably that such interest was to be expected from this hunter, asking if he wants to stop him. The man gets angry easily enough, his expression instantly changing to furious and his eyes bloodshot, repeating whether or not he was going to stop him. Hunter, when compared to the man who arrived, looks quite calm and serious, replies that he's just doing his job here. Some kid in a green sweatshirt exhales, clearly tired after the road, and another guy cheers him on, saying he's all stiff. A man with golden glasses tells the hunter that he likes him, offering to join his scavenger guild. Hunter reflects that Huang Dong Su has a brother who is a suspect in the murder, and the reason for canceling the investigation lies in this terrible man. Hunter recalls that the two were indeed related. Even the two of them had a lack of emotion after the massacre of the hunters. The hunter, remembering their dark past, changes in his gaze and frowns harder mentally despising this man that is now with him. The location changes to some abandoned and dark location, at which point someone's voice is heard saying that it's been a while. The boy had come to this abandoned place with that girl, meeting Chief An, who apparently had to be seen once more. Chief An introduces himself where he works and who he is in the management department, which his assistant Hyun gi Chiol also does. The men seem surprised to see the very same student once more. She greets them briefly, responding calmly. Chief Ann mentally realizes that the girl has an E rank, realizes that there's nothing special about her, and afterwards thinks that he shouldn't be so quick to jump to conclusions. Chief Ann recalled being infuriated by Jin Wu's suggestion that they try out the new recruit, thinking he was interested in their guild. The chief says not many people live in this place, and the C rank gate is perfect for field testing right here. Another person comes into the conversation, saying that it's well past 9 o'clock, it's time for them to stop talking and should start. Some man in huge polished armor appears in the sight of the people here, saying they are no picnic. The boy asks who the man is, and the chief says it's their new A-rank recruit, saying the dungeon isn't for pampering. The boy interjects that the man has A-rank, listening to the chief that his name is Kim Chul, and as can be seen, he is a tank. The chief continues that the strength of this raid consists of one A-rank, seven B-ranks, and four C-ranks, twelve men in all. The chief goes on to say that it probably seems weird enough, but they're still new recruits after all, and the guy thinks that if the raid is easy, the girl won't learn anything. He also thinks that this way she will more quickly realize the difference between herself and other hunters by noticing her activity. An assistant enters the conversation saying that the raid will be easy since Jin Wu will take part in it, and he wants to watch it all from the sidelines. A cheerful girl moving closer to the raid asks if the boy is going with her, and he says he'll only go after her. The girl's joyful face changed to a focused one as she looked at what was ahead of her. What kind of raid was going to happen here? The girl, deciding not to waste much time, goes first, gradually sinking into the portal, and the boy follows her. Everything around is burning red. Somewhere in the distance, something yellow can be seen. One wonders what the feeling is right now. The chief, along with his assistant, open their mouths in surprise and strange sensations. They stare ahead incomprehensibly. Something with the gate. Men don't understand what happens to gates that change in size, and the feel of the gate itself is fundamentally different. Men do not realize what this ominous feeling is happening in the sternum. It is dangerous. They try to get out of here urgently. The men can't move backwards either. Something starts to gradually collapse. Everything is in the red, and the wind only rises stronger. 
Jin Wu's head emerges from the cycle of surprising events, shouting to the chief to alert the main force immediately. The boy looks as if he's trying to say something else, but he's sucked inside until his hand disappears with a trailing hand, and the men stand in shock. Chief An gets nervous, immediately takes out his phone and calls the master directly, because this is not the kind of problem where only basic strength will be needed. One of the hunters wonders about the Red Gate, not realizing how this gate could have come from the other C-rank gates. The red-haired man is visibly nervous, even the veins are starting to protrude on his head, thinking that if it's true what's happening now, then the man's eyes light up with a kind of flame. He realizes that he needs to intervene in this matter, being the head of the S-rank White Tiger Guild, Beck Yunho. An elite black Mercedes flies at full speed in its direction. Someone sitting inside notices that it's a luxury car. The driver remarks that this car is not good enough for the man, and the man replies that it would be easier for him to jog at this speed. He wonders how his brother's funeral went, and the driver says they couldn't get someone else's body, but the funeral was private, asking if he wants to visit him. The man replies that he's not interested in dead people and he's only interested in the scum who dared to massacre his brother. The driver asks about then where they are going now, and the man says the answer is obvious. They are going to the dungeon. The man's smile appears instantly. He states that he will find them in a dungeon. The lousy hunters will undoubtedly be found just in some dungeon. The driver is slightly even nervous, asking how the man is going to find them among the vast number of gates in Korea. The man tells him that this isn't a problem in the 21st century, as the hunter Jin Wu seems to have just entered some kind of dungeon. The man peers out from under his glasses, one of his pupils glowing red, and he says that whether he straightens them out or not has nothing to do with Jin Chul. The driver, listening to the man's speech to the end, finds nothing to say back to him and briefly agrees, continuing on his way. In some place, full winter is happening. It is snowing here, there is cold weather around, and also there is a forest along with some people around. The people who find themselves in this place don't realize what this place is, saying that it doesn't even look like any kind of dungeon. One of the men seems to be getting annoyed with what's going on. He notices that there isn't even a gate in this place. So where did they get to? The boy himself also appears in this place. He silently observes everything going on and doesn't sense anything life-threatening here. The man thinks to himself, wondering if this gate has transported them to this world, and the girl awkwardly asks if anything strange has happened. The atmosphere around is quite calm, winter, and even cooler weather, only from somewhere a blue arrow is flying at high speed. The girl notices it at the last moment, just as the boy manages to stretch out his arm to catch that arrow, seemingly barely just catching it. Something is poured on one of the men right in his eyes, causing him to scream loudly, not realizing what is going on here and the people around him are just horrified. Someone here squints a bit and notices some creatures right up in the tree, shrieking loudly and drawing the attention of the others. It seems that the people here are beginning to realize that there are ice elves in the tree, whose eyes can be seen in a kind of darkness. They glow with a blue glow. The boy tenses as he realizes that they are ice elves, which he can't sense due to the great distance between them. Those who have not met these elves call them ice elves, and those who see them for more than the first time then prefer a completely different nickname for them. Instead of the beautiful word elf, these people call them a word that describes how ruthless they can be when hunting hunters. Someone's hand tries to fumble for something, to press the red essence, but there's no way it can push any further, realizing they've closed tightly. The red-haired man remarks that this is strange enough, since it's a C-rank gate, which is confirmed by the assistant watching him. The man asks if they've contacted the Korean Hunters Guild, and the man says that they don't quite seem to want to deal with the situation. The man is instantly angry, thinking that red gates only form in high-ranked gates, and the Korean Guild doesn't want to help. The man thinks it's some kind of mistake since these gates could be of different levels, and the other asks if they should measure them with a magic gauge. The man replies that it's an extremely pointless idea because in their current state it makes no sense at all. He asks how many employees went in there, and the chief says 12, listing all the high-ranking hunters in that place. The man at this time thinks one A-ranked and seven B-ranked. The assistant asks if these recruits will be okay after everything that's going on. The man continues to think that this gate is either A or B rank. He still lists all the possible options of how and what could affect the rank of this gate. The man is serious, saying that if the gate is A-rang, you should consider the dead. If you're lucky, a few people can come back alive. The chief tries to say something, gets confused, and again states that there are two other people inside this gate who are not part of their guild. The atmosphere heats up, the man asks seriously who they are, and the man says one hunter who has caught his eye lately. The man suddenly lights up, his gaze expressing rage. He interjects about the hunter that Chief Anu had taken a liking to. 
The other covers his eyes, saying that is correct, and the man asks the rank of this hunter, maybe it's an A, or maybe it's a B rank. The other only shakes his head in different directions that, no, it's not that rank. And the man tries to guess that maybe he's rank S, but again, incorrectly. The one still says that this hunter has E rank, realizing how serious the situation is now, that this is no joke and quite dangerous. One of the men is frozen in one place, his mouth open in mute horror and his eyes covered in some kind of white liquid, having been disposed of in a similar fashion. The boy remembers what these elves look like, that they have sharp eyes and are also very attentive since they were able to hunt down the weakest of the group. The boy realizes that if he had been in this situation a couple of months ago, the arrow would have flown right at him while the elves are scoping out their future victim. The boy's face changes to some sort of maddened expression. He easily breaks the arrow he just caught with his hand and also looks somewhere ahead. The boy promises himself he'll kill them with his own hands, after someone shows up saying he didn't think these elves were so welcoming here. That new recruit says that this situation is dangerous enough inside the Red Gate, so they won't get out of here unless they clear this dungeon. The gathered people around exclaim loudly that it happens to be a Red Gate, but the girl doesn't know about this gate, asking Jin Wu. The boy says that this gate connects them to the other world, so they can't get out of here until they clear this dungeon. The boy goes on to say that to describe it in other words, they're trapped in some sort of trap and they're in trouble, which shocks the others. The man re-enters the conversation, introducing himself to everyone, and then adds that he will be responsible for every life within this gate. But he says that you should not hold out hope for salvation thanks to him, because you do not know what can happen at any moment and to lead people in this place will be quite difficult. The man also adds that this is why he decided to organize a separate group to mop up this dungeon with him, which slightly shocks the boy. The man continues that if they sit here doing nothing, most will just die due to the cold, and if no one wants to help him with the cleanup, he'll go alone. The man, not long into his speech, eventually asks who would like to join him to get this place over with and return to his home as quickly as possible. The man who initiated the teamwork notices people one by one deciding to follow along so they can get to their home and out of here as soon as possible. The boy, standing behind the people involved, ponders that they would definitely have a chance at survival if they went with an A-ranked hunter. As weird as it looks, the man pushes one guy in the chest as if to put him back in his seat, telling him he's not taking this one with him, to which he reacts by growling a little in anger. The man goes on to list who can go with him and who can't, and afterwards apologizes for not being able to take those who currently have a C rank or even lower. The man is serious about this case, says it will take a very long time, so in such a situation, he can't take the so expressed dead weight with him to the team. The humans seem a bit insulted by such, interjecting that are they really dead weight, and the one says they shouldn't be so upset, so their main goal now is to survive until they kill the boss. The man is serious in his words and actions, sincerely says and hopes that all his efforts will definitely not go in vain, and the team he gathers will be strong enough and friendly, but he is distracted by someone. He is approached by some pretty girl, asking the man if she can change teams now, apparently having spotted someone else or wanting to get rid of her. The man tells her to do as she pleases, and he wonders why she wants to change teams while being with Arang. Perhaps it's a matter of some sympathy. The man turns to the rest of the people, saying that since he has one empty seat left, he can take someone with him. At the same moment, the guy he rejected appears, shouting that he wishes. The girl walks past the boy who's watching everything from the sidelines, and that one says that Kim Chul, unlike Jin Woo, didn't notice any flying arrow, which amazes her. The green-eyed girl turns to face the boy with a slight smile. She wonders at him, seeming to guess that Jin Woo is not an Erang hunter. The red gate is still closed. One of the people left outside says he tried to gain Jin Wu's trust, and he's also sure he was awakened twice. The man listens to the chief's speech, asks him if he's sure of his version, and the chief agrees, looking down as if there's something he's not saying or about to say. The man says that in that case, his only hope is Kim Chul, and the chief thinks that if the master had met Jin Wu in person, the latter would have figured it out for himself. The head of the management department, Chu Sung Chong, appears in sight, stating that Kim Chul shouldn't have any problems in this situation. He goes on to say that Kim Chul's training results are impressive, and also his strength is as strong as their guild's main attack force. Master only exhales because Kim Chul is indeed an A-ranked hunter, and if that one is the raid captain, he can manage the B-ranked ones well enough to mop up this dungeon. The leader says that he's heard rumors about an E-ranked hunter with reawakening, but he says that Kim Chul is far superior to that hunter. The chief ponders looking at other people's reactions to see who will be right in this situation with all the strong hunters getting out of this ominous place. 
After a while, someone drives a car to the place, holding onto the door and gradually getting out of the car while asking what's going on here. An unidentified man treads his feet on the ground, saying aloud that he had heard that the C-Rang gate was here. But it turns out that this gate actually has an A-Rang. A slightly hunched man with his sly smile and rather intimidating atmosphere comes into view. He asks what the White Tiger Guild Master is doing here. It seems that the red-haired man in no way expects to be seen here together with Huang Dong Su, whom he can't stand. Even his presence around just pisses him off completely. The people standing nearby just open their mouths in surprise. They, as well as the master himself, did not expect to see this person here. Even the leader himself stuttered. The man is an S-rank hunter, smirking, lifting his glasses on the bridge of his nose, saying he hasn't seen Beck Yoon-ho in a while. They are dumbfounded, asking him what he is doing in Korea, and he replies that he came here to take care of some business, but he doesn't expect to see the man himself here. Master instantly gets angry, his gaze becomes frantic. He says what on earth does he need to do in Korea, living in the United States, doing something on guild property. The man smiles, interjecting about the White Tiger Guild, saying he wants to ask him something too, asking about a certain lousy hunter. The man realizes that the people here don't quite know who they're talking about, and after clarifies about the E-Rang hunter, but the other man doesn't understand who that is. The master looks irritated at the man who has arrived, and afterward is surprised when the man speaks of the hunter Jin Wu who entered this gate with the others. The master, looking at the man approaching the red gate, ponders how he knows about the hunter Jin Wu while the man in turn just realizes the red gate in front of him. The boy, watching with his attentive gaze, with someone else's permission, wants to ask one question, asking why this girl, being a new recruit, reacts so calmly. The girl replies that the first thing she was taught is that anything can happen in the dungeon, because even hunter Kim Chul had special training. Several hunters and recruits split into two groups, facing each other, each speaking of their own way of direction. The group of hunters, along with Kim Chul, turn away, heading down the trail they themselves had chosen, wishing each other good luck as they leave. The remaining group of a couple people along with Jin Wu also split up, heading towards the forest in one bunch while the boy turns to the other group and mutually wishes good luck. The forest looks surprisingly gloomy but also beautiful at the same time, as the snowflakes add a kind of good atmosphere to the place while one hears someone's voice. The boy walks behind the others with his new acquaintance, who is the first to start some sort of dialogue about how she feels like Jin Wu isn't going to answer her question. The boy considers the terrain surrounding him at the moment, pulls a vowel, as if reluctant to continue someone else's dialogue, and she thinks he has at least an A rank. The girl is quite attentive to such details, looking at the boy with her green eyes, as if in this way she were trying to peer into another soul, walking over to another group that is walking down the trail in a direction unknown to them but with the same goal in mind, Kim Chul stops, briefly calling someone idiots. A man in large armor points with his hand toward a single tree, which bears the rather prominent claw mark of a bear that has been here recently. The man grudgingly states that the rest of the group should have waited here, since the forest is ice bear territory, and also thinks that because of Erang, the others will just die. A man walking along with Kim Chul amusingly asks if Erang has had any decent training, and he replies that there's no way he has, he's just an ordinary Erang. At some point, the man starts to become silent, and his gaze earnestly goes somewhere, realizing that there are several C ranks and even B ranks in that group. But his thoughts are momentarily cut short, thinking that everything about the rest of the group just shouldn't affect him, since they'll all be dead soon, saying that they'll be on their own. The man is holding a huge weapon and shield in his hand, which are clearly not light and lugging them all around would be from unpleasant business, but Kim Chul loudly voices for his group to start preparing for battle. The man with the gold glasses says he came all this way for Jin Wu, and the man is at the red gate, realizing that it's hard enough to see into the face of this hunter. Master doesn't seem to understand at all why all people are so strongly interested in this person. Why exactly he is surrounded by several influential personalities at once. There is a tough battle going on in the cold weather. A polar and ferocious bear is attacking someone, seeing one of the hunters as his prey or a target just to get rid of him. The polar bear decides to launch an attack first, his huge paw forcefully striking right at Kim Chul's shield, who was just waiting for this moment to hurt his enemy. At the same instant, the ferocious polar bear roars in pain from his sharp claws that curved the other way due to hitting right on the alien shield that even blood starts to flow from his paws. Kim Chul in his huge armor only expects such a reaction from this monster. His weapon accurately hits right on the polar bear's body, dispersing it instantly. There were admiring exclamations all around that their captain was simply the best A-rank hunter. He had defeated all those ice bears almost single-handedly. 
The man thinks he can deal with a few bears, and the others say they can cut the meat out of them for something to eat, realizing that so far, things are going smoothly for them. The man exclaims that the guys are talking nonsense, as they can't relax for a moment until they get out of here, reflecting that they're only coping with all the monsters because of him. The rest of the group of people are walking towards the forest with the same quiet step. It's quiet and peaceful enough, but at some point someone's voice breaks the silence, telling everyone to wait. It turns out to be the same girl who goes along with the boy, loudly saying that they can't go any further. It's dangerous enough, but Jin Woo doesn't understand what she means. The girl continues that there are ice bear markings all around in this place, and yes, this whole forest is ice bear territory and they are quite strong opponents. The girl panics slightly and insists that they need to head back now before those ice bears return to their territory. But the boy only sighs. The boy interjects that, just as she says that this place is full of ice bears, and she even started to get a little nervous, thinking she said something wrong, hesitantly continuing that they need to go back. The boy firmly states that that's why they're going into this forest. And the girl wonders, shrieking that he can't hear her at all, and whether Jin Wu really wants to die like that. The boy seems to be getting tired of other people's yelling, saying that since this is ice bear territory, their presence is the only thing they have to worry about. He continues that fighting ice bears makes a lot more sense than fighting ice elves, which is many times more dangerous. And the girl instantly gets the whole point of what Jin Wu is saying. The girl thinks that since the place is full of ice bears, there will be no one stronger than them, saying that she couldn't have thought of that. And he asks if they are cold in such clothes. The boy seems to decide to take a little care of his team, after all. They are his people after all. He pulls out his inventory, which contains quite a lot of different clothes. The boy tells her to put it on, because it won't be very nice if all the people here die of cold without facing the monsters. The girl, watching all of this from the sidelines, cannot hide her immense astonishment, holding the clothes provided by the boy in her hands, cringing that is it really spatial magic. The men nearby wonder if spatial magic isn't confined to two things, not realizing who this guy in front of them is, who he is. Even the girl the boy went into that red gate with still can't figure out who he really is, seriously asking about it. In the same instant, the boy pulls his hand out, resting it on top of the stranger's head and stating that, since he got her into this situation, he has an obligation to protect her, which embarrasses her. The boy, who is already dressed in harsh weather prepared clothes, states to just not ask any questions silencing that one. The boy who is already in charge of this team has dressed everyone in his warm clothes from his inventory, says the same goes for them. The boy puts a finger to his lips, looking at them earnestly and telling them not to ask anything from him and not to demand anything either. At some unexpected moment, a ferocious ice bear appears behind the boy. Jin Wu turns around due to the screams coming from behind him. The boy's entire team instantly starts to panic saying that it was stupid to go into this horrible forest because there are high-ranking monsters here. The girl who appears to be panicking the most tells the others to catch the moment as she distracts the ice bear. At the same moment, she is stopped by a boy, to which she reacts with a questioning look, and he says that he will hunt monsters himself. The others shriek that it doesn't matter how strong he is because this monster is highly ranked, and the boy briefly voices his command, pondering that he can't lose the experience. The pissed-off polar bear doesn't seem like he's going to wait long to be attacked first, so he aims right at the boy but gets caught in the snow. At the same instant, the boy rises into the air, jumping back a great distance, causing the ferocious bear to stand still for a while in anticipation. The boy's gaze burns with blue flames, he thinks, if adding tidal effects to his current level as well as using his own hands. The boy seems to hover in the air for long, slow-motion seconds, his fist hitting the ferocious bear's head, knocking the air out of him. All the people near this battle open their mouths in surprise, not believing what they just saw, because it seems unbelievable. They're shocked to think that the boy dispatched the ice bear with one punch, and Jin Wu says that just as he thought, the higher the level of the enemy, the more experience he gets. The green-eyed girl begins to stutter, seemingly unsure of how she should react to this situation, asking her question again about who he really is. There is a tense atmosphere in the space, with a group of people looking at each other, gathered in one place with the main man. The master asks what he wants from the hunter, and the hunter replies that it has nothing to do with him because he just wants to have fun. The master replies that whatever his goal is at the moment, they will not be able to enter the red gate for there can be a wide variety of locations and temperatures inside. The master continues that there might be a jungle full of different dangerous animals and enemies out there, 
thinking that those hunters would just die than stay alive. But the man emphatically states his own. He smiles, confident enough, and replies that he also wants to know what's inside. The man continues to stand in front of the closed red gate, realizing that this is problematic enough, and he can't stand here and wait for the gate to open. The other man ponders that Jin Wu is extremely lucky, because since it's a red gate, even Huang Dongsu won't be able to do anything about it no matter how much he wants to. He also reflects on the fact that if the boy can get out of there alive, he'll be a real lucky boy while a team of people are roasting meat in the meantime. Each person gives their opinion on the ice bear meat. To some it's tough. To others it's delicious. Everyone is being as friendly as possible. The girl asks her brother about Jin A, and the boy replies that she is like her, because she likes to play at home and sleep, and she is a regular sleepyhead at home. The girl does not seem to believe, because how she manages to keep her marks and the guy replies that he does not understand it himself, because in childhood they very often visited the arcade. The man addresses the huntress Park Hee Jin as if the ice bears have become very scarce, and she replies that it's all thanks to their captain, still reminiscing admiringly about the battle. The girl, distracted from a conversation with a man, turns to the boy, asking where he is going to go, and he says that he has already eaten and it's time to stretch. The girl asks another question that will the boy really warm up here, and he replies that if he doesn't, he will even be punished. The gathered people around the campfire don't seem to understand this high-ranking hunter in any way, while simultaneously agreeing that this boy is kind of weird. The boy, distanced from the rest of the men on his team, hangs head down on some branch, relaxedly exhaling. The boy also realizes that he can't leave his team alone in this dangerous place, so he has to do all his necessary chores on time. The boy, after spending some time on a branch to stretch himself, declares that he is now finally ready for the hunt awaiting him in this place. The boy notices somewhere near this place a large number of red-eyed, ferocious ice bears just waiting for their prey. The boy is all alone in this place, and he has this whole bunch of embittered bears in front of him, which he calmly handles, asking if there are as many of them here or more. The boy, in no way afraid that he might get into some trouble, gives the command, Get out, in his serious voice, waiting for a follow-up reaction. At the same moment, a large black shadow begins to form from behind the boy's back, enveloping the place with its mystery and danger. Black magical shadows begin to emerge from beneath the ground, worshipping their shadow lord, doing all his bidding and orders. The boy states, addressing his shadows, that this is their first mission, which will have to go as successfully and interestingly as possible, attracting the attention of his subordinates. The boy settles to the ground, his face barely visible due to his hood, and one eye burning with blue light while huge shadows loom behind his back. The boy commands his subordinates to deal with all the ice monsters, which they instantly begin to do without any denials. A large number of black magical shadows surround one ferocious polar bear who seems to have no way of expecting to come face to face with such magic. After a while, the subordinate boys get together and suddenly create a huge flame that sizzles the polar bear alive. Enormous power along with fire keep attacking this pack of ice bears. The boy thinks that the mages who use firepower and regeneration at the same time. The boy watches from the sidelines, realizing that such rapid regeneration could be considered immortality. But because of all this, his mana is melting before his eyes. At some point, a more aggressive species of polar ice bear appears in the pack, which is very different from his team, even in appearance. The boy instantly notices him looks at him with an attentive gaze and realizes that the long-awaited leader of the pack has finally appeared. This fierce leader of his own pack, with a single sweep of his huge paw, dispenses with the shadows beside him who will do nothing to him. The boy realizes that the shadows hit by the blow are now useless, and his mana is also running low. The boy stands not far from the embittered bear, glaring at it. The boy hasn't used his trump subordinate yet, waiting for the right moment and calling out to the bloody Igris, letting him know it's time to act. At the same moment, the majestic Igris pulls out his powerful weapon, which he finally uses after some time on this ice monster. Igris leaps from his seat and with great speed as he knows how to act, motions towards the pack leader, drawing the attention of the ice bear. Igris easily corrupts the alien body of the main leader of this pack, causing him to howl in pain, rising high in the air, about to perform the ultimate action. The white ice bear seems to begin to realize that he is in a mess and a trap from which he will not be able to get out because the knight Igris has already plunged his sword into one of the monster's paws. In a short time, Igris even manages to straighten out the polar bear's hind legs, which can no longer even resist a foe as powerful as the Shadow Knight. The boy, watching from the sidelines, opens his eyes in surprise and can't take his gaze away from this fight, as if to study the abilities of his knight. 
A polar bear, whose wounds are all over its body due to such great speed and the mighty power of the majestic Igris, can already howl in pain in its death throes. The majestic Igris, descending from the great body of the white ice bear, with his tool, gathers some kind of power to make a final movement to end this battle with the ringleader. As the mighty Igris makes his final move, the head of the main ice bear of this pack falls straight to the ground, confirming that the shadow of Igris has won this fight. Igris, ending this fight along with the ice bear, turns around to walk lightly towards his shadow lord, while the boy realizes that he has been very lucky back in the day. The boy looks at the majestic Igris with a serious gaze, realizes what a powerful ally he has on his team, and also begins to realize that with his current level, their powers are equal. After a while, the head of the leader of the Ice Bear Pack appears at the boy's feet, and Igris similarly shows that the fight is finally over and he has won it. The majestic Igris does not let his bowing before the Lord of Shadows wait long. He bows his head, drops to one knee, and shows his honor before the boy in like manner. The boy, looking at the situation from the outside, is still trying to figure out just how strong the majestic Igris is in front of him, but seems to realize more and more each time that the latter is probably even stronger. The boy doesn't make him wait long for his answer. He walks up to the majestic Igris, places his hand on his shoulder in a kind gesture, and then states that he has done a good job, thus confirming the victory. The boy walks up to the huge body of the ice bear, thinking that it would be nice to have it in his shadow collection, so he is about to say his command, rise, waiting for the next reaction. After a certain amount of time, the notification comes that the extraction of the ice bear's shadow has been successfully completed. A blue glow gradually begins to appear, which envelops the immobilized body of the bear. The following action happens rather quickly, and a huge and powerful shadow of an ice bear rises up in front of the boy, who is now on Jin Wu's team and will follow his decrees. In this area, where the boy has dealt with a large number of ice bears, the rest of the shadows begin to appear next to their bodies and will obey the boy's laws. But the most interesting and more attractive to the guy is the main ice bear, the leader of his own pack who appears before him in a powerful guise, ready to obey. The boy is only happy about this outcome. He smirks slightly, because his mandatory training for today is officially over, and the ice bears have been added to his collection. All the same people who are still at the red gate from the beginning continue to wait for the dungeon to open, momentarily distracted to ask how much time has passed. The chief wonders how many survivors they have now, to which the master says that you should be prepared for bad news, because the red gate is very dangerous. The weakest are the first to die there. The master continues that even if those do adapt, it's unlikely they have anything to eat, as the Red Gate is an unimaginably difficult challenge for low-ranked hunters, and those below C rank are probably already dead. The man who came from the States amusingly adds that perhaps that Jin Wu boy had also thrown off his skates. That did he really waste his time traveling for nothing to meet this guy he was interested in. The man was about to return to his car, only to suddenly stop in front of it glaring as if he was starting to guess something, asking about Jin Wu not being a member of the White Tiger Guild. The man's gaze changes to red, some irritating thought has visited him, so he asks a straightforward question about how the boy ended up in this place. Chief An only sighs at such a question, saying that he's known the boy for a long time who was interested in going to the S-Rang raid, which is why he invited him here. Master, watching the whole conversation from the sidelines, analyzes that the chief is covering for the boy, so there seems to be something special about him, and also doesn't understand if Huang Dong Su is aware of it. At one point, the man very quickly begins to head in the direction of the chief with his shined white shoes, saying that there is nothing he can do about it in that case. The man is instantly in front of Chief An, grabs him by the neck with a firm grip, causing the other to clench his jaw in pain, and later states that did he really expect him to say exactly that. The man smiles his devilish smile, looking at the chief with red pupils, saying that he's been looking for something interesting for him for a long time, so he's sure there's something funny here. The grip on the chief's neck is so strong that he can't hold back the drool running down his chin, and moisture gradually begins to build up in his eyes. The man demands the truth from him. Immediately, not intending to tolerate such a picture, the angry master enters the fray, immediately telling Huang Dong Su to remove his own hand from his subordinate. The man only gets angrier at the stranger's presence, asking him if he just heard an order from the head, who only ever gives orders over the phone from his office. The atmosphere around starts to get noticeably hotter. It seems that even some magical glimpses start to surround these guys from all sides. The master shrieks indignantly at what he hears, clearly offended by it. Thanks to the master, 
The grip on the neck of the boss has disappeared, but his condition is visibly deteriorating because the whole atmosphere is getting very hot, and he panically thinks that if things continue like this, then a powerful and life-threatening battle between the S-ranks is just going to be inevitable. The chief looks on as the two men are embittered by what is going on, seemingly ready to start the battle right here. Moving to the other reality where the team is now, wandering through a cold dungeon, some man tired from a long hike comes into view. He's breathing raggedly as if he's about to collapse to the ground from exhaustion, his hand trembling, holding some piece of his gun that's no longer fit for battle, a large broken shield lying somewhere nearby. Before the exhausted man appears a huge monster that has sharp fangs in its mouth, as well as great strength which is ready to tear the hunter to pieces, just give him a reason to do so. The exhausted man, that with every step begins to lose more and more of his strength, seems not to believe in what is happening, trying to realize that is he really. That could he, such a majestic and powerful Kim Chul, could screw up in this dungeon, just losing everything around him, even the lives of those people who had decided to follow on the heels of Arang. An exhausted man from long battle attacks watches as parts of different bodies are in the jaws of hungry and vengeful monsters that are ready to massacre the remaining survivors in the most horrible ways. The man starts to panic, thinking that he even had special training for this place, but still managed to fail without saving his team. He can't accept such a thing. The man begins to think, ostensibly trying to support himself, that he is not to blame for the lack of food, that it is not his fault, but afterwards realizes that the captain is himself he is responsible. The man falls into a kind of trance due to his deep and agonizing musings, repeats, as if in a kind of delirium, the single word, Captain, only to feel that someone is trying to reach his back. The man's gaze instantly changes as he begins to realize that very close at full speed to him rushes the so-called Hiyaki along with his bow, with the rest of the monsters following behind him. The man stares disbelievingly at what's happening before his eyes. He's already exhausted because of a failed plan, can barely stand still, shabby because of the cold around him, and afterward he glares at Hayaki after Bigfoot. The man is all alone in this bloody place, surrounded by his once former crew of men, but one of the wounded men can still move, calling out to the captain in a trembling voice. Some wounded guy stretches his arm toward the man, as if asking for his help to get up, to somehow survive in this situation, but he never reaches Kim Chul because at the same moment someone stabs him with a knife. The mighty Kim Chul at this moment turns around at the sound of the captain calling out and afterward he stares dumbfoundedly with a frozen body at what just happened right now to this guy. The man freezes in stiffening fear, for in front of him sits a satisfied Hayaki, who, looking at the man with his frenzied gaze, has just plunged a sharp knife right into the guy's head. The mighty Kim Chul can't handle this kind of pressure on himself, as these Hayaki would just eat him alive but he doesn't want to die so quickly, just screams and storms off. Apparently, the man's reaction was not only because of the low-ranked hunter who had died in front of him, but also because another Hayaki, but a stronger one on horseback, had appeared in his field of vision. The man is in some woods all alone, visibly shivering and putting his hands together, trying to keep warm that way, and says that if he hadn't been starving all these days, he wouldn't have lost. The man walks in a direction unknown to him but only away from the Hayaki he recently met on the battlefield. Only his gaze changes to one of surprise upon seeing something ahead of him. The man is surprised to see that not far away, somewhere ahead of this forest, lies a pile of ice bear heads, and he exclaims in his thoughts that he could not understand where the ice bears had gone in this place. The man walks a little closer to see this picture up close with his own eyes, also thinking that this is simply impossible. Did these low-ranked hunters really manage to deal with them? The man, seemingly not about to believe in anyone else's abilities, puts the assumption that Hayaki did it, panickedly exclaiming that they're somewhere near him, breaking off into a fast run. Near the Red Gate, something interesting is happening. It seems the gathered people around them are starting to hate each other more. Even a strong wind current is starting to form around them. Someone's normal hand becomes more like that of the werewolves themselves, because instead of normal fingernails, they have sharp claws that can simply rip out someone's eyes. The atmosphere only gets more heated. The master looks angrily at his hated opponent, asking if he wants to put on some kind of show, to which the man only replies that he is always ready. The mighty S-rank master draws his hand with sharp claws aside, gaining his own power, looking only at the opponent in front of him and disregarding the rest. At the same instant, the man who came from the States also takes his hand aside to use his mighty powers in this long-awaited battle alongside the strong master. 
None of the men standing nearby can stop them. They even scatter in different directions while at the same moment the angry powerful men start their strong fight. The rest of the people not far from these strong men are barely standing in one place, for it is hard enough as large puffs of smoke and a torrent of wind gather around. The look of the man who came from the States calms down slightly, but he smiles a crazy smile, holding his arm out in front of him, ready to rip everyone to shreds, saying that someone is still in one piece. The master looks with an embittered look at some kid who's getting in between these strong hunters, only to have them not start their battle, which he has. The man finally moves away from the two hunters, rubbing his hands which had taken a powerful blow from both sides, saying that if the two of them hadn't loosened the blow, his hands would have turned to mush. Guy continues that he was one of the first to assume that Jin Wu had awakened, but thanks to a check with the magic power indicator two months ago, he discovered that Jin Wu had an E-rank. The chief standing not far away from them ponders that it's just not possible, listening to the other's speech that he's mourning the fact that Hunter Dong Siok passed away, but Jin Wu couldn't interrupt his team by himself. The other man says that if they prepared a trap for them, the motive was Yu Jin's construction company and the other man supports that there's no point in torturing the hunter Jin Wu. The look of the man who came from the States changes to one of exasperation. As it had been recently, he begins in his stern tone that this is an excuse to convince the other man. The man even seems to be starting to calm down, realizing that there is no point in this altercation, just turns away from the others and states that he has lost interest and is going to bed. The other people present, who were in no way involved in the altercation, open their mouths in surprise and fear, to which the man rudely asks if this is the first time they have seen an S-rank conflict. The chief, watching all this from the side, only replies nothing, only silently analyzing the fact that he understands Sung Jin Wu's strength far better than the people here together. The chief also thinks about the fact that having known him for so long, he's pretty sure Jin Wu will be alive while the remaining surviving crew sits warming themselves by the fire, talking about their own things. Jin Wu's team is friendly enough, discussing something with each other, smiling, until from somewhere they are found wandering through the forest by Kim Chul, who is watching from the sidelines. The man's gaze becomes frantic, as if he can't believe what is happening before his eyes. He ponders the fact that they are low-level hunters, why are they still alive? The man begins to scrutinize every detail he can from this distance, noticing that they have new warm clothes, tents, and everything they need to survive the harsh weather. The man's gaze moves to the contents within this place, noticing even that this place is full of food, which is the reason these low-ranking hunters survive. Kim Chul is visibly angry, thinking that if his stomach was full of food, he would have easily destroyed Hayaki. He realizes that Jin Wu's team prepared these supplies but didn't share them. The girls are chatting about something, not sensing any danger near them, for Jin Wu seems to have dealt with all the monsters nearby, as their attention is drawn to a shriek of insults. The man is angered by what he's seen, the girls ask how Kim Chul got here, and he angrily blurts out that his team fell apart for lack of equipment and they have all the supplies. One of the men tries to say something but can't, instantly cutting off half a word and gets an angry response from Kim Chul as to why they're silent and if their mouths are sewn shut. The man approaches these people, starting to loudly voice that he doesn't think these people are working together, asking who hid all these supplies and will let them get away with it if they tell him who it is. The man begins to scream, asking who hid the supplies and left his allies to die. The girl begins to cuddle up to the other, afraid of the other's anger. The man, seemingly serious about being able to attack the innocents here, starts counting down with one, causing one man's face to change. Kim Chul continues his countdown quickly enough, he says two, briefly, and with an intimidating tone, his hand fumbling for his sword and beginning to draw it out. The man's gaze changes, realizes that the people here are not going to tell him anything, as they are very good at listening to their ringleader. His gaze moves to the green-eyed girl. He thinks about the fact that she decided to join this team for a reason, clearly had a plan at that point, and knew she was better off going with fewer people. Through the sepulchral silence and silence, the man breaks into a loud and menacing shout, clearly showing that he's going to maim someone, noting the target in his mind in the form of Park Hee Jin. The man with his menacing look shows with all his appearance that he is serious about taking down anyone from this squad, shouting four as a hand appears behind his head. As was to be expected, a boy appeared behind the man, who easily managed to make Kim Chul fly headlong toward the ground with a single flick of his hand. The low-ranking hunters around the campfire cheer as soon as they spot Jin Wu in their sight, 
which is the captain of the raid, giving everyone here hope for salvation. The boy reads, turning to Kim Chul, who here left his allies to die, not to mention that this man has returned with his dead weight. The people around don't quite understand what the boy is talking about and what dead weight he means, because the words are quite scary and frightening at the same time. One of the men, dressed in warm clothes, asks the boys if they are playing hide-and-seek now, because with such powerful energy in this place, it is pointless to hide. The boy walks ahead of the others and then stops, which is followed by the other people with him, beginning to uncertainly say out loud what they have just seen in front of them. The boy tenses up slightly, as if he's scoping out the danger in this place to prepare for someone's monster attack at any moment, starting to notice that there's some kind of chilling atmosphere here. Other people begin to uncertainly and fearfully voice out loud that the ice elves appearing in front of them are quite numerous, what seems to be even more than twenty. One of the ice elves looks purposefully somewhere forward, as if to one person, and then says in his voice that there really is such a valuable guy among the trash here. The boy, hearing such words from the talking monster, immediately blurts out in frustration that he didn't hear the elf just call them trash. The same ice elf who speaks his own language looks questioningly at the boy in front of him, clearly surprised that someone understands him. The boy himself is surprised, shutting up instantly and beginning to wonder how they can seriously communicate, and the girl next to him asks if he talks to monsters too. The boy suggests in his mind that maybe it's because of some system too, and the ice elf says that how marvelous it is when someone is able to talk to them, and there's someone he wants to meet. The boy looks at one of the ice elves, and afterward hears something that they have met before. And yes, this particular elf informed them that there is someone quite strong among the humans here. The ice elf reaches a hand out to his partner, addressing him that this particular boy wanted to fight him face to face, but suddenly the stranger's head falls from his shoulders. The boy, not letting the ice elf finish his sentence, simply massacres his partner, waiting for the opportune moment, making the slain monster fall to his knees. The boy, turning to the apparently chief ice elf of this place, coldly vowels to him whether he has anything else to say, looking all serious. The ice elf stares with his eyes shining brightly, silent for a while as if digesting all that he has just seen right before his eyes. But his face suddenly changes to a cheerful one. The ice elf seems to like this kind of thing even more. He tells the boy that he's a pretty funny guy for doing things so fast. The boy begins to realize that it seems this ice elf isn't going to just give him his life, commanding his horse to head in his direction with all his might. At some point, the ice elf interrupts this silence and holding the weapon in his hands as if playing with it, reads the offer, telling the man not to worry. He will lose nothing. The ice elf appears in his serious form. He smiles, looking only at the boy with his bright eyes and then tells him to let him ask one question first. The ice elf is not modest, immediately straightforwardly decides to ask the boy what he is doing here among ordinary people, when he himself is not human. The boy looks at the ice elf with an incomprehensible look, and directly asks what he's talking about, to which the monster is only more amused, asking if the boy doesn't know. The ice elf says, immediately starting to explain that the voice in their heads is constantly talking to them, telling them to kill giving all sorts of commands that they instantly start following. The ice elf honestly admits that he stops hearing that voice when he's around the boy, and the boy thinks the voice telling them to kill people might be the system's instructions. The boy thinks that if the voice isn't responding to himself, it's likely that Jin Wu is a player in the system itself, and the ice elf says he doesn't want sacrifices and battles. But the ice elf's words don't end there. He calmly states for the boy to instead just give those behind him now, which are his allies. The ice elf says that it is in this case that he will keep the boy alive, because he needs, apparently, it is the low-ranked hunters who will not provide any problems. The boy coldly replies to the ice elf to then also provide him with one question, continuing on, deciding to ask who they are since they decided to come to this particular place. The boy asks where they came from and what they want, these ice elves, one of whom speaks to the boy throughout, briefly beginning to pull that they... For a moment, the ice elf seemed to twitch, his smile disappearing and his gaze going blank, causing him to cut himself short without saying anything. The ice elf reiterates that they have no reason to fight, that they don't want any sacrifices, making the boy wonder, for he was saying exactly the same thing he said then. The ice elf keeps insisting that the boy just give them the ones who are now standing behind him as allies of the friendly team, and the boy doesn't understand what happened. The boy thinks about the fact that the ice elf is either ignoring his question or something else has happened, as he once again interrupts someone else's thoughts, starting to voice something else, suggesting just that. The ice elf looks at the boy carefully, saying all the words while looking him straight in the eyes, 
asking about Jin Wu accepting his offer. But would the boy be so selfish? The boy replies confidently and with a serious face that he refuses the ice elf's offer, cutting off all hopes of a quiet deal, for he doesn't care if there is a battle. The ice elf asks about whether the boy plans to fight him and his army, whether he thinks he can stand alone against them all. The boy seems to be amused by this kind of behavior from the ice elf. He doesn't let his answer wait long, supposedly chuckling at the sense of coping with them alone. The boy wonders if he is alone now, when behind him a large army of shadows rising from beneath the earth begins to appear, obeying their lord. The low-ranking hunters that are there start to panic a bit at what they see, screaming that monsters came out of nowhere and start to surround the area, but not attacking them in any way. The green-eyed girl seems to be the most impressed with everything that's going on thinking about the fact that both Dark Knights and Dark Ice Bears have appeared in the same place. One of the low-ranking men feels extremely embarrassed when he senses behind him a pack of large dark bears that towers a huge and powerful rock above him. The other man swallows his saliva nervously, meeting his gaze with the Dark Knight Igris, who leans forward slightly to look at the new man before him besides the Shadow Lord. The man apologizes instantly, as if to disturb the dark shadow with his presence, and the same in turn looks at him with the attentive gaze of his blazing eyes. The Ice Elf only smiles his wide grin, watching everything from the sidelines and not hiding his words, that this is such a cheap trick on the boy's part. The boy, in turn, only mimics the Ice Elf, asking if he heard a similar expression about a cheap trick, and in what place. After a certain amount of time, a fierce battle begins, in which it is still unknown who can win, because some Ice Elves die, as well as the shadows of the boy. Several Ice Elves try to work together to get rid of one powerful Igris, who only blocks other people's attacks with his sword, which he deftly wields in battle. The low-ranking hunters realize that they are in great danger in this place, so they break off into a run to save their lives and stay out of a deplorable situation, because they are not allowed to get involved in this battle. The boy watches from the sidelines and thinks that it seems the Ice Elf wasn't bluffing when he called it a cheap trick for his army won't last long. The boy realizes that although his dark shadows are immortal in this battle, the advantage will be lost if they continue to be destroyed like this. The boy realizes that although he has pumped up his subordinates, they should be able to handle the Ice Elves. But it seems that these enemies are not as easy as they seemed. The Ice Elf looks contentedly at the scene before him. He is confident in his own actions and words, and the boy realizes that this monster is indeed a real problem. The boy gradually begins to realize the seriousness of the problem that is growing with each passing second. He looks more closely, realizing that one look can tell that the elf is stronger. The boy stares earnestly at his opponent ahead of him, thinking about the fact that even if he teamed up with Igris, it would still be quite difficult in this battle. The boy's look changes with each time as the realization comes to his mind that the battle is one of the toughest, for here in this fight, he is no match for a common soldier. The focused boy's gaze falls on Kim Chul, who is still lying face down in the snow after that blow, unable to get up, and the boy needs a stronger shadow. The Ice Elf doesn't hide his sly smile, as if to show his confidence in a similar way, starts introducing himself by Baruch's name, asking what his opponent's name is. The boy doesn't let his answer wait long, shifts his gaze to the opponent in front of him, appearing calm in his face, and then briefly states that his name is Sung Jin Wu. The boy steps his foot on another man's sword lying on the ground to accomplish something intended at an unexpected moment for the Ice Elf. The boy, gathering all his strength in his legs to get off the ground and jump as high as possible and with great speed, pushes the sword raised in the air with his foot during the jump. The very sword that the boy had pushed away in midair with his feet still in the air landed right next to Kim Chul's body, lying in the snow, as if to hint at a future battle. At this time, the boy does not waste a second of time and appears before the Ice Elf in his battle guise, holding a dagger in his hand, with which he is going to start the battle. The boy tries to make his crowning move, with which he should have stuck his dagger directly into his opponent's head, but the latter proves to be not entirely stupid, only stepping aside to the other side. The boy's powerful dagger hits the snow precisely, thus losing its striking power that the boy had been building up for some time to attack. The Ice Elf's boot seems to override some sort of electrical wave that the boy's dagger has, so this sort of strike does not do any damage. The boy's gaze changed to a puzzled one. He didn't expect this kind of defense from the Ice Elf. He seemed much stronger than he was before. The next move, it seemed to the boy, should be a surprise to the Ice Elf, 
But strangely enough, the monster simply anticipates another's dagger movement, setting his weapon up for defense. The boy piles on his whole body to add some strength and power to the blow, thus making the Ice Elf collapse his body right into the snow. But the Ice Elf is not as simple as it seems at first glance, even calculating all of the boy's moves and exits, suddenly taking a step backwards to make the boy lose his balance. And having waited for a convenient moment for himself, the Ice Elf gathers his strength and strikes with his foot so hard that the boy flies a considerable distance away from him. The boy even begins to lurch and growl at the fact that all his actions are masterfully calculated by this Ice Elf, as he said earlier, that one is much stronger than him. The boy is not going to give up even though the situation seems extremely difficult. He jumps back a few steps away from his target and holds the dagger tighter in his hand. The Ice Elf doesn't hide his true emotions, he doesn't skimp on his words, starting to say that it's been quite a while since he's experienced such pleasure in battle. The Ice Elf is distracted from his speech for a while as some sort of magical force appears from above him, causing him to raise his head to take a better look. After a few split seconds, something falls straight to the ground, destroying the trees around it, some of the monsters that are underneath the item. As it turns out, that magical power is the mage summoned by the boy to get the Ice Elf's attention for a while. The boy looks at it all from the sidelines and is pleased with someone else's work, mentally noting that because he can, he's bought some time for the moment he needs, which is coming right now. The man rises from the cold ground, dragging something in front of him to defend himself with this implement at any moment, lurching for a while as he has not yet been able to fully recover his lost strength. The man begins to get angry, remembering very recent fragments before his blackout seemingly beginning to realize that the stranger's voice clearly belonged to a certain hunter, Jin Wu. The man fumbles for something on the ground with his hand, seeming to notice with his gaze that it is a sword of some sort, instantly realizing that this is a real chance to deal with this bratty boy. The man doesn't linger long and grabs his weapon, squeezing his hand as hard as he can, as if to take out all his anger for a while, to make it feel a little better. The boy stands not far from the spot that erupts in a huge bright flame blocking visibility to his enemy in the form of an ice elf. The boy changes in his face. He says that he couldn't die from such a maneuver, and it's too stupid for the ice elf. He says to stop wasting his time and get out. Through the bright flames, you can see the gradually looming shadow of an ice elf that has disappeared from sight for a moment, seemingly to ambush him. After a few seconds, the ice elf himself appears, with a reckless smile that is only found in this world, saying, is this really all the abilities that only a boy can have? The Ice Elf flies out of the club of burning flames with all speed, heading towards his one target, but the boy doesn't startle and doesn't move from his spot. The boy looks directly at his enemy, silent, as if he is thinking of something and is only going to take that action at the very last moment before the clash. Suddenly the voice of a green-eyed girl is heard who is watching the fight from the side because she can't participate or help the boy in any way, shouting at him. The girl called out to Jinwoo for a reason as the boy not only gets one opponent, but a second one who rushes towards him with all speed and aggression, shouting threats. Kim Chul just seems to be mad with his thoughts, wanting to cripple the boy and straighten him out without even dealing with the past situation. Turns out to be the one who wants to kill. The Ice Elf notices the presence of a new high-ranking hunter moving purposefully towards Jin Wu, rather glaring that it seems he's not the only one who's come for his head. The Ice Elf's gaze instantly changes. It seems that he saw something unexpected and amazing in front of him, which simply shocked this monster. The boy seemed to anticipate Kim Chul's hasty actions, saying that he thought so, expecting this kind of action from a stranger's side, that he would not be on his side and on his team. The boy is never alone. There will always be subordinates behind him waiting for the right moment to attack, which the distraught Kim Chul noticed too late. What a stupid mistake a highly ranked hunter has made that equals the cost of his life, just gets ambushed, and in an unexpected moment, no longer able to get revenge on anyone, a sword is thrust into his back. The boy's gaze changes to a concentrated one, one badge burning with blue flames. Behind his back rises the majestic Igris that thrust his weapon straight into Kim Chul's body. The highly ranked hunter doesn't expect such a thing, seeming to realize he's just fallen into a trap he can't get out of choking on his own blood that gushes out of his mouth. The eyes of the highly ranked hunter change to angry, even while in this position he finds the strength to be angry at someone and call them names, though he gradually dies. The highly ranked hunter can see his opponent from this angle better, the majestic egress watching him with his flame-burning eyes, controlling his every move. The boy stands with his back to Kim Chul, not even going to look at him, because whether it's from behind or in front, he's just surrounded by opponents and needs to be vigilant every second. 
Kim Chul begins to realize that the boy had apparently just anticipated his hasty actions. He instantly changes in his gaze, realizing just how much of a blunder he had made. The boy turns his head for a moment to stare directly into the stranger's eyes with his chilling blue flame glowing but emotionless gaze. The highly ranked hunter Aldai realizes that at this point he is finished, starts coughing up more and more blood, unable to free himself from the alien weapon inside his body. The ice elf observes everything happening from the side, noting that this picture is quite interesting, but smiles madly, saying that nothing will change. The boy still doesn't say anything, only smiles faintly shrouded in black gradually emanating from behind his back, and then voices the long-awaited command, Rise. The boy is completely hidden behind the black smoke enveloping his body. He can't be recognized, and where he is, but the ice elf decides to attack, glaring loudly that there is no point in hiding. Suddenly, the majestic Igris appears in place of the boy, who is just waiting for this long-awaited moment to attack, immediately swinging back at his opponent. With such power of the majestic Igris, he was able to easily fight back against this ice elf, causing the other to hover in the air and spin around. Thanks to the distraction and allure from the majestic Igris, the boy is able to get close to the lying body of the highly ranked hunter by touching it with his hand. The boy wastes no time. He has his own plan that he is obliged to realize, so he gives his command rise, causing the breathless body to gradually awaken. After a few seconds, there is a reaction, and the highly ranked hunter Kim Chul begins to scream in overwhelming pain, for your soul is being picked out. The boy can make out the shadow of the high ranked hunter up close, noting that he seems to have gotten much taller than usual, watching him more closely. The high ranked hunter's gaze betrays nothing, only will obediently follow all instructions of his shadow lord, obeying the laws of others, and the system asks for a name for him. The boy ponders different options that maybe Chul would be a good fit but that means iron, which isn't a good fit for him. So he settles on the iron option. Suddenly, the angry voice of the ice elf is heard, that he realizes the boy is just timing his attack and prepares, with his dagger aiming at Igris. The ice elf slowly begins to deal with the majestic Igris, gradually disposing of several limbs, saying that does Jin Wu really think he can stop him with that? Suddenly, the boy himself comes into view from beneath the alien mantle of the majestic Igris, vocalizing that of course he doesn't think so, being near his new knight. After a couple seconds, Iron begins to use his provocative screaming ability, causing the pupils of the icy Igris to turn completely red, pouring blood. The ice elf is amused by this sort of thing, noticing the message that the dungeon boss has been hit by the ability, realizing that he now has another opponent. The Ice Elf is confident in his movements and words, saying that he is sure to mug the new opponent first, trying to attack him but facing an impenetrable shield. The Ice Elf instantly decides to leap away from the huge shield and finds himself behind the enemy himself, which just doesn't quite have much speed due to the weight. The Ice Elf is only amused by such an opponent, saying that the one is too slow and he won't be able to match him, but the boy is not going to give up. In front of the Ice Elf, one by one, all the subordinate boys at the moment begin to appear. It is himself, the majestic Igris and Iron with whom the other will have to fight. The boy looks his chilling gaze directly at the Ice Elf, asking if he is sure now, since he will have to fight three opponents, if he can handle such pressure. Jin A's girlfriend asks the nearby Miss He Jin that do all hunters fight like this, to which the other says that if that were the case, she would never have a license. The girl states that she has never seen or heard of such a strong fight. The other man blurts out in wonder if it's a dream watching the whole battle from the sidelines. The majestic Igris differs from his partners in his speed and swiftness of movement. For the Ice Elf, it will be enough to fight him just as well as against the other three. The Ice Elf, distracted by the defense on one side of the majestic Igris attacking him, cannot control what is happening exactly behind his back at that moment. The boy takes advantage of the distraction and attacks the Ice Elf from the back, causing the other to change in face, while Jin Wu uses the effects of paralysis and bleeding. The boy looks with his chilling gaze directly at his opponent, noticing to himself the surprising and not-so-satisfying fact that in such a case the Ice Elf avoided the fatal blow. The boy gets the Ice Elf's full attention, pushing himself a few meters away from him to keep his distance and be on guard at all times. The Ice Elf can't contain his emotions on his face due to the pain, states that the one is a pushy little thing for him, and later comes the notification that the enemy resistance is high and the effects have been cancelled. The boy looks at him and says that the Ice Elf is in no position to say such a thing and that maybe he should look behind him. The Ice Elf instantly begins to feel some sort of fear, 
for he may be looking back one last time before he is finished here doing what the boy said. Now the Ice Elf can look at the fact that he is left completely alone on this battlefield against strong opponents, because his army is completely defeated, as the boy says. The Ice Elf, noticing the whole horrifying picture for him, can't contain the anger overflowing his body, starting to insult the boy on emotion and seeming to act rashly as he had with Kim Chul. The Ice Elf starts to get very angry. Even the air around him becomes powerful, flying towards the boy and saying that his soldiers will disappear as soon as he disposes of Jin Wu. But the boy is not going to give up. He still stands on his own and persistent slow steps will gradually get to his cherished goal, seemingly about to throw his weapon. The Ice Elf is visibly puzzled by such a move on the part of the boy. He watches as the stranger's weapon flies straight in his direction rather quickly, seemingly either distracted or seriously making a crowning motion. The Ice Elf only smiles, as if to mock the boy for such an action, that if he thinks to kill him just because of one dagger movement, how dare he think of such a thing. The boy extends his hand, which holds great magic and power. He dares to use the ability of the ruler's touch, focusing on him. High-ranking hunter Jin Wu's flying weapon begins to noticeably accelerate and even spin around, all just thanks to the guy's ability. The Ice Elf watches this and seems to realize that the dagger has indeed sped up meaning that the weapon thrown in his direction was for a reason and in earnest. The Ice Elf can only extend his arm to catch the flying weapon, lest it hit his body with a deadly weapon, colliding with some force yet. Suddenly, the Ice Elf is seized by one of the boy's subordinates named Iron, completely blocking the other's body movements, preventing him from even twitching to the side. At some point, someone's hands start reaching upward from beneath the ground, as if to the sun itself, only to rise with their feet on the ground and fulfill their master's errand. Some sort of magical and fiery force appears that envelops the ground in a large crushing blow right where the Ice Elf and Iron are, preventing him from moving. Iron stands heroically in the same place, but is unlikely to be able to issue any kind of rebuff to the Ice Elf, as the latter is clearly not going to die so easily from something stupid. A couple of seconds later, the Ice Elf appears, but in a completely different guise, with several wounds and abrasions on his body, without outer clothing, but with eyes blazing with flames. The Ice Elf gets completely out of the stranger's grip, sinking to the ground using his magic power, which is completely reflected back at the backstanding iron, taking the damage. The Ice Elf is no longer going to put up with this kind of attempt to kill him. He is finally angry, opening his mouth in screams that he will crush every one of those who only wish to fight him. The Ice Elf is about to go in search of the boy to start a battle with him once and for all, but blood appears from somewhere, directly flowing from the monster's body at that very moment. The Ice Elf instantly froze in place, watching as the boy that had stuck his dagger in front of him slowly and in small pieces began to loom up. The boy only smiles a satisfied smile, having accomplished exactly the plan he had once envisioned, stating briefly to the Ice Elf that this seemed to be the end for the monster. The Ice Elf still finds some strength to, against the dagger in his body, grab the hand of the boy that holds his weapon, as if trying to pull it back out. The Ice Elf immediately burst into a scream, hatefully shouting about who the boy thought he was, if he had decided to deal with his opponent in such a manner. The Ice Elf, completely distracted from what was going on behind his back, instantly falls silent, seemingly beginning to sense someone's presence that intends to kill him. Iron doesn't let up for long, the last action happening rather quickly, not the kind of action the Ice Elf had envisioned as he took the death blow fully on himself. The alien weapon gradually rises upwards, allowing everyone present to see the Ice Elf's body lying on the ground, no longer able to move from such a blow. The boy looks at the lying body of his opponent, finally realizing that he was able to defeat such a strong opponent, that he had indeed taken up enough time and effort here. The boy exhales in relief realizing that now he can really relax, because the notification comes that his level has increased, which means that the boss is defeated. The nearby low-ranked hunters that stand watching from the sidelines are still trembling slightly, for the fight was quite terrifying and time-consuming. The boy watches as Iron relentlessly, time after time, delivers powerful blows to the already breathless body of the Ice Elf, as if hypnotized. The boy tells him to stop, points a finger in his direction, and then Iron instantly calms down, looking at the Overlord incomprehensibly, and the boy thinks he's still just as dumbfounded. The boy turns the other way, saying he's afraid to imagine what the future holds, since Iron is such a crazy, do-it-at-your-will knight. But he stares after him. Aaron is still just as incomprehensible now, looking at the majestic Igris who stares back at him, 
Unlike himself, a rather calm and not so fiery knight, it was as if Iron was trying to understand at least from the majestic Igris what he had just done wrong, and the latter in turn only broke their eye contact, exhaling tiredly. Iron has even more questions as the majestic knight simply turns the other way. Supposedly he's not with him now and doesn't know this knight at all. Aaron is left with only one choice as to who to turn to for an answer to the question. He turns towards the remaining knights and they look back at him. A couple more seconds pass and the joyful knights begin to shout, raising their hands in the air. After all, they were able to defeat such a strong boss as an ice elf. Why shouldn't they be happy? The boy, watching the whole funny picture from the side, says that it is time for his subordinates to return, because it has been a long time since the battle began and its end. The low-ranking hunters, who are still watching the boy from back when the battle began, are incomprehensibly interrogating him about where they should go back to. Suddenly, some kind of magical ball starts to form around the cleared and calm field, which gradually starts to get bigger. At some point, some split second happens, and some sort of portal becomes out of the balloon, through which all the people here and the survivors can return to their homes. The boy, pointing his finger in the direction of the opened portal, says that it is a gateway, thanks to which it is possible to get out to the familiar for all of them environment of life, which cannot but be happy. The low-ranking hunters begin to act joyful, some even crying with overwhelming emotions, for they were the ones who were able to last this long here. Unlike the other hunters, the boy looks serious, but even relaxed, because now you can exhale, now everything will definitely fall into place. The boy stops at the body of an ice elf lying on the ground, thanks to which all the people who survived here will be able to return to their homes through an opened portal. There are still people standing at the red gate, waiting for the moment when the survivors finally get out of the dangerous place, when they can see these heroes in person. Chief An is worried about the rest of the people behind that gate. He looks at his wristwatch and says that the time is currently around three in the morning, and inside the gate a week should have passed. Chief An addresses the master, suggesting that he go rest while they wait. But the other says how can he relax when his charges are there? Suddenly, their attention is drawn to the red gate, which has finally started to give some sort of reaction. Something amazing is happening inside it. It seems to be opening. Chief An loudly proclaims that he's finally starting to see people inside the red gate, which means the dungeon has been cleared out and some recruits have survived, which can't be good. Master begins to think of Kim Chul, that did his ward manage to survive. He happily begins to gaze into the crowd of people that gradually begin to look out. Master starts mentally listing all the faces of the people he sees. It's the hunter Park Hee Jin, the hunter Ko Myung Hwan, and Yoon Ki Jun. They're the ones who came back and survived. Gradually, the rest of the hunters begin to be seen, who come out of the dangerous but already cleaned up dungeon unharmed, with Jin Woo in their company. Chief An can't help but rejoice. He clenches his palm into a fist and smiles as he realizes that his old acquaintance has made it through this dungeon and survived, that he is alive and in one piece. Finally, the gates close, and all the survivors from that dungeon appear before the humans. The master begins to panic over what has become of Kim Chul and why he is not among the low-ranking hunters. The green-eyed girl, instead of rejoicing for her life saved from death, bows her head down as if it were her fault that so few of the recruits survived. The master wonders aloud that did only low-ranked hunters manage to survive. Is such a thing possible here, that not a single living A rank and only one rank B? The master begins to wonder disbelievingly what could have happened inside the dangerous red gate that Kim Chul failed to handle, and the boy turns to the girl and says he'll take her home. The boy is about to leave this place, not wanting to make contact with anyone, when the master grabs him by the shoulder, offering to talk for a while, so that the other simply has no choice. But the boy has a tough temper of his own, removes the other's hand from his shoulder, and lazily states that he's tired enough. But if the master wants to know something, let him ask his guild members. The master at such words looks grimly and with a horrified look, he is in no way satisfied with such a reaction of the boy that he even freezes for a while and remains silent. His hand clutches at the stranger's clothes again, but much stiffer than before, clearly not intending to let the boy go, for this was not a request. Introducing himself as Baek Yun Ho, the guild master of the White Tiger, the man thinks that maybe it was a threat on his part, and after stating that they lost nine people because of this incident, can't he ask a couple questions? The man, when he speaks all his words and shares his own grief, only squeezes the other man's shoulder harder, not letting go a step away from himself, and asks what the boy thinks about it. The boy instantly changes in his gaze, irritatedly stating that he saved the three remaining people. Shouldn't he, the great master, originally thank him for such a thing? 
The boy looks with his cold gaze straight into the eyes of the master, in whose eyes you can see all the emotions that overwhelm him, similar to anger and irritation. But what becomes surprising is that the master reacts calmly to the boy's words, loosens his own grip and turns away in another, saying that he is right to apologize. In the next few minutes, the boy moves away from the master toward his car. Girlfriend Jin A also goes with him, already taking a seat in someone else's car to get home. The girl is sitting in a quiet place for herself, holding a hot drink in her hands and trying to warm up as she hears the voice of the master calling her name and asking her something. Master still asks his question, though. He asks Miss Park Hee Jin about who that boy is and why he looks so annoyed, which can't help but surprise him. The girl lowers her gaze, still holding the drink in her hands, and states that she's not sure about this. But after defeating the boss, the boy yelled something three times while standing over the corpse. But later, Chief An enters the conversation, apologizing before saying that it's probably because the boy is tired. After all, he's not a bad person. To which the master replies that the chief shouldn't worry. The master turns the other way away from Chief Anna, addressing him about why he hasn't recruited the boy yet. And the chief interjects as if he heard him. The man thinks that since the boy is so cocky even when standing in front of the master, he must be willing to lose an arm in a fight with him, and afterward he tells the chief to hurry up and do it. The chief bows, saying he'll do his best to make it happen, but the master says it's not enough, and he'll help him get the boy to join their guild at any cost. Chief An thinks about his own eyes deceiving him. He exhales and hides his smile slightly, saying that he understood the master's instruction and will try to comply. The car rushes in its own direction, overtaking the other cars and outrunning them at its own speed, with a fairly quiet atmosphere going on all around. The boy driving his own car props his head up with his hand and thinks about something while simultaneously driving and going in his assigned direction. The boy recalls trying to take an ice elf with him, but three attempts were wasted and he failed. Was it due to the difference in strength? The boy pulls out the trophy left behind by the defeated ice elf in the form of another man's weapon, which at least that's what makes Jin Wu happy, since he only got the dagger. After a while, the boy reaches the appointed place, stops at a house teeming with many lives where a girl lives. The boy rests his hands on the steering wheel, folds his arms over it, and leans over slightly, vocalizing to the girl that she did well this time, and she bows and wishes him a safe trip. The boy is about to leave his seat to head to his next destination when his attention is caught by the girl's shriek of, Appa! causing Jin Woo to look up in surprise. The girl is still standing by the car, slightly raising her gaze to the boy, so embarrassed by everything that's going on, awkwardly says she thanks him for everything, continuing that they'll see each other later. The boy looks after this girl, who almost ran towards her house, apparently because of her overwhelming embarrassment, and then thinks about the fact that they will see each other later. The boy shifts his gaze to the time, which shows 3 a.m. and 50 minutes, aghast that indeed the time is nearing late midnight. The boy trots out of the parking spot outside the girl's house, stating that it's long past time for him to meet up with Jin Ho and go on a dungeon sweep together. The boy looks at someone in front of him, clearly already tired of the unfolding picture in front of him, asking if Jin Ho took the car for the sake of it, since Jin Wu wanted to pick him up. Jin Ho, dressed amusingly in his armor, says that since Hyung Nim helps him all the time, so why doesn't he come after him, briefly announcing that it's time for them to hit the road. Suddenly, Jin Woo interrupts the silence with his words that they'll need to grab someone along the way, and Jin Ho asks who it will be as the car touches down. The boy is sitting in the back seats on the phone, addressing some Seon Yi and telling her to get out of the house, because they'll pick her up on the way, and Jin Ho interjects about her. The boy ends the call, and at Jin Ho's words, he briefly vowels, interrupting everyone else's thoughts with his answer alone, looking at the cell phone. Jin Ho's gaze changes, as if surprised that the boy is talking to her immediately starting to wonder what kind of relationship they have with her, since he knows her number and is so friendly with her. After a while of silence after the last dialogue, Jin Ho interrupts the silence by addressing the boy to say that they have reached their appointed place. Jin Ho suddenly turns to face the boy, and even angrily blurts out that maybe it's time for him to call the girl his sister-in-law, to which Jin Woo is surprised and says that she's only his sister's friend. Suddenly, a pretty girl dressed in a green blouse and light jeans comes into view, saying hello and good morning, addressing Appa. The girl starts walking to the car and walks up the steps to the top, holding the door slightly and saying hello to Jin Ho, calling him leader, and the latter also cheerfully says hello. Jin Ho watches the stranger's conversation from the sidelines while the boy asks if she slept last night, to which she replies that she couldn't sleep, and Jin Woo thoughtfully offers to let her sleep in the car. 
Jin Ho's face changes more and more the longer he listens to the conversation, while the girl asks Jin Wu if he himself slept, and he replies that he took a little nap, but it was four in the morning when he got home. Jin Ho seems to start thinking darker things, changing in his face more and remembering someone else's words that the one to him is just his sister's friend. But the guy turns to the boy after a while. Jin Ho even seems to start sweating from the thoughts overwhelming him. He grimly starts to say that Han Xion Yi is an underage girl, but the boy still doesn't get the point. Jin Ho doesn't seem to have any hope of understanding from the boy anymore, thinking the latter is completely insane, but he shouldn't judge Jin Wu given his mediocre standards. Some of them say that it's high time they dealt with everyone sooner, others support the idea, and the girl exclaims, Appa, in her words again, which surprises Jin Ho more. Suddenly there is a kind of gloomy atmosphere around. Everything is so dark, as if if you gaze into the darkness, you will start to see scary silhouettes. Some sort of stone monster appears, not surprisingly small enough, as if it were a piece of someone's head lost in space. Apparently this stone monster can pick itself apart and even disassemble, seemingly using some sort of ability to do so. Jin Ho watches everything happening from the sidelines, starting to gradually get worried, because this is something new to him and even scary making him feel afraid. The boy, unlike Jin Ho, looks used to such monsters, standing calmly in front of the battle taking place in front of him between his own subordinates and the monsters. The boy forgets that today is the very first time Jin Ho sees these particular monsters here, and after the boy says that they're his subordinates who won't hurt anyone, suddenly Jin Ho blurts out that can the boy really summon them thanks to his ability. And the boy replies that it's certainly a bit hard to initially understand, but... The boy continues that the fact that his subordinates are hunting is quite convenient for him, and then continues that his knights can run some more small errands while watching the mine work. Jin Ho's look immediately changes, as if upset that his work has been taken away, and then asks if he can at least collect crystals. And the boy asks why he would want to do that. Jin Ho casts his gaze downward, sincerely glaring that he feels like he feels out of place here, as if he's a third extra among the regular people. The boy, watching Jin Ho from the sidelines and listening to his words, only smiles, mentally taking note of the fact that his partner does look so funny some moments. The boy observes the situation and thinks that given today's raids with Jin Ho, their work should end tomorrow, and the boy packs the crystals into his suitcase, almost crying with fear. As expected from Jin Wu's skill, then the next day they were able to clear 19 dungeons with Jin Ho and his assistant knights. The atmosphere in this place is magical, quite calm. There are no scary monsters on the eastern side of the United States. It is desirable to just relax here. But in any marvelous place there is something eerily dangerous and scary for ordinary humans and low-rank hunters. Here is an A-rank dungeon from where screams can be heard. Some man is looking at something in front of him in horror. He is James, an A-rank hunter who is currently in the A-rank dungeon. The man looks at someone, mentally and with horror at the fact that all of his attacking forces have been destroyed. He just can't believe it looking at this horror around him. The man continues to stare at some monster as he looks as if he is the most real human being, his black hair developing in the wind and his character is steadfast and powerful. The man's face was changing with every second, thinking about the fact that after going through the entire dungeon, they still hadn't found a single monster. He thought that something had happened, but that such a monster could appear in the boss's room. For all the energy of an A-rank dungeon to be equal to the energy coming from one monster is just unbelievable. Is this monster so strong that it's turning in his direction? Suddenly, the monster in human form shouts at the man, who already falls straight to the ground out of fear, starting to crawl away from him and telling him not to come near him. The man in human form grumbles that his screaming is making his ears hurt, and then continues to tell him not to worry, because he just turned them all off, not killed them. A man in armor sits on the cold ground all shivering with fear and afraid of any stranger's movement. And the monster in human form says that he is human. And why did they attack him? The man continues to shake, unable to deal with his emotions, while the other thinks that the one apparently just doesn't understand him, and it's not like the Yankee can understand him. Suddenly, this black-haired man gets the idea to put his hand forward with his thumb up and say he is Korean. The man peeks out from under his long hair, looks with the benevolent look that any ordinary person has, and then continues that he just wants to go home. Some conversation swarms near one of the restaurants, someone saying that it looks like they've finally dealt with the whole raid and can just rest easy. Jin Ho apologizes to his Hyungnam, saying that he'd like to invite him to a more luxurious place, but the boy replies that he's more worried that the place isn't to the young master's taste. 
The boy continues, asking about what Jin Ho is going to do now. Since the raids are finally over, a notification comes in that a malicious substance has been discovered and detoxified. Jin Ho replies that he can get his Guildmaster's license as soon as he passes the easy written exam, and then he'll take it and talk to his father, clinking glasses with the guy. Jin Ho is slightly embarrassed, he thinks about after his agreement is over with Jin Wu, which even saddens him a little because so many happy memories they have together. The boy reflects on the fact that getting a building worth 30 billion is certainly nice, but more than anything he wanted to level up, so he has no reason to wait any longer. But something still prevents the boy from doing so. At the same moment, Jin Ho observes the stranger's emotions on his face and quietly states what the boy will do now. What he will do. The boy holds in his hand a certain object, which is a gate key that opens the doors of the demonic castle and is obtained through the gatekeeper's device. The boy clutches this key that is precious to him in his hand, remembers what dangerous creatures are behind those doors, and afterwards states that he will go somewhere he needs to go for a while. Jin Ho is already starting to gradually get drunk, drinking a glass of alcohol one after another, and afterwards says that if the boy treats him like a brother, he won't bother him anymore. The boy thinks about the other's behavior, which apparently Jin Ho took his words the wrong way again, and afterwards calls out his name, drawing the boy's attention to himself. The boy doesn't languish with his question, looking intently at Jin Ho to see the other's reaction, and then bluntly asking him what he is to him afterward. Jin Ho starts awkwardly vocalizing that he has an older brother with whom they're ten years apart, but he doesn't really like him, so they don't spend much time together. The boy shifts his gaze to the food on the table and continues that back when he was still in trouble, Jin Wu was the one who saved the guy, saved his life, and helped when he was in trouble. Jin Ho earnestly continues and admits that it's the boy who is most suitable for him as an older brother. He seems much more kin to him. The boy's face changes, surprised by Jin Ho's words, as he didn't even realize he'd heard those words, but it's nice. The boy only covers his eyes and smiles because he started to think about something else, and afterward he says that if Jin Ho really thinks about him like that, then... Then the boy will think of Jin Ho as his little brother, which surprises the other, who is already sitting embarrassed, all timid, because he is ready for any negative word in his direction. Jin Ho seems already moved by the stranger's words and acceptance of such a sincere acknowledgement from the guy. He's already flooding with tears of joy and affectionately calling out to Young Nim, unable to contain his emotions. Jin Ho doesn't hold back his flood of tears. He's already completely moved by the stranger words of his new big brother, and after tearfully asks if he can hug him, to which the boy already panics and says that he's drunk. Jin Ho immediately blurts out loudly in denial that he's not drunk and has never been that sane, immediately crawling off somewhere down the table, and the boy tiredly vocalizes that he's really something with something. While Jin Ho tearfully lies weeping with mortification in an attempt to hug his big brother, Jin Wu listens to what's going on outside, having heard someone's question about a major incident that occurred during recruit training. The masters are showered with more questions, asking if all the high-ranked hunters died and the low-ranked ones are left. They also talk about the man who helped them, and the master says that the investigation is complete. The boy notices something about the extraneous team, changes his gaze and looks somewhere forward, continuing to listen to questions about why the master is preventing the survivors from being interviewed. The boy listens for a while longer, thinking about the fact that the last question concerns his personality more than anyone else and then he hears the master say tiredly that this is definitely the end of it. The master sits down tiredly in his chair and sips his cravat, glaring that these damn reporters are going to get him because they're so damn good at extracting information. Suddenly, the master is distracted by someone's voice coming from the tube that Hunter Min Byung Gu wants to talk to him, which he should do, and the man briefly says to be connected to him. The foreman hears the next question from the guy about why the foreman's phone was off to which the guy replies that he planned to keep his head down until the reporters calmed down. The next thing he hears from Byung-gu is about the Red Gate, which he's only heard of in Japan, and the master interjects that he's not really in Japan right now, saying that he's not in the mood for jokes right now. Byung-gu tells the master not to worry about it, because he has some big news with him, which the man interjects, saying he thought he was in Japan. The guy continues that about a week ago, Japan secretly invited the Korean Hunters Association. He realized it was serious enough, Korea would soon find out about it, and the master asks what they asked them to do. Suddenly the man's face changes after only hearing one sentence about Japan requesting someone who participated in the raid on Jeju Island for counseling. The master instantly lights up because he's heard something that interests him, 
and he wants as many leads and information as possible, so he asks Byung-gu for more details. The guy, according to the master, is just starting to go on about what he learned a couple days ago, because the S-rank gate opened on Jeju Island more than four years ago. Guy continues that after the failure of three operations, the government simply decided to stop all attempts on this island, which are considered a failure. Byung-gu confesses after the story that it was on that island and in that gate that he and his Hyungnam almost died, and the master, after listening, says that it's the kind of nightmare he doesn't want to remember. The guy continues that he feels like there was a mutation there, and the man interjects, saying that it doesn't mean anything, since they're still stuck on that island. Suddenly, the boy cuts off all the calm thoughts of the majestic master by stating the dreaded fact that now these monsters might just fly across the ocean, leaving the island. The boy announces the terrible news that the ant discovered on the coast of Japan, as it turned out, has wings. So it easily flew across the ocean and ended up in a quiet and peaceful place with people. The huge and winged ant flies at high speed in its designated direction, seemingly to wreak havoc specifically in Japan, which is closest to Jeju Island. The boy continues with something that makes the horror more horrifying, stating that these things are just evolving into horrible creatures. It's a real disaster. The girl stands in the middle of the room, tying her hair in a ponytail and stating that her older brother has done nothing but stay home the last few days, and the boy grabs his backpack. The boy puts it on his shoulder, seemingly about to head somewhere this afternoon, and the girl says that is he really going somewhere so suddenly, and he replies that he will be gone for about a week. The girl snidely adds to the older brother in the wake that maybe he is not going there alone. Is not she right? It seems that her brother has something on his mind. The girl mocks him to which the boy waves away and says that she is wrong. Before the boy appears a tall, multi-story and modern building in which clearly invested a fair amount of money, but at the bottom of the building itself, there is some kind of magic happening. If you go inside the tallest building, you can see one of the corridors blazing with fire, as if it were a hellish road leading only to one strong and powerful boss. The boy is standing by the blazing road, thinking about the moment he defeated Cerberus, he outclassed him by 20 times, and now Jin Wu's level is three times higher. And yes, this time he doesn't have to run. There's some chaos going on around the boy, the room is pretty damn hot, but Jin Wu isn't about to back down from the gate that appears right before his eyes. He's gotta finish his goal after all, gotta pull it off. The boy holds in his hand the precious key to the castle gate that opens the doors of the demonic castle. A notification comes that whether Jin Wu wants to use the key to go inside. Once the boy responds positively to the alert, a second one arrives at the same moment, telling him that his quest has been successfully accepted, instantly opening the door to this dungeon. The boy, without wasting much time, just with a calm soul and without any fear, goes through this door, where there is pitch darkness and he is the only one here. The boy examines the area with his eyes, notices that this is an ordinary royal corridor, no monsters here, a very ordinary place but there seems to be an entrance at the end. The boy is about to go to his appointed goal, as at the same moment he receives a notice with a task, which he has not had for a long time. He needs 10,000 demonic souls. The boy parallel moves towards that very entrance and also thinks about the fact that the reward for accomplishment sounds pretty damn incredible. A characterization boost and an item to choose from. The boy remembers that there are several items in the store whose prices have crossed 10 billion gold. Perhaps, if Jin Wu completes this quest, he can acquire one. The boy opens the doors to see what's inside this mysterious place, thinking that there must be hard work for such a reward. But Jin Wu notices that there's not a soul in the place. As soon as the boy takes a closer look at what is happening in front of him with more attentive eyes, he is instantly amazed at what he sees in front of him. He can't even say the words. The boy observes everything in front of him. What a ruined road this place is, as if there is a lot of battering going on. How many windy and dangerous streams there are, realizing that this is an open space. The boy is simply at a loss for words. Cannot believe this happening to him, after all, who could have thought that the open space could be in some dungeon. The boy looks at the area in front of him, begins to see familiar nooks and crannies of the same city, same buildings, same atmosphere, but more terrifying and violent realizing that this is a mirror copy of Seoul. The boy tries to look a little farther through the wind currents that seem to gather in a pile as if out of spite to force Jin Wu to pass on, but notices several pairs of red eyes, remembering the task at hand. The boy needs to collect 10,000 demonic souls, which means that in this place at least and demons are no less, that only expect the presence of one boy, which they will try to deal with. 
The boy looks at the demons that are slowly appearing in this place, with what hunger they look at him, and also realizes that some of the monsters have a few demonic souls in them as well. The boy thinks about the fact that he seems to have lied a bit to Jin A about going for a week, whether he can handle the task in that amount of time with a backpack in his hand. Suddenly, the boy starts to feel some movement behind him, which seems to have been slightly unexpected, but could Jin Wu somehow foolishly blunder in front of these demons? The boy reacts as quickly as possible, his gaze changing to a serious one as if to hypnotize the monsters near him, and then extends his hand with his backpack. He notices a large number of terrible monsters in front of him that are trying to get to the boy as close as possible, but how stupid they are, if they do not realize that they have already been dealt with at the snap of a finger. A more aggressive demon person appears in front of the boy, that tries to stun Jin Wu with its loud scream, already opening its huge maw to use magical power towards him. But not so, for the boy has great speed and good technique of his abilities, is already behind this monster, having disposed of it at the snap of a finger, as well as the others, saying that there is no problem so far. The boy, having dealt with the first batch of these monsters, smiles as he observes that he can now also observe the progress of his own experience, which is quite convenient for him. Some man is holding up metal sticks with two fingers, starting a serious thread about how it seems someone is starting to make a statement about something important. A gray-haired man in a business suit comes into view, inquiring about the fact that this person really wants to become the head of Yu Jin's guild, which seems like a slightly surprising statement to him. This someone turns out to be Jin Ho, who is dressed up in a business suit, looks serious and replies that yes, he wants to become the head of the Yu Jin guild. The man immediately pulls out a report, daring to look at all the things his son has been doing all this time, and afterwards replies aloud that his guild leader's license and dungeon income report. The boy looks earnestly at the expression on his own father's face, who he thinks is wavering between choosing himself and his older brother, so who he decides to choose as head. Suddenly, all of Jin Ho's thoughts are cut short by a man speaking as if he had found something and the boy says that inviting an outsider to be the guild leader is a big risk. Suddenly, the man continues that he wants to introduce Jin Ho to someone, which draws the attention of the boy, who already seems to be starting to glow with overwhelming joy. The man says a short enter for some unknown to Jin Ho to start walking into the place, gradually opening the doors in front of him. Some man who is a hunter named Ko Myung Hwan appears in front of them, wearing a blue sports sweatshirt and awkwardly saying hello in a polite tone. The gray-haired man states that this hunter is one of those who were able to survive the recent incident with the Red Gate and the White Tiger Guild, motioning for the other to take a seat while the boy thinks about his own. The boy thinks about this hunter being chased by the media, so why is he here now? And the man says to tell his son about who was with him at that moment. The hunter begins to go into the details of what happened exactly at that moment. He begins his story that there was a huntress with him then, who looked like an ordinary high school girl, but... Hunter starts to mention Sung Jin Wu, which brings out their Jin Ho's surprise, which is in no way hidden in his big eyes. He's surprised at the mention of this particular man. Jin Ho is completely clueless. He starts to panic, wondering if his Hyungnam was at the Red Gate, and afterwards asks who was the Huntress, to which the Hunter replies that it was Miss Han Seon Yi. Hunter continues that they were able to get out thanks to Mr. Sung Jin Wu, and the boy laughs awkwardly, wondering if that's why the two of them became friends so suddenly. The man starts to say that at first they were puzzled by the appearance of two E-Rang hunters for the sake of gaining experience. And the boy thinks to himself that it makes sense here, because he knows about Jin Wu's power for a reason. But most of all, what now alarms the boy is that he knows about him not only one but many others. And because of this negotiation with his father, the silence that suddenly appeared is interrupted by a hunter asking if these people have some information about Jin Wu because the White Tiger Guild doesn't say anything and they called him almost immediately. Suddenly, Hunter myung Hwan's sprinkled and uncontrolled speech is cut short by a man who tells him that he's said enough already, so it's time to stop. The man earnestly states that the hunter most likely knows that the man is gathering information on known hunters, and yes, he has already tried to investigate with the Red Gate, but the man looks at his son with a serious look, starting to say, addressing Jin Ho, that he never expected to find his name on his own list of raid participants. The man continues to say in a serious tone that his son chose the wrong time to negotiate with him, and the boy lowers his gaze and remains silent, not knowing what to say in response. The boy listens to the continuation of the man's words about he only got his license because of Jin Wu's abilities and help, asking if he understands that, to which the boy replies yes. The boy thinks about how there's no difference between him and his brother, since they've both gotten help 
and his father hardly has any justification for choosing Jin Ho, asking him what he'd say to that. But the boy is not going to back down from his goal. He says the following with a serious and demanding face, stating for the man to entrust Yu Jin's guild to him. Suddenly the man pronounces the short well without any hesitation or nerves, with a most calm face and even a hidden smile, which extremely surprises the boy. If you look at Jin Ho's face, you can read all his jumbled emotions at the moment. He doesn't know how he should react to such calmness from his father. The man briefly adds that he is leaving the management of Yu Jin's guild to him. But the boy asks why, to which the man says that leaving the guild to an outsider is risky. The boy begins to say uncertainly that he is a cheat in this case, to which the man replies, gradually rising from his seat, that does anyone behave sincerely in business negotiations? The man finally rises from his seat, looks down at his son with a serious gaze, and begins to call out the name of the hunter Sung Jin Wu. The man points at the paper, looking at the other person's image, whose biography is fully described in these documents, stating for the boy to be drawn specifically to Yu Jin's guild. The boy looks with his confident gaze straight at his father, realizes that this is the first and only chance for him, so he loudly proclaims that he will do everything in his power. The boy thinks about the fact that a tiger's child remains a tiger, he means about himself and his father, who he will try to be like all his future, and the man briefly says fine. The man starts buttoning up the buttons on his suit, clearly intending to gradually leave this place, and the boy thinks about the fact that he's already tried to bring two S-ranked hunters into their guild. The man brings up the fact that Cha Hai In is from the Hunters Guild and Myung Byung Gu, who recently retired, but the first hunter is taking over as Choi In's deputy. The man also recalls that based on all of this, he suggested him to become the head of Yu Jin's guild with good funding, but on the other side was Byung Gu. The man reflects on the fact that the body of a huge flying ant has been discovered on the shores of Japan. If there is a fourth raid, he will have the opportunity to invite it to them. The man wonders if he will be the first to gain the favor of these two hunters, or if his son will be able to attract the hunter Sung Jin Woo more quickly. The man closes his eyes as if trying to concentrate on his thoughts, is silent for a while, and in his mind sets his mind to the fact that everything will be clear after a while. The boy stands, rests his foot on the breathless body of one of the monsters, and looks around him for any danger, indicating that he still has a long journey ahead of him. The boy observes the cleared area around him, thinking about the fact that the original difficulty of the demonic castle isn't that high, so this is where he cleared the area. The boy thinks the level of these monsters is at best equal to D-rank, but he has gained enough experience. Will he be able to mop up nine dungeons in four hours of time? The boy reflects on the fact that as his level rises, so does the amount of experience he requires. But in other words, then raising experience is hard enough in this case. The boy thinks about how he felt it when he met Bak Yun Ho. His current rank then was barely reaching S rank, so in order to become a stronger Jin Wu, he needs to stay relaxed. The boy holds in his hand, which is a pass to the second floor of the demonic castle that is used in the spatial magic circle on the first floor, thinking that it's time to go to the second floor. The boy stares at the incredible picture in front of him, thinking of the spatial magic circle that someone must be in, right by the soul tower. The boy looks at what's going on around himself, doesn't languish with time, for he already has little of it, so he says to make anyone with the rank of soldier show up. Something incredibly magical happens in front of the boy. A rather huge creature appears, completely black in color but a friendly enough monster. As soon as the monster turns around to face him, the boy realizes that it is the leader of the frost bears in front of him, huge enough that it even resembles a certain tank. It doesn't take long for the boy to jump up in the air a couple times and land in a fighting stance right on the ice bear's back, slightly expectantly asking if they're going to go. The boy is about to leave the area with a calm soul because he has cleaned it up to the end. But judging by the changed look in Jin Wu's eyes, someone is going to stop him from doing so. And these sudden, someone, are monsters that gradually spread out a kind of pile in front of the boy, forcing him to just stop and not go anywhere because it is necessary to deal with them. The boy sighs, glaring loudly about meeting those pesky monsters again, realizing he's not going anywhere and needs to divert from his plan for a while by dealing with them first. The boy doesn't hide his annoyed expression towards those annoying monsters, but suddenly the ice bear moves with great speed, carrying the boy away. The boy is struggling to sit in one place, trying to hold on to someone else's fur, when a huge ice bear starts moving frantically all over the area, swinging its huge paws around. The boy is encouraged by such an action on the part of the ice bear. He begins to smile and hold on stronger, 
exclaiming that this bear is a real beast. From now on, he will be called a tank. The boy screams, forcing the ice bear to obey his words about running, blowing all the monsters off their feet in different directions to run until he reaches the magic circle. Before our eyes appears a rather quiet city of Washington, which at the moment the sun is shining, bustling with its own atmosphere and constant bustle, because a lot of people are here. If you look between the settled buildings, one of the other buildings you can catch a glimpse of is the United States Hunters Bureau, where everyone gathers here. A certain number of men in business suits are standing just outside the panoramic window. One of them asks if this man is here, to which he has answered that it is so accurate and unmistakable. The deputy director of the Hunters Bureau inquires about what they have learned about the man's identity, to which he is told that the man claims to be living in South Korea. The next question is asked by a man that how a hunter from South Korea could be from a dungeon on the other side of the earth, and he is told that the man was stuck in a dungeon as long as ten years ago. This is an unprecedented case, for not only did the man come out of that gate, but the rest of the group of people couldn't handle him, and the man asks if all that information is about him. The deputy director has answered that they are more inclined to believe it is a monster with human memories. And yes, without help from the S-ranked hunter, all of Washington could be in danger. The subordinate continues that after they contacted the Vulture Guild, then word got out about the S-rank hunter, that he speaks fluent Korean and is now in D.C. The deputy director immediately mentions the chief hunter of the Vulture Guild, Mr. Huang, asking if he's on his way now, and is told that he recently finished his business in Korea and is on his way back. The deputy director briefly states that the interrogation had better continue tomorrow morning. A slightly hunched man walks through the building, thinking about what a shitty day he's having. The man is angry at the mere thought that the parasite he's been chasing so much lately is just stuck in the red gate. He grumbles aloud in displeasure as if they'd picked a fine time. Moving on to the men who are observing the imprisoned man in the cell, they discuss about what the man's name is, and he is told that the pronunciation is a little hard. But the very man believed to be a monster with human memories is a hunter from Korea named Sung Il Hwan, who has his head down and is thinking about something of his own. The boy watches the picture unfold before him that a once whole building begins to blaze with intense fire and he knows that each floor of the demonic castle is a different dimension. The pass to the second floor of the demonic castle that is used in the spatial magic circle on the first floor is next to a huge monster that is shackled with chains. The boy continues his thought that if this giant tower has a hundred floors, then we can say that there are as many as a hundred different and dangerous worlds. The boy gradually counts, beginning with the second floor, continuing with the third and fourth, and afterward ending with the 27th. There are so many of them that one can lose count. The boy recalls that while time was going by fast, he was climbing at a terrifying pace up more and more floors, tackling monsters with all speed and gaining experience. The boy gradually begins to understand the whole essence of this dungeon, thinking about the fact that the complexity of the higher demons will increase proportionally and the same difference between the levels of hunters. The boy realizes that his main problem is time, because if there are a hundred floors, it's impossible to get there in a week. He was also afraid that this dungeon would be too dangerous, but all the battles are boring to him. The boy's brain is gradually starting to even get tired of counting how many total floors he has traveled so far, stopping at exactly the fiftieth floor of this dungeon. Before the boy appears a stronger demon who is the ruler of the lower levels named Insatiable Volcano that watches with such hunger with its three eyes. But naturally, in addition to the boss of this floor will be several more strong his subordinates, with whom you will have to fight at the same time, which gradually appear before the boy. The boy observes a bloody huge ruler of the lower levels sitting on his throne, with an army of monsters spread out at his huge feet, ready to do his bidding. The boy realizes that now he will have to deal with the demon boss. He thinks about the fact that this giant looks dangerous, and yes, you should not be careless, saying that it is time to start. At the same instant, his entire team of subordinates appears behind the boy and begins to use their magical abilities, flaming fireball throwing towards the enemy. The boy still stands his ground as well, looking at the other's reaction and waiting for the next action from his opponent as he continues to attack with his magical abilities. These mages are quite powerful subordinates. They burn with their abilities all that is ahead of them, falling exactly into the army of the huge ruler. The boy is slowly hiding in that smoke, he briefly addresses his crew to take care of the others, and Iron and the majestic Egress are just waiting for that moment. After a couple of seconds, the volcano guards begin to gather speed and run towards the boy, who is with his subordinates, thinking that they can easily cope with them. 
The boy uses his powers. He gradually hides from view so that no one can detect him, and afterward he gives his subordinates the last words to get rid of the monsters. One of the Vulcan Guardians swoops in first on the huge iron, who uses his own shield, blocking the other's attack and preventing him from getting close. At the same moment, the majestic Igris, waiting for the opportune moment for his mighty attack, suddenly approaches the enemy occupied by iron and massacres him with his weapon. The boy thinks about the fact that even these guards are supreme demons. Then he constantly pumped the level of his subordinates, and their strength depends on the characteristics of intelligence. Also, the number of shadows grows. The boy watches the ruler of the lower levels from the side, realizing that he is not moving at all, and doesn't even seem to be about to do anything, also watching his army from the side. The boy is already starting to think that this is a lot easier than he had originally thought before the massacre of this ruler of the lower levels, as suddenly this demon disappears from his place. The boy doesn't even have time to finish his words before his gaze changes, widening his eyes in surprise, because where did the ruler of the lower levels go, and so quickly? The boy watches as the huge ruler of the lower levels of this dungeon is in midair, swinging towards Jin Wu's subordinates that there is no way he would expect such a thing. The boy freezes in one position, continues to look at what this huge ruler of the lower levels will do, for he is such a size and has great speed. Jin Wu's subordinates on the ground stare at everything happening in front of them, frozen in one place, unsure of what they should do at this moment. Frozen. The pissed-off ruler of the lower levels begins to strike with his weapons at high speed, seemingly finding a definite opponent for himself not in the form of Jin Wu, but someone else. And that opponent for the ruler of the lower levels is Iron, who takes such heavy blows while already lying on the ground screaming in pain. The angered ruler of the lower levels doesn't even seem to have any intention of stopping. As if hypnotized by something, he continues to deliver numerous blows with his weapon. Iron can't seem to take that many blows to his body anymore. He is, after all, a shadow who is easy enough to take down, especially with a one-on-one -on -one boss. Gradually, Iron's shadow begins to fade away, dissolving right into thin air, leaving nothing behind and unable to confront an opponent so strong for him. The boy, watching the whole horrifying picture before him from the side, waits for the right moment for him, gains strength in his arms, and jumps back to a great height, heading towards one goal. The boy looks with his chilling gaze directly at the ruler of the lower levels, but in his gaze one can see anger, rage, and hatred at the same time, for how did this monster allow himself to do such a thing? The boy wastes no precious time, gathers the power in his fist, which gradually begins to increase, and then strikes directly at the ruler of the lower levels with all the strength he has. It seems that from such a powerful blow that the boy didn't quite calculate, the ruler of the lower levels flies away such a great distance losing his balance, unable to resist such a powerful blow. The boy was slightly surprised that the ruler of the lower levels had flown so far away, realizing that he seemed to have lost control of himself and hit much harder than usual. The boy decides to check his characteristics, stops for a while and looks at all the data, and afterwards awkwardly realizes that he hastily put points into his power. The far-flung ruler of the lower levels is pressed into the wall behind him, the area around him slightly destroyed from such weight, but the monster begins to use his rage ability. Suddenly everything erupts in a large and bright magical flash that even begins to slightly blind, using his rage abilities that his characteristics increase 50 times. The boy can barely stand on his own feet, crosses his own arms at his face in an attempt to defend himself, and then realizes afterwards that these are the same abilities Cerberus has. Suddenly comes the notification that the pain threshold of the ruler of the lower levels has been raised, and the boy thinks that he has become much faster, so he won't be able to dodge a direct hit. The boy stands, seemingly realizing that he really can't handle this reckless ruler of the lower levels alone, and then calls out loudly to Iron, drawing his subordinate's attention. Iron instantly reacts to his Shadow Lord's shout, running closer to use his own shield to take the powerful blow upon himself, growling with exertion. Iron waits for the right moment for himself, he has a certain amount of time, and then, having gathered the necessary strength for a powerful shot with his shield, he does what he intended. It seems that the huge shield shot was so powerful that Iron can't stay in one place and starts spinning around at high speed, knocking down all the surrounding monsters with himself. The boy receives the shield of his own subordinate flying in his direction as he wished, ready for any attack from such a serious opponent. The maddened ruler of the lower levels screams without restraining all of his furious emotions, seemingly sizzling everything near him with his gaze, intending to launch an attack. 
The boy, for his part, holds a powerful shield above him, ready to take any blow directed in his direction from this ruler of the lower levels, looking directly at him. In a couple of counted seconds, a terrible battle ensues, the boy holding his shield as best he can, holding back a powerful blow in his direction from the ruler of the inferior forces. The impact is so powerful that the ground just starts to crack in every second. Rocks fly off in all sorts of directions, and the boy does his best to defend himself. Everything begins to blaze with blue light. The low-level ruler not far away from the boy begins to notice this powerful reaction due to his impact, thinking that the boy did not survive. But not here, because the boy is not some ordinary hunter. He is quite experienced, with a lot of experience. So he withstood such an attack and thinks that he just needs to wait out the moment. The boy, fully protected thanks to his subordinate's shield, watches the next attack of the ruler of the lower forces to wait for the right moment for him to make his attack. The boy needs just such a moment when the ruler of the lower levels takes a swing, which happens in a couple of counted seconds. So the boy takes that moment and begins to commit. The boy's instant reaction would be the envy of any hunter. At the same moment he swept his shield aside, leaping a high distance, holding his dagger in one hand. The man, making a high jump towards his designated target, is about to take a swing when he suddenly notices that the ruler of the lower levels seems to be starting to fight back. The boy's face instantly changed to one of surprise and anger at the same time, for apparently the lower-level ruler, surprisingly enough, had expected Jin Wu's actions. Because of this flow of wind in his direction, the boy simply pushes himself much farther away from his own target while at the same moment the ruler of the lower levels swings his huge weapon. The boy is getting visibly nervous, thinking about what he should do right now, because he won't be able to dodge such a powerful blow while in the air, but if he could move. The boy's gaze instantly changes, as if there was some kind of hope in his thoughts. He once again thinks about moving, isn't such an ordinary action beyond his power. The boy, without wasting a second of precious time, uses the ability of the ruler's touch, extends his hand forward, accumulating some power in it that even starts to go reaction. The boy realizes that since he cannot repel such a huge and powerful ruler of the lower forces, he must surely resort to another solution to this problem. Then the boy simply uses the recoil to push himself away from the lower-level ruler, which he does in the next few seconds, instantly flying away for as long as possible. It happens so quickly that a sort of bluish trail is left behind the boy due to his ability, and the ruler of the lower levels is already making a strike without hitting the target. The boy holds back the flow of air in his direction, calmly stopping after that speed, and then he can exhale for the blow to his side was close enough. The boy peers at the monster in front of him, realizes that the only place for him to strike is only the ruler's head, but that would be dangerous enough in his case. The boy looks at the opponent in front of him with a serious look, thinking about the fact that he first needs to somehow limit such ridiculous movements of a lower-level ruler. The boy's gaze runs to one side and then the other, for he is trying to think of the perfect plan to massacre this ruler of the lower levels, so he needs to create. The boy thinks of the perfect moment he needs to create just as his gaze falls on the gradually crumbling city in front of him that is engulfed in flames. The boy begins to smile, for this particular plan seems to him as anything but ingenious enough to have been thought of, saying that this is what is needed. The boy, instead of standing in one place, waits for the moment when the ruler of the lower levels starts looking at him, and then breaks into a rather fast run, hiding in the nooks and crannies. The boy picks up on the fact that the ruler of the lower levels is in a kind of rage at the moment, which is just what he needs for the boy, who takes off running much faster. The boy tries to confuse the ruler of the lower levels, who is chasing right behind him, but Jin Wu has set some sort of goal, which he is now heading towards with all speed, forcing the monster to run after him. The boy is eyeing his desired target in the form of a dilapidated building that is about to fall, so he tries his best to make the monster chase him faster. The boy uses his sprinting ability, breaking into a hell of a sprint to make the monster run faster than normal in an attempt to catch up to his target in the form of Jin Wu. The ruler of the lower levels runs after his target with all his might but suddenly stops, seeming to notice a dangerous thing in the form of a ruined building. The boy climbs up this building with all speed. He loudly voices that even if the monster understood his idea it's quite late to run, looking at the ruler trying to stop. The ruler of the lower levels watches everything the boy does with great speed, causing him to tense up at what is happening, realizing he is trapped. The boy smilingly observes other people's attempts to stop, saying that with such great speed it would be hard enough for a lower level ruler to stop. The ruler of the lower levels has nothing to do but try to stop the ruined building falling on him with his large weapon, but all in vain. 
The boy uses all his strength to deal with his strong opponent. He accelerates with all his might and then swings his arm to strike. The ruler of the lower levels seems to be slowly starting to realize that he has fallen into a situation that is inevitable for him, unable to simply dodge such a strong blow. The boy uses all the power he has in his body. He purposefully hits directly on the body of the ruler of the lower levels, which is what he wanted for a long time during the ongoing battle. At the same moment, the ruler of the lower levels bursts out in a loud roar of pain, a large stream of blood immediately starting to flow from his wound, showing that the boy had hit exactly on his target. Some unknown grandmother with barely visible eyes looks at the person who disturbed her, interjecting about the man in room 902, saying she hasn't seen him in a long time. The people disturbing Granny are Chief An and the green-eyed girl who have come apparently for the boy, and the chief starts wondering aloud where Jin Wu has gone. The girl replies that his sister told him about the boy going on a week-long trip with his friends, and the chief asks how she knows about it, to which the girl replies that she's been talking to Sun Yi. The girl is holding some document in her hands, saying that they have come all this way for nothing, and the chief replies that something doesn't add up here, because there is no trace that Jin Wu has left the country. The girl questions the man that it's really possible for him to find out about such a thing, and the chief replies that it's his job to keep an eye on the hunters, starting to remember where Jin Wu was last seen. The girl gives a suggestion that perhaps the boy has been kidnapped, and the chief replies that doesn't that sound absurd, for it would take at least a special Chinese agent to kidnap him to match his powers. The man is distracted from the very essence of the conversation, falling back into his own thoughts and worries about where the boy has actually gone and what is happening to him at the moment. The lower level ruler did not hold back his rage, looking with his red eyes at the fast moving opponent in the form of Jin Wu, already cracking his own fangs from overwhelming nerves. The ruler of the lower levels can only stand looking at the boy high in the sky who seems to be about to deliver the final and fatal blow to the monster. The boy's gaze burns with a blue light. He is confident in his movements and realizes that he is winning this battle because the ruler of the lower levels simply cannot compare to his speed and abilities. After a couple of moments, the ruler of the lower levels finds himself pinned into the rock behind him, unable to move and with no sign of life, for he has finally been dealt with. The boy stands next to the breathless body of a huge monster, observes the dropped items due to the level passed, and also says that the dropped items are incredible. The boy gradually collects all the dropped items thanks to his victory, and they are the earring of the demon lord, the sphere of greed, the horn of the volcano, and a fragment of the world tree. A fragment of the world tree takes most of the boy's attention. He says it's an ingredient for creating magical items of the highest quality, and yes, he can't throw it away. The boy puts an earring on his ear with a set effect that even begins to glow red, wondering if he'll be able to find the remaining items if he keeps hunting. The last thing that catches the boy's attention is an item with amazing properties. And yes, if the boy had magic class skills, he would be able to use it. The boy clutches this interesting fire-colored object, and afterwards states that the orb capable of amplifying magic damage by half, which makes one think harder than before. The boy is distracted by some clanking sound as he watches the body parts of the various subordinates of the lower-level ruler continue to make these sounds with body movements. The boy rolls his eyes and turns towards the majestic Igris, vocalizing to him that maybe he'll get over it by now, watching the knight bow to him. The boy says one last tired thing, that the knight is always surprising him more and more, as suddenly Jin Wu's gaze is drawn to something even more interesting and more surprising. And this very cause of surprise is Iron, who having gathered all his strength, carries the head of the ruler of the lower levels with one hand behind him and the boy no longer seems at all surprised by such antics. The boy looks away, distracted from his subordinates, and thinks about giving the boss one last blow, then says aloud to Iron that his shield just saved him at that moment. The boy recalls that rather life-threatening moment with the brawling lower-level ruler, who could easily crush Jin Wu with his weapon if he swung it once. The boy watches as Iron fairly brags to the rest of the knights that they only look admiringly at such a tank, and the boy draws attention to himself and calls back home. After a while, the boy holds a fireball in his hand that burns his skin like hell, which Jin Wu tries not to react to and passes into someone else's hands. The boy is standing with the mage near a building that appears to be in need of final destruction, as Jin Wu points his burned fingers in the direction of the house. It doesn't take any great difficulty for the subordinate boy to create from one small ball a whole huge one that can sizzle everything in its path, surprising Jin Wu more. 
After a couple seconds, the boy's subordinate directs a powerful strike thanks to the fireball directly at the designated target of his Shadow Lord, followed immediately by a huge explosion. The boy looks surprised at the fireball in his hands, which seems to be enough quantity that it will be able to be used in battle, and the subordinate stretches out his arms as if to ask again. The boy picks up on the fact that he didn't pay any attention to such powerful characteristics of this item, and it doesn't say that this particular item can only be his. The boy is only satisfied with such good news about the new item. He thinks about the fact that hunters using magical skills will tear and throw. In some building there is a peculiar dialogue. Someone of unknown people saying that he in no way expected anything so interesting on arrival in Washington, which is very surprising. A large and pumped-up man stands, crossing his arms over his chest, his insane smile proclaiming that there is some kind of monster that can speak human language. The black-haired man denies being called a monster. He asks for a DNA test if they just don't believe him, and the other states that there is no difference, because he was found in the gate. The man only smiles harder. He crushes the black-haired prisoner with his aura, suggesting the fact that the monsters could now impersonate a normal human. The black-haired prisoner lifts his gaze from beneath his long hair, silent for a while, seeming to realize that no one is going to listen to him, or even wants to. The look of the man who had recently arrived in Washington changed to one of insistence and seriousness, and he made it clear that the black-haired man was the best person to cooperate with. And only after someone else's consent will the man decide who this prisoner really is, a human being or a monster that can speak human language. The male prisoner has nothing left to say but his agreement. And what is he to do when he is in such an uncomfortable position where people are not going to take his word for it? The serious man begins to ask his accumulated questions, asking if the prisoner in the dungeon has already died. Otherwise, how did he last ten years? And the man says he is not undead. A man continues to make assumptions as to how the one who died in the dungeon was able to return alive and unharmed, while another states that it is impossible. The prisoner does try to try and ask a few questions of interest in this place, but the man answers him briefly that he is the one asking the questions here. But the prisoner ignores the other's rudeness and bluntness. He raises his gaze to the other and asks how much he knows about gates and monsters, and the man is silent, wondering what to answer. Not far away from the panoramic window from the ongoing conversation, people are thinking about their own things. Some assistant calls the deputy director, to which another tells him to shut up. The men begin to listen intently to the conversation going on outside the windows. They hear the dialogue continue, and someone's question with sneers about whether this particular person is well informed. The male prisoner looks on with his testing gaze as he begins his tale of the various dungeons, gates, monsters, for it is all nothing. A real disaster, and war is coming. A man listens to someone else's warnings, calmly asks if this is someone else's goal, and the prisoner states that he wants to prevent disaster. The other asks for clarification, to which he is refused. The man smirks, glaring at the man who came to stop the disaster, unable to elaborate on the details, for isn't working together the best outcome. The prisoner replies that quantity will not win this disaster. Even if the most useless people unite, they will be used as cannon fodder and he should be aware of that. The man who listens to the prisoner's entire speech changes in his face, mentally scrolling through the other man's insulting words about how he is only quite strong, which shows his weakness. The man clutches the documents in his hands, thinks about how the prisoner dared to put himself above himself, and then says that if only he can stop this catastrophe, then they have nothing to talk about. The man looks at the other man's ID, realizes that the other man's name is Il Juan, and yes, if you take away the other man's hair, the man would be tidy enough, but he shouldn't look that old. The man reads aloud that the days of being a hunter are awesome, continuing to say that he chipped in another man's inheritance for three generations to come, so the man will be able to live without any worries. The man decides to start talking about the subject of children. He thinks on the subject of his son the one that most attracts the attention of the highly ranked hunter that even back then was trying to meet him. The man starts asking about the other man's daughter, recognizing her name, to which the imprisoned man calmly states that his daughter is Jin A, and afterwards the man immediately asks a question about his son. The prisoner says without some sort of long moment of silence that his son is Sung Jin Wu, the high-ranking hunter the interrogator is so after starting to smile. The male prisoner seems to begin to sense something amiss about this man in front of him. For what adequate person would smile so crazily, he asks what is wrong. The man interrogating the prisoner begins to smile his creepy smile, his eyes burning with the flames of hell, and Il Juan begins to feel the other man's bloodlust as he hears the words that he's the only one asking questions here. 
After a few seconds, the prisoner does not make him wait long for his reaction either. He instantly flares up with a kind of rage, for he senses in this man a danger to his children, demanding to answer him. A frightening aura even gradually begins to emanate from the imprisoned man, as if he's ready to incinerate everything in his path. But you don't have to wait long for a furious reaction from the other man. The imprisoned man thinks about the fact that maybe even the gods personally gave him another chance. The angry man presses his finger on the red button and says that he has no doubt that that monster. A man who arrives in Washington angrily ogles the deputy director, hastily saying that the creature is a monster and seems to be hostile, that they need to evacuate. The deputy director replies incomprehensibly, telling him to take his time, but the man says that he has just returned from South Korea and is quite aware of what is wrong with the prisoner's son. The man's entire aura makes everyone in the vicinity shut up. He pauses for a moment and then loudly announces that the prisoner's son is dead, causing the man to go into shock. The man has a crazed smile, his eyes showing all of his rage and hatred for the prisoner going on inside. He confidently divulges that the other man will soon be joining his son. There is a rather gloomy atmosphere going on around. It seems to be a graveyard, but naturally there are many different and even more dangerous monsters. There is a flash. Someone reacts instantly to such a flash by jerking his finger in the direction of the bright light that appeared, as if to force the others to follow his index finger. The subordinates of one of the monsters instantly began to react to the stranger's body movement. They opened their ugly mouths, mimicking unpleasant screams. These monsters on this harder level are quite numerous and they are of all sorts. Some even have arrows left in them that seem to have been obtained by the rest of the hunters from this dungeon. The horrible place instantly becomes brighter than it was before, the monsters one by one rising up on their bony legs and barely moving towards the light. Sitting on his throne, the boss of yet another heavy floor points his long finger in the direction where his entire army of barely walking skeletons is headed. The boy gets to this floor, looks at the unfolding picture before him, knowing in advance that he will need to deal with the new boss, turning to Iron and Egress. The boy's gaze instantly changes, his pupils beginning to glow with a blue light, and his silhouette becoming dark, barely visible, as if he himself were some sort of ghost or subordinate. It doesn't take long for the majestic Egress and Iron to react instantly to their Shadow Lord's words, completing the errand with a speed that is to be envied. The huge number of the boy's subordinates grows bigger and bigger every time he defeats a boss, at which point everyone from Igris, Iron, Knights, Mages, and Ice Bears swoop in to attack the foreign army. The first to enter the serious battle is the majestic Igris, who with his body movements and good technique can easily deal with several enemies at once. The majestic Igris doesn't even turn in any direction to take his mind off his business for a moment. He hits even those near or behind his back with powerful blows. The boy looks at the reaction of the boss of this particular dungeon floor. He can't help but snicker, thinking about whether this monster is surprised by the sheer strength of his subordinates. The boss of the floor in question is still sitting on his throne, and doesn't even seem to be about to make any moves when the boy is already towering over this monster, standing tall. The boy looks with his captivating eyes directly at the target in front of him, very close to him, holds in one hand a dagger that carries power, and then says that he did not expect such a situation. The boss sitting on his throne opens his jaw, stares with his red eyes, as if he feels some kind of fear that he can't even move, as if paralyzed. The boy gazes more closely at his enemy below him, even slightly amused by the stranger's reaction, and wondering if the undead can sense fear. But it doesn't matter. After a couple of moments, so as not to waste precious time and the strength of his subordinates that are fighting, he massacres his foe damn fast, mangling his face apart. At exactly the same second, the boss of this floor crumbles into a lot of his own bones, without taking any defense against himself, because the whole army is fighting, and he is left alone. After a while, the battle gradually ends, because as soon as the most important monster falls at the hands of his enemy, the rest of his entire army itself falls apart. After defeating the boss of a given floor, the boy receives a notification that he has defeated the soul guide, Methos, after which he is sure to be given some items. The boy sits on a rock, reasoning that this guy's magic was quite powerful. Plus, the guy could control hundreds of times more souls than Jin Wu, that he wanted to turn the boss into his soldier, but the boy himself doesn't understand why he can't use his abilities on demons, because every time he tries, he gets a notification that his mana is infected and shadow summoning is impossible. The boy continues to sit, looking at what he's been dropped off by the boss himself, which is part of someone else's kit 
which will probably be of some use to Jin Wu in future battles. The boy gets a notification to choose the effect of the set, which can be likened to leveling up as much as five times. So useful is it. The boy looks at the shining space in front of him, thinking that a little more, and will be able to collect the whole set, and his first task of 10,000 demonic souls is completed. The boy is slightly unsure if because he has reached his limit, then Jin Wu's powers are running low at the moment. A notification comes in that the task from part one has been completed. The next alert says for the boy to choose the following rewards, and Jin Wu chooses to be able to choose the item of his choice which is successfully confirmed. The boy is thinking about whether he should pick an expensive item that likely has an incredible ability, but he can also get the equipment by defending the dungeon. The boy is seriously thinking about the fact that he needs to make a considered choice about which item can be sold back to the store, and what is best to buy from new. The boy stands in the same spot for a while, still undecided on what he should choose from the store, as suddenly a notification arrives for the boy to choose an item. The boy makes his choice, talking about the random cursed box, seemingly thinking that it's a good choice in his case, and yes, worth trying some kind of luck in this place. The boy extends his hand forward, in which a black box gradually begins to form, and the notification comes to confirm someone else's choice about the cursed box. The boy recalls that last time he had a choice between the cursed box and the blessed box, after which he tried to increase his daily workouts, but didn't get the extra rewards. The boy received the key of this demonic lock when he opened the blessed box, thanks to which he was able to raise his own level and obtain rare items. The boy candidly admits that he's damn curious to find out about what's inside the random cursed box, wasting no time in opening it. Once the box is opened, what appears in its place is a key unknown to the boy without any written details that Jin Wu has no idea what it's for or what door it's for. The boy thinks about the fact that for the first time he sees just such an object, which lacks any description, not realizing how he should use this key, for what purposes. The boy sighs and opens his inventory, thinking that he'll find a use for the item someday, and the random cursed box should yield the right thing. The boy returns to the system, which is still also waiting for other people's words, and Jin Wu doesn't languish and says to accept award number two, after which he gets characterization points. The boy thinks about where he should put those extra 20 points, and afterward thinks he should put them into intelligence, which he does instantly. The boy returns to the system, thanks to which he has already taken two items, but the last one remains, which is a hidden reward, causing Jin Wu to announce his acceptance of the item. The boy holds some kind of box in his palm again, thinking about how he shouldn't expect much in this place after a random cursed box. In the palm of the boy's hand appears a certain bundle with a drawing that has a description that says, Holy Water of Life, thanks to which it is possible to study the creatures for the item. Some kind of chaos is happening in some city. Buildings start to burn with huge and uncontrollable flames for a long time that it seems impossible to stop this catastrophe. A large number of rescuers crowded into one burning room, trying their best to extinguish such a strong fire by hustling each other. The men look from afar at the fire and the rescuers in the area, one of them saying that when the S-rank hunters put up a fight, everything nearby turns to rubble. The deputy director still has no way to hide all the emotion in his gaze, as if he hasn't gotten over the fight that happened a while ago, as if it was something unbelievable. One of the men says the obvious thing to the eyes and something amazing that strikes them all is that hunter Huang Dongsu has lost in this battle. He is between the collapsed rocks. The picture changes to a brighter, whiter picture that is familiar to see in the local and city's huge hospitals, which are teeming with other lives, lots of people and the pain of the rest due to the loss of loved ones. In one of the bright rooms there is a bunk on which a lovely woman lies peacefully, which seems to be in the realm of Morpheus at the moment, gaining strength. After a while, a whole and unharmed Jin Wu appears in the half-empty room, looking at the woman in front of him and calling out for his mom with some tenderness. The boy takes a seat on a nearby chair near the bunk with the woman, trying not to make much noise so as not to disturb his own mother's sleep. But Jin Wu misses her so much. The boy pulls out the very item he got thanks to the defeated boss from the ill-fated dungeon, seems to know where to use the item this time. The item is the holy water of life. It is a mysterious potion that can cure any disease. The boy recalls that it is a created item that has powerful magic in it. The boy looks at the still, still, unresponsive woman, unresponsive to any of the guy's movements, that continues to sleep peacefully in her deep slumber, Jin Wu seeming to find hope in saving her. The boy realizes that he needs three things to create the potion, but two he already has, 
One is a fragment of the world tree that he got from a volcano on the 50th floor. The boy also recalls getting the spring water of the Whispering Forest after defeating Metis on the 75th floor. But there is one last item, the purified blood of the Demon King. The boy thinks about the fact that he hasn't managed to find this particular item yet, but he's pretty much guessing the location of where this chance to save someone else's life might be. The boy remembers this hellish dungeon and seems to realize that this item is on the very top floor. He will most likely be able to get it on the final boss. Consequently, he realizes that if he completely clears the dungeon, he will find all the ingredients. In this week, he was able to raise 16 levels. Now Jin Wu's strength is equal to that of an S rank. The boy sits for a while, imagining future plans that he must surely fulfill, says goodbye to his mother, and promises her that he will definitely come back. There is someone's irritated yet tired voice coming from a building saying that they seem to be at some sort of dead end, the building being the South Korean Hunters Associations. The men listen to what the TV is saying. It's about an explosion, the cause of which is a showdown of S-rank hunters. The man says that hunters are now the problem. One of the men puts his palm to his mouth to share information quieter, and afterwards says that sometimes hunters who couldn't accept reality come here, and the girl asks if that guy is the same. The man keeps whispering that it's that more milk, offering to simply explain to him that he should cover all the costs and then poison him in the reassessment room, to which the girl agrees. The man continues to think about the situation that happened after changing to some hunter, trying to remember someone else's name that had slipped his mind as if out of spite. The master is in his office. He appears to be quite tired from the amount of work and papers on his desk, but takes a call, introducing himself to someone by name. One of the staff members states in a business-like manner that the topic is about a hunter the master was interested in, for he did deign to come to this place after a time. The red-haired man's gaze instantly changes. He forgets all his problems and business, asking if the hunter is here now, to which he is answered that he has just entered. Hunter Sung Jin Wu has come to reevaluate his rank. He's already being greeted by a pretty girl who smiles embarrassedly as she talks about escorting the boy to the right place. To reevaluate his own abilities, Apparently a lot of people show up, so the boy has to sit apart from the others and try to think about something that will take a little time. Some black-haired girl peeks out from behind the door, calling softly to the next young man so as not to break the silence, and the boy thinks about how nothing has changed since then. Some man draws attention to himself, and the boy that is not far from him sitting and hears everything. The one says that it is not worth being nervous, that, of course, there are people who were able to turn their lives around, but they are few. The man goes on to say that if they get a D rank or higher, then they will then try to be lured in by the guys he points his finger at, and those listening to him wonder who they are. The man goes on to say of those people that they are from various guilds, and since the hunters are not eager to join the smaller guilds, they are waiting here. The man earnestly says that such people are best to steer clear of, as small guilds have an increased mortality rate often enough, and the boy thinks the man is right. The boy thinks about the fact that on the one hand it's disadvantageous for them to go to low-rank dungeons, but they also lack the strength to go to high-rank dungeons, which is hard enough. After a while the girl attracts attention again, peering out from behind the door and smiling at the people there, inviting the others to pass, while the man who came out does not appear to be happy with the results. That same man steps up and says that they won't be so worried if they set aside all their expectations. And as long as you're not an E-rang, you can always provide food for your family. Some man sitting next to him nervously bit his fingers, saying in a trembling voice that he would get an advance if he joined the big guild and also be able to pay off his debt. The man frantically shakes and continues to say in a shaky voice that he damn well needs at least a C rank, and the boy looks at him and thinks that rank will change the lives of hunters in a number of ways. The boy thinks about how the strength of hunters is determined by their ranks. Jin Wu remembers the many different strong, high-ranked hunters that have come through this way. The boy thinks about how no matter how much they practice swordsmanship or develop their bodies, it's not enough to bridge the gap between ranks. The boy remembers about Song Chi Yol, who continuously honed his sword art, but ultimately couldn't stand up to some gang Tae Sik because of the difference in their ranks. The boy thinks about the fact that in all these years spent fighting, he's never been able to escape from his E rank, clenching his palm into a fist because of it, as if to set himself up for the best. The look of the very man who had just come out from behind the reassessment just changed to one of complete shock, as if he hadn't expected such an unfortunate result on his side. The man barely leaves the damn office, it seems, starts shaking violently and frantically stating that he's E-ranked, 
and the girl is already calling for the next hunter. It seems the next hunter isn't quite going to get up from his seat, that even the girl with an awkward smile on her face leans over to him, asking if the man is feeling ill, and he says he isn't. The man frankly admits that his stomach is just turning from the overwhelming excitement of the reassessment. He suggests that the boy go first, and he replies that no problem. The boy walks into the room behind the girl, observes the girl standing behind a special counter, and asks a question about telling her full name, which the boy does. The girl thinks about it, because she knows that the boy already has an E rank, so why should he come again, and then asks if he wants to be fully re-evaluated, to which he gets a short yes. The girl thinks about why it's the kind of hunters who become E rank that come to the reassessment, and afterwards she politely tells the boy to put his palm on the black crystal. The boy hears all of the girl's instructions on what he needs to do, and then goes over to the magic crystal and places his palm until the girl tells him that's enough. The girl looks rather puzzled, even her eyes widen from not understanding what's going on at the moment. She asks slightly nervously to wait a little longer. The girl is already starting to resent it out loud. She snorts unhappily and says that this has never happened before with this machine. The girl apologizes again and says she will try again. The girl does not hide her misunderstanding. She is indignant, saying what is wrong with this car. When another worker approaches, asking what happened and why she is now alone, the girl holds on to the appliances in a puzzled manner, briefly replies that the other man is in the restroom and the man who came in sighs, saying that the other man is brazen enough since he leaves his post during rush hour. The man coughs into his fist, bringing it up to his lips as he thinks about what he also does at times, and afterward he states what happened in the end, and the woman replies that some sort of malfunction with the car. The man comes closer to look at the mistake and thinks he came here because he's curious about Beck Yunho who fidgets with the idea that reawakening is by no means a rare occurrence. The man starts running thoughts through his head that it was about three months ago when the entire association was on pins and needles over an E-rang that might have been twice awakened. The man thinks about it being a false alarm at the time, and the girl points her finger in the direction of the error popping up every time she tries, and the man thinks it's not a simple phenomenon. Suddenly, the man shifts his gaze towards the said finger of the girl, his face instantly changes to a dumbfounded one that even opens his mouth in surprise. The man immediately asks a question about how long the girl has been working here, and the girl looks at him incomprehensibly, but replies that it's about six months, asking if she's done something wrong. The man thinks six months is short enough. She clearly wasn't notified of what happened about two years ago, and it's not surprising that the newcomer doesn't know about it. So he asks to get Chang Shik. The man thinks about not being able to realize someone else's power which is why there's no way he can get a promotion, and afterwards states that going to the bathroom isn't the most important thing right now, forcing him to call the other person. The man loudly states that it's not a mistake, but immeasurable, meaning that their detector is unable to measure the boy's full magical power, and the girl is surprised, incomprehensibly asking him. And the man continues to rant about the boy being the tenth person in South Korea, while Jin Woo stands quietly by the magic crystal waiting for the results. Two guys are in some yard that is lit by a bright and blinding sun. They are both looking at a certain point, thinking about something. One of them starts talking about Hunter Dong Su of the Vulture Guild, asking if it's true that he's not connected to the Red Gate, and the other one tells him that it's true, and he had nothing to do with it. The man in business form continues to claim his own, that he has personally seen Dong Su, and another man replies to him that he must then know the identity of the one who helped everyone. The man averts his gaze and begins to say something that he didn't stay there until the very end, so he doesn't know all the details, but if he suspected someone, it would be... Suddenly the man shivered, thinking that he shouldn't tell the other man this, for he couldn't assume anything after his last unfortunate conclusion. A man, noticing something the other is holding back about, begins to say that the other definitely doesn't want to share something with him until he is completely sure about it without scolding him for it. The man continues that he is more interested in finding an ant with wings, while the other replies that they came across a dead specimen, and yes, he is sure that all the guilds will convene before doing so. The man decides to light a cigarette, holds it between his fingers, and afterward talks about how all the hunter's guilds will work together, how it doesn't look strange. The man goes on to say that Building B seems to be a pretty noisy place today and the assistant interjects about Building B, saying that he doesn't hear anything suspicious right now. The man in the purple suit continues to hold the cigarette between his fingers, momentarily remembers to smoke, and afterward admits to being quite sensitive. After a while, another man talks about how it seems like the new hunter has caused some problems because of his rank, 
so he's already going to check out what's really going on. Suddenly, the other man stops him with his short no, making him wait for him and temporarily forget about his purpose for being in the building, and afterwards states that he too is interested in the case. The man watches the other extinguish his cigarette on the ashtray, but says nothing in response to the other's words, for how can he resist the other's desire to go out with him? The man thinks about the fact that because of the other guy's appearance, which gives the other guy a gentlemanly look, he's completely oblivious to what the man is really like when he hears about the two of them going out together. Some heated dialogue takes place inside one of the buildings, some man talking about their detector, that due to the low power of this device, Jin Wu's strength cannot be measured. The man approaches the boy saying that he needs permission from management to use a more accurate detector, asking if Jin Wu can visit them in three days. The incumbent workers are thinking about how they can delay the evaluation, while continuing to think about the fact that Jin Wu seems to have an S rank, they still don't believe the fact that this kid has such a rank. A large team of workers come together to see for themselves, thinking that the boy is clearly not the kind of person a small guild can attract. The gathered workers are thinking about how they can get the attention of a strong hunter like Jin Wu, and yes, many guilds don't have a lot of funds to provide for the hunter. The men are vigorously discussing a plan to win the attention of a hunter as powerful as Sung Jin Wu, when suddenly their gaze changes to one of surprise, full of shocked emotion and disbelief. The men begin to discuss the man who appears in their sight. His name is Choi Jong In, who is a representative of the Hunters, the strongest guild in Korea. The men and all the people here are wondering what a man who is called a universal soldier is also a high-ranked S-ranked hunter. The boy looks at whoever it is that starts to gradually appear as it approaches towards the people. He thinks about the fact that it seems to be Choi Jung-in with his own person. The boy thinks about the fact that with alien fire magic, there are rumors that this guy can turn any building to ash, a hunter who is known as the Universal Soldier. The boy smiles awkwardly, thinking about the fact that Choi Jung-in's nickname seems similar to his as well. He laughs awkwardly, not even knowing how he should react to someone else's presence here. People on here keep discussing about whether or not finding an S-ranked hunter would constitute joining that hunter. And yes, the top guilds are on a completely different level. The man in a business suit standing next to him changes his look to one of surprise, as if he can't believe what's happening. He thinks about whether Hunter Jin Wu is an S-rank. High-ranking hunter Choi Jung-in raises his glasses slightly on the bridge of his nose, thinking about how he can't ignore all this commotion caused by the new hunter, realizing that Jin Wu is the tenth. The man thinks about the fact that he doesn't even need a detector to determine someone else's rank, which feels so and so high, so the boy doesn't even need to wait some three days for results. The man decides to introduce himself to the new to him hunters, introducing himself for who he is, but also apologizing, asking about the fact that the boy has only just gotten his rank and if he has a guild in mind. The man acts quite cunning and deft, is with his back to this boy, and offers to step back for a few minutes to discuss about his offer. But Jin Wu says he refuses to be a stranger. After the stranger's words, the highly ranked man instantly changes in his face, instead of his welcoming and friendly smile changing to a surprised, even a little shocked by the stranger's rejection. The people here are shocked to realize that Choi Jung In just refused the offer, and the boy thinks about the fact that he has to wait for three days, and now he has a lot of worries. He needs to get the potion. A man who's just been literally blown off made to feel embarrassed asks a nearby Jin Chul that if he just forgot to introduce himself, and afterwards continues his question about maybe being even too pushy, closing his eyes and trying not to show all the emotions overflowing from within him. The man decides to turn in the opposite direction from himself, and afterwards notices that the boy has vanished without a trace, making the assumption that Jin Wu is a skilled hunter of the assassin class. The master runs with all his might, it seems, to meet the boy, and the man thinks that if this boy joins the hunters, they will become on par with the strongest guilds in the whole world. The master notices the people in this place, already out of breath from how fast he was running this way, and then notices the head Choi, while the man himself thinks about what the head Beck is doing here. Master instantly shifts his gaze to the other side, beginning to wonder that he doesn't seem to have gotten the right person in time, because you can tell from Choi Jung-in's face that he doesn't seem to have gotten it right either. Head Choi Jung-in's gaze changes to a serious one, as if he's trying to look straight into the master's soul as to why he ran here so quickly, but from the stranger's face he seems to be slowly starting to put together a puzzle. The man analyzes the fact that the master apparently ran a considerable distance, even ran apparently without stopping, it seems Baek On Ho knew about him from the beginning, even now trying to find Jin Wu. 
The master seems a little puzzled by what happened right now because just a couple minutes and he was in this place where the boy should be, who apparently had already fled the place without leaving a trace. The man continues to analyze everything that is happening. It seems that some brilliant thought has visited his head right now, that maybe all these meetings with such people are connected, that maybe this boy is really the one. In the end, the man has the final puzzle right in his head. He was looking for ins and outs, searching for exactly the right person, as here it came to him right on a platter, but suddenly disappeared without agreeing to the proposal. The man thinks about the fact that Bak Yun Ho appears to be constantly chasing after the boy, but the boy, as it turns out, just isn't going to stop as a chapter and thinks Song Jin Woo isn't so easy to get. The men stand next to each other, each immersed in their own thoughts and thinking about their own, what they should do in the next moment, how to get the attention and appropriate such a strong boy to their side while the master realizes he is too late. The master seems damn tired of what's going on around him. He's thinking about the fact that of all people he met this particular snake, looking with his tired gaze, hearing some man yelling in the background that he finally has a C rank. The master decides to look out the window to follow the man leaving in his direction, who had to be seen in such a place today, which is extremely surprising, thinking that this is becoming much more difficult than it seemed. The hospital no longer looks as friendly and welcoming as it was not so long ago. A gloomy atmosphere lurks around this huge building. It seems to be having a rough time. The pretty and pale woman has been immobile for a long time still showing no signs of life or attempts to get out of her eternal sleep, which upsets her son. The boy doesn't take his eyes off his own mother. He softly voices the fact that as soon as he looks at her, the thought that the woman is about to wake up from her eternal slumber never leaves Jin Wu's mind. The boy remembers about a dreamless sleep, a dream from which you can't just wake up. This disease broke out and affected the poor woman exactly at the moment when the very first gate appears. The woman, no matter how much the boy talks, no matter how much he spends his time by her side, still can't support the already weary Jin Wu, can't respond to his affectionate words that promise to save her. The boy leaves his mother's chamber gloomy, full of depression, but still setting himself up for one thing only, to level up, thinking of bosses from different floors of the demonic castle, but something prevents him. The boy thinks about his thoughts, starts to make a plan on how he can continue to successfully cope with these enemies as a man suddenly appears, saying that he is not the one who cleaned up that two-level dungeon. The man doesn't let the boy say any word. He goes on to say that it was then, thanks to the boy, that he was able to realize that his point of view wasn't quite right. The boy doesn't seem surprised that someone is following him again, either to get him to his side or to ask a few more questions of interest to his interlocutor, so Jin Wu states that they've met up with Jin Chul again. The man ignores the stranger's greeting, has no intention of taking off his black glasses, and continues to talk about how the stranger's main goal of the monitoring department is to try to make as much contact with humans as possible, but not with monsters. The man, pausing briefly to consider his next words, for with this boy one must be vigilant, says that otherwise they must watch and punish hunters who now and then break the rules set forth. The boy doesn't make his answer wait long. He turns the other way and walks on, saying he has no desire to mess with their department, and the man says that their existence is the only shackles for hunters. But these hunter deterrent shackles are meaningless precisely to those of high rank, such as the boy is at the moment, forcing him to stop and turn in another's direction. Jin Chul doesn't let Jin Wu wait long for his next words. He talks about the person who is here to meet the boy. Can he make time for this meeting? Asking Jin Wu a question. Jin Chiu, without giving the boy a chance to say a word, kindly puts his palm out in front of Jin Wu and says that the president of the Hunters Association, a certain Ko Gong He, is coming right now. The man bows slightly in a respectful manner to the boy and to the important man about to emerge from the dark corridor who seems to have been eavesdropping on other people's conversations from the very beginning. After a few moments, footsteps begin to be heard, what seem to be leisurely and valiant footsteps, so confident in their actions, as if they know that the boy will not leave at this moment, but will remain here. The boy seems to freeze on the spot. He eagerly anticipates to see the person who is to appear before him due to Jin Chul's said words. Jin Wu opens his eyes and thinks that this person is... An older man appears in front of the boy, extending his hand forward in a welcoming manner, even showing his benevolent smile, saying that he is glad to meet Jin Wu like this, introducing himself in front of him. The boy is not going to stand like a stumbling block. He can see that the president of the Hunters Association is trying to be as polite as possible, which he can't ignore, so he accepts the kindly offered hand in return. The boy thinks about the fact that despite the man's age, 
he reminds him of a retired wrestler that has been honing his body for decades. Plus, he's S-ranked. And then he hears the president's voice congratulating him on his promotion. The boy sits across from the president, feeling at ease in his company, and afterwards states that he has another reassessment ahead of him, to which the man replies that reassessment is a meaningless formality in this place. The president, smiling, says that they need the detector to sort the results, and the thing is useless because it can't measure what is beyond its capabilities. The president goes on to say that even if it were possible, they still wouldn't be able to clearly define the boundary between S, S's, SS ranks because of this magic crystal. The boy doesn't understand what the man is getting at, what he wants to know from him, and the president interrupts him with a counter question about whether Jin Wu wants to ask about the reason for the reassessment procedure. The president of the Hunters Association puts his finger up, causing the boy to look at him closely, saying that this is what allows them to buy some time. The boy interjects what the president means by buying time, and he replies that it's to meet S rank hunters like Jin Wu. The man continues on about how the man obviously knows that there aren't many good hunters in the Hunters Association, and who would want to join them when other guilds guarantee fame and further growth. If you look out the window, you can see the full moon. The man continues that even though Jin Chul is one of the strongest A-rangs, that's why they went to such a small trick for the hunters. The boy seems to be starting to realize what the real purpose of the reassessment really is, and the man interrupts the other's thoughts that are slowly filling his head, telling him it's time to get down to business. The president of the Hunters Association squeezes his knee, saying that since they are not a commercial organization, they cannot promise the boy a large amount of money. But there is something else. The president of the Hunters Association is briefly silent after his speech, and then continues that they can help the boy in another matter, which further interests Jin Wu, who wonders what it's all about. The president of the Hunters Association spreads his arms out in different directions, shows his smile, and talks about how they can help the boy in a very different way, and perhaps in the way that Jin Wu exactly wishes. The man goes on to say that this country is not so much run by the government as it is by hunters who protect the citizens from dangerous monsters, and yes, only the Hunters Association is above it all. The man continues to talk about how they and their guild will help the boy become their equal, causing Jin Wu to look somewhere in the floor and even start flapping his eyes as if trying to come to his senses. Suddenly, the boy looks up, thereby turning off his own emotions, which could only be read in his eyes, thinking about the fact that does this president offer him authority. The boy does ask his unsure question after a certain amount of time as to why this president is offering him such a thing, drawing the attention of the man and the nearby Jin Chul. The man doesn't make him wait long for his answer. He looks levelly at the boy, saying that Jin Wu probably knows about the top five guilds in South Korea, something the boy can't help but know about. The man's gaze changes to a sterner one, as if annoyed at what is happening in South Korea, as these five titans barely hold the balance in that country. A man after a while softly voices the fact that his Jin Wu will join one of these powerful guilds, then the balance will be broken and real chaos will begin in South Korea. The man says that no law, order, or government will be able to rein in determined hunters, so a hunter's association is needed, and the man thinks that magical beasts aren't the only monsters. Some amount of time passes. The people in the room seem to fall into a kind of silence and contemplation. And then the president interrupts it with his question about what the boy will choose. The boy thinks that the president's offer isn't so bad, and with Ko Gong Hyun's support, he can quickly climb the career ladder, which attracts Jin Woo. The boy starts to remember that Ko Gong Hee also has a national assembly, a government, associations, and even the media. This president has all the connections a powerful man needs. This man is truly amazing. The president of the Hunters Association is as amazing as the skills he possesses. The boy realizes that even despite how many levels he has raised, the two of them are practically equals. The boy casts his gaze downward, thinking about the fact that this kind of opportunity comes along rarely enough, making him think only harder about making the right choice so as not to make a mistake. The boy thinks about the Hunters Association being the sixth and only force that is different from the other five guilds, finally deciding that it is the Hunters Association that South Korea needs. The boy is also running through his head that the president clearly doesn't have much time left. Looking at his age and appearance, this man needs a successor who can inherit his seat. The boy is going through too many thoughts in his head. It seems like sometimes he just needs to stop fretting so much over various details, but he suddenly apologizes, which draws the man's attention to himself. The president of the Hunters Association seems to have time to get a little upset at the boy, thinking about the fact that Jin Woo appears to need money more than anything else, 
rather than authority or some safe place, closing his eyes. But the boy does not make himself long to wait. He immediately utters sincere words that he wants to fight, not to sit in place and do nothing. He wants to move forward and raise his level further. The president of the Hunters Association's gaze changes instantly to one of surprise, as if he hadn't expected such words from a high-ranked hunter, the man simply froze for a moment. After a couple seconds, the president seems to force himself into a familiar position and then hesitantly asks a question about the boy apparently wanting to fight monsters, to which he gets a confident yes. The boy thinks about the fact that the Hunters Association is in charge of the E and D rank dungeons that these powerful guilds have abandoned, and if he joins it, his development will come to an end. The boy begins to gradually realize the valuable detail that he will be able to grow until he stops himself and afterwards says what he thinks his place is exactly in a dungeon, with monsters. The president of the Hunters Association does not hide his surprised look. He is really stunned by such persistence of the boy on his goal. It is the first time he sees such determination to achieve the goal. The president of the Hunters Association looks directly into the boy's eyes, begins to realize that another man's confident gaze only tells the real truth. In Jin Wu's gaze, you can see everything he values and desires. The man doesn't hide his vivid emotions that only came about because of the boy and his words. He holds his hand near his heart, thinking about how he hasn't felt something like this in a long time. The man thinks about the fact that it didn't seem to him that his heart could ever again beat so well. He grieves to think that if he were 20 or 10 years younger, he could too. The boy observes everything that is going on, but he is not going to stay long, so he picks up and says that his sister is home alone now and he has to hurry, to which he hears the old man's thanks. There's nothing left for the boy to do but gather himself to walk towards the exit of that room, and as Jin Wu starts to walk past Jin Chul, he calls out to him, telling him that he was in no way wrong. The boy states that he wasn't the one who cleaned up that two-level dungeon, causing Jin Chul's gaze to change to one of dumbfounded disbelief, because how could that be? Jin Chul stares after the departing boy, who heads on his way toward home, but the assistant still can't figure out who really cleaned out that two-level dungeon then. A man standing at a panoramic window, talking about how when healers and their magic appeared, he thought he could regain his youth. But he was wrong, because even the highest magic cannot turn back time. The man continues to stand at the window and talk about how each of the five powerful guilds are currently building up their forces. After all, those are still on par with the National Army. But if the association loses power, those will be torn off their chains. Jin Chil enters the other's thoughts stating that the association currently has this particular president, to which the other replies that he was thinking that when he steps into that position, the association will always prosper. The man sighs, saying that it's just unfulfilled hopes, thinking about the hunters having to stay in the dungeons, and then orders the other to cancel all appointments for today. Jin Chil says that the president has a meeting with the ministers today, and the other replies that he doesn't want to ruin his mood over these old men, after asking if the guy will have a drink with him. Jin Chil responds sincerely about not being entirely friendly with that alcohol, asking the president if it makes him uncomfortable, and the man turns to him slightly and says that's exactly what he expected him to say. The president of the Hunters Association remembers Jin Wu, thinking that he was the one who was able to rekindle the fire of former passion in him, and then asks aloud, thinking about how much this guy can drink. A powerful and influential high-ranking hunter is hit so hard that his eyes turn completely white and blood flows out of his mouth in a great gush. The man has no time to recover from the last blow he received on himself, but instantly receives an equally powerful and quite painful blow directly to the face, causing his head to seemingly almost fly off to the other side. All these powerful blows are created by the imprisoned man who has experienced enough nasty words and expressions. Now he is just taking revenge on the hunter for all his actions and words. It seems to have been a horrible dream, after which the exhausted and abrasion-filled man opens his eyes, as if afraid to realize that this is not a dream but reality, that this is happening to him right this second. The man finally wakes up after this tumultuous dream, unable to move due to the large number of casts on his own body. The wounds are so damn bad it looks like he'll even have to learn to walk on his feet. The exhausted high-ranking hunter closes his eyes as if from overwhelming shame, talking about what this man wants from him, and if he came for a purpose, let him speak quickly. This suddenly arrived person is the deputy director with all his serious face. He says that he wanted to ask the high-ranked hunter something personal, that's why he was waiting. The deputy director doesn't make his question wait long, because the high-ranking hunter is quite testy, 
so he asks about Il Juan if he's really a monster. The highly ranked hunter raises his gaze and directs it towards the deputy director, ostensibly tiredly starting to talk about how it's as if the man is implying that he attacked a regular person. But the deputy director's next actions make the high-ranking hunter instantly angry, and his eyes turn red when he hears word that there is surveillance video. The deputy director hands the device right into the hands of the high-ranking hunter and speaks in disbelief about how he's never seen such a monster helping ordinary people. Does the man still think Il Juan is a monster? The highly-ranked hunter seems intent on insisting only on his thoughts. He tiredly shifts his gaze to the other and asks about seeing people emerging from the dungeon. The deputy headmaster has nothing to reply to the high-ranked hunter's alien words, after all. He doesn't quite understand the whole point of hunter and dungeon techniques, but apparently this man is right about something, driving away his doubts. After some moments, the face of the high-ranked hunter changes significantly, the red eye already redder than before, as if charged with something, and afterwards states that this man is indeed a monster. The deputy director begins to realize that there is no point in him arguing with the highly ranked hunter, so he voices for the man to come into the bureau after he is fully recovered, for the paper mountain is going nowhere. The high-ranking hunter dares to ask about what happened to that man, and the deputy director says that after the battle the man disappeared without a trace, and yes, the bureau is chasing him, but it is unlikely that they will be able to catch the man. The highly ranked hunter says nothing to such terrible news for him. He is clearly unhappy with what is happening, realizing exactly that he has never so humiliatingly lost to anyone before. Il Juan shows himself in a terrible and powerful form. The man can't forget those flaming eyes and his words about not being in Korea anymore. And it's not about his son. It's about the man. The majestic Il Juan says in a cold tone of voice that a highly ranked hunter will not sleep a wink even after his own death seeking revenge on all his detractors. There is no way the highly ranked hunter can forget these snippets of the past from his memories, his eyes portraying a kind of fear and bewilderment at what he has heard from Il Juan, in what sense he will not sleep a wink after death. The highly ranked hunter isn't about to back down from this man, he realizes he knows where Il Juan is headed, but catching someone else requires equipment he'll request from the guild, and thanks to the artifacts there won't be a problem. It was as if the highly ranked hunter was making a promise to himself, that as soon as he was well enough to work again, he would tear Il Juan apart with his own hands, changing his gaze. There is some sort of auction of all sorts of hunters going on, the very marketplace where hunters can buy or sell raid gear and various materials both online and offline. The boy realizes that the number of hunters has crossed several tens of thousands. The auction is the most easily accessible place for them to buy and sell all the different gear they want. Equipment for hunters is the same as a life preserver for a person drowning in water. The better and more powerful and much more reliable the equipment becomes, the more protected the hunter will be. That's why D or E rank hunters whose arrival is not exactly high don't have the opportunity to equip themselves fully. But if low rank hunters can join a known force, things change. After all, since the hunter's equipment is filled with magic, even the most ordinary sword owned for a D-ranked hunter can cost millions of one, which is in no way affordable for these hunters. Since C-rank and above hunters make a good profit, they can be wasteful when it comes to outfitting the gear that all hunters depend on. The boy is sitting at his computer thinking about the fact that there's no need to talk here, that the price tags on the equipment of high-ranking hunters pierce the sky of hundreds of millions of one, and Jin Wu is wondering why it's so expensive. The price of the best gear is so high that almost no one is able to purchase it for themselves with all their assets, and Jin Wu says that his current gear is not enough. As you ascend the floors of the demonic castle, not only do the attacks with the fire attribute become more frequent, but the dungeon is on fire. Jin Wu just needs equipment, wondering if he should use the store. The boy thinks about the fact that he has no choice but to sell the greed sphere so he can buy artifacts, and Jin Wu can just sell it which is nice. The best artifacts on this market can increase the bearer's strength by 20 or 30 percent, but since the guy's sphere is doubled, the price should be higher. The boy also realizes that since it was obtained the honest way, there's no need for the black market, but he'll have to explain what the legal way is, Jin Wu suggests, which is what he should tell the would-be buyer. The boy realizes that getting an S-rank license will take a while, and if there was a record of going to an A-rank dungeon in the paperwork, they wouldn't have delayed it so much. The boy controls the mouse in his hand and thinks about the fact that it's unlikely that a high-level group would take an E-rang hunter on their raid, which is a big deal right now. Suddenly the boy finds something, leafing through the vastness of the internet and changes in his look to one of surprise, 
realizing that there is really an open recruitment for such a raid, which gives a great opportunity. Some man holds out documents with a photo where the boy looks not at all his age, and then someone says that this folder contains all the necessary documents. The president asks if the kid put in a photo from four years ago, as if they're two different people. And Jin Cheel says that here are all the records of working as a hunter over the past few years. The president says that it's completely impossible, and indeed impossible, that Jin Wu is a liar. And Jin Cheel says that based on the testimony of his former bandmates, he's not. Jin Chul states that in that case, the members of the past raid from the two-level dungeon incident would be alive, remembering the boy's words that Chul wasn't wrong after all. The president says that despite his frequent injuries, the boy didn't lose heart and got up, and Jin Chiu says that he couldn't give up because his mother needs treatment, and the president is extremely surprised. The old man says that the boy has taken responsibility for his sister and ailing mother, thus replacing his missing father, and Jin Chiu says that the boy seems to have just joined the raid. Jin Chul doesn't keep the president waiting long and states that the raid group was organized by the Hunters Guild causing the president to open his eyes with some surprise. The president of the Hunters Association sadly thinks about whether the boy was speaking empty words at the time and is attracted by the money offered. And Jin Chiel says that according to a verified source, Jin Chiel doesn't make his words last long. He states that the boy joined the ore mining squad, so he's not in the attacking squad right now, making the man wonder. The president of the Hunters Association holds the document in his hand, rereading all the information about the boy again thinking about the fact that an S-rank hunter, and even to the miners, the boy is hard to understand. Some man comes into view. He's fully dressed in a uniform prepared for hard labor, looking at someone studyingly, asking if the E-ranga hunter in front of him is a hunter. The boy, noticing the fact that he is being addressed by this man, briefly states that yes, he is an E-rang hunter who is already prepared for any physical labor in this place. The man asks about the boy's experience in this line of work, but Jin Wu has none. Then a question about fighting style follows, to which he replies that he does close combat, which makes the job a little easier. The man smiles, saying that there aren't many people like the boy in this place, so let Jin Wu not worry about nothing and work, and they will enter the dungeon a little later. The boy looks at the knights in front of him and thinks about the size of the high-ranked dungeons being too large. The attack group can't handle all the things at once. So they came up with the idea and divided the job into parts. The first one to start is the advance team, which is in charge of clearing the dungeon of all sorts of different and powerful monsters. Then follows the ore mining squad that collects all the necessary resources, and then follows the gathering group that takes the carcasses of monsters. So these two groups will be the last to enter the dungeon. The boy thinks that since it can be too costly in terms of manpower, they can't use modern technology that runs on electricity anyway. So they resorted to an outdated method. The boy feels even in this pickaxe a particle of magical power, and then looks at the opening portal of bluish light in front of him, for a while even freezing in place from the sight. The boy holds onto his helmet and thinks about the fact that he has been wishing for a long time to see a high-ranking dungeon for himself, glad that he came here, because soon he will have to clean up such a dungeon. The boy can look at the faraway team of this country's strongest hunters, thinks about the fact that this dungeon is actually quite deep, not like Jin Wu's. The high-ranked hunter stops in one place, forcing the others to get behind him as well. While he states that it's time and they can't waste much time on this dungeon, or they'll let the others down. The highly-ranked hunter seems serious about eliminating the whole problem in the form of huge and dangerous monsters on his own, putting in as much effort as he can to save time. The highly-ranked hunter, once he gets the other people to separate away from him, wastes no time and exhales, starting to talk about how he doesn't quite like... He doesn't exactly like the fact that the room is too bright, as it visibly cuts the high-ranking hunter's eyes. But he seems to make a complete exception this time, picking up a cigarette. The man, with a single movement of his hand, forces the lit cigarette into the air under the control of the deft movements of the hunter's fingers, causing it to light up slightly. After a couple of magical circling motions, the lit cigarette instantly explodes, thereby creating several magical circles that are controlled by the man. Some small lit cigarette makes a strong magical weapon that gradually begins to fill the dungeon with its bright and fiery light. The man continues to stand in his place, extending one arm forward which controls the entire magical process, as suddenly there is a huge powerful force that is capable of burning everything in front of him. The monsters in this A-rank dungeon don't seem to be expecting this kind of attack in any way, as they can't even do anything or get close to their opponent to strike. 
These monsters are instantly under the fiery power, their bodies burning at that very second, leaving behind only burnt remains until the man stops using his magical power. After a certain amount of time, the high-ranked hunter stops using his magic abilities, and afterwards states for the tanks to quickly take a stance. A high-ranking hunter with the greatest composure this planet has to offer says that there's going to be some kind of massive storm in a couple seconds, forcing the tanks to hurry up. All the tanks here, without wasting a second of time, completely cover the high-ranked hunter with themselves and their huge shields to protect him from the coming storm. After a couple of countable seconds, as all positions have already been taken, everyone awaits the next reaction from the dungeon itself. There is a bright flash, blinding everything in its path. A powerful strike begins to happen that no one would be able to withstand without a huge and powerful shield in front of them, which saves them from any only strong attack, which is nothing short of amazing. With such a huge tank defense, the high-ranked hunters of this dungeon are under complete protection from an attack that cannot reach them themselves. The high-ranked hunter is satisfied with this job. He slightly turns to the other side of him and says that he was a bit restrained in this attack. And yes, the gathering group won't be able to collect the corpses, for those have turned into embers. The high-ranking hunter states that they don't know the exact depth of the dungeon, but most of the monsters are incinerated and the nearby tanks are surprised to realize just how powerful this hunter is. The highly ranked hunter gives his very real word and promise that he will escort everyone in this dungeon to safety, which cannot be doubted in any way. The highly ranked hunter states that a miss with a keen sense of smell needs to be extremely careful in this burnt dungeon, as there is a rather strong smell of burning coming from the place, causing her to turn away. Some person at the A-rang gate grudgingly asks if the advance team hasn't returned yet, inquiring about how long it's been since they entered there. Some man in a business suit awkwardly states that the advance team is almost at the finish line, while another grudgingly states that he's heard the phrase safety about three times already. That man replies that it will be a problem if the workers encounter a monster that survives the rush of the advance team, offering a drink after work, and the man says to just leave them alone. Someone watching the A-rank gate loudly announces that the advance group is returning, and we need to be ready for it is the turn of the other groups in the area. The boy that is among the rest of the workers waiting for the command to enter the A-rank gate thinks about the fact that finally the advance team has returned from the sweep. The boy gazes into the front A-rank gate, gradually starting to see the silhouettes of high-ranked hunters coming out of this dungeon, watching carefully. The boy begins to notice a large number of highly-ranked hunters coming one by one out of the dungeon with the most calm look. The boy realizes that they are the strongest in the country. These are the strongest high-ranked hunters in the country, who one by one take turns leaving the cleared dungeon, allowing the rest of the group to gradually enter the place. Most unexpectedly, the boy notices Choi Jung-in in the crowd of high-ranking hunters, whom the last thing he'd want to see just now. The boy, not expecting such an encounter with this highly-ranked hunter, wastes no time in covering his face with his helmet so as not to show his presence on this raid, which would be unpleasant. The boy in the crowd of working forces watches as the rest of the hunters gradually begin to emerge from the dungeon, realizing that the second guild is about to emerge. Amongst the crowd of the advance group, it was one girl in particular that caught the boy's attention. A damned eye-catcher amongst the rest of the workers in this dungeon. The boy doesn't even seem to waste any time in realizing who this girl is really. The deputy head of the hunters who is full of great strength. The girl looks forward, not surprised at all after the dungeon was cleared. She seems used to it, and the boy notices that she is the S-ranked hunter, Cha Hai-in. The boy thinks about whether there are many women in this world who can have such an incredible aura. Jin Wu begins to realize that the one is damn strong and no weaker than Choi Jung-in. In the boy's mind flashes even such a thought that perhaps this high-ranking huntress is even superior to Choi Jung-in, because if only to look at it all from the other side. The boy looks at the girl intently not taking his perceptive gaze away, and continues to think that perhaps the strength of this high-ranked huntress is close to Ko Gong He's level. The girl is walking along her path, seemingly about to rest after a successful job done, but something catches her attention so abruptly that she turns her head in the direction she wants to go. The girl starts running her eyes over the workers standing not far from her, thinking about the strong presence she just felt. But how is that possible among the E-ranked? The girl continues to look out for a certain person among the others, thinking that she seems to have imagined it, thinking for a moment that President Ko Gun-hee is here, but her feeling has evaporated. 
Her gaze becomes even sad for a while, as the girl thinks about the fact that such a busy man like the president of the Hunters Association would hardly want to visit this place. The girl, distracted by her many thoughts about the president of the Hunters Association, seems to be starting to sneeze after being in that dungeon for so long, covering herself with a handkerchief. The boy, thanks to his speed, moved farther away from the others, thinking that the girl's sensitivity was amazing, and some man talking about how it was finally their turn and time to go. Some man turns to the boy, asking about what happened, causing Jin Wu to hurriedly walk towards the A-rank dungeon and the boy, coming to his senses after his thoughts, immediately follows him. The boy realizes that the A-Rang dungeon is seriously huge. The rank of the dungeon is not determined by the level of monsters. It depends on waves of magical energy, because that's how the scale changes. And since the scale along with the amount of magical energy determine the rank of the gate, in high-rank dungeons, even a low-level pile of monsters will be able to release powerful waves of energy. But still, even if there are many weak monsters in the dungeon, they won't be able to release a wave of energy that corresponds to an A-rank dungeon. But the monsters that are in an A-rank dungeon aren't that weak. The boy stops while inside the A-rank dungeon, daring to look around himself and what is going on here, as he begins to feel some sort of surprising wind in the place, himself wondering where it is coming from. The boy looks far inside the A-rank dungeon itself, and afterwards begins to realize that it's far from wind but rather some waves of magical energy that are probably coming from the boss. Some workers stand not far away from the boy, starting to discuss Jin Wu's rank, talking about how he seems to be an E rank, causing the boy to perk up his ears and listen to what those are saying. The boy hears about how these workers continue to discuss him, wondering how the bosses could have hired an E rank hunter into this A rank dungeon. What on earth are they thinking? The workers talk about how they seem unlikely to be able to keep up with such a lineup today causing the boy's face to change, realizing that E-rank discrimination will continue to be so. But the boy thinks about the fact that he is not going to stay in this place for a long time anyway, because he just decided to try himself in this business, as a man appears, who begins to hurry the workers who are here. The insolent man, who has a pickaxe slung over his shoulder and is walking around the area with a wobbly gait, is talking about why the boy stood in the road like a stooped man, raising his voice at him. But the boy doesn't seem to be going to tolerate such an attitude in his direction. He raises his gaze showing icy coldness and danger, making the other man startle. The brazen employee's face instantly changes to one of surprise and creepiness that he just saw in someone else's gaze, in a shaky voice saying that it's okay and won't touch him. The insolent man looks after the departing boy to the rest of the workers nearby, wondering if Jin Wu really has an E-rank, for if only to recall the look in his eyes. The gathering group is already in the dungeon, starting their hard work, which is to carry the remains of the monsters that are after a hard fight, trying to work at a pace. The boy realizes that the gathering group that entered even before their group is already toiling in sweat, gradually loading the numerous carcasses of monsters spread out with magical abilities. The boy recalls that the first to enter was the advance party, having dealt with the monsters, and the next were the workers of the gathering group to collect the corpses of the monsters, and after that, the ore mining party. Mana and magic crystals are common, but the bodies of high-level monsters are very valuable. They are used as materials for various things. There is nothing that can be discarded from monster remains. That's the main difference between high-level monsters and low-level monsters. The boy can't believe that such a mutilated carcass could be valuable, but also when the squad sweeps the dungeon, leaving nothing. Then the advanced squad will destroy the main boss to close these gates, because each stage must be done properly because only in this way you can say that the high-level dungeon is passed perfectly. The man turns to the boy, thinking that the boy seems shocked, as this is his first experience in an A-rank dungeon, and Jin Wu says that the man is right, as the size of the monsters surprised him. A boy watching the team at work asks a man a question about the fact that since all the monsters have been killed, only the boss is left, and another says that he is right, because if you kill the boss, the gate will close. The man says that the advance team will take care of him as soon as their group and the gathering group have finished all their business. And the boy asks what will happen if the boss leaves his lair. But that's unlikely. But even if that happens, the man is silent for a while, seemingly trying to hide some horror in his words. That they would all die watching the work going on in this dungeon and how the place is teeming. The boy stands and asks the man if he is afraid if the monster sneaks up from behind, and the man says that he is not afraid at all, because for three years he has worked for the Hunters Association and has never met one. 
The boy thinks about how sometimes ignorance is bliss, because even if the boss is still idle, the magical waves emanating from him make you covered in goosebumps. The level of this boss is not lower than Volcano and Metis. Choi Jung-in and Cha Hai-in look too incredible since they are able to defeat such a monster. But the perfect organized group is also surprising. The boy thinks about, that's why they never faced any serious incidents and closed the gate without harm. Not only brute force is involved here, but also combat experience and qualifications. The boy spends some time on his thoughts. He thinks about how strong these high-ranking hunters are. But it's still time to get to work, which Jin Woo begins to do, picking up a pickaxe. The boy works non-stop. His technique is surprising disposable even from the outside, so that the work is done with enough speed and intensity. The boy doesn't seem to notice anyone around him, as he engages in the goal set for himself, his muscles only beginning to appear bigger, all with each movement of the pickaxe. The nearby workers are looking at the boy's work in amazement, asking each other if Jin Wu really has an E-rank, and this guy's first experience, as the man said. One of the employees asks if that one is really E-rank. The intensity of the work and his skills say otherwise, of course, someone else's license is verified. Would anyone take someone without a license? The man looks at the boy's high-speed work, asks the other guy, then how he will explain the stranger's speed and technique, the fact that the boy is already clearing the dungeon alone. The people there continue to discuss the guy, but in a good way, saying that Mr. Sun Jin Woo is undoubtedly the kind of miner who has been blessed by the heavens themselves. The man boasting that he has a keen eye. Some amount of time passes and someone loudly announces such a nice word that lunchtime is starting, thanks to which all the workers can distract themselves and finally eat. The man seems to see that the boy has no intention of leaving, so he asks him why he is standing there, to which Jin Wu replies that he had time to eat beforehand, hearing back that he should rest then. Gradually, the tired workers begin to distance themselves from the boy standing in the same spot, who is looking at the crystals closer and also thinking about something of his own finally maybe alone. The boy realizes that he has finally been left alone, which can't help but make him happy. So he puts the pickaxe in its place and thinks about the fact that you can't miss such a good opportunity. The boy looks with fascination at the deep dungeon in which he is left almost alone, realizes the fact that he has some hour of free time until the others return. The boy holds onto his helmet with his hand and quickens his step towards his target of interest. He thinks of just a glimpse of the ultimate boss himself. What a hell of an attraction. In the gloomy A-rank dungeon, there is a main boss walking around in huge strides, who no one is going to touch yet. He is a huge wall walking all over the dungeon. The boy can finally see in person the real giant boss of the A-rank dungeon for which he dared to apply for raids. The monster looks strong and intimidating. The boy's gaze changes to a focused and habitually cold-blooded one as he thinks about the fact that the giant boss is definitely strong in his abilities, even stronger than Metis. The boy pulls out his mighty weapon with a single motion of his hand, from which streams of electricity emanate like this. Jin Wu thinks that his current power should be enough, but something prevents him. Something inside the boy says that it's not that simple. He says aloud whether he should try to deal with the monster, because the gate will start to close after he kills the boss, but the guild will suffer losses. The boy is about to start executing his plan, leaning in for more concentration as he suddenly hears a voice behind him, making him tense up more. The boy's gaze shows a second of consternation. He doesn't seem to be in any way expecting to meet someone just at lunchtime. And the girl's silhouette sternly states that she asked a question. The boy is so puzzled by the stranger's presence that he forgets for a while about his mighty dagger in his hand, which he holds tightly but manages to conceal in time. The boy thinks chagrinly about how he could have made such a mistake, but exhales a sigh of relief that he didn't burn himself, thinking about how it was damn near the ultimate failure. The boy doesn't turn to face the girl behind him, starts to say something that he just got lost in the mine and somehow wandered into this dangerous place. And the girl interjects, in what sense lost? The girl holds a handkerchief to her nose, asks the boy if he's from the mining squad, and then starts telling him that this is the boss's lair, asking him to get out of here as soon as possible. The man watches the girl out of the corner of his eye and thinks about what a dangerous girl Cha Hain is because she was able to sneak up on him from the back and almost burn Jin Wu. The girl again turns her scrutinizing gaze to the boy's hand, in which there is nothing, and then she thinks about whether she imagined or seriously saw a weapon in the boy's hand. The girl keeps vocalizing, asking the boy to leave the place, because if the boss awakens and goes into a rage, a lot of people will die, and the boy turns to face her and apologizes for the trouble. 
The boy wastes no time and tries to escape from this place as quickly as possible, because the girl is quite cunning and guessing, trying to find a clue in every hole. Just at the moment when the boy starts to walk past her, the girl removes her own handkerchief a little and widens her eyes in surprise, for she senses some sort of aura from Jin Wu. The boy doesn't have time to move a considerable distance away from the girl before Cha Hai In shouts at him, asking him to wait, to which Jin Wu gives her a confused look with the corner of his eye. The girl doesn't waste a second and comes almost right up to the boy, starts sniffing his t-shirt in the strangest way, making the boy open his eyes in surprise at what she is doing. The girl sniffs the other's shirt for a while, not covering her sensitive nose with a handkerchief at all, and then steps back and stares dumbfoundedly at Jin Wu, even opening her mouth and realizing that there is no nasty smell. The girl doesn't make her question last long and talks about whether the boy is really a hunter, holding him up for a license, and Jin Wu asks the counter question that there's some kind of problem. The girl begins to peer into the contents of the international license, noticing the brief information about the boy that he has an E rank and his name is Sung Jin Wu, trying to remember his name. The girl awkwardly moves away from the boy and tells him to forget and be careful in this place because they are in a dangerous dungeon as it is, and the boy already nervously says he will be careful. The girl looks after the departing boy and starts filling her head with various thoughts that it might be because of Erang Jin Wu, but he didn't smell any stench at all like the others. The girl continues to stare after the departing boy, who is clearly embarrassed by Cha Hai In's act, while she thinks about how Jin Wu rather has more of a pleasant odor that she rarely encounters. The boy walks beside the man in embarrassment, listening to him amuse himself over his confusion at the dungeon and his encounter with the huntress Cha, but not everyone gets to talk to her alone. The man says that she was worried that the boss might have left his lair, so she went to patrol it, working even during her break, for which she is often pitied by the other workers. The boy thinks about the ore mining squad being relaxed due to never having come face to face with the boss. It makes sense why the advance squad is working cautiously. After all, they're the ones in the know. One of the nearby miners says that Miss Hunter Cha Hayin can sometimes smell a kind of disgusting odor from the hunters, because it is said to be a kind of unique physiology. Some man says that's why that one is always covering her nose with a handkerchief. Isn't it strange? It's quite difficult for her to breathe around other hunters. And the boy understands why that one asked if Jin Wu is a hunter. The boy remembers the very conversation he had with the ice elf. He talked about how they keep hearing the same voice in his head. But towards the boy he hears nothing surprising him more. That very conversation with the ice elf only makes you wonder more, because whether the current situation and the past situation can be considered to be converging in some way is extremely strange. The boy thinks about the fact that he has no special scent common to all hunters, and no voice telling the monsters to massacre him themselves. Well, aren't all these events connected? The boy joins the miners walking in some direction, who are vigorously discussing something among themselves smiling, and Jin Wu thinks being a loner to get the advantages of the system. At the end of the work, the atmosphere is quite friendly. All people are tired but satisfied, because the payment for labor begins, so the boy receives an envelope from someone with words that he has done a good job. The boy gratefully accepts payment for his labor, and accepts various compliments that if it wasn't for him, the workers would have finished the job two hours late. No one expected such abilities of Jin Wu. The man approaches the boy and says that he's met many in all his time, but this is the first time he's had the chance to work with someone like Jin Wu, saying that the kid has outstanding talent as a miner. The man coughs slightly awkwardly into his fist, and afterwards says that he doesn't usually say that. But the man asks if Jin Wu wants to work for him from time to time, because the man will take good care of him. The boy smiles awkwardly, even closes his eyes, and afterward vocalizes that he is grateful to the man from the bottom of his heart but continues that he already works in some place where he is comfortable enough. The man's face changes to a slightly chagrined one, saying that it's even a kind of annoyance to him, and then asks about tomorrow, as the boy looks at working tomorrow. The boy thinks about the fact that from dirt to princes in just two days, whether it makes sense for him to work as a miner, after all, he's already a bit into the intricacies of mopping up high-ranking dungeons. The boy thinks about how there seems to be no point in agreeing to this offer anymore, but suddenly realizes what the man said about tomorrow, making him wonder even more. The boy is surprised to hear the Hunter's Guild raiding again tomorrow, to which the man replies that yes, there's another A-rank gate waiting for them to mop up together. The boy hears the words that the A-team will be replaced by another team that is B-ranked, 
and the boy wonders in what sense the B team will be replaced. The boy begins to slowly speculate about whether they are splitting their forces in half to mop up the A rank dungeons, and the man says, This is what is called the strength of the Hunters Guild in all of South Korea. The boy doesn't even seem to be listening to the man's last words about the details and how strong their guild is anymore, so he confidently asks him where they need to approach tomorrow afternoon. The man immediately says that the boy is making the right choice, that he'll talk to the management and ask for a double salary for Jin Woo, because it's worth doubling the salary of someone who does the work for five people. On the table is a deliciously fried bacon with various vegetables. Some girl states that she only came to this place because someone wanted to have dinner with her. But why barbecue pork? Drunken Jinho holds alcohol in his hand and says how dare she look down on this meat. And does this girl know that the boy and Jin Woo were having a great time together here? The disgruntled girl sits across from the boy, crosses her arms over her chest, and indignantly asks him why he brought her to a place of other people's dear memories. The boy visibly calms down. He casts his gaze downward and feels a kind of fever due to the alcohol, but states that the conversation with his father went quite smoothly and pleasantly which is nothing short of amazing. The girl is instantly energized by this news and starts prying information out of the drunken boy, asking about whether Jin Ho will become the next head of the Yu Jin Guild. As soon as the girl asks her question, the boy instantly responds with a trembling and distressed voice about needing an expensive hyungnim for this case, and the girl has no way of knowing who Jin Ho is talking about. The boy is already starting to flood with uncontrollable tears, causing the girl to look at his cell phone, where a large number of the same messages and Jin Ho thinks he's ignoring him. The boy says that Henim said that he would be out of range for a while, but it's been over a week because that's too long. And the girl asks what kind of relationship he has with him, because he's starting to scare her. Some boy with a broad smile answers someone's question, saying that due to the fact that his filming is still not over, the evaluation of this young man's rank will have to be postponed for a while. The girl is distracted for a while from the tears of the boy, who seems to begin to pathetically call her sister, asking the other one why she changed the subject so quickly. The boy even determines from his voice that Lee Min Seong, who is a popular star, is now on TV, according to other people, the one who plans to be reevaluated in two days. The girl closes her eyes and says it's just a show because he's already gotten his A rank and now he's going to do it again for show, and the boy asks if Lee Min Seong is just playing to the audience. The girl says that he simply lacks attention, also famous for his love affairs, because this man is quite good at such intrigues, even before that he was a cunning and cunning snake. The girl decides to stop talking about this man, and afterwards suddenly snatches the phone out of the boy's hands and says that did he really call her for this, and afterwards just offers to call his henim. The girl makes a phone call, and afterward looks at Jinho unhappily saying that the call is actually going through, to which the other looks at the girl in surprise and unbelievingly blurts out that really. The boy answers the phone and says that he was delayed, and the other asks why he was away for so long, to which Jin Woo replies that he was just running through some dungeons. Jin Ho immediately brightens with joy at the thought of what was expected of his young Nim, and afterward he hears a question about how the conversation with Jin Ho's father went, to which he replies that he wanted to talk about it asking to meet tomorrow. The boy doesn't make her answer wait long, and afterwards states that he'd love to meet Jin Ho tomorrow afternoon, while the girl props her head up with her hand and watches her brother. The city is slowly sinking into a noticeable darkness. It's quite quiet and peaceful now, which can't help but be a good thing. Some houses are burning brightly, for there are many lives swarming inside them, but someone's welcoming voice can be heard. The girl stands in her slippers at the panoramic window, looking out at the city plunging into darkness, and hears the words that Miss Choi is surprisingly late calling at this hour. Perhaps something is wrong. The girl starts to voice her request if the person on the other side of the phone can't find some information about a man named Jin Woo, who is working in the mining squad today. The girl thinks about how a person can get lost in such a place, and immediately stumble upon the room of the main boss. There's clearly something that doesn't add up here because suddenly he's a spy from another guild, which worries her. The girl hears a question on the other side of the phone asking if Miss Cha Hayen is referring to the very E-Rang hunter from the association, to which she is surprised and asks if the person knows about him. The unknown man says that he was actually asked by Head Choi about an important matter, also to request some information regarding E-Ranked hunter Jin Wu, who has attracted the attention of several at once. The girl continues to look at the beautiful city through the panoramic windows and asks why the head was wondering about it, to which she receives thoughtful words about not being quite sure, but 
John Doe has been trying to gather as much information about him as possible, but the hunter associations have classified some of Jin Wu's information, so this is the first time he's encountered such secrecy from a low-ranking hunter. The girl thinks that even the head of the hunters tried to find out about this man, but it turned out that the Association of Hunters somehow interfered in this situation and opposes everything. The girl thinks about the fact that it's time to end a conversation that won't lead to any results so far, saying out loud the fact that something amazing is seriously going on here. It's quite late and the girl still hasn't been able to sleep, so she lies on her bed, face resting against her own soft pillow, and thinks about all sorts of thoughts. The girl stares slightly drowsily somewhere ahead and thinks about why this particular boy named Jin Wu is different from the rest of the other hunters she works with. The girl after a while turns over on her back and looks already at the ceiling with a pensive look because the boy is the only one who emits a pleasant odor. The boy walks up to a waiting group of people, sees the very girl he once came in contact with, who affectionately tells Jin Wu not to hurt himself today and to be careful. As soon as the boy comes to his senses, the girl disappears without a trace, while the other people present are still there as well, greeting Jin Wu with their joyful smiles. The boy only nods silently to all the people here, does not hide his peaceful smile, immediately tuning into the positive mood of today's work. Suddenly a man exclaims that the boy is obliged to eat lunch with all the workers together today, and another interjects that Jin Wu should not say that he has already had his lunch. The boy thinks about how it's such a nice feeling for a while that he even managed to forget about, and also the good atmosphere reminds him of the old days. Once again the work begins in a flurry, some man loudly proclaiming for the miners to make a good start to their day's work, while others reply that they will rest a bit and get on with their work. Some man in sturdy armor turns to the others with a smile and states that if he can borrow one man from the mining squad, as their porter just didn't show up today. The men stare unhappily and discuss whether those want to hire one of them as an errand boy, talking about how many tough guys there are from the collection squad. Some man says that his guys plow continuously for three hours straight without lunch in order to get everything on time and others suggest that they also carry bags, so their squad simply refuses. The man says that it was the squad along with Sung Jin Woo who finished the job a full two hours earlier than usual. So why don't they borrow their powers again for the sake of a successful job, making the other wonder. The man in armor loudly voices if anyone wants to go with the advance team, for they will definitely pay them life threat compensation when the important raid is over. The workers are thinking about the fact that it's too damn dangerous for them, and they don't want to risk their lives for it and nobody is going to agree to it. Too damn dangerous. The man says that this is an A-ranked dungeon, because it's not at all dangerous for low-level hunters in this place, even if he wears gear. Compared to ore mining, the risk is high. The man continues that their squad is mostly D and E rank hunters. They can die from even the weakest monster attack, indignantly blurted out. Would his workers risk their lives for that? The man in armor seems to feel extremely embarrassed. After all, he was given the task of finding one porter, but all the people here just refuse. So the man asks, what is it no one wants? Suddenly, all the attention of the people nearby is taken up by a boy who stretches his arm forward and says that he wants to try his hand at being a porter to go with the advance party. All the workers around them open their eyes in great surprise because they do not expect such activity and clear determination on the part of the boy who has recently come to them. The men instantly fly up with a sort of panic surrounding the boy on both sides and ranting about how it's damn dangerous, since Jin Wu is an E-ranked hunter. How can he go into an A-ranked dungeon? The men say that the dungeon is crawling with different monsters. Why the boy raised his hand? Because he is such a young guy with a bright future. And Jin Wu says that he will be fine, because he has a head on his shoulders. The boy thinks about the fact that even though he's been assigned to carry the gear all this time, it's a great opportunity for him to gain experience. Because after all, this is an A-ranked dungeon. The men talk about how this kid just got a job with them yesterday and clearly doesn't understand the seriousness of the details. Another asks what his rank is, and the other replies that Jin Wu's E-rank is too weak. But the man who has long been trying to find a porter for their squad only closes his eyes and smiles, saying that this particular option in the form of a determined boy is just right for them. The man walks up to the boy and thanks him for joining them specifically, saying his name is Sung Ki Hoon and today will be Jin Wu's leader, which he extends his hand to shake. The boy is already carrying the huge equipment on his back that will be used by all the hunters, and the man asks if Jin Wu is heavy, thinking in his mind that he doesn't even need to sweat. The boy looks at the gate in front of him, pondering the fact that it seems like yesterday it was quite large, 
but today it has gotten much larger, thus only making him tense up. The man asks about whether the boy had his first day of work as a miner yesterday. It turns out that today is already his second trip to the raid and to the very real A-rank dungeon. The boy thinks about the gate getting bigger, because the waves of magical energy are weaker today, but if it were too dangerous here, Team B would have abandoned today's raid. The boy looks over at the B-Team Hunter Guild standing a bit apart from all the other high-ranked hunters who are just tuning in for future dungeon work. The boy runs his eyes over everyone here, counting 11 A-ranked hunters and 6 B-ranked hunters, but any other guild wouldn't allow such a division. Quite a large number of all sorts of hunters gather in one big pile to go on a long journey with everyone else to fight monsters. The boy walks with the gear on his back behind all the other hunters, thinking about the fact that the waves of magical energy have weakened noticeably, and also the association's calculations are sort of correct. The big A rank gates are teeming with the unknown. You cannot predict what awaits you on the other side of the dungeon, what monsters are there, and what will happen to you. The boy pauses for a moment before entering the A-rank dungeon itself, head up, wondering why the dungeon is acting this way today. After some amount of time, the boy steps right into the A-rank gate, thinking that for some reason, the ominous feeling that once emanated from the red gate itself never leaves him. A large number of very different hunters finally find themselves in the A-rank dungeon, which is so full of dangerous foreboding, a rather strong aura and the uncertainty of the path. The boy gets the attention of a girl who comes up to him, telling him not to worry, because their leader and everyone here are outstanding hunters. Suddenly, the knight ahead of them says for everyone to depart, and the boy thinks that one is the healer of Arang, remembering Miss Ju He and her injury, after which she couldn't participate in the raids. The boy thinks that the six B-rank hunters are close to getting A-rank. The Hunter's Guild is positioned with such strength, and the girl tells Jin Wu that as long as he's in formation, monster attacks won't be scary. The girl states that they have an unspoken rule that if mages attacked, the tanks are responsible, if healers, the vanguard is responsible, and if porters, the entire guild is to blame. The girl says that's why the boy will not get into a situation where there will be a threat to his life, because as long as the advance party simply does not fail, then this will never happen, which is not something to be afraid of. Some man is setting himself up for a tough battle in a high-ranked dungeon. He is visibly nervous of what is going on, but tries to set himself up only for a hard win. The man thinks that he was chosen to be the team leader for the first time, and if today goes well, he can become the leader of the B team because he is still one of the best hunters of the A rang. While the man is tuning in with good and positive thoughts to make sure the fight goes off without any terrible losses, suddenly a rustle is heard somewhere deep within the dungeon itself, forcing him to look in that direction. High-ranking hunters react instantly to this rustle, turn their heads in the direction of the sound itself, and tense up as much as possible, ready for any attack. All the hunters in this dungeon react as quickly as possible to the sound that occurred, preparing their weapons and magical abilities, looking precisely into the distance. The boy observes from the side the combat readiness of all the hunters here, and afterward is momentarily surprised at the fact that this team prepared for battle without any said commands. Something terrifying happens from the depths of the A-rank dungeon, some horrible sounds, magical waves appear, making some people feel not so good. The temporary leader of Team B changes his face to one of puzzlement and surprise, for he had not expected to encounter something intimidating in this dungeon, causing him to freeze in place. The man begins to peer into the darkness and listen to various sounds coming from the depths of the A-rank dungeon, and then becomes startled when the underground jackals begin running at them. Underground jackals are damn fast, their eyes glowing a hungry red, their jaws open in an attempt to get at hot and human flesh, but would hunters allow this to be done to themselves? But the highly ranked hunters here will not allow these, albeit agile monsters, to approach them and try to strike them, as the hunters are slowly starting to get a handle on them. Team B's leader dodges the various attacks of the underground jackals, looking at them with his confident gaze and using his shield at times to avoid getting some kind of blowback. The man deals with these underground jackals quite deftly and without any fear in his eyes, except that seeing something ahead of him makes him feel threatened. These subterranean jackals just don't seem to end, coming in numerous streams, trying to straighten out the high-ranking hunters, but this kind of thing just doesn't work out for them. Just as another stream of swift underground jackals appears, a man appears from somewhere directly high in the sky, lurking in his shadow, seemingly swinging at one of the monsters. This strong hunter doesn't make you wait long for his action, so he lands on the ground and massacres one of the subterranean jackals by correctly calculating some sort of fall trajectory. 
After a moment, some powerful huntress also appears, holding both of her hands by her side using some sort of magical power, loudly telling everyone to instantly duck down. After a couple seconds, the girl uses her strong magic abilities, thus developing her own magic throughout the dungeon to similarly attack these underground jackals. The attack of this huntress is quite strong. She was able to deal with several subterranean jackals at once, which can't help but delight anyone nearby that is watching from the sidelines. As the small battle ends on the last disemboweled dungeon jackals, the leader of Group B asks about what that just was and where those monsters in Dungeon A came from. The boy next to the healer asks her if these underground jackals shouldn't be here, to which she replies that not really, because this is an A-rank dungeon. The girl states that the underground jackal is a C-class monster, and yes, they are too weak for A-rank. Jackals undergo natural selection and all go to feed stronger monsters. The girl stands next to the breathless bodies of the monsters and says that even if they joined together as a pack, they wouldn't be able to defeat the monsters here, so they wouldn't have survived in this place anyway. The boy that holds a large equipment on his back crouches down next to one of the jackal's body and thinks about what kind of collar mark they have, and afterwards says that these are unusual jackals, they were following someone's orders. The leader of Group B seriously states that it appears they were just sicked on by dogs, and the boy thinks about how monsters must have high intelligence to tame dogs. Those are obviously hard to deal with. The boy thinks his many thoughts, tries to guess about who is really the boss of this A-rank dungeon that is crawling with a scary aura, and then starts to put the puzzle together. The boy thinks about whether it's possible that if his intuition just doesn't fail, Jin Wu begins to focus on his surroundings, seemingly beginning to sense someone's presence not too far away from him. The boy's gaze instantly locks onto someone not far away from him. He stares intently and studiously, seeming to think that the true inhabitants of the A-rank dungeon are about to appear. After some amount of time, while the boy is gazing in some direction, already at this moment, the leader of Group B is covered in sweat and numerous shivers on his body, shocked by what he sees now. The man's gaze changes to one of horror. He can't tear his eyes away from what is happening very close to him, somewhere ahead of him, making him forget all words and look forward in horror, not knowing what to do. And the very reason for all the horror of all the nearby hunters is some huge monster that is painted in peculiar white stripes but with surprisingly large fangs and a hungry look. Some standing hunter shouted and frightened that there was a higher orc in front of them, while another high-ranking hunter only said in a shaky voice that how was this even possible? But in this A-rank dungeon, things won't be as easy as they seem, for the supreme orc can be seen to be several, even more than the sheer number of professional hunters here who are standing fearfully. The monsters don't seem to be about to waste their time. One of them opens its huge maw and lets out a deafening scream that seems to announce a real battle in their meaning. One of the nearby monsters holds in his hand some wooden but sharp at the end of the device that at the ready holds and then with great force launches directly into one of the designated targets. This contraption, created by the dangerous monsters themselves, flies at an incredibly tremendous speed, seeming to hold some sort of magical power within it, causing it to spin around harder. It seems that the target of the powerful orcs themselves is the leader of Group B, who stands all alone without any help by his side, counting only on himself and looking ahead. The man with a kind of horror on his face manages to cover his face with a strong shield, thanks to which alone he can save his life, holds it as strong as possible to resist the force of the blow. The fixture itself collides with the shield of Group B's leader. It seems the force of the alien strike is so immense that the weapon begins to create some sort of crack in the shield, barely holding the force. As the device flies off in the other direction without achieving the desired result, the man looks at what his shield has become, being almost useless at this point, but his gaze sees something else. The man notices some huge monster that holds a heavy weapon in its hand and swings it right at the leader of Group B, seemingly deciding to deal with him right here and now. The huge orc even jumps up on the spot to make his strike as strong as possible as usual, colliding his weapon with the huge shield of the leader of Group B while the rest of the monsters also attack the others. Not far away from the leader of Group B, the hunter also takes the blow of the huge and powerful monster that targeted him, uses his own shield and all his strength to defend himself. But this attacking orc isn't some stupid monster. It instantly reacts to a defense using the power of one of the hunters and steps back to avoid getting hit. One of the high-ranked hunters who had just defended himself against the monster's attack 
is thinking about whether his provocation just didn't work on this savvy monster. The hunter watches as this huge orc rises straight up in the air, seemingly deciding to target the other hunters altogether, and the man cries out for the mages to be careful, for they are the next target. One of the mages, not far away from all the other hunters, loudly voices for the others not to worry, for messing with mages is bad enough. The man is already starting to use his power. The magical power of one of the mages is right inside the lantern he puts forward, thus burning the body of one of the monsters that only tried to attack the others. This powerful orc doesn't quite expect this kind of sneaky tactic from one of the mages, so the one who took the hit flies off in the other direction, falling straight to the cold ground. But the mighty orc seems to instantly regain his lost strength and health points, immediately rising from the ground and heading for the mages again with great speed. One of the attacking mages begins to visibly panic, crying out the annoying fact that whether his attack didn't work on the powerful orc, whether the latter is immune to such magic. The very next second, another mage intervenes in this dangerous endeavor, thus using his magical ability and restraining the body of the reckless powerful orc in some purple chains. The girl who uses this kind of defense on the powerful orc is loudly vocalizing that the one is too strong, so she'll be able to hold him off for something like five seconds, which isn't much. But the mage standing next to her says loudly that this is enough for him, and then turns to his magic, telling it to answer his call and defeat the enemy attacking him. At the same second, one of the fire spirits appears ready to fulfill any errands of his mage, noticing a dangerous powerful orc ahead of him who will have to be fought. A fairly strong and fiery spirit begins to attack the powerful orc, while the mage thinks about the fact that he can only summon two spirits, but even so they are as strong as the A-Rang hunters. The man is a little nervous, because he can't use magic during summoning, and if his spirits are damaged, his magic will be severely depleted because it's his trump card, and his mana is starting to run out. One of the mighty orcs massacres one of the knights with particular fury who tries to stop a strong attack from the monster, but is struck, losing his arm. The same knight is instantly next to the healer, which speaks loudly about what their tanks are doing and why they aren't watching their rear. It's a very panicky atmosphere right now. Someone watches from the sidelines and thinks about how their provocation just doesn't work on monsters. Skills are just ignored, and one of the hunters ends up in the monster's hands, screaming for a cure. The leader of Group B shouts loudly that the matter is very bad at the moment. If they are surrounded, they will be at a disadvantage, and then makes everyone group up and form up into three hunters. The man thinks about the fact that even if this is an A-rang dungeon, there certainly shouldn't be so many evolved individuals of higher orcs here that can defeat all the hunters with their strength alone. The leader of Group B is visibly nervous and covered in sweat. He is stating that the measurement results of the magic waves of this gate showed something completely different. So how could such a thing happen? The man thinks about the fact that the High Orcs are not just Orcs, but the strongest monsters among their race. Also, each of them is equal to an A-Rang hunter in terms of their strength. But these monsters here are a whole army. The man lists that there are 22 higher Orcs, or in other words, 17 hunters versus 22. But that is far from an accurate comparison, for they have B-ranked hunters on their team as well. One of the men stops, looks with terror in his eyes at the swinging arm of one of the monsters that holds his sharp weapon, while the leader thinks that if the B-Ranks are killed, they will be in some kind of trouble. The man can no longer control his rolling panic. He thinks about what to do in this situation. Without sacrifices in such a case, simply cannot do without, and the hand of one of the monsters is already lowering. The nearby knight, who was in no way prepared for such an attack from the mighty orc, breaks down into a loud cry of pain, as his half of his body is simply thrown aside by the monster's blow. One of the sorceresses shouts loudly for the man to move as far away as possible covering him with herself and getting in front of the powerful orc, seemingly about to use her magic. A girl with large glasses on the bridge of her nose seriously uses her magical powers, puts her weapon directly on the ground, thus starting a kind of attack that emanates a purple glow. At the same second, a huge purple snake appears, which instantly wraps the body of the mighty orc around itself, starting to gradually strangle this monster who is not expecting such an attack. Thanks to the sorceress, one of the knights that has been seriously wounded is near one of the healers, who asks to bear with him for a second while the man is tormented by the immense pain in his body. The girl doesn't waste a second of precious time. She starts using her healing skills, holds some green magic and brings it closer to the man's body. Thanks to her professional skills, a hand form begins to form that can be used and attached directly to the body of one of the knights, who is already slowly getting better. 
A few more moments and the girl finally creates something incredible, as the man gets a whole and unharmed arm with which he will be able to continue fighting in this dangerous battle. But something terrifying begins to loom over the girl who has just finished the healing process, a kind of terror frozen in her eyes as the huge shadow of one of the monsters appears above her. This shadow comes from the huge body of a powerful orc, who easily dispatched the summoned snake of one of the sorceresses, holding in his teeth the very snake that failed to stop his attack. One of the sorceresses, who was the one who used her magical abilities, cries out loudly about how could this powerful orc have survived and overpowered her magical attack. The mighty orc seems pretty damn pissed off right now as he took on a large number of different attacks, but dealt with them instantly, so he'll be able to reward himself to the helpless healer. The girl can't do anything because she only wounded in battle hunters, helping them to fight on and be in the strength of spirit, so she just closes her eyes and realizes that everything is finished. But it only seems so to her, for the boy's trail has instantly disappeared, he has left the equipment of the high-ranking hunters not far from the battle site, and seems to be starting to use his skills. The boy begins to disappear from sight in seconds, using his magical abilities, his eyes burning with a bluish light, and he begins to accomplish what he has planned. The all-frightened healer expects an attack from the powerful orc, but nothing has been happening for some time, so she opens her eyes and looks forward excitedly. The mighty orc seems to be experiencing someone's choking attack. He raises his huge hands to his neck as if trying to remove someone's shackles on it, unable to draw in a breath of air. The healer girl's gaze instantly changes. She watches with disbelieving eyes as the powerful orc slowly begins to vaporize into thin air. The girl continues to watch as nothing is left of the powerful orc. It's as if he didn't even exist, as if she was just dreaming of a stranger's attack that could have sent the girl to the other side of the world. The girl can't understand what just happened. She has a lot of different questions in her head. She doesn't know how she should react to what just happened. The battle is happening on the other side of the battle as well. The leader of Group B tries to straighten out one of the powerful orcs, but at the same moment some white streaks appear in the air. The man's face instantly changed in his face, starting to question the fact that somehow fighting was so much easier than usual. What had happened at this point? The man has just dealt with one of the powerful orcs and can watch with his own eyes the ongoing battle around him as the others fight against the monsters. Gradually, some sort of purple monster blood begins to appear in the air from the powerful orcs. One of them has a huge gash right on his bandaged leg. The next attack doesn't leave you waiting long. Someone moving with great speed moving through the dungeon and launching their stealth attack on a variety of monsters, brushing a knife across their bodies. One of the hunters fights a powerful orc, holding his weapon as tightly as he can while the monster feels someone start attacking his body in a variety of different areas. The boy moves rather stealthily, his gaze still as icy and serious. He begins to look at the monsters and thinks he'll weaken them to their fullest while he's in the shadows. The boy's gaze shifts to the rest of the powerful orcs as well, seeming to realize that those two were able to notice his attack and presence after all, which is troublesome. The boy instantly walks up to one of the powerful orcs and sets his weapon up, looking straight into the monster's eyes and vocalizing that it would do him no good if they created some kind of ruckus over him. At the same second, while the boy takes all of the monster's attention to himself, one of the melee hunters begins to run at full speed, seemingly targeting the powerful orc. The girl is next to one of the powerful orcs in a matter of seconds, puts her arm forward that holds immense power, and then strikes right at him. In the same instant, the mighty orc falls straight to the ground, purple surges emanating from his body, and the girl loudly voices that she was able to finally deal with one of the monsters here. The boy holds the precious weapon in his hand, looking at his palm, which is stained in someone else's blood, which is enough to add some trouble, but he will try to be careful. The boy thinks about the fact that Song Ki-hoon and the other hunters here are elite hunters selected by the Hunters Guild, so they can be considered some of the best hunters in South Korea. The boy walks past the gradually weakening monsters, and also continues to think about the fact that it can't be said that he doesn't believe in hunters, but just defeating a high orc is really hard. The boy thinks about the fact that female healers are usually the very first to die in battle, so he can't just sit back and watch them being mercilessly slaughtered by these monsters. The boy thinks that as long as he helps the group, then whether his level goes up or not, he could kill all the orcs himself, but he won't interfere much since the Hunter's Guild paid the money. The high-ranking hunters here look rather tired and lost. They look on with disbelieving eyes as they look at the fact that they have defeated the all-powerful orcs and defeated them. 
The leader of Group B asks if anyone is injured at the moment, and as long as they are able to breathe, the A-Rang healers will be able to heal them as long as these hunters are able and strong. The boy stands not far from the knights, which suggests that the dangerous orcs were unexpected enemies for them at all, while the other replies that they're damn lucky it all worked out and they're alive. One of the sorceresses is not standing far away from the boy who continues to carry the equipment on his back. She watches him carefully, and is silent for now, trying to analyze him. The girl thinks about the fact that this porter considers them for stupid people, because no one can hide such an ability as stealth from the spellcaster mage which is what the boy used recently. After a certain amount of time, the leader of Group B is approached by the same female healer, addressing him as an appa and stating that when they first fought against the higher orcs, something... The girl begins to remember a terrifying yet amazing picture of the moment when she was supposed to be finished off by a powerful orc, but instead that orc took hold of her throat and couldn't breathe. The man states that one high orc suddenly hovered in the air and afterward burst apart, thinking that someone had used some sort of spell, and the woman exclaims that's exactly what she thinks. The leader of Group B turns to one of the huntresses, asking Gina if it was her doing, to which she replies that it's impossible to do such a thing with her skills, she's not that strong. The girl goes on to say that she can only immobilize them for a while with telekinesis magic. But no one in their group practices curse magic, which surprises them more. The girl says that their group of professional hunters are practicing on the fire element, so there are no assassin hunters among them, which makes you wonder even more, because how is that possible? One of the sorceresses enters the conversation, stating that the other huntress is right, because if anyone could pull off such an act, it would be an outsider, clearly alluding to Jin Wu. The Enchantress thinks that maybe Jin Wu has something to hide, but should she keep it a secret? And the other mage says that the one is so glad, because his mana is almost all depleted at that moment. The leader of Group B says that everyone here is right. The higher orcs are strong, though they behaved strangely in the second half of the battle, but that's what helped them to disperse. One of the hunters enters the conversation, drawing the attention of the leader beside him, asking what they will do next and whether they will continue the battle in this place. One of the knights fearfully says whether it is not dangerous for them, and the other continues that they are not so far away from the gate, and they have already been so heavily attacked, and it will be even more dangerous from here on. One of the knights places a hand on the shoulder of the leader of Group B, starting to say that since they are already aware of what is going on in this dungeon, it would be too risky to continue this long journey. The knight states why don't they just go home as well, as right now at least a couple more healers are needed, as well as about three mages specializing in spells. Toth continues that he understands the fact that this is Mr. Sohn's first time leading the B-team, and it's a little frustrating that it's come to this. But it's better to stop, and the leader thinks that if he succeeds, he'll become the official leader. The man clenches his palms into fists, fighting with himself and his thoughts. He thinks about the fact that there may not be another chance, because this is so rare for him. The boy observes the leader of Group B, thinking about the fact that it's not an easy choice for another. In his place, anyone else would be tempted and want to successfully mop up the dungeon. The boy continues to watch the stranger not far away from him, thinking about what if still the leader of Group B is thinking soberly for the moment, while the man continues to think about what to do. A certain amount of time passes of other people's mental torment as to what should be done in such a grave case, and afterward opens his mouth and slowly states, then, that then their team should go back and gain strength and experience to be ready for the next ambush from such powerful monsters, because it's damn hard, they're not that strong. The hunters here exhale in relief. Someone says that for a moment he thought they would have to continue and got goosebumps from some kind of terror, making him tense up. The leader of Group B, who hears the words of one of the hunters from his group, softly voices that he is not stupid enough to actually kill this strong team and smiles afterward. One of the hunters says he knows about it, and afterward talks about his hands shaking, and he is told to stop acting like a child and they should go back. In high-ranking Dungeon A, blue fireflies gradually begin to appear, which with their light begin to gradually illuminate this deep dungeon, which gradually begins to roll less scary. A large group of highly ranked hunters with some positivity and good spirits start heading back in the direction from which they started this arduous journey, never finishing until the end. Suddenly, the leader of Group B loudly exclaims for all the hunters to stop, causing everyone to cringe at what had happened, and the atmosphere gradually becomes more heated. 
In front of the hunters in front of them, the same portal through which they entered this A-rank dungeon appeared, except that there was a barrier created by a high-level spell. Someone asks why the path was blocked as everything was fine. The leader asks the enchantress if she can get rid of it, to which she says she will try her best. The girl focuses her eyes on the barrier ahead of her, thinking about the far more important fact that there is someone in this dungeon with such magical abilities. With their current powers, they won't be able to mop up the dungeon. The girl concentrates on her magical abilities and tries her best to get rid of the barrier in front of her, but suddenly everything around her begins to glow with white light. All the hunters here instantly begin to feel terrible. They are shaken. Everything around them becomes a green light that constantly changes to various other lights. Standing not far away from everyone else, Jin Wu observes what is happening to them now, and why such a reaction of the barrier to someone else's attempts to get rid of it. What is going on here now? Someone cries out loudly that the dungeon boss is really here, causing every hunter in the area to panic, become more afraid than before, and think of nothing but bad things. The Enchantress tries her best to get rid of all the horrible things that just happen in this place. She loudly tells her partner that they need to speed up. The nearby mages who are trying their best to get rid of this powerful barrier can't seem to handle it. One of them saying that breaking the barrier won't be easy. The boy carefully watches what is happening now, and afterward he thinks that the waves of magical energy are so strong that even the hunters that are unable to sense them will be able to feel them at this moment. The eyes of the wizards are covered with blood. They think about why they couldn't feel such strong magic waves back then on the other side of the gate. The boss simply simply can't hide his energy. The sorceress who was the very first to try to straighten out this strong barrier begins to react acutely to the magical waves, causing her to cough up blood and unable to stop it. But it's not only the sorceress herself who reacts this way, but all the other high-ranking mages who react to such a thing in their own way, some starting to gasp and others falling to the ground. Hunters not far from the horror taking place are loudly proclaiming that it is their mages that the enemies are targeting, summoning healers as quickly as possible so as not to lose them. Only the other hunters around them can notice something terrifying around them, one of the knights calling out to Mr. Sun in a frightened voice, while the leader, frozen, stares at the red eyes around him. These monsters are so huge in number that there is no way they will be able to handle them. The leader of Group B starts to say that this is definitely a curse for them. This battle will be terrifying and with losses. The leader thinks about the fact that not long ago their squad ran into a couple dozen higher orcs, but then they barely got out of the water dry. But this time it's heavier. The knight fearfully voices that isn't at all seeming to him. The high-ranking hunters here are grouped together and crowded into a single pile. They are surrounded by a huge number of monsters that are ready to massacre them this very second. Just give the command. One of the hunters calls out loudly to Mr. Sun in his shaky voice. But the leader of Group B says to keep it down, standing right in front of some huge and powerful orc that isn't attacking yet. The leader of Group B does not turn his face to his hunters. He says that if they start to resist, there will be no trace of them because in this battle they simply cannot cope with so many monsters. The leader of Group B tries his best not to show his fear of his own hunters. He thinks about the fact that only with the support of Head Choi or his deputy Cha Hai In, they might have been able to resist. The man continues to stay steadfastly in the same spot, with all his effort not running away, even when the monster comes damn close to him, starting to whisper something in his own language they don't understand. The mighty orc begins to shake slightly from side to side, as if he is trying to regain consciousness and keep control of himself, still speaking incomprehensible words in his own language. The stranger's jaw opens in an attempt to say something understandable to the highly ranked hunters as the first understandable word suddenly flies out, speaking of the human as if addressing the leader. The man changes in his face, seemingly oblivious to any fear, for he is surprised that he begins to understand the words of the powerful orc before him, that he begins to speak of humans, apparently hunters. The mighty orc's eyes grow even brighter, shimmering into a red light, and he continues to try to speak in the alien tongue, saying something to the effect that his name is Kargalgan, and he wants to meet these people. The high-ranking hunters here exclaim in surprise that the orc can speak human. Isn't that real magic? And the girl says that he is just a puppet used for communication. Someone talks about whether the monsters want to talk to them, addressing Mr. Song about how he obviously doesn't take other people's word for it, because there could be some kind of trap here, and they need to be on guard. But the leader of Group B, completely ignoring all appeals in his direction from the high-ranking hunters, tells the mighty orc that it was really he, Kargalgan, who put this barrier on the gate. 
The mighty orc, hearing the boy's question, speaks slowly and in particles of words about how proud he is to have succeeded in sorcery, while he has a huge number of other monsters behind him. The powerful orc, while making every effort to start speaking in human language, keeps saying things that his magic can't dispel, making the enchantress feel worse. The mighty orc states that his magic cannot be dispelled by any humans common to him, causing another sorceress to almost bend from the magic used on her, worsening her condition many times over. The man confidently begins to speak to Orc in his usual language. He states that is, there is anyone else in this A-rank dungeon that is more powerful than the mighty Orc. The mighty Orc, with eyes burning with hatred and rage, slowly glares at those who are so brave as to dare to go against him, clearly implying that he is stronger than no one. A powerful Orc gives the high-ranking hunters here the choice that they can go with him or die at the hands of his people who are just waiting for someone else's command to attack. The man listens to someone else's heavy speech, still standing with his back to his guys, realizing that many different lives depend on him. He thinks about what he should say to the monster. Literally a couple seconds pass, because you can't waste a lot of time in other people's patience. So he states that they will go after the mighty orc, and the hunters begin to fearfully ogle their leader. The mighty orc, having gotten his long-awaited answer after a hard conversation, turns his back to the rest of the high-ranking hunters, and with a hard voice tells the humans to follow him. The boy thinks about the fact that in the possession of the boss clearly has a huge army of higher orcs. The chance of winning the battle is noticeably reduced. The boy does not understand that after all the leader wants to return after the conversation in one piece. The leader of Group B lowers his head and nervously thinks that he simply has no other choice, so he will put everything on the line for this chance. After all, what can they do against so many superior orcs? The leader of Group B suddenly addresses the boy as Mr. Porter, drawing the attention of Jin Wu, who is following behind the entire team of hunters, which raises his gaze upward. The leader says that when they arrive at the boss's lair, they plan to attack it, but no matter if the chance of success increases, but the boss's magic will surely be weakened. So when he gets distracted by them, have Jin Wu run to ask for help. The boy straightforwardly says that while the rest of the support arrives to save this team, they will simply die, because they will not be able to fight against the higher orcs. The boy asks if the man is going to bury his entire squad alive, and the man replies that they must close this gate with all their might even at the cost of their lives, which is why the work of hunters is so highly valued. Suddenly, the healer girl turns to the boy, catching his attention, and then states if Jin Wu can do her one favor, holding out her notebook to him. The boy accepts it from the girl's hands with a most puzzled face, and afterward continues to listen to the fact that she wishes to send this notebook directly into the hands of her family, for whom she seems to have prepared everything in advance. The high-ranked hunters say they will do their best, but this is simply not their fight. The forces are noticeably different. Also, the number of hunters is not as many as the monsters themselves here. Some say prayers for the successful return of the high-ranked hunters, that with some uncertainty and noticeable weakness after a hard battle follow the mighty orc. The boy, taking someone else's notebook with him, voices that he understood everything, but thinks about the fact that he will not need to deliver anything to the healer girl's family, saying it sincerely and confidently. The boy thinks about the fact that these magic waves belong to the top boss himself, so if he has that much energy in him, anything can happen and there's no way to predict. Cha Hyun, who is dressed in light work clothes, looks at the labor going on around her, seemingly searching out just the one person she needs. The girl is standing far away from all the other workers, who are discussing something heatedly among themselves, for there is no work at the moment, and they can just rest from the eternal work frenzy. The girl puts her palm to her chin thoughtfully, wondering if Jin Woo isn't here right now. Perhaps he just gave up his job, making her think harder. Some man turns to her, drawing her attention to himself and saying that isn't Miss Cha's day off today, to which she responds by asking if Jin Wu was out for work. The man says that Mr. Jin Wu has already entered the dungeon as a porter, causing the girl to open her mouth in surprise, once again asking what's wrong with him entering the gate. The girl thinks about it while looking at the A-Rang dungeon, thinking about the fact that the E-Rang hunter was chosen to be a porter in the A-Rang dungeon. But humans only have one life. And what was he thinking? The girl thinks about the fact that when she was remembering scraps of the last encounter yesterday, she definitely saw a weapon in the stranger's hands, so she just wasn't wrong in her guesses, making her wonder. The girl says she's about to enter this dungeon, and the man asks if something is wrong and if they should notify the main guild forces, but she says it's fine. 
The girl thinks about the fact that it's time for her to enter this dungeon for one person, except that she suddenly stops, forgetting that she didn't take her weapon with her, without which there is nowhere to go. The girl thinks that clearly she would never have entered the dungeon not on her day off, and afterwards asks if she can borrow their weapons, and the man orders them to bring their gear for Miss. After some amount of time, one of the workers, reacting quickly to their boss's command, bring a certain pickaxe, which is the equipment of the gathering squad that they can only offer. The girl takes the pickaxe into her hands with a most thoughtful face, for what is she to do with such equipment, continuing to hold it in her hands and look at it with a thoughtful look. The girl calls out to the man again and awkwardly asks if they have anything else, to which the man inexplicably interjects, and the woman says that there might be some sort of sword or spear. The man begins to scratch his head awkwardly and says that the girl asks for something like this weapon from their gathering unit, and she doesn't know what to say because she completely forgot about it. After a while, she makes the decision to simply hand the pickaxe back into someone else's hands, saying that she will enter the dungeon that way, since nothing else can seriously be offered to her. The girl, though she tries to make a look full of confidence, realizes that it will be hard enough for her to enter the A-rank dungeon without any weapons in her hands. It doesn't even make sense. All of the girl's former confidence instantly vanishes as soon as she stops at the A-rank gate, causing the man behind her to also silently watch to see what would happen next. The man states that whether Hunter Cha really plans to enter the dungeon empty-handed, making the girl shudder slightly, because that man is right and it's too rash. Even after the man's words, the girl continues to stand in the same place, looking at the gateway to the A-rank dungeon, thinking about what she should do at this moment. After a while, the girl just suddenly turns to face the man and with large strides begins to approach him, still not looking into the other man's eyes, seemingly out of embarrassment. The girl reaches the man rather quickly, who without any questions holds out in his hands, though so silly for a girl, but at least some equipment to be used. The man says that the girl made the right choice because it's better to be armed than unarmed, to which Cha bows, holding a pickaxe and still hiding her face under her cap. The girl, though with noticeable embarrassment, quickly turns around in the opposite direction and walks quickly towards the A-rank gate, finally entering it after losing some time. The A-rank dungeon is a damn huge place, making anyone in the place feel anxious and fear overwhelming the body. It is in this deep A-rank dungeon that there are a large number of diverse and powerful orcs, some of them well-dressed in strong armor, guarding something from the others. Some of the powerful orcs are holding a huge shield that is unlikely to be easily destroyed. You'd have to put a lot of effort into such an attack, but the chances are slim. Most stunning and amazing is the following picture of how in a similar depth of A-rank dungeon is its own castle, with a big bunch of higher orcs that report to the head. If you look into some distance ahead of you, you will find a powerful orc sitting on a throne with a huge number of other subordinates beside him, ready to defend him. A powerful orc with surprisingly wrinkled hands stares intently somewhere ahead of him, seemingly at the newly arrived high-ranking hunters that he was the one who ordered to be brought in. Looking into the face of the mighty orc, one is simply horrified by his expression, for behind the hood is a solid skeleton, but with such chilling eyes that it is frightening and that one welcomes these people. The high-ranking hunters here just don't seem to know how they should react to all this going on because it's like it's a total nightmare, something incredibly scary. A small number of high-ranked hunters are right in the middle of this castle, raging with waves of magical energy. They are surrounded by a large number of higher-ranked orcs. The powerful orcs do not lower their hungry gazes from the newly arrived high-ranked hunters. They clang their teeth as if to show that they intend only to fight them. The leader of Group B thinks with a kind of inner fear that if all these powerful orcs, which is an impressive army, get out, things will be simply terrible and deplorable. The man stares somewhere ahead of himself, feeling cold sweat running uncontrollably down his body. He continues to think about the fact that if the inevitable is to be prevented, the team absolutely must. The team definitely needs to defeat the boss who towers over all the monsters and high-ranked hunters present, stands on his throne, and watches everything that happens. The man realizes exactly that the retinue of this powerful orc that sits on the throne has a rather powerful aura that it seems any even the weakest hunter would be able to sense. The leader of Group B continues to make some kind of plan in his head, thinking about whether his team will be able to bypass all the guards and take out the shaman in one fell swoop, but it still seems impossible. All the hunters here are thinking about the fact that at their leader's signal, they will aim at the shaman alone, with the whole bunch and all their strength, no matter what it costs them, but they have to do it. 
The high-seated, powerful orc begins to ask the high-ranking hunters in his chilling and hypnotizing voice if they are afraid of him. Why they look so scared. The stranger's face is now clearly visible beneath the hood itself, which changes to a blinding white light as soon as the powerful orc finishes his question, using his skills on the hunters. The leader of Group B stands heroically in the same spot, beginning to feel a certain aura that only worsens the condition of all the high-ranked hunters in the area with each passing second. Suddenly, the leader of Group B starts to see everything around him with different eyes. It makes his health deteriorate by times, as if to show the full power of the majestic orc. After a few seconds, the faces of the highly ranked hunters change to haggard, full of incomprehension as to what is happening to them because of this powerful orc. Why such power? Some high-ranked hunters are thinking about how powerful this monster in front of them is. How could they ever think of being able to deal with this boss? After all, it's almost impossible. The sorceress feels blood start to trickle from the corners of her eyes. She thinks about the fact that the powerful orc is on a whole other level, and compared to him, she is a third-rate mage. The leader of Group B can't stop shaking in his whole body. He's so damn sick and scared at the same time, he starts frantically asking the same question, why did this monster bring them here? The man continues to say in a shaky voice that the warriors who came after them near the portal were enough to kill the high-ranking hunters. Suddenly, the leader of Group B hears a straightforward question from the powerful orc about it being done for fun, causing his mouth to drop open in shock and his face to change to an aloof one. The mighty orc says that they will kill one high-ranking hunter after another until no one is left alive, for his people crave entertainment by creating a ruckus. Suddenly, the mighty orc shivered, keeping his fingers near his eyes, which showed sheer coldness and indifference to everything going on. He didn't care about the hunters. The mighty orc says that there is someone among the high-ranking hunters who is quite an unusual person, looking directly at the boy with his horrible eyes. The man is shocked to hear the words of the mighty orc, thinking that if their extermination is just entertainment, they don't even see the hunters as enemies. The man keeps thinking about what is more to this powerful orc is that their lives are just some kind of game to them, looking straight into the eyes of this monster. The man thinks about the fact that their lives to the powerful orc is just a toy to be thrown away when he just gets bored with it causing the leader to suddenly erupt in rage. The leader of Group B, seemingly no longer able to handle his uncontrollable and overflowing aggression, loudly voices for his team to rally on a fence, immediately holding up his sword. The leader of Group B stares at the enemy in front of him with a maddening fury that overwhelms him, while behind him the high-ranking hunters are still standing, unmoving. One of the high-ranked hunters looks on in horror as his leader walks towards the powerful orc with such confidence he can't say a word or follow him for fear. The leader of Group B, without wasting his precious time, leaps off the ground in a high jump, aiming precisely at the mighty orc who didn't even move aside. The mighty orc, without moving from his seat, uses a song of defense from the many others that the high-ranking hunters have yet to face if they hold out. The leader of Group B, gathering all his strength in his own weapon and high jump, was not at all prepared to face the wall that appeared in front of him that could not be penetrated. As soon as the exasperated leader of Group B collides with the wall ahead, he instantly flies off in the opposite direction of himself, hitting his back painfully and rolling on the ground. The mighty orc says that the leader is a damn foolish man who only goes to battle on the basis of his emotions, and the man is already starting to shake in his body, unable to control it. Suddenly, the powerful orc begins to use his magical abilities, and one of them is gravity, causing the man to rise in the air at great speed. The mighty orc easily controls the man's body, flying through the air with one arm stretched forward. He can do anything he wants. The mighty orc doesn't seem to be about to spare the very one who just dared to approach him and try to kill him, vocalizing his next ability, which will only speed things up. After a certain amount of time, the man, not long in the air before someone else's orders, begins to fly straight down towards the ground at a tremendous speed. The earth is instantly shattered by an impact so violent that the man's face changes to shocked. There is no way he can resist the alien abilities that control him. The man, barely hanging on with his strength, endures all the pain he feels as the powerful orc is about to do a similar maneuver once more, beginning to lift the other man's body in the air. After some amount of time, the mighty orc raises his hand up again to force the man up in the air as well, and after numerous times lowers and raises. One of the high-ranked hunters not far away sheds his tears as he watches what is being done to the leader of Group B, which only horrifies everyone here. The man's body is already visibly shabby. The man is in no way able to resist or resist the alien force that even seems to be gradually starting to emanate some steam from the leader's body. 
The man's body continues to hover in the air. It begins to twist around itself numerous times until the powerful orc wants to stop bullying. Suddenly, the mighty orc's gaze changes to a surprised one, his attention being drawn to something, seemingly some human, causing him to look with his red eyes directly at him. A boy who had thrown his gear away from himself and caught the bee leader, shaken by this abuse, to save him from this torment is lowered to the ground. The boy looks at the face of the leader of Group B, which is already starting to gradually take on a blue hue, with large amounts of blood coming out of his mouth and nose and his eyes turning red, but the latter calls him back by name. The boy says that this dungeon is under the jurisdiction of the Hunter's Guild, so he can't interfere without asking, but the advance party is on the verge of being wiped out. The boy goes on to verbalize some detail to the man, but in the meantime, the powerful orc decides to send one of his subordinates to rat out both of them. But the man seems to notice the other's attempts to create something terrible, so he looks back with terror in his eyes as the boy asks permission to exterminate all the monsters here. The boy stands with his back to the powerful orc behind him who is about to deliver the killing blow at the behest of his ringleader, but is it ever that simple? The boy, without even turning to face the monster behind him, pulls his arm back, using his magical power to use it on this supreme orc. At the same moment, the high orc that tried to fight the boy becomes immobilized, unable to resist the other's magical power, immediately freezing in one place. After a couple seconds, the boy raises his hand upwards, thus causing the huge body of the mighty orc to rise in the air, just as it had recently done to the leader of Group B. It is in that very instant, without any pity for such an ugly monster, that the boy begins to lift the orc's body with great speed then lower it straight into the ground to take his revenge. The boy once again turns to the leader of Group B, who looks shocked at what is happening in front of him and what Jin Wu is doing right now, not sparing this powerful orc. The boy towers over the leader and states that all the monsters present here can he take care of, asking permission from the leader of Group B, which stares back at him. The red eyes of Group B's leader widen in some hope of salvation, of the boy in front of him being able to straighten out all the monsters and ask them. The face of the leader of Group B instantly changes to one full of hope and a kind of pity. He wheezes for the boy to help them, to deal with all the monsters and save everyone. The boy doesn't need any more words of permission from the leader of Group B. At this very second, Jin Wu lowers his hand, ceasing to use magic powers, thus finishing off the monster. The mighty orc says that for a human, the boy has pretty good abilities. But how much strength does Jin Wu have to put up with all the forces attacking him? The boy, standing with his back to the mighty orc, vocalizes that he has never faced such power before, continuing to stand in the same spot and feel all the magical powers of the monster. The mighty orc's eyes change to more red, full of contentment and confidence. He even laughs merrily and vocalizes how could it be otherwise in this situation. The boy hasn't finished his speech yet. He stands in the same spot, but gets into a more fighting stance, continuing to talk about how even so things are really bad. So bad. The boy spoke his entire speech with a smile on his face, finally turning to the mighty orc and glaring that things were pretty damn bad, not for himself, but for the monster that was here. The boy doesn't make you wait long for his command, he states in a firm voice for his subordinates to finally rise up, causing the nearby mages to cover themselves in goosebumps and stare with horror. A couple of moments later, the majestic Igris becomes beside the boy, holding his mighty weapon, and is sure to fulfill all the errands of the Lord of Shadows. Following the majestic Igris is iron, which with its sheer size could make anyone in the place cringe at the thought of another's power and might. Behind the boy is lined up a huge army of subordinates, who are ready to fulfill all the orders of their Lord of Shadows, ready to bow their heads before him to tear and throw opponents. Some kind of expensive car pulls up to a designated location at night, using low-beam headlights to see the area around it. After a certain amount of time, a young man with black glasses starts to emerge from the expensive car while he is thinking that apparently something seriously scary has happened. Jin Chul walks up to the A-Rang gate, stares at it for a while, thinking about why this kid had to work as a miner. Okay, for one day, but today is the second to last day. Toth thinks the boy will soon officially become an S-ranked hunter. But it would be nice if he remembered to always keep an eye on him, and the man approaches and asks what brought him here. Jin Chiel briefly states that he only came here with this group of people for Hunter Jin Wu, inquiring about the whereabouts of the hunter, and they ask him if anything is wrong. One of the miners says that he knew it, thinking that Jin Wu had the true face of a killer, because even then this guy looked at him angrily, and he thought Jin Wu was going to finish him off. The man goes on to say that he even felt a shiver run through his body 
and Jin Chiol interrupts and asks where the boy is in the end, to which he's told that he's currently in a dungeon. The man continues that their porter couldn't make it out for his shift, so the boy offered to take over and Jin Chiol thinks that first the man was a miner and now a porter, which is surprising. The man, looking pensively straight at the A-rank gate, still can't figure out why there are so many of the most powerful people chasing the boy. What on earth is going on? The man says that Miss Cha Hei in was also searching for that young man today and then followed him into the dungeon to meet face to face as soon as possible. The shouting man inserts a word saying that the boy has really killed someone because he is obviously capable of something like that or even more since he has such an intimidating aura. Jin Chiel coldly states that this man will only know the answer after tomorrow's news, lifting his black glasses with one finger, starting to think about something and what to do. The one continues to say that he was right about the boy, while the other protests that this can hardly be the case. Also, someone maintains that Jin Wu is kind and even did the work for the four of them. Jin Chiel walks along with his workers in the other direction from the people there as a sudden change in his face, sensing something incredible and powerful. Jin Chul instantly realizes that something terrible is happening in this A-Rang dungeon. He feels with every part of his body the eerie energy that is emanating from this place. Jin Chiel says that his body feels like it's going to explode and he even starts breathing rapidly. And one of his assistants asks the chief if he felt the same way. The men instantly begin to raise their devices that they only take with them. And afterwards there is some sort of reaction, showing the bloody immense power of this dungeon. Jin Chul even cries out, glaring that this A-rank gate is the most dangerous type, realizing that the previous changes were completely wrong, letting all the hunters down. Jin Chiel thinks about the fact that considering the current mistake, the unit inside the gate is in danger at the moment, even though there are two S-ranked hunters inside. But still, the defeated mighty orc lies on the cold ground. A frozen horror can be seen in his eyes. It seems that there is even foam coming out of the stranger's mouth after the fight that happened not long ago. The girl who entered the dungeon thinks about the fact that Song ki -hoon's group was able to deal with so many monsters alone, wondering how they managed such a thing. The girl has very little time in the A-rank dungeon, looking carefully around as if trying to find this powerful man, but senses some sort of aura. After a certain amount of time, the girl, wasting it on finding the presence of that very person, throws her pink cap on the ground and thinks to herself that no. This just can't happen. The girl thinks about the fact that if this powerful energy is coming from the boss, no one from ki -hoon's squad would be able to survive as she continues to hold the pickaxe in her hand and stare confidently somewhere ahead, returning to a dangerous place where a large number of monsters and hunters are in the lair of the main boss. The subordinate boys gather into one team and patiently wait for the instructions of their lord. The boy, standing with his main allies in the form of the majestic Igris and Iron, feels at ease and confident enough he only has eyes for his enemy. The mighty orc sits in the same spot, and afterwards asks his question that is the boy going to slay him with so many subordinates, making you even feel the mockery in his voice. The boy smiles, listening to all the words of the mighty orc, and then begins to say in a confident voice that if this monster continues to look down on him and his subordinates, then... The boy says it in such a confident voice that one can't help but believe in the truth of his words, and what a serious look he has on his face. The boy uses one of his many abilities in the form of a monarch's possession, whereupon a huge dark circle appears around Jin Wu's subordinates, surrounding the soldiers. A notification comes in that the boy's dark soldiers have become even stronger, and their characteristics have increased by 50%. Jin Wu gained this ability on the 70th floor of the dungeon. The boy observes his subordinates and realizes that his shadow soldiers have become even stronger, although even before this skill they could easily defeat many different bosses. The huge iron is covered in purple light as it turns out to be obvious. His stats have also increased by a full 50%, allowing that one to be much stronger than before, which helps a lot. The sorceress, who is standing not far from what is happening, can't believe what she is seeing while the other mage opens his mouth in shock and says that he can summon a maximum of two shadows, not believing his own eyes. The sorceress continues to stare at the whole picture unfolding before them, and afterwards says in a disbelieving voice that such an ominous aura can come from an ordinary person. The mighty orc seems to be slowly beginning to tense up over his new opponent in the form of Jin Wu. He instantly gives orders to his subordinates to smear the shadow spirits. As soon as the mighty orc voices his order, that very second the embittered higher orcs begin their attack with a huge scream, a large crowd heading towards the opponents in front of them. 
Some sort of alert arrives, stating that the Mighty Iron is using his ability as a provocative scream, forcing ordinary people to cover their ears, because the sound is so damn loud and piercing. At the same second, some sort of notification arrives, stating that the opponent's characteristics are too high, causing Iron's provocation to fail, so the orcs calmly head towards the enemy. Iron is not going to give up, because in addition to his abilities in his hands, he still has a powerful weapon that burns with its great power, which he will use in this fight. After a certain amount of time, Iron, having set himself up for the coming battle with these embittered orcs, gathers all of his power and in a huge circular motion begins to push everyone out of his way. After a certain amount of time, the majestic Igris also appears in the field of vision of the powerful opponents, displaying a huge sword that flames with uncontrollable power. The majestic Igris is waiting for the right moment, seemingly tuning in for this battle, not even paying attention to the fact that a large number of monsters are starting to come at him in droves. In a matter of seconds, the majestic Igris utilizes his technique and sword skills, instantly slaying all the monsters that surround him the entire time. The mighty orcs follow their ringleader's instructions with their marked fury, but they just can't seem to get a handle on such powerful opponents. But they don't give up and attack further. The boy, though surrounded by quite a few monsters around him, deals out powerful orcs with ease and palpable aggression, who receive strong and deadly blows in return. The boy, as soon as he disposes of the surrounding monsters around him, gains strength and rises high into the sky, seemingly locking onto an even more interesting target for Jin Wu. The high-ranking hunters near the fight watch with some shock, realizing that the boy's attacks are exactly like the way their deputy head fights. The hunters continue to perplexedly discuss why the boy hid his true nature and power, and volunteered to work as a porter while Jin Wu approaches the rest of the opponents. The boy thinks about the fact that if you exclude Igris, Iron, and the tank, the level of his other shadows is roughly equal to the B-ranked hunters, making him think and count their powers together. The boy also notices the fact that while the weak knights were trying to overpower just one high orc, they had already managed to die several times, making the situation slightly worse at this point, which is what most wouldn't want. The boy thinks about the fact that since the enemies outnumber him and his subordinates, he should definitely cut down on the numbers, looking with a confident gaze at the opponents around the place. The mighty orc uses his ability called Fire Dragon Song, due to which he begins to burn one by one the subordinate boy, starting to reduce the number. The boy instantly reacts to such an action with a slightly surprised look, turns the other way to look at what is going on, and afterwards states that his shadows... The boy sees how the mighty orc still continues to sit majestically and smugly on his throne as the head of the dragon looms over him, from whose mouth blazes great heat and power. The mighty orc is amused that the boy dares such helpless dolls to behave so arrogantly to him, which visibly makes him angry and forces him to act. The boy, completely distracted from the battle, looks at the mighty orc with his chilling gaze, saying in a cold and serious tone that only this head of monsters is the arrogant one here. The boy thinks about the fact that until his mana is completely depleted, then his subordinates will be restored again and again, watching as one of the knights rises again from his ashes, ready for battle. The mighty orc, watching the subordinate boys stand up one by one even after such a maneuver, that loudly proclaims that there is no difference in this action, because Jin Wu's mana will run out anyway. The mighty orc goes on to say that it will be before the boy can defeat all the warriors of this dungeon boss while watching Jin Wu's subordinates being tormented by the monsters. The boy, not waiting for the mighty orc to finish his long speech, gathers his strength and breaks away from the place, rising high into the sky, intending to launch a sly attack and saying that by this time he will be dead. The boy, without wasting a second of his precious time, gathers as much strength as he can and, accelerating in his movements, collides with the suddenly appeared wall of the powerful orc. The mighty orc says that the boy looks worthless since he spends a large amount of time on the boss while his entire army gradually dies while the monster hides inside his defenses. The boy, facing the stranger's barrier, is not going to give up so quickly, steps back some distance and holds his hand to the ground so that he doesn't fly far away and then says, who knows what will really happen. The boy confidently states that he has a couple of powerful guys on his side who shouldn't let Jin Wu down, shifting his gaze to Iron, who uses his fighting skills against his enemies. Afterward, the boy shifts his gaze to the majestic Igris, who stares at his opponents ahead with a confident look, while Jin Wu voices that the monster need not worry about his mana, 
The mighty orc, with his devilish smile, says that he then needs to destroy their master with all his might, who has such good power, using the song of fierce flames to attack. After a couple of counted seconds, the lair of the powerful boss gradually begins to blaze with heat. Something explodes momentarily, seemingly trying to similarly frighten the boy, but the other one doesn't do well. The boy realizes that this opponent is stronger than Metis and Vulcan. Although Metis was subjected to a legion of a thousand souls, he had a weak defense, but the opponent at the moment has incredible defense and attack. What's worth bringing up is the horde of superior souls that block the boy's path to this day, keeping him from being close to the boss, but also keeping him from escaping the place. The boy realizes that this is quite different from the quest to change his class, so Jin Wu decides to waste no time and use something hidden inside his inventory. The boy pulls out one of the bluish-colored potions from his inventory. He finally realizes that he can use potions in this dungeon, and therefore can restore his own mana. And so as not to overfill the boy's stomach with the contents of those many bottles, Jin Wu will finish off the mighty orc as quickly as he has any idea. It's going to be a fascinating show. The boy thinks about the fact that it is finally time to show everyone in the area, especially the powerful orc, what the true power of a necromancer is all about, giving the command for the fallen souls to rise up. After a couple of moments, once things have quieted down for a moment, new monsters begin to spring up from the ground and immobilized bodies, which will be the boy's subordinates. The mighty orc is surprised to realize that his fallen warriors are becoming undead, which is not good information for himself as he watches his subordinate boys confidently march forward. The boy states that there are quite a large number of warriors of the mighty orc in the boss's lair, but it depends on time, because soon they will definitely become Jin Wu's subordinates, which he guarantees. The boy stretches his arm forward, pointing his index finger somewhere to the side, stating that when the monsters of the mighty orc are finally finished, then, then a similar fate will await the mighty orc looking at him with his chillingly cold eyes that show all the confidence in the boy that resides in him with great strength. The mighty orc no longer looks as cocky as he was a while ago. He is surprised at what is happening and opens his eyes in shock, wondering if the boy could be. The mighty orc watches the morale of his subordinates, despite what is happening, still not falling, as they try to please their boss in order to successfully finish this bloody battle. But it is unlikely that the gradually dwindling number of the mighty orc subordinates will hold out for long, for their opponents are the superior orcs themselves, who are ready to tear others apart for the sake of their lord. A fierce battle takes place. A large number of powerful orcs try to resist the pressure from the subordinates of the boy that begin to gradually squeeze the others in this battle. The mighty orc begins to gradually become nervous. He watches the whole battle taking place without taking his attentive gaze away, seeming to realize that he's gradually beginning to lose, stating why they. In the mind of the mighty orc, there is a huge number of questions that he can't get rid of during the ongoing battle. He thinks about why they are here. When already awake, one order echoes in everyone's mind. The powerful orc ceases to control his emotions. They take over, causing the monster to cry out in a loud voice in order for his subordinates to destroy the human race, putting brutality into his speech. The mighty orc finally makes some movement, rising from his throne to point his hand in the direction of the boy, vocalizing loudly for his underlings to tear them apart and then lay the remains at his feet. The boy, in no way intimidated by such threats from the mighty orc, asks with the most contented smile if this battle is like a duel between two commanders. Iron, not listening to what is going on around him and what his main subordinates are chatting about, changes in his face, concentrating with someone fighting someone who seems to have just as much skill. The mighty Iron holds a huge weapon in his hands, thus trying to cover the attack from his opponent, which is also of great size and strength. In just a couple seconds, two strong monsters clash their weapons against each other putting as much force as possible into such a clash to make one of them lose their weapon. Their looks show a mutual hatred for each other. Iron tries to do everything to win this battle, to do the bidding of his Shadow Lord, when the monster does all the same but his ringleader. At some unexpected moment, Iron's opponent decides to suddenly loosen the collision, thus causing the subordinate boy to tilt slightly towards the ground due to the lack of support. But Iron instantly reacts to such a cunning maneuver by being able to use his protected head as a collision with another's head, thus fighting already unarmed. The blow to Iron's head was so powerful that his opponent gets a noticeable crack in his armor, and he loses his balance and falls straight into the ground, 
thus giving him a chance to straighten him out. The mighty iron raises his weapon blazing with immense power at that very second, and afterwards deals numerous damage to his opponent's body, thus winning this war, something he can be proud of. Moving on to the majestic Igris, who stands before several powerful orcs that are so eager to try and straighten out this subordinate boy, but they are unlikely to succeed. The majestic Igris anticipates the moment when the mighty orcs will begin to attack him, so he swings his sword blazing with uncontrollable power to do battle. The majestic Igris dodges the attack from the two orcs with ease and good skill, uses his sword as his own body is lifted into the air, thus surprising these opponents. The majestic Igris carries several smaller swords in addition to a single sword, so that he can use a surprise attack at any time, thereby starting to swing with great speed. A couple seconds later, the majestic Igris uses his one weapon, hitting one of the powerful orcs directly in the head, causing the other to freeze in place from the fatal blow. The majestic Igris stands on the body of one of the mighty orcs, one foot pressing his sword into the breathless body and resting his hand on the other, glaring at the other opponent. The mighty orc doesn't seem at all intent on stopping in his attack. He wastes no precious time and swings at the majestic Igris in an attempt to try and slay him alone. The majestic Igris reacts instantly to another's attack, so he also begins to swing his weapon, anticipating with anticipation what this opponent in front of him is all about. After a moment, the two strong opponents clash their swords, thus creating an amazing enemy atmosphere around them. Igris will definitely straighten him out on his own. There is so much strength in the majestic Igris that as he resists another's body weight, he gathers all his skills and pushes as high as he can, causing his opponent to hover in the air for a long time. The mighty orc even seems to manage to flip in the air a few times due to such a strong blow from the majestic Igris, and below him is Iron, waiting for the moment. A couple seconds later, and Iron swings in, accurately striking his heavy weapon directly at the mighty orc flying through the air, thus causing him to fly even farther and longer. Somewhere on the other side of the battlefield, a huge paw appears over the lurking mighty orc that approaches him so stealthily seemingly waiting for the right moment for a stealthy attack. After a couple of counting seconds, the ice bear nicknamed Tank punches the mighty orc with all his might while growling loudly, satisfied with the job done. To such an action on the part of the tank, Iron shows his huge hand, which depicts a thumbs up, thus giving respect to the ice bear, who raises his paw upwards as if giving thanks. The boy, watching the whole bloody battle in progress, calmly states that apparently it is his precious boys who are much stronger than the orc's subordinates put together. The boy thinks about the fact that of course he doesn't doubt his words, but his mana is still being used up faster than it seemed, and with Jinwu's powers running out, his shadows will disappear from sight in an instant. The powerful orc appears to be shocked by what is happening. He can't hide his excitement, not understanding how this can happen to him, because the boss never imagined such a thing. One of the high-ranking hunters in the area says that he can't stand by and watch the boy fight alone, so he suggests that everyone rally to the attack and help the guy. As soon as the high-ranked hunters attempted to take a step towards the coming battle, they are instantly pierced by an incredible pain in their bodies. Orc uses a song of frenzy and blindness. The mighty orc states that spectators in the form of high-ranked hunters should stay put and not engage in this fight in any way, to simply watch from the sidelines and not be able to move. The mighty orc confidently states that he will soon be able to shut the boy's arrogant mouth once and for all, beginning to use his magical abilities in the form of drowsiness, fatigue, and blindness. The boy seems to be aware of what the powerful orc is about to do to him, and after the stranger's attack, there is a body reaction that all negative effects have been nullified by immunity. The mighty orc doesn't seem to expect such a thing from the boy at all. He changes in his gaze, slowly starting to realize that this Jin Wu is a damn strong opponent. The mighty orc's gaze becomes full of terror and fear, the surprise that gradually overwhelms his body. He cannot hide his shocked state, exclaiming loudly what is wrong. Various curses do not work on the boy. Orc cries out how he was able to nullify all his curses, to which he replies that the boss has forgotten about what the boy told him. The boy says that the mighty orc just had the misfortune to meet just him, using the blessing of the great spellcaster Kandinar, thanks to which he receives longevity. The boy voices for the mighty orc to allow him to get rid of someone else's pesky shield, thus prepping his mage in advance who holds a fireball in his hands expectantly. After a couple moments, the boy's subordinate skillfully lifted the fireball straight high in the air, thus expanding it and increasing in size, causing the powerful orc to feel fear. 
The boy thinks of getting rid of the alien barrier by using the greed sphere on his own mages, which one of his subordinates is already starting to send toward the boss at a great rate. A couple of counted moments pass, the voice of a powerful orc begins to be heard, trying to utter his song of defense, but just doesn't have time to finish, thus destroying his own defense. The mighty orc, completely not expecting such a maneuver and even at such an amazing speed, begins to cough loudly at the fact that his sphere of defense just shattered, forcing him to face the attack. The face of the mighty orc shows all his fear, which he begins to feel exactly the moment he lost the ability to defend himself with his strong shield, coughing and glaring. How dare the boy! After a certain amount of time, somewhere in the distance begins to see a girl who is watching the whole battle from afar, which seems so damn unreal and scary. The girl looks shocked at the whole ongoing battle in front of her eyes, continues to hold the useless weapon in her hand as a pickaxe, and stares at this picture with her mouth open. The girl contemplates the bloody battle, wondering in her mind if this is all an army of someone's souls, which seems pretty damn incredible and very much a powerful phenomenon. The girl stares at the whole thing disbelievingly, thinking about the fact that a hunter specializing in summoning magic can only hold back a couple of these spirits. Then what on earth is going on? The girl flies towards the battle with great speed, but she is called out by the high-ranking hunter standing nearby, surprisingly ogling Miss Cha Hai-in, recalling the deputy head. The girl quickly runs up to the healer girl sitting on the ground, asking her if she's in one piece, and if she's okay to which the other responds that they haven't quite figured out what's going on here yet themselves. The powerful orc becomes visibly angry and overflows his body with uncontrollable rage. He hatefully exclaims that the boy's pathetic abilities are nothing before the strangers. The mighty orc begins to use a large number of his curses, ranging from rampage, fortification, to song of the titans and burning, making everything around him blaze with light. The mighty orc instantly changes in size. He becomes much larger than he was before. His every step is followed by a huge shaking of the ground, but the boy still stands. The girl says for all hunters to move back as soon as possible, lest they fall under the dangerous attack of a powerful orc who is purposefully heading somewhere with a palpable desire to kill. The mighty orc shows all his rage and hatred towards the boy, saying in a loud voice that he will finish the boy off like a fly, pushing Jin Wu's subordinates out of his way. The boy looks at the scene in front of him with the calmest face possible and says that the giant monsters certainly don't bring back the best of memories, as if the orc is pushing his hurt. After a certain amount of time, the boy receives a notification that all of his mana for the moment has been used up, thus losing his own subordinates, swearing unhappily. The mighty orc angrily begins to tell the boy not to turn up his nose, just because he's decided to play with Jin Wu a bit, calling him a nasty little man and gathering his strength. The mighty orc, settling down habitually, begins to inflate some sort of balloon with his mouth, seemingly about to use some new attack towards the boy. After a small amount of time, that very balloon instantly explodes, reaching its limit and starting to pour fiery lava all over the room, saying that isn't Cargalgan weak to it. While the mighty orc opens his mouth in an attempt to burn the boy somewhere below, at the same time Jin Wu rises high up, ending up next to the monster himself. The boy briefly agrees with the stranger's words that the powerful orc is actually a weak opponent for him, thus speeding up in his movement and moving purposefully. The boy doesn't waste a great deal of time, gathers his immense strength into a fist, and concentrating, delivers a mighty blow right into the eye of the mighty orc. The boy says that becoming bigger, the powerful orc has only made it easier for him, as the sorcerer without the help of his guards is unlikely to be able to stand up to a powerful assassin like Jin Wu. The mighty orc in no way expects such an attack from the boy, howling loudly at the pain in his eye while at the same moment the boy begins to inflict wounds directly on his body with great speed. Jin Chul and his reinforcements in the Arang dungeon are watching the scene before them with their mouths wide open in amazement. As the men appear shocked to watch one of the summoned powerful orcs attack another of the same kind but already in armor, Jin Chul doesn't understand what's going on. Jin Chul exclaims loudly about what the hell is going on here, where is this powerful aura coming from, and what kind of bloody battle is right in the A-Rang dungeon, which is the strongest in South Korea. Suddenly, someone else's screams are interrupted by a girl who is closely observing the ongoing fight. She says that these monsters were summoned by the person who is currently fighting the lair boss. The girl says that speaking of that very person, she means the boy who moves with great speed through the body of a powerful orc that in no way cannot cope with his enemy. The boy thinks about the fact that in a normal situation his dagger is useless for carrying out a critical attack against the giant monsters, 
But today, things are happening quite differently. The boy clenches his palm into a fist and then instantly summons his own weapon, which emanates an uncontrollable force that will allow Jin Wu to deliver a deadly blow. The boy realizes that his dagger is the best tool for the moment, so he purposefully strikes directly at the powerful orc's body, creating critical damage. After the critical strike from the boy's dagger, there is an instantaneous body reaction from the mighty orc, who lets out his cries of pain loudly and begins to lose his own balance. After a couple of seconds, the mighty orc simply collapses his entire huge carcass to the ground, no longer having any strength to face such an opponent, until Jin Chul realizes that it's Jin Wu. The girl watches Jin Chul's reaction, and afterward thinks about the fact that not only Choi Jung In's head, but the chief from the monitoring department also knows about this boy. Surprising more, Jin Chul says that as soon as they sense the incredible power from the gate, they instantly came here, but it looks like they're doing just fine here without them, so they can only watch Jin Wu mopping up the dungeon alone. Those nearby are thinking that doesn't Jin Wu look like a high-ranked melee hunter, whereas he might possess summoning magic, thinking about how much the boy can summon spirits. The girl, watching Jin Chul's reasoning, keeps trying to find out some information about the boy. She asks if he knows anything about the boy. Jin Chul, not even looking at the huntress Cha Hai In standing next to her, briefly voices that she knows very little information about the boy, lowering her glasses down. The mighty orc keeps trying not to give up. He glares hatefully at the boy in front of him, growls and clenches his palm into a fist, hitting the ground directly beneath him as if trying to get up. The boy looks down on the mighty orc's attempts to rise from the ground and afterwards states that as soon as the mage is stripped of his own subordinates, he, that mage just cannot win the battle. So the boy is facing a defenseless, powerful orc, surrounded by his subordinates, that are ready to protect him. The mighty orc's lair is visibly shabby. The alien throne can no longer be in its place, falling somewhere into a pile of rocks. The ground is completely cracked, and nothing much remains. Dumbfounded by what is happening, the mighty orc says that he simply cannot be defeated and starts laughing uncontrollably, as if trying to scare the boy in a similar way. But after a couple of seconds, the mighty orc's annoying laughter is cut short as he is stabbed with two weapons at once by his own subordinates, who are now on Jin Wu's team. Finally, the dungeon boss is defeated. He falls face down into the ground and will no longer be able to move. The boy receives notifications that his level has been raised several times at once. The boy observes everything that is going on and says that it was only necessary for him to defeat the boss. Then the forces of the remaining powerful orcs have significantly dried up thus leaving them with nothing. The boy watches a large number of different items fall out of the body of a powerful orc. He wonders if he should take all these rewards he has received. The boy thinks about the fact that he can't do it, because he can't indulge his own desires. After all, the dungeon belongs to the Hunter's Guild, which would be unfair to them. The boy thinks of retrieving a few shadows of interest to him as compensation. Why not take advantage of such an opportunity, which will only add to his noble powers? The boy announces in his serious voice the command for the one cherished spirit in this place to obediently rise, awaiting the next reaction from the mighty orc. The dark force begins to surround the boy who sits next to the breathless body lying on the ground, thanks to which there is a gradual reaction that this spirit will now be his subordinate. The mighty orc's body even begins to visibly blush, as if to resist a bit the pressure of the boy's desires, but it is already completely enveloped in dark smoke, showing that there is no point in resisting him. The high-ranking hunters open their mouths in surprise. They freeze in one place and watch intently as some silhouette gradually begins to form ahead. Even Jin Chul and the Huntress Cha Hai In are seeing this kind of powerful force for the first time. They look at what is happening in front of them, what this boy is doing, with a noticeable look of surprise on their faces. In front of everyone present in the lair of the former boss appears the same powerful orc, but in a completely different guise, because he is not a rival, but an ally of Jin Wu's team. The boy, watching his new partner, smiles and notices that the mighty orc is noticeably quieter and not as exuberant and self-assured as he was in the battle. The boy begins to list that his team has a normal rank, an elite knight, and a knight rank. He had only observed these three ranks before, but today is something new, which is to be expected from an A-rank dungeon. The boy stands, holding a hand to his chin, and thoughtfully trying to remember what the mighty orc's name is, asking aloud and thinking that somehow it starts on Carr, addressing him. The boy apologizes sincerely and says that he didn't remember the other's name, touches the mighty orc's head with the palm of his hand and says that the past name doesn't matter at all, because Jin Wu has some in mind. The boy, 
looking at the expression on the mighty orc's face, can only think of one nickname for this subordinate, Fang, which describes the power of this spirit quite well, as well as its appearance. The boy, looking at the reaction of the mighty orc, can tell that that subordinate liked his new nickname, so it fits perfectly, assigning a shadow with the rank of an elite knight. The boy thinks about the fact that the result of this battle has taken its toll. After all, he got the power of the higher orcs, so he now has about 127 shadows in his arsenal, some he will just release. The boy thinks of the rest of the monsters from the former clan of the mighty orc he will now add as his subordinates, beginning this long-awaited process of surprising the other humans in the place. The boy, engrossed in the whole process, is suddenly spotted by Jin Chul, causing Jin Wu to be visibly surprised and stop to mind his own business, not expecting someone else's presence. The boy's face changes to a surprised one, nervously thinking about how Chief Jin Chiol and even Cha Haiyin along with him ended up here. The boy so engrossed in the whole process that he didn't even notice them. Not far ahead, the high-ranking hunters in the advance group start calling out for Mr. Sun, someone calling the boy a porter, saying what he just did, realizing that Jin Wu is in over his head. Suddenly, the whole situation is taken over by Chief Jin Cheol, who puts his foot forward in the most masterful move, begins to state that the Hunters Association, the monitoring department, are in charge of the confidentiality of all data related to Sung Jin Wu, so today's incident should be kept secret from the media, looking seriously at everyone else and covering the guy with himself. The three men standing in front of the boy are in control of this whole situation, continuing to say that they will be able to find out all the details as soon as they leave the dungeon, but until then, everyone must remain silent. The two men address the boy as Mr. and tell him to follow them, for they will help him avoid possible problems, and Jin Wu looks at them with a completely uncomprehending stare, as if he were a star. One of the guards says that just now, Jin Wu showed strength surpassing S rank right in front of one guild, and Jin Chiel tells the others that they can contact the guild with questions. The gathered men in a single pile are about to leave this dungeon the very first, as some voice slightly with a kind of trembling shouts to wait a little while, drawing the attention of those present. The leader of Group B comes into view, stating that if the boy really has such abilities, the outcome of the battle is not considered unusual for Jin Wu but he doesn't care why he went on the raid as a porter. What matters to the man is that they are only alive because of the boy. So he asks for permission on behalf of the entire advance squad to thank Jin Wu, thus bowing their heads down. The boy, accepting all these thanks, goes up to the healer girl and tells her that since she is alive, why doesn't she send her notebook to her family? And she looks surprised. The girl finally realizes what the boy is telling her and afterwards accepts her own notebook from his hands and laughs embarrassedly that yes, the situation is quite funny what happened. One of the bodyguards says that this is the end of it and it's time for them to leave the A-rank dungeon, thus causing the four of them to turn the other way and head towards the exit. Behind standing hunter Cha Hai In still hasn't said any word, only remaining standing in the same place and pulling her hand forward as if she wanted to call the boy away but hesitates to do so. One of the high-ranking sorceresses appears next to the girl, awkwardly addressing Miss Deputy Head, drawing the attention of Cha Hai-in, who looks at her expectantly. The sorceress asks incredulous questions about why the girl needs the pickaxe she keeps holding in her hands without using it in battle, causing Cha Hai-in to awkwardly keep silent and think about what to say. The girl doesn't seem to be in control of her raging feelings, immediately instantly asking the sorceress if she looked weird in that moment, to which the latter asks who exactly Cha thinks that is for. The girl lowered her eyes to the floor in embarrassment seemingly starting to realize that she had said something unnecessary and to the wrong person altogether, thus making herself feel even more awkward by talking about being forgotten. Jin Ho sits at one of the tables, hands on either side of his legs, and thinks about some thoughts that have been weighing on his mind that won't let him rest. It seems to be about the henim again. Jin Ho still continues to sit in a similar tense posture, looking somewhere ahead of himself and thinking that the fateful hour is about to arrive, making him expect something serious all this time. The boy begins to continue to torment himself with many questions and uncertainties, asking himself to gather his thoughts soon, thinking that his future depends on the decision of the henim. As soon as the silhouette of a boy begins to be seen somewhere at the end of the diner itself, Jin Ho reacts to it instantly, raising his hand high up, thus drawing his attention to himself. The boy stands tiredly in the very aisle, holding his hands on either side of his clothes, which are just soiled, hearing Jin Ho's question about his things, why those are in such a state, to which he says that he was in the dungeon. 
Jin Ho thinks about the boy tirelessly mopping up dungeons even when he has free time, as expected of a great for Jin Ho Henam continuing to admire him. After some amount of time, Jin Ho does gather his thoughts when the boy finally sits down across from himself, and afterward begins to voice from afar that in fact, Jin Ho begins to share all the events that were just discussed back at the serious conversation together with his father, what he was experiencing then, and what the man told him while the boy listens intently. The boy says that during the negotiations with Jin Ho's father, Ko Myung Hwan appears and reveals the whole truth about the Red Gate incident, which is something he really didn't want to happen. Jin Ho, sitting on the other side of the table and holding a coffee in his hand, states that the boy is quite right in his speculation for the fact that they saved the members of the White Tiger Guild. The boy thinks about the fact that this guy said something he shouldn't have said, and afterwards states that if Jin Woo provides widespread help, Jin Ho could become the next head of the Yu Jin Guild. Jin Ho immediately states loudly and confidently that he's betting everything on the Henim's decision about the case, and would never dare tell the boy to do anything, sincerely confessing his words. The boy, watching Jin Ho's reaction to the whole affair, begins to slowly voice his decision to the guy sitting across from him, slightly delaying some intrigue. Jin Ho waits with all the fear and stifling impatience he has for what decision his Hyung Nim will finally make for he really does depend on other people's opinions on this matter. In one of the buildings in the dark, there is some heated discussion about something that happened. Someone shrieks and says that a certain Sung Jin Woo has already raided them. The red-haired man in his glasses shockedly asks someone in front of him that if Jin Woo worked in the ore mining group yesterday, but already today, he managed to work as a certain porter. Group leader B sincerely says that it's even hard for him to imagine Jin Woo's intentions, but he's sure that this kid didn't plan to interfere with their raid showing with all his appearance the seriousness of his words. One man says that when the dungeon boss showed up, the entire team couldn't lift a finger, but the hunter who was watching at that moment had nothing to do but do something about it. And another says that he helped the other guild, and now them. The man with glasses thinks that this boy has the power of countless mystical creatures, a fighting style like a hunter killer, and he can summon defeated monsters to his army. The red-haired man, after thinking about all this for a while, decides that this is not new information to him at all, but if suddenly the leader of Group B is hiding something from him, the man, being in his deep thoughts about the boy's deed, props up his chin with the palm of his hand and begins to slowly say that if this young man is so strong, then, since the boy is so strong, what does the B leader himself think about which of the two of them would be stronger? causing the other man to look at him even with some sympathy in his gaze. The man begins to speak his mind in order to compensate for the weaknesses of the members of the raid. Then each of them performs a certain role in the boy, which is not surprising, because he is quite strong. The boy holds an attacking role, tank or support. Lack of either will put the raid in a dangerous position, after all, one for all, and all for one, which is the basic core. But the boy is something else something that is far beyond the bounds of reason, causing the man to clench his palm into a fist and begin to clench it to a sort of shiver of excitement. The man asks what he thinks about whether a red-haired man would be able to mop up a high-level A-rang dungeon by himself alone, without anyone else's help at this point. The man's gaze changes noticeably to shocked. He thinks that it doesn't matter how strong he is, because being surrounded by monsters, he is unlikely to be able to keep the defense, and then says that it is simply impossible. The red-haired man lowers his gaze and states that the nickname Universal Soldier even sounds kind of ridiculous. He ponders what the real strength of this boy is. The leader of Group B tells the head Choi that he is in no position to tell him how and who should be accepted into their huge hunter's guild, but there is something very necessary important. The man goes on to say that they need the boy. They absolutely must recruit Jin Woo into their guild, no matter what it takes, no matter what effort it takes. A huge number of reporters are in one place. They are discussing something heatedly. Many of them are smiling and ready to use their huge cameras to shoot the important things. Some of the reporters here are doing something passionately, clearly making a list of their future questions for the real stars of this place, because they need some content for their company. There is a black expensive car in one of the parking lots near the rough spot because of so many reporters, which doesn't draw much attention from the rest of the people. Some man is sitting in his chair, watching everything from the tinted window and says how many people have gathered, but it's even better for him, and someone says that they are in place. A man starts reading a certain script that talks about Lee Min Sung, who has conquered billions of peaks, yes, and gained immense power, and another says that this news will pepper the media's front page. 
Suddenly, another tinted car pulls into the parking lot, attracting the attention of everyone in the place, both the employees and the reporters standing and ready to film. One of the men, who is holding a camera in his hands, looks in surprise at the unknown car and asks if anyone else has come to this place. Bayek Yunho and Choi Jong-in appear in all their glory from two cars, attracting a lot of attention as they are the unexpected guests of the event. The master turns his head toward the shouting and overly loud reporters, wondering what's wrong with the media today, because they're acting so wildly, as if they've gone off the chain. The reporters draw attention to themselves and ask questions that the purpose of their visit is to recruit Min Sung into their ranks, how they feel about this hunter's departure from show business, and what their assumptions are about Min Sung's rank. The reporters ask to say a couple comments about Min Seong, and the master thinks about how is this media really here for some guy, why did they choose the association, and afterward says that he's not here for him. The red-haired man states that the media is clearly already aware that Hunter Lee Min Seong has contracted with the Reaper Guild, and he's here on completely different business, surprising all the reporters. The reporters here are momentarily upset at such responses from such powerful hunters they thought they could catch more information. The master, who is standing next to the red-haired man, begins to touch on one thing about the Hunter's Guild, that there was one unpleasant incident for them. The red-haired man instantly attacks, glaring that this is nothing compared to how the White Tiger Guild lost their A-ranked hunter, thus causing the master to become enraged. But the men decide not to conflict and find some benefit in other people's actions. Because if it were not for the boy, without him the advance team would have been completely destroyed. He gave support to everyone. One of the men states that following his moral convictions, he wants to see this particular boy in the ranks of his own guild by any means necessary, which he will diligently pursue. The master seems to be starting to gradually get annoyed with such confidence from the other man, so he says that his guild has suffered heavy losses, does the one think that they should be the ones to recruit the guy. The red-haired man says what the master is up to since he's so eager to invite S-rank, declare war or worse, and the man asks when Choi started following moral convictions. The men begin their silly squabble, throwing silly promises at each other as some man suddenly appears, surprised at who he now sees in front of him. A man in a business suit appears before the men, quite publicizing his question about whether such bigwigs have come to fight for their Min Seong, which noticeably flatters him. The men are already in an embittered state. They think about what this jerk thinks of himself, and afterward they say that they don't care about this Min son who doesn't interest them at all. The man seems to become even insulted at hearing what such serious people said about Min Sung, and afterward he softly voices what's going on with these two. A satisfied Lee Min Seong looks through the car window and notices Choi and Beck in the area, thinking that they've come for him since the country's top guilds are clashing with each other, and it's because of him. The driver suddenly catches his eye and approaches Min Sung to say that they're finally ready to start the long-awaited interview, to which he gets agreement from the guy. Lee Min Sung doesn't waste his precious time and gets out of the tinted car, starting to shine in front of the cameras that only take pictures of this smiling guy. Suddenly the boy in all his glory also appears in this noisy place, looking even a little tired, wondering why there is such a ruckus. The boy thinks about the fact that the media is already aware of all the cases, and then looks and realizes that those here on another case, and then says that because of all this hype is unlikely to get into the association. The boy starts pushing away all the reporters who are here who call out softly to the boy, but he does it all while apologizing to them. Some shouty man appears in front of the boy, asking about who Jin Woo is and if he is from the association, can't the boy see that there are cameras everywhere. The man says that you can't block the reporter's view of you so unceremoniously, and the boy briefly says that he has business to attend to in the association, but the other says that they don't care about him, so let him leave. Min Sung thinks about what's wrong with this empty-headed boy, because he should have realized the situation he's in now, while the bodyguard shouts that there's no further Jin Woo's way and let him get lost. Suddenly, some other person comes into view, talking about who decided that no one was waiting for the boy in the association, drawing the attention of the others. The ever-famous Ko Gun Hee comes into view, smiling welcomingly, and stating that the boy is their precious and long-awaited guest, which can't help but make the president happy. The president turns to Lee Min Sung about whether he knows who let them have a press conference in this place, causing this guy to look awkward and agree with a shaky voice. The president of the Hunters Association isn't going to spend much time on Min Seong, so he turns to the boy and walks with him inside the building itself, discussing something. Starly Min Sung visibly changes in his face to an embittered one. He thinks about who this kid is since the president personally held him, 
and the others ask if anyone knows about that guy. Min Sung softly says how dare the kid ruin his performance and then turns towards his bodyguard and says to find out about who the kid is. Min Sung wonders how he should get the crowd's attention back to him now and afterward decides to go with the script because first he needs to enter the building and then start going through the ranking assessment. A smiling Min Sung turns towards that crowd of people and says to wait a couple minutes so that he can talk to the association about some details regarding his evaluation. Min Seong is about to enter the association building itself getting close enough to it as several people suddenly appear in front of him with great speed. Jin Chil appears in all his glory in front of Star Min Sung, who does his job by not allowing this guy to enter the association building, because it's currently undergoing negotiations. Jin Chul says that there is currently a reassessment of another hunter's rank in the association building. Roughly this will be over by 11 o'clock, but in the meantime, you can't enter. Already offended, Min Sung loudly blurts out what's going on here because all the attention should be on him and not on that boy. Min Sung pulls his cell phone out of his pocket and looks at the time showing that it's half past 11. And he thinks to himself that he's talking about the guy the president has now personally escorted out. Min Sun says that the evaluation of his rank has scheduled for 11 o'clock. Almost all the media is in place. After all, the president of the association has already been inducted, so why deny it? Min Seong voices whether Jin Chiol is aware of who he himself is, that his name is Lee Min Seong, whispering to the man that says he can wait until it's his turn. Min Sung changes his gaze and says that he's not aware of the fact that the biggest sponsor of the Hunters Association is Yu Jin's company. Shouldn't he fully support him considering their sums? Min Sung continues to voice that whether Jin Chiol will ignore the star right in front of a large amount of media, whether he realizes the consequences that await the association. Jin Chiol, after listening to all of this guy's long and pathos-laden speech, briefly states that none of this matters to them, which elicits a surprised and indignant look from Min Seong. Min Sung instantly becomes enraged by the other's words. He starts yelling about how Jin Chil dares to say such a thing, is this boy a better person than himself? Jin Chil seems to be slowly getting annoyed with this kind of situation, and this guy's shouty behavior starts to take off his glasses and says that if he told him, if he told him, would Mr. Min Sun not be able to coexist with the consequences, looking with his angry gaze that portrayed sufficient coldness and seriousness? The guy standing in front of Jin Chul begins to visibly get goosebumps, and his face changes to a shocked one, full of horror at what he's seen and heard from this bodyguard. The boy walks through the huge building next to the president of the Hunters Association. They stroll silently through the long corridors, each thinking about something different. At some point, a red-haired man appears in company with a master that bends their bodies in a respectful gesture while closing their eyes and not looking at these people. The president of the Hunters Association addresses the boy saying that these heads of their guilds seem to have shown up at this place an hour earlier just to see Jin Woo. The president of the Hunters Association says that the one hunter who reached S rank in two years, and Choi Jung-in is probably more worried than all of them, since he was the first to learn about Jin Woo's mighty power. The men walk in their own direction, after which they stop at some huge place. One unfamiliar man stands in front of the boy, with whom he says a polite hello introducing himself. The man holding the folder says that before they begin the reevaluation process, they would like to see the basic abilities to establish a class, asking about what specifically Jin Wu uses. The boy, realizing what basic abilities are required of him, begins to summon one of his knights, forcing the dark magic to gather into one pile. The unfamiliar man that specializes in rank reevaluation opens his mouth in surprise and looks at what's happening when the president of the Hunters Association is also surprised by what he sees. Next to the boy at his command appears one of the most ordinary knights, ready to carry out any errands of his Lord of Shadows, only let him speak his decrees. The unknown man is visibly excited by what he sees. He asks if it's a spirit, and then asks another question, that if the boy can control souls through his abilities. Suddenly, the president of the Hunters Association enters the conversation, turning to the hunter Sung Jin Wu and asking if this is all the abilities he can possess. The boy looks unhappily at the president of the Hunters Association and thinks that since he's already been burned, there's not much choice. This time, Jin Wu managed to get the higher orcs. After a couple of seconds, the boy, concentrating on his actions, gradually begins to summon the rest of the shadows, which are some kind of prize bonus after defeating the boss. The president of the Hunters Association, who is nearby, stares in amazement at what is happening in front of him, seeming to stop believing his own eyes. 
Because what is so amazing? Not far away, the heads of the other guilds watch the whole thing happen, and then look on in shock as the boy easily summons more dangerous and powerful orcs. The boy, once he summons the rest of the different types of his own shadows, states with a calm face that he can summon about a hundred such subordinates, which is a strong ability. The male hunter rank evaluator looks around shocked, seemingly unable to believe what he is seeing at the moment. The president of the hunter association at the same time also looking at his new subordinates. The master does not hide his emotions and thinks about how powerful the boy's power is, that it really comes from him. Even Jin Wu's power is not comparable to the one he felt when he first met him. The master guesses that the boy has become much stronger than him, that he has surpassed all expectations and even surpassed various guild heads, while Jin Wu at this point finally goes with his license. After some time, the boy is finally given a new license, thanks to which he will be able to do a lot of new things. And suddenly he is called out by the master who is standing next to Choi Jung In. The master asks Sung Jin Wu to take some of someone else's time, and the boy states at someone else's words that he still has some things left to do, starting to open the door with a nervous face. The red-haired man says in surprise and nervously that this is the exit the boy is going to go out in, and the foreman says he wouldn't be in such a hurry to go out if he were someone else. The boy thinks about the fact that the master seems to want to interest him in the terms of his own contract in this way, while Jin Wu presses the handle of the door and opens it. The boy, as soon as he opens the door, starting to walk outside, instantly notices the sheer number of cameras taking pictures of him, which just keep blinding Jin Wu. The boy clearly does not expect such a moment, because he just wanted to get out and go on his way. As he changes in his face and opens his mouth, thus getting on the cameras. It is this moment that is captured by a large number of photographers, putting such a photo on the cover of various videos, titling it with interesting titles that can only be thought of. One of the students holds a phone in her hand that has some kind of broadcast going on, and calls out to Jin Wu afterward, talking about how her brother is now being shown right on TV, surprised more. Jin A, who is quietly studying, immediately looks at someone else's cell phone and says with surprise, what is this nonsense after all? Why would her brother be on TV not believing the words? Just a little while ago, Min Xiong is trying his best to attract media attention by saying that even though his evaluation will not go well and he will get a low ranking, but still, Min Sun raises his voice, saying in a confident voice that regardless of his overall outcome, he will definitely stand up for the residents as only befits the truest hunter. The media has been asking questions about why Min Sung is suddenly ending his career even without looking at his rank, asking if the star wants to announce that he is ready to give up the title of number one pop star. Min Sung is contentedly basking in his fame, spreading his arms out to the sides and thinking that's the way to go. Let them all look only at him as someone tries to ask one question of this star. Min Sung doesn't even try to hide his smug smile. He thinks about the fact that it's all a pure lie. After all, he had already been evaluated and obtained the A rank already like two years ago, taking advantage of the moment. Min Xiong thinks about the fact that he plans to make a huge amount of money as a hunter in these two years. He is only required to raise the public status of the Reaper Guild, which he does. Min Sung thinks of the best way to eliminate unnecessary rumors and resolve issues with the army. After all, he had the idea to come down to Earth and become a hunter protecting the residents. Isn't that the perfect plan? Min Xiong, covering his eyes, starts to voice that there is also a person present at this place that is the head of the Reaper's Guild and supported his injury. Only before he can finish speaking, the media switches to someone else. Some man is furiously on the phone talking loudly about how there is some news from the Hunters Association, asking the person he is talking to why he is only talking about it now. Min Sung silently continues to stand in the same spot, never having finished his speech, as he hears the media's heated discussion about whether or not they have the 10th S-ranked hunter in their country. Min Sung listens to the reporter's raucous chatter with closed eyes, seemingly puzzled as to why these people were so quick to jump to a completely different person, but then realizes afterwards that it was that boy. Some man furiously clutches the phone in his hand and says that the Hunter Association has just updated their page which already has information about the 10th S-ranked hunter Jin Wu. A man in a business uniform furiously ponders that didn't the Hunters Association inform him today that it would be impossible to use the reassessment room when Min Sung was speaking. The man's gaze flames with rage as he continues to think about the assessment room being reserved for the new s rank hunter, thus setting up a star in Min Sung's face. Min Sung, definitely puzzled by what's going on and the fact that the media is completely ignoring his presence, 
only hears the reporters loudly exclaiming that they can't miss such a scoop about the hunter. The reporters start making a huge ruckus, some asking for directions and some yelling that they heard about the new S-ranked hunter, asking about whether the Hunter Association shouldn't talk about such things in advance. Min's son even settles down to the ground from sheer surprise, unbelievingly ogling about the new S-ranked hunter, not understanding why this boy of all days appeared on this particular day, the most important one. Suddenly, Min Sung manages to spot one he knows in the crowd of reporters, shouting at him, thus attracting the reporter's attention, who looks awkwardly at the star and says he'll be sure to come over later. Repet Lim furiously keeps talking on his cell phone about someone changing the headline from from E-Rank's sorrowful tears to S-Rank's tears of happiness this very second. Min Sun seems to still have no way of understanding what is really going on, continuing to settle on the cold ground and looking in different directions with surprised eyes, as if trying to find the answer to the question. A man from the collection squad holds a phone horizontally in his hand and afterward asks why Jin Woo is on TV thus drawing the attention of the other workers. The same man who was once frightened by Jin Woo's gaze loudly proclaims that the boy is on TV for a reason, saying that he's interested in learning about the boy's terrible deeds. The workers on this shift sit down to all sit back and watch what is being broadcast on TV together, wondering what the hunter Jin Woo actually did. The man continues to hold the cell phone in his hand, listens to what the news is broadcasting about, and afterwards he hears someone saying that Jin Wu is the newly minted 10th rank S hunter. The very man who was offended by someone else's act is instantly covered in goosebumps and a palpable chill, changing in his face to a frightened one as he realizes just who he has encountered then. This broadcast with Sung Jin Wu is being scrolled on literally the biggest platforms that exist, forcing all people to watch the news. Even some men stop exercising during their workout to pull out their phones and start watching the broadcast with Sung Jin Wu discussing the news. Some statuesque man sits on his kessel and says that the Hunters Association has announced about Sung Jin Wu that he is the 10th S-rank magic class hunter. The man asks Jin Ho if his son has managed to recruit such an important person into his guild, Yu Jin, which doesn't seem like such an easy thing to do at first. Since the boy is so popular, Jin Ho seems to be struggling with his emotions, but just stays silent and doesn't say anything to someone else's question as he gives up and says that he can't go against the decision his Hyung Nim told him then. Jin Ho gathers his strength, wondering if he should share the boy's decision with his father, but what to do when he has no other choice in this situation. Jin Ho, a little delayed in his speech, begins to voice that the boy is going to start his own guild, inviting him into the place as a deputy, nervous in front of his father. Suddenly the man looks at his son in surprise, and afterward begins to voice whether Jin Ho knows why he decided to start the Yu Jin Guild, and the other assumes it's most likely because of money. The man starts to say that he has enough money. Does Jin Ho really think his father would start such a huge guild just to make money? Jin Ho doesn't make his question long about then what was the purpose of creating such a huge guild, to which the man replies that it was for the protection of themselves. The man says that the power and influence of hunters is growing every day. There are some whose power can match a whole country, but there are also monsters that call themselves the strongest hunters. They are called national level. The man continues that there are countries where hunters are exalted as kings, as Jin Ho thinks about how long the government will last and whether the law can protect them. The man says that he had one goal in mind when creating the guild, and that was to gather reliable hunters in one place, those whose beliefs aren't tied to money, and Jin Ho seems to have already found one such person. After his long speech, which the man shares with his son, he briefly states that Jin Ho has passed his time trial by holding his hand over the cup of hot coffee he's about to drink. The man continues that he leaves the Yu Jin Guild specifically for his son Jin Ho, causing the other young man to open his mouth in shock and feel defeated in tangible hope. The man tells his son to take care of Yu Jin's guild, to make alliances only with strong and trustworthy hunters, allowing Jin Ho to run the company. The man goes on to say that it is such hunters who will soon be more precious than any riches, covering his eyes after a long speech, and all Jin Ho can do is loudly express his gratitude for such an action on his father's part. But all of a sudden, Jin Ho continues to voice that he doesn't seem to think he'd be able to run Yu Jin's company properly, causing the man to open his eyes in bewilderment. Jin Ho continues to confidently vow that he will definitely join his Hyung Nim's guild, and this seems to be his final decision even after a long journey to aspire to Yujin's guild. The boy continues to stand in the same spot, looking wistfully at all the reporters filming him, wondering why these people are filming him and not Min Sung's star. 
One of the reporters tries to get close to the boy and asks if Jin Wu is the same Erang guy who worked for the Hunters Association because he was able to enter a rare group. Jin Wu isn't going to say anything back. He keeps hearing the reporter's cries for the boy to look at them, and the master says it's a tedious endeavor, so he'll take him without any hassle. As soon as the master tries to place his palm on someone else's shoulder, Jin Wu instantly reacts to the other's body movement, immediately disappearing from sight with great speed, causing the other to be surprised. The boy seems to have no intention of listening to anyone and is not going to accept help, stating that he is perfectly fine, thus surprising all the reporters in the area with his disappearance. The reporters open their mouths in surprise, turning back at the audible voice behind them, and the master seems to change completely in his face, in no way expecting such an action on his part. The red-haired man that stands beside the master only adds fuel to the fire with his words that a magic class hunter with this type of movement is simply an incredible person. The red-haired man seems to be thinking passionately about the boy's movements as he suddenly shifts his gaze to Mr. Puck standing next to him, who seems to lose face altogether. The master can't hide his overflowing gut pleasure. All of the man's emotions can easily be read on his face as he thinks about how fast Jin Wu is since his eyes didn't follow him. The man's hands begin to gradually shake due to the thoughts overflowing his head. He continues to think about the fact that he is certainly aware of his own power. But that is not the problem at the moment. The biggest problem for the master is how fast the boy's movements are, and his magical power that comes from Jin Wu in the evaluation room is just incredible. Getting the man. The master thinks about how strong this boy has become, because the current Sung Jin Wu is on a whole other level, surpassing many S-ranked hunters in terms of his killing power. The red-haired man watches the master incomprehensibly, who continues to think that the boy's reawakening was because of this, but the fact that he's gotten even stronger isn't exactly surprising. The man can no longer contain all his emotions. His eyes are burning with hellfire, as if he wants to burn everything in his path that is associated with the boy because perhaps it is not a reawakening. The man clenches his jaws, goes into deep thought and contemplation about who this powerful boy really is, whether it's possible that this guy, that Jin Wu is the kind of hunter who is able to constantly build up his own strength, thereby being able to surpass many other highly ranked hunters with his uncontrollable power. There's a TV running in some room, which continues to broadcast today's new news that Jin Wu had his first reawakening to S rank in two years. A lot of people are watching the current broadcast, vigorously discussing today's news, including a man in the hospital, wondering if it's Jin Wu. The man stares furiously straight into the TV, looking at the image of the boy, and afterwards says with a disbelieving look that could this Jin Wu really have survived without being trapped in the dungeon. One of the artifact connoisseurs says that he has been working in this particular field for a great deal of time, but in his entire life he has never been able to see the blood-red orb with his own eyes. The man, touching the blood-red sphere with his gloved hands, states that it is with this item that you can increase your own magical power by as much as 100%, because it is incredible. The man thinks about the fact that even the most skilled artifactors are able to create one of these at 50%. If Choi Jong-in saw this orb, he would give anything just to acquire this item for himself. A man in glasses asks the boy where he got the object from, to which he replies that he got it from a dungeon which the specialist interjects, ostensibly asking for clarification. The man is surprised that there is such a thing in the dungeons, and afterward reads a suggestion to put it up for auction at an auction house, so they will do anything to satisfy the price, to which Jin Wu says he will think about it. The boy is thinking about the fact that now he needs to mop up the dungeon and create the sacred water of life as soon as possible, and the artifacts that will protect him from the hellfire come in handy, so he asks to see them. The artifact specialist interjects that he seriously needs protection with resistance to fire, to which the boy wonders if they don't have that kind of protection, or if it's hard to get. The man says that no, of course they have it all, and the boy says that he hasn't even found such protection online, and the man says that these artifacts are expensive, so they don't post them online, but they're sure to have something for Jin Wu. The man says that fire magic is the most common among the other types of magic. And the boy thinks that the guild heads also used fire magic like the fang. And afterward, he hears Jin Wu follow him. After a certain amount of time, they find themselves in some place hidden from the rest of the world's eyes, where there are a large number of all sorts of protections in the form of armor, helmets, and more. The man asks if the boy likes anything, and the boy says that it is safe to store something so expensive behind such thin glass, because something here does not see any protective devices. 
The man says that this glass has been enchanted with magic. Even if an Arang hunter hits it, it will hold up. And the boy wonders if it's really that strong. And the man says for Jin Wu to try it. The man says that if the boy manages to break the glass, he'll be able to take any artifact he wants. And Jin Wu thinks it's true that he feels some magical energy enveloping the glass. The boy is not going to waste much time, so he is very much interested in testing the glass for strength, starting to use his magical abilities, surprising the man. The artifact specialist even becomes visibly nervous as soon as he sees the way the boy puts out his fist shrouded in dark magic to get ready to break that glass. Suddenly the man blurts out, putting his hands out in front of him, that if the boy really does break this glass, the elite hunters will come running here with the mage, because their auction house has contracted for protection. The man nervously thinks about whether the boy isn't a magic class hunter, not realizing what's going on here, and Jin Wu states that he can look at the daggers in this place, getting consent. A completely different specialist approaches the boy, greeting and inviting him to walk with him towards the weapons, while the artifact specialist continues to look away nervously, not believing his eyes. Suddenly the artifact specialist notices something amazing right on the glass, behind which are expensive artifacts and protections. Momentarily surprised by what he sees, the man looks nervously after the boy who is leaving and says softly that this boy could damage this strong glass without even touching it with his fist. The boy, along with the weapons consultant, begins to look around for daggers that interest him, choosing one of the many and asking its price, testing the power of magic. The weapons consultant, after looking at the one Jin Wu had chosen, states that its value is 30 million won, thus slightly surprising the boy with such a price. The boy thinks about this blade being worse than a night killer, but its price is decent enough. The characteristics of this weapon are comparable to the basilisk fang at best. After a small amount of time, the boy thinks about what it would be like if he showed his blade and asked its value, which he does for the next couple moments. The weapons consultant gingerly picks up another man's blade and marvels at the excellent work of a master craftsman, and the boy awkwardly thinks about the fact that he bought it in a store. The man states that the value of this weapon is 100 million won causing the boy to open his mouth in surprise, thinking about how a blade worth two and eight million won would cost around one hundred. The boy thinks about the fact that Kim Sang-shik's sword is worth about three million won. Also, Jin Ho's armor is about a hundred million won. But if Jin Wu were to auction the sword and armor, he wouldn't have to sell the sphere of greed. Some young man, folding his hands into a tight lock, goes into his deep thoughts about whether or not this happening is even possible, only making you think harder. The master. In complete darkness next to the panoramic window, thinks about the fact that a hunter who can build up his power without any restrictions looks like a damn powerful man. The master softly divulges that his beast eyes can accurately determine someone's abilities, and even a short time ago, Sung Jin Wu was much weaker during the Red Gate incident. But now everything has changed. The master says how foolish he was then. If a boy has such power, he should have no trouble forming his own guild rather than joining someone else. The master thinks about what's in store for the strongest guilds in South Korea, because if the boy keeps this up, he could become the most powerful wherever he goes. A video is produced on some computer stating that Hunter Sung Jin Woo, after going through a reawakening, was able to become S-rank while having magical abilities. The chief with hellfire in his eyes says that maybe the head of Pak gave up with Jin Woo's recruitment. Then he still hasn't. If he can get to talk to him again, then maybe he definitely will. His assistant says that he can rely on him. The chief, standing behind the crowd of people, says that maybe they can get a rise out of him, and the girl says that would Jin Wu, surrounded by a crowd of media, talk to them about anything. After some amount of time, Jin A tries to cautiously look out of the window of his house, saying that the reporters are still not giving up and trying to get to the boy with all their might. Suddenly, Jin A finds herself noticed in a surprising way, so the reporters standing below turn to her, drawing attention and making attempts to talk to her at least. The girl, realizing the fact that she is being spotted by these crazy reporters, changes her gaze and instantly settles to the floor as if trying to recover from the adrenaline. The boy says that maybe he should go down and disperse them, and the TA says that he definitely shouldn't do that, because there's already a lot of negativity on the internet related to Jin Wu. The boy asks incomprehensibly what the hell he did, and the girl, crawling on the floor, states that he ran away from the media without ever answering their questions so her brother should ignore those reporters. Unhappy with what's going on, Sung Jin Woo says that the brash reporters are already starting to knock on the door, offering to deal with them, and the girl is already standing outside the door, telling him not to do it. The boy, completely enraged by the actions of these annoying reporters, 
is ready to rip them to shreds and make sure these people don't come back, talking about how they should stop, but understating it. In the boy's field of vision appears a crying Jin Ho, who, not holding back his many emotions, begins to say in a trembling voice that his father has kicked him out of the house. The boy, opening his door to a man he knows, asks that the man does not live apart from them, and the man replies that the villa in which he lives is in his father's name. So, suddenly Jin Ho tries to take control of the situation, stops crying and says that if he can stay with his young nim for a while, and the boy immediately closes the door right in his face. The boy doesn't seem like he's even going to listen to this young man. Jin A asks about him who this guy is, and Jin Wu replies that this is the first time he's seen this man at all. Jin Ho, who happens to be on the other side of the door, starts banging on the boy's door in an attempt to get through to him because he's packed his things and really doesn't know where he can live. The pretty woman standing behind her husband voices the question of whether the man is overreacting to his actions toward his son, to which the man replies that Jin Ho deserves it. The man says that if Jin Ho wants independence, he should start pursuing it himself. But the bigger thing that pissed the man off was his son saying that he would follow his Hennyim. The man, being near his closet and falling into some sort of contemplation about his son's act, suddenly says that it all seems strange to him, and the woman interjects as to what exactly it is. Suddenly the man begins to voice in a tired voice that his woman's face is double, causing her to change in expression, and instantly fear for her husband, who seems to be getting sick. The man, unable to cope with his poor state, settles to the floor, trying to regain his senses so he doesn't faint while the woman, holding onto his back, calls out loudly. The room is quite dark, the boy seems to be lurking, trying to act carefully so that no one will accidentally notice him, which is not what one would want in the first place. The boy thinks, looking at his sleeping sister, that while he's not here, someone might unexpectedly sneak right into Jin A's place, which Jin Wu wouldn't want to happen, that he has a duty to protect his sister. The boy, after briefly considering what he should do in this situation, briefly voices a command to report to his subordinates, who immediately follow the order of their shadow lord. The boy calls for strong warriors, stating that each of the powerful orcs could easily stand up to an A-ranked hunter, so he may not worry about her safety. The boy, looking at the subordinates around him, wonders if they are the same four from Fang's retinue, but doesn't quite understand why there are three and not four. The boy, changing in his face, immediately remembers that this fourth powerful orc was stuck in the ceiling because of his attack, which is why he failed to retrieve the other's shadow. The boy, after briefly pondering, declares that it is best to leave one powerful orc to protect his own sister, trusting him with his most intimate possessions. The boy voices that two other subordinates will come under the command of one powerful orc, voicing for them to watch over his sister. After himself, one of the shadows bows his head. After the boy's words, all of his summoned subordinates hide in various places in the room to ambush the enemy at any moment. The boy, observing the beauty of the quiet night city, turns to someone and asks the question that maybe he should put his subordinates around since he's here for now. After a certain amount of time... The boy summons his subordinates, beginning to place them in the places that seem logical and better for defending the territory. The boy, sitting on some object, addresses his subordinates and states that they are now the guardians of this neighborhood. They must be quieter than water and lower than the grass so that people will not notice them. The boy, still sitting in the same spot, gives the command for his subordinates to get to work, whereupon all the guards hide in the various corners of the neighborhood. The boy thinks about the fact that even if a maniac sneaks in here, being a low-ranked hunter, he won't pose a threat to his shadows, figuring this world will be a little safer. A rather large car is speeding away. Some man, apparently having a conversation with someone, asks whether his interlocutor has had a good night's sleep. The boy in the back seat says that until they find a suitable place for their guild office, Jin Ho will have to live there, and he replies that in their time, a separate business is doing quite well. The boy thinks he didn't even plan on becoming the head of Yu Jin's guild, but he's also in no position to lord it over Jin Ho just because the latter respects him, and the other asks if he has business in Seoul Tower. The boy doesn't seem like he's going to answer someone else's question. He states with a calm expression and a sort of smile that he's going to go, putting Jin Ho in front of the fact with his suddenness. Jin Ho doesn't seem to be expecting such an act from the boy at all, surprised that he's already about to leave somewhere before he's even traveled a certain amount of time. The boy, in a place destroyed and constantly burning in flames, thinks that this time will be more difficult. But he has prepared considerably, treating it with a sensible head. The boy thinks that the newly acquired artifacts will definitely help Jin Wu win in this most difficult battle, also can keep him safe from this strong flame. 
The boy thinks of the wind mantle and the nameless ring with the attribute of water all to help him protect himself from the flames, and also Jin Wu bought these artifacts at the hunter's auction. The boy, already pre-dressed in all his new and expensive artifacts thanks to the auction, remarks that he is perfectly prepared for this dangerous place to handle everything. The boy, already about to go in the right direction, suddenly notices the received notification that there is a new quest and he looks surprised that he will have to go through the quest again. The task involves collecting the souls of demons. Also, the boy needs to defeat Baran and collect his soul, who is the king of all demons. There are listed rewards for this boss below. The boy remarks that these rewards are much better than the previous ones, as he will receive a top-quality runestone that allows him to learn the Jin Wu class skill. The boy recalls that he has three class skills in his arsenal, which are Shadow Extraction and Preservation, as well as ruler possession, all of which have incredible abilities. The boy, approaching some powerful place that causes the hem of his robe to start developing in the wind, receives an alert that floors 1 through 76 are open. The next notification does not take long to arrive. It asks which floor the boy wishes to move to, and he replies that it is the 76th. Something intimidating happens on this floor, as a large number of highly ranked monsters begin to slowly approach the boy, trying to get to him and win the battle. The boy wastes no precious time on this floor, for there is much ahead of him, so he summons a powerful orc in whose hands he has a fireball to attack. A huge powerful orc nicknamed Fang is quite a strong subordinate, following the instructions of his Shadow Lord and massacring opponents. The mighty Fang does not hold back his scream, showing all his emotions that he is just feeling at the moment, holding a fireball in his hands and planning to slay all the monsters. The boy observes what his subordinate is doing, commenting that the fang has mighty power, though he must have been a bit weak with the sphere of greed in his hands. The boy states, suggesting that the size of the sphere of greed appears to depend on its owner, which at the moment is a powerful fang, killing monsters with ease. The boy, observing how things are going for the mighty fang, draws some sort of conclusion during the battle that he should leave the realm of greed to this subordinate for a while. There is some dialogue going on in the medical care center. It seems some man is asking his question about how long he has been unconscious, in poor health. The doctor next to some patient states that he had been unconscious for two days, looking at the patient with a serious face, slightly sympathetic to another's condition. The gray-haired man seems awake after a long sleep, now able to sit up and lowering his gaze, glaring that he may have overworked himself, asking if his tests showed anything else. The doctor next to his patient asks if the man has had contact with someone who has undergone a reawakening and the man asks incomprehensibly what that has to do with anything. The doctor goes on to voice that familiar expression about unbroken sleep, causing the gray-haired man to open his eyes in marked surprise, as if not believing what he's saying. The doctor says that this is a dream from which one cannot wake up. The patient's life force is draining away at an incredible rate. With the appearance of the first gate, this disease has claimed a large number of lives. The doctor says that the main symptom of those suffering from unbroken sleep is drowsiness, and a man asks if it's all hunter-related, and another says that such sleep is definitely related to magical energy. The doctor says that there are those who cannot resist the magical energy with their own strength, and unbroken sleep is one of the progression of long-term illness, all because of the magical energy. The doctor continues that the man should steer clear of magical crystals, monsters, and such people, also considering the rapid rate of symptoms, then there was something that affected someone else's condition. The doctor asks the president with noticeable concern if there is someone in his family who has magical powers, someone who is a hunter, catching him off guard. The man begins to remember his son, which proves true to his own henim. He thinks of the uninterrupted exposure of magical energy to human. Every day the use of magical energy is increasing, hence the magical power of people is also increasing, and for people like the man that has none of this, there can only be one outcome. The man, starting to realize that since he had lost all his magical abilities due to his dreamless sleep, voices the fact that he is now behind, clenching his jaws and hiding his sad smile. The man seems to be trying not to give up, trying to stay in a positive frame of mind, talking about how he can be behind the rest of them, how this can happen to just someone like him. The man, surrounded by one woman and his own doctor, bows his head down and softly proclaims that this is not the end for him. He will do his best to get back on his feet. Some island in Japan is lit by the bright sun. It's quite green, surrounded by an endless stream of water, and there seems to be a lot of life going on in this place. Some powerful ant managed to overcome the land due to his ability to fly for a long time, so he was able to reach one place and even survive. 
Some two guys are walking around the area surrounding the two of them. One is apparently the mage of the place, and the other is some kind of knight, which says that peaceful times are the best after all. One of the old men goes outside and addresses Nogawa-san, that is he patrolling as usual, and the latter replies that yes, also there is a newcomer beside him, asking him to be sure to keep an eye on him. The man says that they must patrol every day, and also memorize the faces of the inhabitants, because if a gate like this appears on any island, they will be in trouble. That's why it's so important to track the location of the gate in time with the help of magic radar, and then immediately send a request to the hunters on that continent, because help will arrive in three days. The man goes on to say that the only hunters in this village are just the two of them, so the entire responsibility of keeping the first wave of monsters at bay rests on them, without saying anything. The man suddenly breaks off in his speech when he sees some creature in front of him, which gradually moves on the ground, not realizing if it is a human in front of them, looking forward with a kind of horror. The man seems to squint slightly and begins to notice something that looks like a red color, asking a loud question of surprise at what it actually is in front of them. The boy thinks about the fact that the total number of warriors gradually starts to increase as his intelligence increases. If only Jin Wu could retrieve the shadows of defeated demons, he would have an entire army. The boy thinks about the fact that such a large army would not be entirely effective. It's about time he learned how to distribute them properly, deciding that he will divide them into six teams. The boy, concentrating on his thoughts and ideas, believes that one group will consist of Fang, the second team is Egress, and the third is Iron's team. Moving on to the rest of the groups, then the fourth team will be at the tank. The fifth team consists of the Higher Orcs B, and there will also be a team of Higher Orcs A. The boy says that he will have two instructions for them to distribute themselves into said groups and then begin the sweep, and afterward inform him when they find a pass to go to the next floor. The boy is not going to waste a large amount of time. He, having made a few instructions dividing the subordinates into groups, gives the command to disperse, which his shadows do, instantly leaving. The boy thinks about the fact that he will have to give up any loot except a pass to the next floor, but the first priority is to reach the top floor as soon as possible. The boy, looking at his goal in the form of the very top floor of this hellish dungeon, begins to notice how his experience is gradually replenished, saying that his subordinates have only just left, and already such a result. The boy realizes that his solution is much more convenient than having him lugging around everywhere and wasting his time. Also, as long as his subordinates are alive, then Jin Wu's mana won't be wasted. The boy realizes that ordinary shadow soldiers can no longer handle the high-ranking demons. Jin Wu has to constantly drink potions to increase his mana. Some time passes. The boy, along with his subordinates, continues to fight in this hellish dungeon, increases his experience and level. The boy standing next to the tank, which is already 24th level, says that since their last meeting, the tank has already managed to gain a few dozen levels, surprising more. The boy thinks about the fact that he wasn't the only one raising his level, but his subordinates are here as well, so teamwork is indeed more effective than Jin Wu once thought. The boy stands next to the firestorm, looking up at it and thinking about the fact that he was able to get to the 80th floor much faster than he ever planned all along. The boy says that it's been two days since then. If we take the fact that Jin Wu still hasn't found the pass to the next floor, does it mean that a strong opponent is waiting for him? The boy, starting to wonder what lies ahead of him all this way, begins to notice his mana gradually decreasing, which it wasn't a couple minutes ago. The boy thinks about the fact that his mana is starting to drain much faster than usual. Someone is apparently constantly destroying his subordinates, making this situation worse. The boy thinks about the fact that since things are pretty bad with the soldier's regeneration, the enemy is superior by an order of magnitude. It must be all going on in Aaron's team. It seems someone is actually stronger than him. The boy continues to watch his mana decrease significantly, stating that he has no choice but to summon the shadows back so they don't waste mana. The next day, due to prolonged ambushes towards the shadow soldiers, those were called off by the boy himself, who decided that this seemed to be much better. The boy sits down and starts drawing something in the sand, saying that High Orc Team B and Team Igris were attacked in succession, so there really is a serious opponent on this floor. The boy thinks about how Fang's team should be next after Igris, but for some reason the enemy has ambushed the Higher Orcs A. The attacking demons don't seem to have enough power for Fang. The boy thinks about the fact that if monsters purposefully get rid of weak opponents, it only means that Jin Wu's enemy can easily recognize his opponent's strength. The boy considers how the floor is ablaze with considerable fire, burning everything around it. 
and also thinks about the fact that if those purposefully attacked a team of higher orc bees, then that next target will only be a group of tank. The boy looks at his subordinates in the form of ice bears, who are minding their own business while resting from the battle. The boy thinks about the fact that the next target is the tank crew, because otherwise all other people's actions have no meaning, watching his subordinates from the side. The subordinate tank crews are slowly walking towards the battlefield in which they will have to fight their opponents, and the boy seems to be starting to gradually notice the others. Before him appears a large number of armor-protected monsters who are still on their steeds, thus adding speed and wrenching skills to their abilities. The boy continues to hide out of sight to avoid being seen, and also begins to realize that his opponents are three demon knights and a demon lord. Some amount of time passes, and one of the ice bears creates a loud sound, thus starting an attack towards their opponents, trying to keep morale up in the battle. One of the demon knights, without wasting his precious time, rises high into the sky and heads towards one of the ice bears with great speed. This demonic knight is so agile and fast in its movements that an ordinary ice bear simply can't handle it losing this battle. The boy, watching everything happening from the outside, thinking about why the regeneration of his subordinates simply could not cope, because the forces of the opponents are great. The boy is gradually approaching the battlefield, which is fighting a number of demons, saying that shadow monsters cannot cope with these enemies, gradually appearing in the guise. One of the demonic knights, starting to notice a new opponent in front of him, rushes towards him with great speed, seemingly thinking that he can easily deal with him, but no such luck. The boy doesn't even make much effort or use his magical abilities, just kills this opponent with one kick of his own foot, gaining experience as a gift. As soon as the demonic knights one by one began to notice the new opponent in the form of Jin Wu, they began to quickly run towards him, trying to win this battle as usual. The boy uses his magical abilities, is close to demonic monsters, literally flying past them, and then uses some sort of power on those knights afterward. The boy doesn't have much trouble dealing with these demonic monsters. He instantly kills them one by one, also starting to gain experience after dealing with them. As soon as one demon is defeated from the boy's action alone, the demon monster falls as well, losing this battle and giving away the victory. The boy, having dealt with the weakest opponents of the other team, comes face to face with the most important monster in this battle, watching the other's reaction from the sidelines. The boy has always been curious to know if monsters have any fear of their killers. Jin Wu watches this knight shiver, unable to contain his fear in his eyes. The boy looks pretty damn confident in his actions. He smiles and shows all his dangerous self in front of this opponent, stating what he's sure of his thoughts now. While the boy appears in his dangerous dark guise, which only he possesses due to his magical abilities, the knight is not going to just give up and attacks first. The boy easily dodges even such honed and quick movements with his bluish eyes and keeps his opponent from getting right to his body. The boy on this battlefield moves quite fast and agilely, his eyes continuing to glow with a blue light, as if hypnotizing his opponent in a similar manner. The boy thinks about his opponent attacking directly at his heart, neck and head. The one is quite articulate and has trained for a long time for such precise moves, but he is unlucky to have Jin Wu in front of him. The boy, while dodging the monster's attacks in the meantime, begins to remember what ranks he has met in this dungeon, starting with the lowest level demon and ending with the highest demon. But that's not all, because in this dungeon there are also ancient demons of higher level, as well as mini-bosses S rank, which are demons of noble origin, which are not so easy to deal with. The demonic knight, while continuing to attack, completely misses exactly the moment when the boy, Quickly approaching the monster, simply breaks the other's sword with a single movement of his hand, disarming it. The boy does not waste his precious time, acting as usual deftly and very even quick, instantly grabbing the other's head as if trying to remove the demon's mask. The boy with his strong grip can easily crush any human, and not only the skull so instantly began to hear the words that the demon surrenders, saying in his pitiful voice, the boy's gaze changes and he thinks about the fact that either he is slowly going head, or he is seriously starting to hear human conversation from the monster's side, starting to listen to the voices. The boy understates, seemingly trying to listen into someone else's voice as, after some amount of time, the stranger's mask comes off his head, revealing the true guise of this demon. The boy is surprised to realize that in front of him is a girl, who begins to apologize with some trembling in his voice for attacking him. They did not mean to do it, again asking for forgiveness for the act. The boy glosses over the fact that the one first attacked his subordinates and then starts apologizing, arching his eyebrow, and the girl starts glossing over the fact that she sinned, which she apologizes for. 
The girl says that she's been tasked with guarding the area, and Jin Wu wouldn't sit idly by while some man went around killing other demons like bugs either. The boy says that is it okay to beg for mercy for the man who killed her subordinates, to which she replies that it is her duty to protect her master. They will obviously be happy to know that she is safe. The boy thinks about the fact that this is the first time he's met a monster so selfish towards his subordinates, looking at her with his surprised gaze as she makes eye contact. The boy thinks that he can't just kill her like that because the girl looks like a human, but the girl in her gloating form thinks that she has caught Jin Wu right on a fishing line trying to kill him. The girl in her knightly guise wastes no time and pulls her hand forward with her weapon, trying to deal with the boy once and for all, but he simply vanishes into thin air. The boy, in full protection thanks to his subordinate Fang, asks in a menacing voice about what the girl is doing using the Song of Protection. The girl instantly falls face first into the ground, starts vocalizing that if the boy keeps her alive, she'll do anything for him, and Jin Wu can't figure out if this girl is shameless or desperate. The boy, after hearing the girl's words that she would do anything to save him, voices a pass to the top floor, whether she can get it for him while Fang uses his skill with gravity. The girl instantly rises in the air and states that the pass to the top floor is under the protection of her clan. If the boy brings it in one piece, she will be sure to get it for them. The boy says that he thought that's why this pass is nowhere to be found, not expecting to be guarded, and the girl says that she knows where the other passes are, so she will show them to him if he will guarantee her safety. The boy, listening to the promises from the girl, says that it's a tempting enough offer, but also thinks that the problem is that he just doesn't trust this girl. After some amount of time, the boy, having gathered all his strength, comes a little closer to this cunning person who looks at Jin Wu in surprise. A couple of counting seconds pass and the boy begins to use his magical abilities, raising his bluish-colored eyes and making the girl look confused. The girl, who was confused just a couple seconds ago, changes in her face to a visibly frightened one, for the boy is so damn strong in front of her, starting to ask her question. The boy, using his magical powers and hypnotizing skills which he uses famously, continues to voice his question about whether he can trust this girl and her words. The girl looks fearfully at the powerful boy in front of her, continues to hover in the air and is visibly nervous, genuinely stating the fact that she's not lying to Jin Wu and is telling the truth. The boy's gaze changes noticeably. He is quite serious and cold-blooded towards everyone, so he is not going to pity this girl, which she realizes and shakily says that the truth does not lie. The boy briefly states that he believes her, going on about how if the girl grants him a pass, he will leave the place and spare the monsters thus receiving thanks from her. The boy, turning in the other direction from the girl sitting on the ground after gravity, that is quite visibly frightened, looks at her with the edge of his eye and states that first, some huge monster in the guise of an ant is devouring the prey it has just caught through its efforts, while at this moment the terrified officer sits on the ground and watches in horror. All the emotions can be read on the face of the frightened officer, who is puzzled by the appearance of this kind of monster, seeing it for the first time in their territory and silently trembling, unable to speak. After a while, you can see how the flying ant, apparently having done its intended work, leaves the place and flies away in its own direction thanks to its own wings. Now the girl in human form presents herself with her full name, that she is Lady Isil, eldest daughter of the Radir clan smiling at her new acquaintance who almost killed her. The girl was about to tell him about her clan, but the boy cut her off immediately, saying in a cold voice that this was not the information he was asking her about. The boy thinks about how he should formulate the question to get a direct answer from the girl, and then asks if at the last moment she hears a voice ordering her to kill people. The girl listens to the boy's question in front of her, and then looks at him in surprise, seemingly puzzled by the question, not knowing what to say because she obviously expected something else. The girl isn't going to dwell on her thoughts after all, lifting her gaze somewhere upward, as if trying to remember similar moments the boy tells her about. The girl, after spending some time on her memories, does start to talk about not hearing such a thing, but another voice in her head also responds, causing the boy to look at her. The girl says that at times a voice in her head orders her to defend this dilapidated place, seemingly only thus adding morale to battle against opponents. The boy thinks about the fact that they have a different task altogether. The monsters here protect artifacts and temporary dungeons. Perhaps Jin Wu is like a gateway monster to them, asking when they started hearing voices. The girl, looking at the pensive boy, confidently states that they started hearing these voices from the moment they first arrived here, when they started defending this place. The boy seems to snap out of his deep thoughts, 
puzzled by what he has just heard from this girl, questioning again in his mind that has it really been from the beginning of being here. The boy thinks about the fact that these monsters, it turns out, lived in a completely different place, whether he has a clue to the system, asking where they originally lived, if not in this place. The girl, watching the boy in front of her, says that before this place, they were still living in the demon world, so they found themselves in this place without even noticing it. The boy, looking directly at the girl with his chillingly cold eyes, asks her a straightforward question about what demons did in the demon world then, what errands they ran. It seems the boy is starting to use his magical abilities to uncover as much information as possible through his power, watching the changes in the girl's gaze. The girl, standing in one place like the most real willless doll, answers the boy's questions that all the demons in that world were preparing for war, developing a variety of plans. The boy doesn't procrastinate with his next questions. He asks about who they were preparing for war against, and the one answers that this war was against a powerful enemy, that all the demons had to unite. The boy, trying to find out more, is told that he has exceeded the limit of available information, so the conversation will be cut short by repeating the same phrase over and over again. The boy, thinking about the same thing happening to Baruka, because the system is forcibly blocking the girl's speech, which means that Jin Wu could be extracting some sort of clue based on their conversation. The boy thinks to himself that given that everything before this was like some sort of video game, having a backstory wouldn't be something strange, questioning what powerful adversary she was referring to. The boy doesn't give up, tries to get this system to talk, watches as the girl starts holding her hand to her head, apparently due to some sort of pain, trying to say something. But the pain is so intense that the girl just can't stand it thus fainting while the boy manages to catch her in his arms, calling her by name to bring her to her senses. The girl is in a reclining position while the boy watches her while simultaneously pondering the fact that the system has reacted rather violently to attempts to learn the identity of the enemy. The boy thinks about the fact that if this enemy has unthinkable power and is also trying to influence Jin Wu and the land, then maybe the enemies the boy was going up against are the key. Something terrifying happens in one of the towns which begins to be attacked by a monster. The local knights try to attack it, visibly panicked by the alien's speed and power. One of the alarmed knights, watching the movements from the side of the flying ant, loudly cries out that this monster is an anomaly, causing one to be horrified. The knights here are visibly panicking, one of them shrieking furiously. What is wrong with this ant? Why did this particular monster attack the healer directly? What did he find so wrong with it? The knight thinks about the fact that the E-ranked hunters were the first to fall, Yes, with the death of the healer, the team has been weakened, and after loudly proclaims that the monster knows that if the battle drags on, he can't beat them. A flying ant calmly moves through the air, seemingly assessing the situation around him, and someone unbelieving voice cries out that does he really have any rudiments of intelligence. Some man is holding a remote control in his hand, thus showing what he says is the only image of this ant where it was able to be captured full length. Jin Chil says that the mutated ant was eliminated in a day, but it was first spotted on another island. Only thanks to the hunters did that danger pass and all was well. Jin Chul continues that a large number of hunters were lost. The mutant itself was defeated by an A-ranked hunter. The other man saying that one A-ranked hunter would be enough to kill such an ant. Jin Chil states a large number of dead civilians. The mutated ant is able to fly and dodge. The Japanese Association estimated the number of hunters sent as a small price to pay for victory. Jin Chil continues that Japan's hunter association system is one of the most advanced in Asia. But what would happen if mutated ants came to South Korea? Jin Chil says that like Japan, they have many islands, and their country simply can't afford to keep track of all of them, as there are a huge number of them, and monsters can be everywhere. The president of the hunters association says that the island that was attacked is quite far away from them, but if the ant can fly to them, they will apparently be able to reach Mokpo. Some say that otherwise speaking, if they had flown in the other direction, they would have easily reached Chindo Island or Wando Township. Also, they look more like bees than ants. Someone goes on to say that unlike Japan, they can't send hunters to every island. They simply don't have enough manpower. And yes, if they send low-ranking hunters, those will become food. The president of the Hunters Association thinks that who can help South Korea because they have a big nation and a huge area, but lack of defense, like Russia and China or the United States, which refused to help. Jin Chiul, noticing Chairman Ko Gong-hee, turns to him respectfully and seemingly with some question that has arisen, wanting to speak up about this moment right now, because you can't wait. 
Jin Cheel, leaning closer to the chairman, secretly says that he wasn't going to talk about it during the meeting, but there's someone who contacted them in strictest secrecy. Jin Cheel states with his most serious face that hunter Huang Dong Su of the Vulture Guild is willing to cooperate in the upcoming raid on Jeju Island, alerting the president. The president amuses himself by saying that it's an obvious ploy, and Jin Chul says that he has a target in the form of Jin Wu, which is why they sent in a request to be banned from the country during the Red Gate incident. Jin Chul states that hunter Huang Dong Su is not the only one who has contacted their guild specifically, attracting the attention of the president of the Hunters Association, who asks who it is. Suddenly another worker appears, addressing Chairman Ko Gong Hee and stating whether the man would like to walk with him and find out what the guy who appeared in sight wants. After a certain amount of time, the girl opens her eyes, seemingly having been in this position for hours, gaining the strength she so desperately needs at this moment. The girl, gradually beginning to wake up, assumes a sitting position holding her head, and the boy, seeing the other's body movements, immediately asks if she is awake. The boy, standing in his seat and looking at the girl with an attentive gaze, tells her that the demons don't seem to be particularly friendly towards her, pointing a finger. The boy lets the girl look at the huge number of breathless bodies he's been dealing with for a while, saying that these guys were trying to attack the sleeping girl. The girl, opening her large eyes in surprise, vocalizes that the boy does not tell her that he was seriously protecting her while she is in a sleeping position. The girl instantly approaches the boy and bows her head in deference, thanking Jin Wu and saying that demons who lack intelligence do not perceive demons who have it. The boy, looking down at the girl with his chilling gaze, asks her a question about how long it would take them to walk towards the current pass location. The two of them walk in the right direction. Gradually, somewhere in the distance of their path, they begin to notice a huge, sprawling castle on a hill, which shows all its gloominess. The boy thinks about the demonic castle being inside the demonic castle, too confusing, and the girl asks the knight where her father is, and the knight says the man is in the throne room. The girl asks to take care of the boy behind her, for he is an important guest, and afterward the two of them walk towards the throne room to meet the girl's father. The girl leads her important guest down the red carpet, addressing her father and stating that she's brought a new person here, while Jin Wu thinks that if he walked in here with a shadow, a fight would break out. The man sitting on his throne lurks for a while in the shadows, beginning gradually and with a palpable horror in his mind to voice that Essel has done something terrible on his part. The man that is the king of the demonic castle is horrified in his pale face and states who the girl has brought here, examining the new person with disgust in his eyes. The girl says that this man is their guest, and the man replies that since when do guests come to someone else's house and with his army to boot? causing the man to break into a loud scream. The girl seems dumbfounded by her father's words, opens her huge eyes and looks around incomprehensibly, hearing the question of whether the girl can't see this. The man rants about how there are over a hundred soldiers, maybe even countless, in the boy's shadow, and Jin Wu wonders if the king has such good intuition. The boy continues to stand his ground even after a moment when knights with their swords appear around him, hearing loud words about how he dared to come here with his knights. The boy calmly states that he has promised Ezel to leave this place without any incident, only if one of them gives Jin Wu a pass to the next floor. The boy calmly pulls back the weapon of one of the demons with his hand, and the king thinks about whether this is the same hunter who was killing demons with crazy speed and climbing the tower. The man thinks that although they belong to the nobility, their clan Radier remains the weakest among the other twenty. He even heard that the boy defeated Metis and Vulcan. Can they win it? The man who continues to sit on his throne comes up and asks if the pass is the one thing he wants, and the boy replies that there is something else he wants. The boy earnestly states that he wants to take the girl with him on his long and bloody journey. He draws Ezel to him, who is embarrassed by such a gesture, and remains silent. The boy thinks about the fact that Aesel knows where the other passes are, which is why he will need her to guide him to each of them and save precious time. The boy thinks about whether he said something wrong, looking at the reaction of the king who glares angrily at Jin Wu, but never says anything contradictory, so only silently agrees. The man elegantly holds a fork and knife in his hands, slicing the bloody steak while trying to find out more about the boy's intentions by asking about the chaperone. The man questions that the boy only needs a pass and an escort while Jin Wu thinks that the king seems to have misinterpreted his thoughts on Essel. The man says that if he had known from the beginning that this monster was the master of those black soldiers, he would never have gone to fight him saying that Jin Wu was not going to put his daughter in danger. 
The boy thinks of a monster worrying about his daughter is an interesting enough picture. Jin Wu slices a piece of steak and says that he gives his word and always keeps it. The man seems to get a satisfying response from the boy, briefly reads, All right, and raises his hand in a sign for one of the demons to approach him. The demon gradually approaches the boy, holding some paper object in his hands, and the boy, realizing that it all belongs to him, immediately reaches out and takes the object in his hands. The boy thinks about the fact that it's really a pass in his hands that allows him to cross over to the 81st floor of the demonic castle, opening up even more doors of the place for Jin Wu. The boy, seemingly not about to waste much time on any more conversation, rises from the table and turns to the girl to ask if she's ready to get ready to hit the road right now. The girl agrees, and afterward receives a notification that he has received a request for a group from a member of the demonic nobility which means that they will be able to share the experience with the members of the group. The boy thinks about if the whole experience is shared with input, and afterward says that if the girl sees even the slightest hint of a fight, let her stay out of it, so he'll figure it out for himself. The girl realizes the seriousness of the boy's words, literally entrusting her own life to some man who is only mopping up a demonic dungeon, agreeing. The boy asks the girl if it's hard for her to move around without a horse, and the girl says that only members of groups can enter the moving circle, so there is no need for a horse. After some amount of time, the girl asks the boy to wait for a couple of minutes, starting to look for something in her backpack which she took with her. The girl pulls out a bottle and says that it's the favorite alcoholic drink of the head of the Garshi clan. Her father prepared the best for each clan head, and Jin Wu asks what it's for. The girl says that with such gifts, their negotiations will go more than smoothly. And the boy says that there's no chance their guild is on friendly terms with this one. The girl says no, because in the demon world, clans fought for their positions in the rankings. But they definitely can't fight this clan. And the boy says it's fine and understands everything. The boy, more confident than ever in his words and actions, tells the girl to just sit and wait for him, seemingly finding new opponents for himself, which he will do. The boy states in a confident voice that this battle won't take him long, promising the girl to handle it all as quickly as possible heading towards the new clan. The boy states that it only took him a couple minutes for the flames to burst into flames, and screams began to strip from around every corner that came from the castle of the Garshi clan. Moving now to the Hunters Association building with many different situations going on, such as and some talks along with the president of the Hunters Association. The newly arrived hunter reads the man's excellent English, but he's sure he didn't mishear that the whereabouts of the 10th S-ranked hunter are now completely unknown. Jinshil says that this hunter is elusive, so they're trying to track him down, and the man asks how he can trust them, to which he hears that the hunter's association isn't that stupid. Not stupid enough to lie so easily in the eyes of a national-level hunter, thus causing the newly arrived man to smile and briefly agree. Hunter says that he heard about Dong Su and the fact that he came to Korea and made a ruckus, because since he is an S-ranked hunter, he can't be forgotten about as well. The president of the Hunters Association clings to the word our in someone else's speech, thinking about the fact that this man is talking about Dong Su as if this hunter belongs entirely to the United States. Hunter states that Jin Wu is one thing, but he also came to Korea to request a ban on Hunter Dong Su from entering the country. But it seems the guild has already dealt with it, which the president confirms. Hunter continues that then this dialogue will end much sooner, so he'll call them if he needs anything. And the man thinks about the fact that although he himself is by no means of small build, but next to this hunter, the man feels like a baby. And the man says he heard that South Korea is in distress. So once he came to his senses, did he give any hope to them? Hunter keeps saying that he wants to help them with the Jeju Island situation. But the hunter's association knows that he is a busy man, which is quite unfortunate. The man begins to smile widely as he continues to say that if South Korea had enough money to hire him, he would still be able to think about the case. The hunter says he has to go, and Jinshul asks if their hunter can accompany him on his way to the plane, and the hunter replies that it will be up to them, also adding to keep their conversation private. As soon as the hunter leaves their building, the president of the Hunters Association surprisingly states that it was in fact a national-level hunter. Was it foolish to hope for a foreign presence in Jeju-do? Jinshul tries to support his chairman by saying to just not worry about the case, because the cooperation with Japan has already been confirmed. Jinshul goes on to say that a hunter from the Big Japanese Guild is going to visit South Korea today, currently heading in the right direction on an airplane. On the territory of the demonic castle is coming fierce battle. The boy does not stop attacking the surrounding knights, receiving for each kill additional experience. 
The boy who just defeated a noble demon gets a lot more experience, and afterwards states that they seem to give a lot of experience due to the fact that they have a high level. The boy notices that Igris has the maximum level, so now a promotion is available due to reaching the required level. Also, the rank of the shadow will be raised with confirmation. Even the tank now has a max level, so now a boost is available due to reaching the required level. Also, the shadow rank will be boosted with confirmation. The boy thinks about the fact that he seems to be able to increase his rank if the shadows reach the maximum level, watching the subordinates give a request to increase their rank. The boy, looking at his subordinates, notices the notice coming in, which asks about making a decision and ranking his shadows, which he does, looking confident. Immediately, notifications start coming in that the majestic knight Igris has been promoted from the rank of knight to elite knight, and the tank has been promoted from elite to knight. The boy notices the new alerts again, stating that shadows who have a rank higher than just knight can get a name, asking them to choose some name for their subordinates. The boy watches as Igris appears, beginning to think that his soldier's aura has noticeably increased to a higher level, something that Jin Wu can't help but admire. The boy realizes that due to the rise in rank, now Igris has gained strength comparable to S rank, and the tank has resumed his level to his starting level, but already being a knight. The boy before looks at his tank and thinks about the fact that this subordinate has been given a power comparable to the maximum power of an A rang hunter, which only makes future battles easier. Suddenly, the girl draws attention to herself by calling the boy by name and using Mr. with it, thus causing Jin Wu to be embarrassed and tell her not to say it. The girl calls him Master again, but awkwardly, and then asks him if he knows how many clans he's managed to destroy, and he replies that it's about nine if he's not mistaken. The girl says that starting from the 90th floor, each subsequent floor will be controlled by clans from the high-ranking nobility, and those are on a completely different level, as if to discourage. The girl goes on to say that if the boy negotiates with them, they'll probably give him a pass like the girl's clan did, and Jin Wu asks that if he was weaker, would their clan give him a pass? The girl's gaze instantly changes after hearing the boy's words, seeming to begin to realize why her father did exactly that. The boy, looking at the girl with his bluish colored eyes, smiles slightly and says that that's how it works here. That's how you can get passes. The boy stretches and states that the girl was talking about a fierce fight between demonic clans, so he will raise Radis's clan to the top of the list, and the one states that her clan is called Radir. The girl awkwardly calls out to the boy again, using Lord in her speech, and then continues afterward, asking about why Jin Wu didn't touch her clan, which still seems to be plaguing Isil's thoughts. The boy answers the girl straightforwardly, looking her exactly in the eye, that he liked Isil, seeing nothing odd about telling the truth since she inquired anyway. The boy thinks about the fact that maybe he's somehow compatible with people who are quite awkward, or it's something else while the girl is covered in a blush, not knowing what to say. The boy thinks about the level and number of monsters being on a whole other level that doesn't even come close to comparing to the lower floors, gradually realizing it. The boy thinks that despite the increase in his intelligence, it seemed insignificant to him that mana was being consumed, but it shows in how often his warriors recover after being destroyed. The boy is on the 97th floor, thinking about the fact that it doesn't mean about passing to the 97th floor due to luck, because Jin Wu also has his great strength. The girl watching the boy thinks about the fact that even the 4th rank Paistos clan and the 5th rank Ricardo clan were destroyed. She quietly wonders if other people are as strong as Sir Jin Wu. The boy reads something like that, and afterward thinks that Go Gun He and Cha Ha Yun are definitely stronger than ordinary S ranks. Based on their aura, they're clearly a couple leagues higher. The boy thinks about the fact that S ranks are very different from each other. Also, the time gap will be stronger than other ranks, because once Jin Wu reached the higher floors, everything might change. The boy turns to the girl and tells her that she can go back to her floor because he can take care of the rest, making the girl freeze in surprise. The girl even reacts somehow offended by the boy's words, starting to vowel uncertainly about whether Jin Wu doesn't really need her anymore, staring with her big eyes. The boy thinks about the fact that this girl was funny until the end, and afterwards says that the one did a great job thanks to her, and Isil in the meantime lowers her head and accepts all the words of the guy. The girl seems to be different from many of the others in her resilience and assertiveness, starting to voice that she wants to go with the boy, wants to help him all the way. The girl, standing across from the boy, begins to confidently vocalize that she wants to see the outcome of Jin Wu's battle, 
since she's been an observer the whole time they've been going up the floors. The boy does not seem to find the strength to resist the girl's desire, so he voices for her to do as she wishes, going with her to the 98th floor. The action takes place at an international airport called Incheon, which is constantly crowded with a huge number of people and countless flights. From this airport, some man with company in the form of a girl gradually and at a leisurely pace comes out, carrying behind him someone else's suitcase, seeming to be a guide. The man, who is an S-rank hunter named Ryuji Koto, is surveying the area around him, unhappily noting the fact that the place is somehow noisy. The man, very briefly in this huge place, states that there's definitely someone damn strong at the airport, and the girl asks about whether Koto-san himself is stronger than Koto-san. The man thinks about how it's impossible, because such a person would never show up in a place like this, as some guy suddenly appears, apologizing for his long delay due to the crowd. The man says everything is fine and no need to worry, asks if anything happened at the airport, and the man says the hunter from the United States flew in on personal business, so everything is fine. The man thinks of the hunter of their United States, beginning to wonder if it has something to do with the current situation in Korea following this man who is pointing their way. Moving into the Hunters Association building, the president of his clan sits in a chair in his business suit, folds his hands on his desk, and thinks about the man in front of him. Is the only hunter capable of competing with Liu Jian from Asia itself, calling himself Ryu Jin Koto, looking at the president with a serious look and seemingly ready to negotiate. 